Are you interested in 10xing your life savings? Then invest it. <laughs> Isn't that what always happens when a, when a channel mysteriously gets a lot of uh, viewers? I got to put some music on. Hang on. Everything's messed up since the account switch up. that coming through okay yeah i'm trying to make a i'm trying to make a community post um the issue is i can't make a community post uh on the main channel while i'm signed into the second channel so uh i know how to get around that of course which is we just uh use a second browser simple as link so how are we all doing today Add an existing YouTube video. It's not a video, it's a stream. You can tell YouTube's like not meant to be a uh, streaming platform. What browser do I default? Um, <clears throat> on my old rig, I used Iridium a lot. Um, I have I use Iridium for the streams. That's the browser that you see. But as for what I normally use, I've been lazy. I installed Firefox um, and never, never moved away from it. Invested myself in it. Oh. Where am I live? I can hear myself talking. Maybe it's on my phone. I think it is on my phone. That's funny. Stop watching myself on my phone. Because I was trying to do the community post on my phone. I just saw the Odd Grub Skyrim videos by Two Clicks Philip. Have I seen them? I have not heard of those. Uh, let me get the, <clears throat> the old anime girls set up. And then I'll go take a look at that. Skyrim Adventures with Odd Grub. Oh, it's a it's a series of videos. Mm. I know who I know who Philip is. Um, here, let me just. Uh, Move her over, make her smaller. There we go. How are we all doing today? I'll throw it at like the bottom of the list. I'm trying to gauge what it is without actually watching the video. Any chance you stream VTube model creation at some point? Um, I don't know how interesting it would be. Damn, I can't show that stream. Uh, I opened Steam today, and the top game was a game called Orc Massage, and it literally, like, one of the preview pictures is just an anime girl getting fucking railed. Uh... <clears throat> Any chance for Nocturnal Rambler video? He's always been on the on the list. His Skyrim video has 45k. Okay, so it's up like 8,000 views from when I took the. Uh, I, 
by the way, things have been... Th the videos I've been watching are kind of mildly sorted by, like, view count, so... There have been some exceptions, though. Like, we watched private sessions a lot earlier than, like, view count would suggest. I'm gonna ask me when the Skyrim VR stream ends. Um... I don't know if I could stream VR. I, I know it's possible. I don't know if I could do it. That's an odd perspective. Do you like... Do you get confused if your girlfriend's like really far away from you? You just think that she's tiny? Is that depth perception? Or perhaps a lack thereof? Finally joined a stream without missing an hour first. Yeah, um... Well, that happens when you do the unscheduled streams, which I guess I should say, uh, that was the big reason that I think I didn't get across on the final stream on the other channel was um i'm fine with streaming over there if it's scheduled that's like one of the big things is i want to be able to just turn on the stream and go and um youtube's not conducive to that as a platform basically give it a trial run see what your endurance is well, I, I'm just looking at it from a how do I make this entertaining perspective? Because the last thing people like to watch is um, the Pat Hour. Let's uh, do some tr tech troubleshooting live on air. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the loudest thing ever. Could YouTube, like... Maybe it should be up to creators, but could YouTube, like, slow boil in the content and not just, like, uh, open with the barrage? Would it be amusing if we, uh... If we did Acer Thorn instead of DW Terminator. I personally think it would be. But, um... I don't know. It's like... Should we really let Acer Thorn kind of dictate terms and what have you? Or, um... Because that was the big issue with that stream was like... He was dictating the pace... There's some job, yeah. There's some jobs that um, is conducive to like watching at work. So and I think I marked down when we stopped. It should be around one twelve fifty three. See, he knows how to open a video. You can't just like the first second of your video can't be this. Hello, everyone. No, just... That's a... That's a... Uh, is that a cold open? That, is that what we call that on YouTube? In, in the video analysis space? Cold open. Oh, a cold open is when something opens without... Okay, yeah, without, like, a teaser sequence. So, that yeah, that's, like, literally what it is. Just hide Acer Thorn in the chat if it's a problem. Um... I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, like, that's probably the worst way to do it. Because you know full well he's going to cry, like, censorship. If that's the case. Like, you're not letting me defend my video, and it's like, well, you know. Um, it's a different kind of stream when the, other, when the other person is there. And I think he got to defend a lot of, like, the first... God, like, the first half. I think. 
Uh, the first 40 percent. So if he wants to watch the stream and like write up a comment or something, I don't think it. I don't think these streams merit like a like a video response. But I am also biased in that matter. Like obviously, uh, it would be in my interest if I could just bully people ruthlessly on the no I don't bully people uh it, it, but it would be in my interest if like uh there weren't extensive dramas although maybe it wouldn't be maybe I'd make more money if there were dramas but not Acer Thorn dramas because it, uh it that's a lame drama I'd rather have a cold open than the Skyrim op opening theme I don't know because the issue with the cold opens is like uh, when I first start the videos for the streams, they're max volume. <laughs> so it, like, destroys everybody in the audience. Is Acer Thorn in the room with you now? I'm not going to say... No, I'm not going to say that Acer Thorn is sitting across the table from me with a shotgun pointed at my cock. Um, that is not happening. He's not... He's definitely not holding up the, the, the webcam. <laughs> You made some JoJo poses for the VTubers girls. Did you ever post those pics anywhere slash on the Discord? Yeah, they were on the Discord for a while. That channel is not there currently, but I still have all those pictures. But yeah, like, I would look up uh, JoJo poses and then, like, recreate them. So that's that's what I would do for some girls. This one doesn't have anti-aliasing. This one does. Like, I think my favorite one is uh, this one. Cause, because uh, there was some, like, so you can't have, you can't load up, like, two models in the post thing. So there, I had to do some, like, trickery to make it work. But that's a pose of Jotaro and Kakyoin. I think that's how you say his name. I wouldn't know. Private Sessions is holding the webcam. I think Private Sessions is not available. I think he, that's what he said was Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So it is Wednesday. Um, I am thinking about like asking him to come on and we could do... I don't know how I feel about covering my own video, if only because there's issues with that. Number one is I'd kind of want somebody who has like Morrowind under their belts there. So we can't really watch the Morrowind video because uh, Private Sessions hasn't played it yet. So unless he wants to stream with me because like he's interested in doing his own note taking on this on the video. I don't know because um, I think he's said to me before he wants to do a Morrowind video. But that, him coming on could be like the day we do the Kretosis video since um, those guys have been waiting patiently forever for me to actually watch their Skyrim video because they're looking for critique. Um, and I rudely have not provided it to them. Have you heard of the reaction drama with Moist Critical, Dark Viper AU, and JXC? Okay, so... Is this a new thing, or is this... Um, I know JXC's been involved in, like, drama before. Uh, I didn't know Moist Critical was involved, and I don't know who Dark Viper AU is. So, let me... Uh, let me look it up. How do I even... How do you even look up drama? Now, why is this guy familiar? Oh, he's got an all my links. I was like, why wouldn't you link your platforms? But that's because he... Oh, God, he's got like 20 of them. He's one of those. He's got 626,000 followers on Twitch. Got 939,000 subscribers on uh, on YouTube. Wait, is he live? Okay, what the fuck is this? Uh, horse. So, like, 
He's live. And he's looking at the same page it is that I. I'm looking at. Demetri. Wait. Did I literally like... Why does it say it's still running? It's not still running. Did I literally click on his stream? Or is this a clip? I don't know how Twitch works. Fuck. What is that? Why would you design a site like that? Bully the word controversies proceeded with their username. I don't know, but Moist Critical is like involved in everything. Alright. The funny part. Even the unofficial channel run by Fanu uploads his reactions to YouTube, gives credit, and links. Been told Critical does not link the creator's videos when he uploads his react live streams to YouTube. Such a weird situation to be in. Normally when I make a video, I can think, yeah, maybe they 2x speed this and got through it. Gotta say it is a struggle thinking people are that interested in reading essays. Even I prefer audiobooks. I used to make videos responding to people on the most... Ah, Jesus. This seems like... Uh... I'm not following on what the situation is. All right. Essentially, Dark Viper AU made a 14-page script for a video he was going to make calling our reaction content creator, calling out reaction content creators for making bad slash unacceptable content. Moist Critical reacted to the script and was disingenuous, poisoned the well, etc. That would be surprising if... I would be surprised if Moist Critical... I, I mean, it's, it's certainly possible, but he's not a guy that, like, messes up stories. So... Is that what Critical does over on Twitch? You gotta remember, I literally don't use Twitch. So I don't know... I actually don't, like, have no clue what he does over there. Okay, so like... Okay, so that's what's happening. Twitch plays, like, the most recent VOD automatically when you go to their page. I guess that's like how if you go to a YouTuber's page, sometimes it I plays a top video, but that's like we pick those. We pick what video uh, plays for the first time on your channel. So I'm seeing a lot of, like, game streams. I have to know, I've been wondering since your Morrowind video, what rhymes with Spudgrings? Good Springs from New Vegas. I was surprised too. Moist Critical's video ended up getting a higher dislike ratio than Dark Vipers. I hope this causes the YouTube audience to be more strict about low quality reaction content that mostly just steals other creators' videos without transforming it like you do. Well, that's the issue they typically run in. I've typically seen with other reaction content is um, they just play the video and they don't really like contribute any anything to it or even worse I really hate like and I know that I've been wrong about stuff before I hate when like people watching videos are wrong or like taking away the wrong interpretation it's Curtis <laughs> gets criticized for reaction content and then reacts to it. Well, I mean, okay, so if that's your platform, if that's what you do, um, then, yeah, it makes sense that, like, that would be the the means by which you would uh, respond to it. But yeah, I, the Twitch reaction people, and I guess... It's not as much a thing on YouTube because we have, like, better copyright systems. Um, the Twitch reaction people really bother me from the sense of, like, they make it harder for me to do my streams um, if they're, like, just fucking up and uh, making the rest of us look bad, basically. Oh, wow. Okay, so one of the guys on my list is Genji. And his videos has jumped up over a hundred thousand views um, since I marked it down. So that's cool. 
I was just watching a video about this. Uh, yeah, well, this is gonna just, this is gonna keep being an ongoing thing. Um, until something happens. Uh, I've always said, if you are a video content creator, maybe a way to go about it is you issue a content use policy and and then uh, strike these people. Now, I don't know how well, like, striking works on Twitch, uh, but basically, like, yeah, just write up a policy or, like, there could be, like, a stock policy that gets passed around that's, like, actually written by a lawyer, right? And just say, like, I'm not going to strike you if you are being transformative with your reactions, but if you're just watching the video and not really adding anything to it, then, like, you, you know, this is what's this is what's going to happen, basically. Are we still disliking streams or liking them now? Um, as long as you do something, I think it's fine. I think people took away the wrong, the wrong, um the thing from the disliked stuff. That was supposed to be, you're supposed to dislike everything you watch. And so like, so that like across the board, there's just a market increase in dislikes. Not that you're specifically supposed to dislike my streams. Wow, what does that accomplish? You've basically told me that you also don't like that they got rid of the dislike counter. Thoughts on Dovinati's Morrowind review? I haven't seen it. I haven't really seen a whole lot of Morrowind stuff. Morrowind, unbiased review. Oh, I, I got... Yeah, I was linked this. But I haven't watched it. The second thing is Israel, unbiased history. Um, the fuck? Wild shit. <laughs> The obvious answer is to put a massive opaque watermark in the middle of the frame of your entire video. Isn't that sad? Um, I'm trying to think. I think there have been people who've done that. But, uh, okay, so here's the issue. Is when you don't react hard enough, which I know is the meme, when you don't react hard enough, then there's no reason for that person to go actually watch the video by itself and that's always been my mentality is like if we watch a good video i think people will go watch it um without the commentary to like get the full experience themselves but if there's no commentary and we just basically rebroadcast it then there's no point in you going to the channel and actually watching the video again you're not giving them exposure i guess you're giving their other videos exposure that doesn't really help a whole lot of people, though. Liking videos, it's actually practical. All your liked videos are saved in a big playlist, so I can't dislike all videos. Well, the what was the thing? It was um, any video you don't outright like, you should dislike. So, like, any video that you don't put a like on, you would dislike. I think that was the that was the rule we came up with. Reaction content can also steal impressions by diluting the pool of available YouTube videos that can be suggested to you by the algorithm, meaning it steals views from not only the original video but potentially other videos too for such low effort content. Yeah, and I'm glad somebody I'm glad you said the low effort content because that's been my kind of big hang up with streaming is that um it's a like a one to one uh, content or time to content ratio whereas the video would have been you know the ratio would have been a lot different there would have been a lot more uh, effort to the number of minutes of content produced nobody is going to watch a reaction stream and then go watch the original video basically um I like to think that this stream's probably been like a big advertisement for Angry Joe and G-Man. Because <laughs> I've said time and time again that they had the best videos. And then, um, let's see, Angry Joe Skyrim. I'm surprised. I'm, it's a shame Angry Joe Skyrim isn't the top search result. Uh, we showed before. Oh. There goes YouTube again, being temperamental with its features. Uh, you can see I no longer have the heat map on the timeline. Why? 
Why did I have this feature for one stream? Like, may okay, maybe it was two streams. But I showed before, like, um, the part where Joe's says 10 out of 10 is, like, the most viewed part of the video. And it had, like, a the Pornhub heat map uh, peak there. I like to think that that's my fault. Who watches Angry Joe ever? Um, I think some people, some people it has to, he has to be appealing to somebody. I mean, he's not getting bad views or anything like that. What is this title? All right, so the title is. Can I, okay, ignore ignore what that says. I'm gonna change it. All right, here's the title. AGS. <laughs> I like that it's warped. Uh, that stands for Angry Joe Show News. Oh wait, no, he doesn't cap. He doesn't fully cap news. Okay. Dash. Now there's no space before the dash. There's a dash and then space, which strikes me as weird. It takes two dollar sign five mil sales, comma. Now you might be thinking, okay, so the next thing this title is going to say is going to be like some elaboration. Like, what do you mean it takes two five million dollar sales? At least say like who's involved in this story. Nope, space GTA six. Uh, I got it. Okay, so this is where I got a mouse over it. Uh, con confirmed all caps comma. Stadia, lowercase, is dead. Nintendo, no purchase plans, NFTs. Um, I'm in love with this title. My friend sincerely recommended me Angry Joe and Crotton Tea. Um, Angry Joe, I can see, like, being a appealing to, like, uh, the anti-corporate kind of game news crowd because that's always been kind of his thing is like he doesn't really seem to get how the, how the industry works but he knows that like rich people are bad or something who is this Why is YouTube telling me about this? YouTube like went out of its way to notify me that about some channel with 20 subscribers commenting. That's weird. Highly unusual. If we're looking for good Gaming news, my latest game got accepted for Steam. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Steam just seems to have, like, a open-door policy when it comes to porn games. Um. Uh, I don't, I, is there any limits? Is there any, like, fetishes that are taboo? Like. There's always somebody in the comments of an Angry Joe Show news video that leaves timestamps so you don't have to waste your time on 90% of the video. Uh, yeah, God bless people like that. I mean, that's one of those things where it's like, logistically, Joe could do that himself, because whoever edits the video can just have, like, a document that says, all right, now this is the part of the video where it starts. Like, it's annoying after the fact to make timestamp markers for stuff, but if you have it as part of your process, then it's not impossible. Only illegal stuff isn't allowed on Steam. I'm thinking about what, what would have to constitute an illegal game. I guess child, like full motion video child porn games <laughs> surely steam had, like if it's american laws then that's a pretty fucking open book in terms of what you can and can't do
Have you played Arx Fatalis? Let me think. Was that the one I played? That's the old... Is that the old arcane game? I think it is. Arx. Yes, I've played it, but not very much of it. That was one of those I-have-to-do-this-later kind of games, and it never happened. Well, yeah, I mean, like, Hunt Down the Freeman is on Steam. Like, if you can violate Valve's copyright and still get published on their platform, then I think that, like, there there's not really a, a barrier to entry. Is Astrid the dumbest person in Skyrim? Well, Delphine is up there. <laughs> Have I watched Boba F the Boba Fett TV? No. Um, because I saw season two of The Mandalorian, and I was like, I don't need to... Yeah, I'm not interested. The worst episodes of the of the season two of The Mandalorian were the ones that involved Boba Fett. Alrighty. I am... I am working to find the will to start the Acer Thorn video. <laughs> Wait a second. This is not how the post captioning is. Did he finally... Oh, wait, no. I gotta scroll down. I forgot. No. You might actually have, like, a full captioned video. I know, like, the first ten... Last time we watched this, the first ten minutes were fully captioned. Um... He's still... Okay, so the video's still, like... Does it still hold up in 2022? Hmm. And then, like, the... Dis like, at least change the description. And then... See, I don't... I see people do this. I think they got, like, they figured out a way to make this not work as well. But, um, yeah. You ever consider doing a video on the Fable series? I'm particularly interested in a breakdown on the remake of Fable, The Lost Chapters versus the original. Um, well, the only one I played was Fable 3. No, I played Fable 2 as well, I guess. But, like, I'm not first enough. It's one of those things that could happen, but I don't know. I don't know. Was there character development in EU Boba Fett? All I, I just seem to recall he would show up. Not necessarily that... Um, oh. When did that happen? We got stuck in top chat. Not necessarily that, um... Like, I don't know if there were any big Boba Fett stories. I'm sure there were, but... It's sort of like saying, like, um... They really ruined IG-88 or Bosk's character, or like, uh, Greedo. I'm about to play Metal Gear Survive while I listen to this. Well, that's a, that's a great choice in video game to play while listening to content, because there's fuck all going on in that game. Well, the problem with top... I wouldn't mind top chat if it wasn't so damn sensitive. How big of a Star Wars fan are you? 
Um, I'm one of those Star Wars fans that doesn't hate the prequels. I don't think they're very good movies, but I don't like hate them. And I think that's just that's an age thing more than anything. Like, um, I don't know. I just never understood like the passion that like the Star Wars guys who really fucking hate the prequels have. I can understand that for the sequels. But like, I don't know. I guess like maybe it's that the sequels give you like appreciation for what we had with the prequels. At least the prequels were made by like a genuine person. Like I saw a thing about um, George Lucas breaking down the difference between joy and pleasure and how like living a good life is about having lots of joy and how like pleasure is like a short term uh a short-term deal and, and joy is like a long-term deal. It's very interesting. Um, a lot more interesting than any of the things that anybody who worked on the sequel trilogy has ever said. I had a Darth Vader mask. I couldn't afford a Darth Vader helmet. I was poor coming up. Alrighty, let's uh get this started. Be made for the cities themselves having to be so small. If the cities were bigger, Bethesda would need to create more NPCs to live in them, otherwise the lack of population density would be immersion working in its own right. And more NPCs means fewer NPCs who feel unique and have unique personalities. However, as I said Hang on. Own right, and more NPCs means fewer. So, like, last time it was seeing NBCs, now it's seeing PUCs, which is, uh, kind of unusual. So, yeah, I forgot. I Well, I didn't forget as much as, like... After watching the DW Terminator video... Was it the DW Terminator video? I don't know. It's something we've watched since Acer Thorn that, like... A big crux of it was, like, the... My immersion was broken... That, um, that I've really started to be bothered by that style of argumentation. Maybe it's that, like, I wrote a part about immersion breaking since the last time we saw this video. But it's one of... Oh, God, no, please don't, don't start saying it. Um, I just don't find my immersion was broken to be a particularly convincing argument. You know, it's one of those, like, oh yeah, my immersion was broken because I decided to shift my legs because I got really uncomfortable. I've completely detailed the chat by asking, or I assume you mean derailed. Derailed the chat about asking about Boba Fett. Yeah, this is, there are, there are some things you can do to derail chat. One of those is, like, talk about Star Wars. Uh, talk about terrorists. I actually hated even the small clips of Rebels I've seen on YouTube looks god-awful. Uh, I've seen a compilation of, like, all the Thrawn scenes. Those That was pretty good. Although, the issue with Thrawn and Rebels is that, like, they need... Thrawn to fail because if he was successful and if he was as successful as he's typically been in other stories then he would absolutely devastate the cast of Rebels and I know nothing about the cast of Rebels I know that there's a kid named Ezra who has a lightsaber and that's basically it I guess they have a robot or something uh, I was more interested in like the Thrawn scenes but like so it's very formulaic Thrawn can't fail because that ruins the mystique of his character so they just add like subordinate characters that do fail and then it's like well i mean that still reflects poorly on thrawn because he like he's in charge he's their boss you know he put them in that position am i being derailed Thrawn is too competent for the show. I think Thrawn is too competent for Disney. That's like the... 
that's gonna be the worst thing is like there's no way with how much pandering they're doing with like the live action stuff that they're not gonna try to do like live action Thrawn. Where NPCs who feel unique and have unique density, cities were bigger. Bethesda would need to create more NPCs to live in them, otherwise, the lack of population density would be immersion breaking in its own right. And more NPCs means fewer NPCs who feel unique and have unique personalities. However, okay, so that's a weird, that's a weird thing. Like, let's be honest. How many of the city NPCs can we say have like are unique and have personalities? Like, like you, I, it's like saying, um, you can't put more water in that. You're going to dilute it down. And it's like, well, it's diluted. It's already like basically non-existent. Like diluting it any further isn't going to have an effect on it because there's already s such a small amount. It's called stun locking when you cause a streamer to get stuck on a talking point, I think. Um, I guess that's a that's a good name for it. In its own right, and more NPCs means fewer NPCs who feel unique and have unique personalities. I mean, like there are unique pers NPCs. Like, so this lady is the like blacksmith's apprentice in Windhelm. Um, I like Norellian and his apprentice. They're in the shop, like back behind there. Um, it's not that, like, I like them, but it's, like, they do stand out as characters. But that's not really, like, a convincing argument to say, well, we can't have bigger cities and we can't have more NPCs because it would dilute the existing NPCs. Like, uh, one way you can go, I don't agree with it, but one way you can go is the will route of let's have a bunch of generic unnamed NPCs that you can't talk to or something like that. I don't even think, like, I think that there's no reason to have a system where you just have peasant like it's very easy to assign names out of a database so it's like there's no reason why you should ever encounter a generic bandit they should have names they should be randomly selected names but they should have names nonetheless that's been one of the big things that's bothered me since blood moon maybe even tribunal blood moon more because of how many reavers you encounter the generic bandit problem. Like, all the bandits in Morrowind are named. Even if they don't serve purposes, they have names. And sure, you can say, well, they have to be able to respawn. Yeah, I get that. But, um, again, randomly pull it from a name. This is, like, that was already done in Daggerfall. Anyways, we're going off about names. Um, when that's not really, like, conducive to what he's talking about. Is the guy here... Pro I, not that I've seen so far. Um, he might not show. He might not show up. He was lurking for a while. I know, because I think he was like really worried that I was going to continue watching the video, and he was right to be worried. Um, but I am probably more patient than him, or he might show up at some point. His his fans might tell him, or maybe not his fans. Maybe. Maybe not his fans, maybe like an instigator will tell him that I'm watching his video. I just want to watch part of his video without him being here to see the difference. You could always have unique NPCs in the city and then have more generic NPCs walking around. I, I, I don't know. Maybe like it might be like something he was talking about before that like obviously we don't remember because it's been a few months. Um... I don't think he made the case that, like, you have to start with, you have to make the cities bigger. I guess I have a note that says he says that, um, but you have to wonder, like, is the stylized small cities of Elder Scrolls legitimate? Is there a thing that they're trying to go for? Um, I'm thinking they're trying to do like a vertical slice of what the city's actually like just to create the illusion because they have difficulty uh, doing the proper scale. There's a mod for a name generator for settlers in Fallout 4, so it seems possible. It's not just possible. It's been done before um, in Daggerfall. All the NPCs had random names. 
that you could look up like um if you want to like if you ever want to name a character a real name you can look up the names that were used uh like the pool or the database or what have you However, as I said earlier, I think Bethesda can afford to make their cities and populations just a little bit bigger without sacrificing too much in terms of handcrafted. Are you their actuary? I mean, yeah, you can you can give credence to this argument and say Yes, they could make them bigger. But one, should they? And can't you say that? about everything um i'm uncertain i've heard the claim before that like bethesda ran up against the clock when it came to developing skyrim like they were working on it until the game came out basically i've heard that before i've also heard that like it was a very chill environment i don't think they're like you'd have to ask somebody like because, like, there's stuff that's cut from the game, and it seems to be cut because it was, un like, unfinished. So, like, uh, Never Knows Best's favorite inn was actually going to be a town, uh, which would have been really interesting. So, Nightgate Inn would not have been the lonely, solitary place that he spends five minutes talking about. It would have actually been, like, it was going to be a village. And uh, it got cut for some reason. And there's dialogue in the Dark Brotherhood that actually still refers to it as a village. Um... Will we get a procedurally generated Daggerfall video? I don't... I am of the mind that it would not take a considerable amount of time to talk about Daggerfall. Or just use fantasy name generators? Sure, if you want, like, a generic fantasy name, but um, Elder Scrolls is not... is not generic fantasy, in my opinion. Some of it is. Like, the, Nord, the Nords definitely are. The... I'm going to have a Nordic first name and then a conjunction of two words as a second as a, as the last name. That's pretty common in fantasy. Are the cities that important to warrant expanding them? Well, and also if you make the cities bigger, um it, it's an issue of scale because they haven't changed the scale since Morrowind. There's just not enough space. Like so people like to complain about how there's not 7,000 steps on the uh, throat of the world. The mountain would have to be 10 times bigger for there to be 7,000 steps. And it would be as big as the whole map of Skyrim. So you can make the case that, like, the cities need to be bigger. No, Skyrim needs to be bigger. Um, they need to just up the scale that they're working at so that they can actually, like, fully realize these cities. Because I've always thought, like, the Imperial City was extremely goofy. Because, like, it's really big proportional to the area around it. Just rip them from the UESB. places and people but yeah it's like okay so it's hard to it's hard to counter the argument they should have worked harder I, uh, yeah i guess i guess i agree i've said before um this video is not like the worst thing there's some weird takes but it's fine we've seen way worse uh skyrim videos actually And that's not like me being nice for the sake of being nice. Like, no, this is actually like, this is this is at legitimately in the top half. Now I can't speak to uh, his other videos. Hey, boys and girls, do stop, please. Uh, I can't speak to his other videos. His more like infamous ones out there. I think the New Vegas one is one that's typically cited as like a particularly infamous one. But this video is fine. Um. I think before, like, we figured out, like, he did this first, and then, you like, he started... I think he had all his bad takes after this video. That's one interesting thing. Province of Daggerfall has more landmass than Skyrim. Uh, yes. When it comes to, like, 
map size arguments, Daggerfall always comes up. But I don't know, it's like always bringing up, uh, uh, like Minecraft in a map size comparison. Like, you have to compare handcrafted stuff to handcrafted stuff, in my opinion. Tribunal was pretty cool because there weren't really generic pointless NPCs, but the city was still decently sized with a proper population. I've always, one, I've always felt that, uh, Mornhold was kind of small. And two, um, there are the Dark Brotherhood assassins that are generically named. Uh, but other than that, yeah. You don't need to be nice. He's not here. Yeah, but he'll, he'll find this stream. Um, and even then, I don't know. I you should try to be nice. I, I I said at the start of the last one, like uh, with these smaller guys, you have to be nice and kind of constructive with them. You know, trying to don't just call out the issues. Try to be helpful. Now, as far as the unique NPCs are concerned, that is, people who serve major roles in major quests or quest lines, this is one instance where Bethesda really hits it out of the park. First, the fact that most unique NPCs have unique voice actors helps to give the unique NPCs some individuality and identity to separate them from the pan. Okay, except Mercer Frey, who has um, the Bellothor voice actor. Ah, fuck, I forget his name. But he's in a bunch of Bethesda games. Um, <laughs> that bothered me. So, like, Brynjolf has a unique voice actor, Carlia has a unique voice actor, but Mercer, they did, they just couldn't couldn't uh, come up with a unique voice actor for Mercer Frey. And also my issue, which is something I wrote about in the script. Hang on. I'll quote myself. I'll quote my own script. How about that? That's uh, that's always fun. That's something that is different from the previous streams. Uh, let's see. Thieves Guild. Voice, uh, it would probably be easier to... Garrett. Okay, hang on. Um, we go to the Riften Marketplace or Tavern at night and get approached by a stranger named Brynjolf with a unique voice actor, so you know he's important. The world calls for wet work, and we answer. No greater good, no just cause. That's a that's a Metal Gear Solid Five quote, or a Metal Gear Solid V quote. Actually, Robert At Robin Atkin Downs is one of those voice actors that's practically in everything. Hell, he was literally Vivek in Elder Scrolls Online, and I had no clue. Unlike most game voice actors, he can actually sound different between performances. That said, while I appreciate Skyrim for going to the extra effort of acquiring more voice talent, I feel it's a bit misplaced. It means that it's very easy to tell which of these market stall NPCs are giving side quests and which of them represents a faction. I feel like they would be better served doing the Oblivion thing, but with a larger pool of talent. Instead of getting expensive voice actors to play single-role single, single role key characters, Get a bunch of voice actors to be general roles, but provide each actor a key character to represent in one of the primary stories. This is similar to how Oblivion voice actors usually also got to play as distinct Daedric Prince. This is, of course, unless the intention is to make me immediately identify quest NPCs simply by voice. The issue is that Brynjolf doesn't sound like a Nord, he just sounds like a normal human with a nice voice. So not only does it stand out because Brynjolf has a different voice from other characters, but he also doesn't really sound Nordic either. It's fine if it's a character that's presumably from other provinces, like some of the guild members we meet later, but Skyrim definitely has an accent problem with important Nords having strange accents. So, yeah. Isn't the voice actor for Bellator the same guy who did Nick Valentine? Yes. Um, I like him. I actually do like him. And people complain about him getting reused. Um, I think the issue is that he's not able... He doesn't really seem able to bring, like, a distinct uh, difference to each of his... Uh, I think Craig Seckler did Gallus's voice. Yes, he, he definitely... Because he's an elf. So he, he definitely sounds like an Oblivion elf. But um, I don't think... Fuck, what's his name? 
he doesn't he's not distinct enough between his roles so like it always stands out that like oh yeah this is Bellathor and also Mercer Frey and Nick Valentine Bethesda should just make better games in my opinion that yeah that's always true he could pass for an Imperial if his name was Cassius well okay I found it interesting that like there are so many Nords in the Thieves Guild I mean it makes sense it's Skyrim but like I don't know. Like, Morrowind's Thieves Guild was run by a Red Guard. You know? Like, um, there, there's nothing wrong with having these factions be run by the other races. And it might stand out that, like, the Nords are, like, basically being taken advantage of. Oh, yeah, hang on, hang on. I, I got you. What brilliant gameplay. Due to archive, I was ever just a mechanical copy of some cop from a bygone era. I'm not sure how to feel. Let me know if you see anything. What were you expecting? I Everything's for sale, my friend. Everything. If I had a sister, I'd sell her in a second. Thought this would fix things, but it's not that easy. Because I was Nick Valentine. I had his memories. I like Nick. Um, I think the the hireling idea that they had for Skyrim was a failure, and I doubt that they'll bring that kind of idea back. I think I think there's no way they they can't look at like the difference between the followers and the follow games and the hirelings in Skyrim and go. Yeah, we want to do that again. That's like part of our distinct identity for the games. And I think Serana was like a big clue of that. Because Serana is like a, basically a Fallout companion in Skyrim. And that's why people like her. They are also some of the few characters in the game who actually undergo character arcs. And Can we really say that Bryn Yolf undergoes a character arc? Here's, like, Brynjolf's character arc is a flat line where he starts greedy and he ends greedy, right? I guess he finds Jesus, but, like, he's skeptical of the whole thing. He, and he respects Nocturnal in the sense of, like, no, that's an actual god that's over there and interacting with us. But, like, he doesn't really, like, he doesn't start evil and then end good or start good and end evil or, um or anything like that, like, learn any deep lessons. Carlia doesn't either. She doesn't learn that, like, revenge is a bad thing and that she should, like, try to forgive or... No, she's, she starts with a goal. I'm going to kill Mercer. I'm Well, she starts with the goal. I guess she undergoes a character arc. Her character arc is, I was going to capture Mercer Frey. Now I'm going to kill Mercer Frey because we have no mechanics for capturing him. <laughs> so, I, no, I, I disagree. Um... Let's see. College of Winterhold. The only person in the College of Winterhold that I think undergoes a character arc is Savos Aaron, and that it's literally like, um, it's literally just like a square wave. It's literally just a right angle up. That's his character arc. Um, the companions. Um, Fark, Fark is it Farkas or Vilkas? the smart brother i guess he undergoes a character arc but aella stays mostly the same skewer dies vilkas stays the same codlack dies um dark brotherhood astrid astrid's stupid start to finish i guess uh, she's also like the square wave of uh right angle right at the end where she admits that she's wrong uh everybody else mostly stays the same i guess Nazir warms up to you over the course of the quest line. That could be considered a character arc, maybe. If you have a very liberal definition of character arcs. There's so many followers in Skyrim almost feels wasteful. Uh it well it's more like they wanted to come up with like a generalized system so that like you could recruit basically anybody into being a follower. So in a way, it's its own distinct thing and it's interesting, but 
the end result is really bland because there's very few companions in Skyrim that are notable or memorable. Like Lydia is memorable because she's everybody's first, basically. Carlia learned to have other people do your revenge for you. My favorite part of the Thieves Guild is when they make a contract with Nocturnal to get superpowers to beat Mercer Frey, and then Nocturnal doesn't give you the powers. So it's like, oh, we actually could have beaten Mercer Frey before we made this agreement. Oh, I guess, no, it, they were lucky. It was their luck. Nocturnal made that rock passage fall from the ceiling and open up so that they could escape. It's, like, it's not like water breathing is an attainable power in the setting. Or, you know, teleportation. And also, like, at some point, the room's going to stop filling with water and all those pipes that burst open, you're going to be able to go out them. Like, you're eventually going to be able to escape that room, even if you don't get lucky and have the, the ceiling open for you. Does Greybeard's reacting and banishing you for killing Parthenax count as a character arc? Um... Not really, because there's nothing that really changes. It's not like uh, they take Parthenax very casually and then, like, change and become very serious when, like, his life is threatened or anything like that. Uh, it's pretty on, on brand. If you're Argonian, the flooded room is funny. Uh, it, like, if you're anybody and you have water breathing, the flooded room is funny. I can't die in here. I... Shouldn't vampires be able to, like, breathe underwater, too? I, I, I mean, I think gameplay-wise they can't, but... Therefore had the opportunity for change. Very rarely did these characters actually change, but the fact that they had the Wait. opportunity for change is a welcome addition to Skyrim's various storylines. What? Separate them from the pack. They are also some of the few characters in the game who actually undergo character arcs. Okay, so he's saying... There's some of the few characters that undergo arcs, and they have the opportunity for change. And therefore have the opportunity for change. Very rarely do- But very rarely do any of these characters actually change. So they- Okay, so he admits I'm right. They don't have character arcs. So why did you say they do? Okay, so they- very rarely do these characters actually change, but the fact that they have do these characters actually the opportunity... Change? But the fact that they have the opportunity for change is a welcome addition to Skyrim's various storylines. Okay, so... <laughs> do you usually kill Parthenex? No, and I couldn't bring myself to do it this time. Um, and I played, like, an explicitly evil character, and even an evil character, you have a hard time justifying doing it. Because it's like... Hmm, do I side with the dragon or do I side with an order of five people? You know, it's like, fuck you, Delphine. I'll just go start my own military. I don't need the blades. How's it going today? It's going fine. Okay, so his logic here is that <laughs> uh, Skyrim is fine because their Skyrim is better than presumably in this instance, Oblivion and Morrowind. I'm going to assume that's the case. He's had anti-Morrowind opinions before. The Skyrim is better because the characters have the potential, the opportunity to have character arcs. They don't, but the potential is there and that's what's important. And it's like, okay, I mean, I made the Oblivion video and I think there's the same exact opportunities with the characters in Oblivion. Maglir, uh, Hannibal Traven, um, Lucien Lachance, uh, what's his name, the Red Guard guy, maybe, well, no, Umbernox is a better example there, but it's like, you can make the same argument with Oblivion that those characters also have the potential to have character arcs, and arguably do. Um, I'm not going to say that they're like, they're uh, insane character arcs or anything. I would say the Grey Fox does not have a character arc. Um, Maglier does by... No, he, do he really doesn't. Hannibal Traven does. Because I, I don't think the Hannibal Traven that you meet at the start and the Hannibal Traven that sacrifices himself for the Mage's Guild are the same character. I think that, like, events of the story influence this change. It's just not very well realized. I mean... I know Martin Septim absolutely has a character arc in Oblivion. 
Yeah, he definitely has the character arc because he starts off despondent and confused about why the gods would allow Kabach to be destroyed, but then by the end of the story, like, you know, he finds the vigor. He finds the vigor to like believe in the gods and and uh, you know sacrifice himself for the greater good. What have you? You know, we all we all know uh, what happens in Oblivion's main quest. I don't know. It's just a it's a weird thing. It's a weird thing, in my opinion, that you would say that you would praise the game for providing the potential. GTA 5 is a really good driving is a really good racing game because it has cars. It has the opportunity to be, have like really good racing. Well, does it or does it not? Like We don't have to list off like where everything has the opportunity to be good. Am I crazy? Am I insane? Okay, hang on. I gotta share this with you. This is from Hassan Piker, who's probably like the principal offender when it comes to like the uh, abusive reaction content that goes on on Twitch. Um, he says, it's wild that this is even a convo when most people love watching it, and it's o the overwhelming majority of content creators, open parenthetical, including myself, close parenthetical, love when people react to whatever we make. And it's the myth of a uh, meme. So the myth of mutually beneficial react content. And it's like... I don't know. Just because you haven't had your videos basically stolen uh, doesn't mean that you can't have opinions on it. N like, have opinions on the issue. Like, I know how I would feel if it happened, even though, to my knowledge, it hasn't happened. Although there are some instances where I think it has happened. But there's no way for me to go and find out if it has. But there have, there have been times where, like, there was a sudden... Like, one of the Call of Duty videos had a very sudden flood of, like, really ignorant comments that I think was because somebody on Twitch watched the Modern Warfare 2 video. I think that's what happened. Otherwise, it's just a massive coincidence that, like, five morons decided to leave comments on that video at the, like, within 30 minutes of each other. Yeah, I saw... I... Yeah, I, I have the... I clipped it. Um... Uh, let me turn it up. I know you can't see it. There's not really anything to see. Fair, but uh, yeah, it's definitely going to be quite, quite lengthy. Well, personally, I love documentaries like this, um, and, and I think a lot of people like long form videos. So hmm. uh, don't don't try to constrain yourself too much. I mean, I, I'd sit there and watch it if it was seven hours. Yeah, you know, like I watch oh, yeah. those fucking uh, uh, video game analysis videos where people spend eight hours talking about Morrowind. So if that can <laughs> if that can hook me, watching Mersh will cry about kitty litter for ten days is gonna probably do it too. <laughs> Fair, but so, oh, yeah, thank it's God! Gonna be quite... Thank God that's the reaction that Control Shift F4 does. I was uh, basically guessing. Yeah, it's, it was pretty cool that um, to find out that like uh, he's seen my video and that he likes it. And I'm especially thankful that he didn't name me when he said it because. Uh, I, I can thank the stars that I have not been named in any kind of like internet blood sports thing because I don't think there's a single person who's walked away from internet blood sports looking better for it. When will someone live stream react to your Morrowind video? Well, yeah, that or you know the Oblivion video. Um, I was like, we were talking last stream about doing that with uh, private sessions. And he said that he'd be down for it. Um, my my big issue with it is one: how do you distinguish be like between the stream voice and the uh, 
How do you distinguish between the stream voice and the voice that's on screen? How do you not come off as appearing like super egotistical that you're just like streaming your own video? And, um, but I don't know. It would be nice to like, does my shit, does my shit stink kind of deal. Like, I know full well I'm probably guilty of like a lot of the stuff that I call out on stream. Um, but I'm not one of those people that like thinks that the most damning thing you can be is a hypocrite. I actually think that like scammers and pedophiles, uh, rank higher in terms of uh, priority of calling out than you know people who are hypocrites and it's one of those things where it's like if i were to do the morrowind video again there's things i would do different based on experiences i've had use a voice changer well so th wouldn't that be annoying to listen to get like a kawaii voice modulator so I sound like an anime girl? Yeah, that... That would make it better. You should get all the creators that you bully and get them to bully your Morrowind video. Uh, I can think... Well, if we're gonna go that route, I can think of better videos to bully. Like, I think the... Let's play a game and it's called Let's Jump to a Random Point in the Bioshock video. Note that the last time I saw this, which was probably a while ago at this point, uh, the last time I saw this, I still agreed with, like, the majority of stuff I was saying in this video. Oh, they act as quasi-optional boss fights. Cue me facing not one, not two, not three, but four big daddies in a row. Yeah, this level fucking sucked, by the way. One of those I didn't have to fight, but was actually respawning, still. And on the final one, I had to bump the difficulty down because I didn't have enough ammo to kill him on hard. Some daddies have a drill they carry as a melee weapon. They oh, please don't say daddy. So I still I still haven't lost the... Oh, let's click to a random part of the Bioshock video and see if it if like I have a bad take or something. I still haven't lost that game. But we gotta play it more frequently. It's gotta happen at some point. It, is, it certainly is a weird compliment. Isn't that kind of where Bethesda's writing peaks? By that I mean providing story templates for the audience to imagine depth within. Yeah, I, I've said that in my script. Um, one of my big issues with modern Bethesda storytelling is that it's like, it's basically in, like, so Morrowind, that era, Ken Rolston understood um, being vague can make the story more interesting, but there's a difference between uh, being vague and uh, leaving it up to the audience to write your own story. And Skyrim very much feels like a game that was written around the idea of, like, the fans will come up with their own copium explanations. For why stuff is the way it is. Like, this fucking three-hour-long video about the Augur of Dunlane. Which I tried to watch. I tried to watch it. You sound so different in that video. Um, well, okay, so it's a different microphone. And um, I think I've said it before. I made the Bioshock video like not long after I was uh, furloughed from work because of uh, ongoing uh, global conditions. Um... <laughs> So it, if it seems like it's an angry video, it's, it absolutely is an angry video because it was one of the, oh God, it really was one of those things where um, I had been telling a lot of people about like what was going on in the world and like people didn't believe me. And then suddenly like everybody was like, was, was like into it and there was no like uh, crediting that like, I, I've been saying for years, like uh, the way things are right now could lead to and an ongoing uh, pandemic. So yeah, I was very angry uh, at that video. What's wrong? What's wrong with Camel Works? This video. Well, I don't know if there's anything wrong with Camel Works in general because I'm not really a connoisseur of their content. Um, but specifically, this Augur of Dunlane video uh, was insane with some of the th with some of the things he took with, with some of the roots that he kind of took with the video. Camel's video on Roar Extent. Well, no, I don't hate Australians. Take that back. I highly recommend G-Man's video on Skyrim. He's Australian, I think. 
<laughs> I think. I do hate New Zealanders, though. I think I hate them as much as uh, as Brits. Camel's video on Rorikstead was reading into so much random stuff. Yeah, this video gets into, like, ESO lore. Um, the only thing I can say about it that's, like, praise is that, like, it's very methodical and it pays attention to a lot of very specific lore. But I think at the end of the day, the Augur of Dunlane is a... Uh, is a terrible uh unfinished piece of content um that really doesn't deserve reading into because it's just it's a piece of shit yeah that that's basically the extent of it is it's mysterious for the sake of being mysterious it's not because there's an answer nobody at bethesda knows what the deal with the auger of dunlane is they wrote it that way because it seemed more interesting than it actually is How are such vicious shit posters so prone to getting like locked down by their government? I never understood that about Australians. Like they're some of the most vicious people unless you work for the government. Meanwhile, the most significant faction in the game that you can't join yourself, the old Mary Dominion, is <laughs> The caption the caption went for the old married men get is perhaps the most interesting and politically <laughs> Old married men are perhaps the most interesting and politically compelling faction in the history of the real world. It's true, actually, though. Um, if you've ever met, like, old gay men are some of the most powerful people in our society. Just FYI. Opinions on the Irish. I've never had a bad run-in with the Irish. I'm also not from the East Coast, so. Uh, I guess, well, there were a lot of Irish people that came out to this part of the country, but a lot of them, like, kind of culturally acclimated to the point that they don't really see themselves as like uh descendants of the irish they didn't keep any of the culture basically they just like mixed with the germans and uh formed into the mid the weird midwestern culture all right i'll be right back fucking snow outside and it is warm enough to go outside in a t-shirt crack open a cold one with the homies why do you guys want my opinions on a bunch of ethnic racial groups listen it's not the genetics of anglos that i'm biased against maybe it is but listen it's their culture that i have a problem with Like, it's really weird to say, uh, <laughs> nah, I'm not going to go on this rant again. Old married men are the most powerful and interesting faction in the world. I heard that U.S. water is filled with estrogen. It's true. It's to, uh, make us less violent. Why the distaste towards Brits and Kiwis? Um... Okay, so with British people, it's almost universally... I have never met somebody from the UK who did not try to dictate that we should change things to be more like the UK. And I get every immigrant is going to be like that. And I don't, I don't mean like... I don't mean like that as a racial thing. I mean that as like... 
So I'm from Washington, and there are some things about Washington that, like, I wish were true here. And I live in the same country. You know, my skin's the same color as, like, the people around me, so... Um, with, but with British people, it's like, if you want things to be like the UK, go back to your island! Did any other waifu have the chance to shine the stream? I guess that's true. I was okay, so I was going off my old rule that like I was gonna wait, I was gonna change waifus at, at donations, and then I've suddenly realized, oh fuck, we're on the second channel, which isn't even monetized, so I can't, I like literally can't get donations. I can't monetize the stream, so <laughs> yeah, this is the stream that we. Um, we have to get like 800 watch time hours on this video, and then we can uh, we can apply for monetization. I mean, I mean, of course, we could always like set some other fucking way of donating up, but I don't care that much. I'll do I'll do a stream for free, no problem. Why do people keep asking him about Slavic people? I don't know. What time is it in that part of the world? Are, are they like... Are they up and watching the stream? I have a... Slightly higher than proportion uh, following of Russian people. Because Morrowind was very popular in Russia. I think you just hate late night comedians from the UK. Well, it's not just John Oliver I hate. It's um... I mean, like, uh, no, I, I won't, I won't name the specific YouTubers that are that way too, but yeah, there's YouTubers that are like that, uh, and I met one person from the UK who was like that as well. You're getting, yeah, getting partnered on your second channel is along the road, but you have to have a good viewership so you get there soon. Well, I don't think it'll be an issue. I think that, uh, this stream will absolutely just, this stream will do it. Because the channel already the channel already had like a decent amount of watch time as is. And it's not like we started a new channel uh you know from scratch for the streams. Like this channel had a purpose before. Um and sure some of those watch hours are probably gonna be from the uh Mr. Caption re upload. Because I put Hello Oh god, he he does it too. Oh one and all look He he does the he op opens the video very loudly saying, hello, everybody. Which, I won't monetize that archive, by the way. Just in case anybody's curious. Perhaps the most interesting and politically compelling faction in the history of the Elder Scrolls franchise. Strong believers in high elves and supremacy. Strong believers in high elves and supremacy. <laughs> I love the closed captioning. The closed captioning is making this the best part. And the issue is, he ha he kind of has like a muddled voice, which is hey boys and girls, like probably something he's worked on. I don't know. Let's watch something more recent. Like, let's see, drama, drama, drama. Here we go, this is a great video. Kretosis is a toxic, lying sack of shit. Yeah, he's gotten better at enunciation, so. <laughs> well, introductions to videos are like the worst thing. Streams as well, for that matter. They tend to have their head. Thoughts on cheesecake, not the biggest fan. history of the Elder Scrolls franchise. Strong belief- There's a lot of- okay, so I've- it's funny you make that joke. There's a lot of, like, quotes in Skyrim that are really funny, like, uh, that are, like, about, uh... They, like, reference, like, oh, understanding the Elder Scrolls is something that is extremely difficult to do, that- that kind of shit. That's why, like, 
some people could talk about how like a lot of the Elder Scrolls games have nothing to do with the the titular Elder Scrolls. I personally don't have an issue with it. He sounds like he's both angry and trying not to wake mom up. Um, is that what it is? I mean, I think every YouTuber has been in a situ been in a situation where sometimes you have to get loud, but you can't fully get loud. You know interesting and politically compelling faction in the history of the Elder Scrolls franchise. I think it's his accent. Is it his accent? Strong believers in high elves and supremacy, they tend to have their heads the farthest up their asses of anyone else in the game. Unlike the multiple races of Tamriel, which are definitively modeled after specific real-world cultures, e.g. He's one of these. One of these. Races and other scrolls are modeled after real world cultures. Sure, there's some of it that you can't deny, but I, I think this is one of those things that people lean a little too heavily on. Sees a video about a game you like. Open said video and boom, eardrums liquefied. Dog dead, windows shattered, can't you move your spine is now jelly, death comes slowly. Where's he from? The Midwest? Uh, yeah, the Southern Midwest. He's actually, like, he's not terribly far away from where I live, so uh, if we want to set up a boxing match at some point. <laughs> no, I will, I will not box Acer Thorn, I'm sorry. The Elder Scrolls was the last minute prefix added to make the original game a series. They didn't even know what the Elder Scrolls were until they were sort of vaguely explained more and more over time. Yeah, I really hope that, like, Elder Scrolls 6 doesn't have any Elder Scrolls in it. Is there a Thalmor supporter among normal High Elf NPCs? You know, that's actually a good question. And I don't, I don't think there is. I think every Thalmor supporter is like wearing the Nazi uniform um, and is like part of the Thalmor. I can't recall NPCs who support the Thalmor like the closest you can get is what's her name Naranya um hello it's the the not, oh fuck not the stream not this one either this one Niria this one uh I think and that's only like really like her deal is like she's toadying up to Ancano because she thinks that like that might be an avenue for a chain for like political maneuvering basically at the college. Um, so she like starts sucking up to you after you become Archmaids. So I don't think there's any normal like high elf NPCs who are um, who are like overt Thalmor supporters. I saw someone say that Dunmer are like Slavs. That's a weird, that's a weird interpretation. I've heard a lot of interpretations for what the Thalmor are like. Um, that's not one of them. Let's see. Uh... Are there high elves who support the Thalmor? that aren't actually part of it. And I think the answer is no. Because the Thalmor are like a youth movement. I mean, they're not youths anymore, but like they were a uh, they were a movement that was going on like during Oblivion to kind of culturally revitalize the Aldmeri Dominion. Do you hate Halo? No. But I do know people who do. There cannot be open Thalmor supporters because if you're not part of the Thalmor, then your mutilated body will be found in the gutter the next night after you come out about your beliefs. I don't think that's necessarily true. There's open Talos worshippers who get away with it. I think you could, if you were a Thalmor supporter, you could get away with doing it. Um, okay. He's not necessarily a Thalmor supporter, but there is a veteran who 
served as a battle mage for the Altmeri Dominion, who lives in Falkreath. He's the priest of Arke there. I think he's a conjuration trainer. The Nords are clearly modeled after the Vikings, the Imperials are clearly modeled after the Roman Empire, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you did the you did the two most obvious ones, but you don't really want to like talk about how like the Dunmer are <laughs> a metaphor for like the Jewish people or anything like that. Like you don't want to go crazy. Uh you can make the case actually that like all the elven racial types are like modeled after various points of Hebrew and uh Israeli culture. FYF He's regretful because of his war crimes though. Oh, you can be regretful about what you did and still, you know, support the Thalmor. Those aren't mutually exclusive. How accurate Samhide tap water is. Can you rephrase that as a as a sentence? Well, the secret is the Dunmer are basically everybody. Like, I think people lean a little too hard into the let's compare cultures to other cultures deal in Elder Scrolls. Like, that's why it's in my notes that I'm like, that I'm kind of making fun of it. Like, people go way too hard on this stuff. Like, yeah, the Imperials are like Romans, but not really. Not really fully. And not culturally. You know, the Romans did this thing. It was called slavery. And uh, the Imperials are very anti-slavery. So it's like... Yeah, you can't make that case. Not really. How accurate Sam Hyde tap water skit is? Where is the tap water skit? Is it in one of the videos I've seen? The tap water sketch from World Peace. Okay, I haven't seen World Peace in like five years. Like, I saw it when it aired. For the Aldmeri Dominion, Bethesda appears to have drawn inspiration from multiple religious or racist radical tyrants from real- Oh god. I don't know if Acer Thord is equipped to have this conversation. Most popular videos. This new Vegas video came out nine months later. Oh, hang on, what's this? Разве сюда? А, ну вроде да. Так, сюда, 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 сюда. По-моему, дальше спуск вниз. I think I found a new waifu. Дальше мне надо доделать квест. Понятно. Так. I want to see him talking about the Legion. Because I've heard that's where he gets, like, really out of out of line. That their actions were justified because of how deeply this town's moral sickness flowed. So I might be willing to accept such savage treatment if the punishment actually fit the crime. So tell me, what was this town's crime? Did they eat grown men and women before throwing their babies into the air and shooting them out of the sky while giggling? And did they like? Didn't wasn't Nipton's crime that they sold out? Um, they sold out the NCR to the Legion. Like among other things, obviously there were like powder gangers there, but.
Nipton seem was it is it Nipton? I haven't played New Vegas recent enough um to know this kind of thing off the top of my head. I don't know. You can make Here's the thing with making racial comparisons is you can do it with anything. I could make I could try to make the most alien culture possible and you could draw a comparison and say that um that it's based on such and such culture. You know what I mean? Like there've been cultural experiments all over the planet for various things. Like, if I came up with a culture that, um, a couple's firstborn son would be genetically theirs, but then, like, they, they, it's basically, like, a swinger culture where, like, the husband will knock up his, like, best friend's wife, and then his wife will get knocked up by somebody else, and, like, they have lots of children, and they go down the line, and they do all that. There would be somebody out there who would know enough about um, the Uman Manda and like step cultures to be like, oh yeah, this specific tribe did that. You're basing this culture on the practices of such and such horse tribe. And it's like, no, I, I, I came up with that. It seems like a generic enough thing to come up with. To say, oh yeah, uh, for, ge for genetic diversity purposes, they have this practice. D don't don't fucking tell me that like, oh, that would create problems genetically. I don't. I don't. I really don't care. I'm just saying. World history. They are part Hitler, part Mussolini, part Stalin, part Napoleon, part Genghis Khan, and part Osama bin Laden. They're part Osama bin Laden. I didn't know the Thalmor were. Uh, anti-capitalists who believe that their local culture was being corrupted by outside influences. If anything, the Thalmor are more like the Americans and the Nords are like the uh, Taliban. Or like the Stormcloaks are the Taliban. That... <laughs> he literally only said Osama bin Laden because like Osama bin Laden is evil. The Thalmor are part Osama bin Laden. But also, I don't think you can be part Hitler, part Mussolini, and part Genghis Khan. I think these, uh, there are differences in these philosophies. You know, you could do it under Genghis Khan's ruler, under the Khan's rulership, you could practice pretty much any culture you wanted as long as you were loyal and, you know, uh, gave money to the Mongolian government. Maybe that was a joke. I'm okay. Listen, knowing the caliber of individual that Acer Thorn is, I'm going to say that it, it's probably easier to assume that he's lumping Osama bin Laden in because uh, this is just a list of like evil people. Have drawn inspiration from multiple religious or racist radical tyrants from real world history. They are part Hitler, part Mussolini, part Stalin. Genghis Khan was not racist. Just FYI. He would equally he he equally tried to conquer a diverse group race group of racial phenotypes, and he didn't impose any kind of racial imperialism. Like his goal was to expand his influence, and he had a lot of kids that would have been half Mongolian, sure, but um, you know it wasn't his ethos that like the Mongolian people need to rule the world, or it was, but. Not in the sense of, like, literally every single person on planet Earth needs to be Mongolian. Oh yeah, and Napoleon definitely doesn't fit on a list of racial, uh, racially motivated tyrants. And Osama bin Laden doesn't really fit on that list either. Wasn't Osama bin Laden Arabic? Like, I don't think he was from Afghanistan. And he was educated. Part Sargon of Akkad, part PewDiePie, part H-Bomber guy. 
Part Mauler, part Medicare. <laughs> He was racist as hell. I let's put it in the metric of other what 13th century people. Part Napoleon, part Genghis Khan, and part Osama bin Laden. They are also, of course, walking embodiments of every stereotype you have ever heard of the snooty rich snob, as evidenced by their behavior at the Thalmor party during the quest of diplomatic immunity. Oh wow, people at people at a snobbish, <laughs> high class noble party were high class snobbish and nobles. Truly, how illuminating. Stalin and Bin Laden were made out to be Hitler stand-ins by American media. Now, I say all that to say this. I have spent an ungodly amount of time on the cities and NPCs of this game, but the primary question for this retrospective is, does the game hold up by today's standards? Is this a game that holds up in 2022, published in 2019? I don't know, I think there's been a version of the game! That's come out since then. Part Noah Caldwell Gervais, it's true. Uh when Ulfric Stormcloak gunned down all those Dunmer refugees, you know, who gave him the gun? Noah Caldwell Gervais. I wonder... <laughs> there's no way that, like... We have to have crossover fans. There's no way that Noah Caldwell Gervais has not heard about, like, all the crazy shit I've... I, we've claimed that he's done on this stream. But I also think he can take a joke. But I would be really interested, like... What would his first impression be to being told that, like, we have a joke about how, like, Noah Caldwell Gervais is one of, like, the most horrible people? Can't donate to Mickey Change VTuber model to a Dunmer? Well, she was up for a long time, but I will, I will change. But you have to give other girls, you have to give other girls a chance. Wait, so he changed the title but not the description? No, it's true. And it was great because last year this was 2021, this was 2020, and this was 2019. But now it's not like a, a sequence, right? Like, I really wish he would add like another sentence that said like, uh, Today I, I take a long, extensive, and exhaustive look at one of my favorite games, analyze it from a 2020 perspective, and see if it holds up in the modern day of 2021. Well, as far as the storytelling is concerned, a godly amount of time on the cities and NPCs of this game, but the primary question for this retrospective is, does the game hold up by today's standards? I don't recall, um, because it's been a while. Does he establish what exactly today's standards are? I miss a nickname, Nick. Oh, it's, it's true. I actually have not... Hang on. Let's play a game called Let's Look at See at See What. Oh no. Oh, he deleted his account. I hope I so I haven't kept up with Nick in a while. I really hope that like he realized that Twitter was a super bad thing for him and um and like deleted it so that he could um Wait, he changed the title again. Oh yeah, he he changed his title before it was even 2022, actually. Like, I think he changed the title, uh, like, three days before the new year. But yeah, I, I really hope that, um... Oh god, I was reminded of this. That he, um... Realized that, like, Twitter was such a negative thing. Dude, not even t that Twitter was a negative thing, although it certainly is, but that, like... The way he engages with Twitter was really unhealthy for him.
I think I have a screenshot. Oh, yep, I do. So, oh, it, I will correct myself. It was on January 1st, I think. Because that's when the screenshot is dated. Quick rundown on the Noah Caldwell Gervais thing. Sure. Uh, give me one second. I guess I can post the uncensored one since his Twitter account doesn't exist anymore. Uh, or is there? Okay, there's not one where Noah responds and it's uncensored. This is the guy that was like, fucking stop it. I'll tolerate a video being over a little, an hour in length, maybe even half an hour. I, I st <laughs> but this, not this bullshit. It might be a great video, but I'm not going to watch it. Just like I'll never read a 12,000 page book or listen to a song that lasts for three days. And then Noah responded. And this guy established a grudge for Noah Caldwell Gervais that lasted for months. I mean, truly, uh, truly and legitimately. Uh, coping, seething, and shitting himself about this fucking seven and a half hour video. And like, the he had like a really bad day on Twitter where he, no joke, spent like seven and a half hours responding to people on Twitter. So, yeah, we kind of have a joke about how like Noah Caldwell Gervais is this horrible person that deserves your scorn because of his like crazy fucking unhinged tweets. It is an Acer Thorn moment, actually. It's true. But the primary question for this retrospective is, does the game hold up by today's standards? Well, as far as the storytelling is concerned... How often little did you make use of Creation Club shit during the playthroughs? I would say often. My The house I used for the for the uh, Anniversary Edition playthrough was a Creation Club house. Um, there's Creation Club equipment that's some of the best in the game. And... I generally tried to play all of the Creation Club content it, that I found anyways. If there was anything I had to like seek out, I didn't play it, but. The thought of a Doug Walker VTube waifu is giving me brain damage. Hang on, I can hook you up. I have, I prepared for this moment. All right, here's our Doug Walker VTuber model. Get it? Because he's bald. <laughs> so as far as the storytelling is concerned, yes, absolutely. Um, Is he leading into the storytelling? No. So, like, he's making the argument that as far as storytelling is concerned, uh, Skyrim holds up. But he hasn't been talking about the storytelling. He's been talking about, like, the world design. Yes, we need a Nostalgia Critic VTuber avatar for Pat. It's sad, but I could, I could make one pretty easily. His outfit's pretty... I don't know if the if the software has like a loose tie. I think that's the only thing that would be missing. But we could just like draw that. We could draw that on the avatar, on, on like a shirt. I love getting attacked by ash zombies every five minutes. Yeah, that is definitely an issue that I had that I ran into. There's also uh, a broken thing where like the Boethia cultists keep attacking you every time you go to the library. Yes, it absolutely does hold up. Even without playing Witcher 3, and even if I eventually decide... Even without playing Witch R3. ...that Witcher 3's story is a thousand times better than Scully Runs, I can def... Better than Scully Runs. I love the... The, the closed captioning is like a game in and of itself. It, it's got to be rough being deaf. You can't hear shit and like... Um... If you grew up deaf, reading closed captions on YouTube, you might just assume that, like, everybody on the internet's just, like, an inarticulate fucking moron. Definitively say that Skyrim's story holds up simply by reason of the story of being good. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Okay, so it was the latter. He's leading into 
he's leading into the topic of talking about the story, but I'm like looking at the section heading and it's like this is the middle of the NPC section and there's like a part for artifacts and stealth and it's like... <sighs> I don't think I agree that Skyrim's story holds up. I think that Skyrim's story didn't hold up by, like, the standards of 2011. You should stream your Morrowind video, but mute it with captions and you react to it. Ooh, that could be content. Hang on. Is this a... So you're telling me if I drink this, I will feel warmth in my heart again. Oh, I thought that was a potion craft meme. Because you can make healing potions and you can make love potions. I like combo effects. Okay. Let's jump to... Um, turn on the closed captioning. Let's go. Morrowind is an open world game and the world of Vardenville is just as much a character in this story as any other, if not more so. Morrowind is, however, deceptive in its name, perhaps as its tradition in the Elder Scrolls game, where Arena was anything but, Daggerfall was just a city and a whole country, Oblivion was a dungeon, and Skyrim wasn't an Elder Scrolls game. I don't know, the closed caption seems to be able to figure out what I'm saying. Well, so we could download the closed captioning. I don't, you couldn't really time it, but um, you could download the closed captioning and then make a uh, text to speech from it. Including Native Dunmer, the one you'll generally see being used for slave labor are the two beast races. I should note that it is impossible to be enslaved unless you spend time in an Imperial Corrections and Rehabilitation Center. Yet, yeah, the closed captioning seems to be able to figure out exactly what I'm saying. Well, good stories never die. I can pick up a story that was written literally hundreds of years ago, and if it's translated and updated into a language that I can understand, I could still enjoy that story as much as if it were written yesterday. But what if the story wasn't good when it came out? If you enunciate, auto captions are pretty solid, just no punctuation. Yeah. When are we going back to Fallout? That's the stuff I actually know about. Um, we're not watching this Fallout video. If that's what you're asking for. Does holdups means it's not as boring now as it was before? Well, he's kind of making this argument, that argument of... Um, it's mildly impossible for like a story to age poorly, I guess. I don't know. Insert witty response from what i remember closed captions work best at the beginning of a video for some reason well i think they they like process the first 30 seconds more because that's how they come up with like monetization that's why like it's a general rule on youtube to not like swear or say anything uh, naughty uh, in the first 30 seconds. Wasn't Moby Dick, like, literally ignored by anybody? Um, it's fair to say most historical literature was ignored by people at that time. The concept of being an author, a, a popular author, is a very modern concept. Holy Salt Skyrim side quest. We already did. I thought you skipped to a part later in the video where he talked about New Vegas. No, we skipped to 
a video he made nine months after this where he was talking about New Vegas, which is uh, fairly infamous. Gilgamesh these nuts into your mouth. That's why Shakespearean plays, as well as the Iliad and the Odyssey. If I read the closed captioning, then like, so the closed captioning being so wrong is kind of a problem because I read, that's why she experienced plays. And I was like trying to parse that sentence as he was saying it and him saying it did not make it easier. But like, I need the closed captioning. I need the close, I need accurate closed captioning is the issue because As much as if it were written yesterday. That's why Shakespearean plays, as well as the Iliad and the Odyssey, all remain popular even to this day, despite being written hundreds and even thousands of years ago. Oh yeah, dude, the Iliad is like a fucking banger. I hear all the kids on TikTok are talking about the Iliad. It's a... I get what he, he's trying to say that, like, they're relevant. But he's saying that they're popular. Which New Vegas ending did you choose the first time you played? I think, yes, man. Something, something Shakespeare was plepped here for his times. Yeah, we've all heard that. Are any of them my favorite stories? Of course not. None of, of them would even- Of course not. I'll fuck to some Hamlet, but like, hang on. What's the name? Um. Uh. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like this a lot. Rosencrantz and Gilder Guildenstern are dead. Oh damn! Like the whole movie's on YouTube. Uh, so if you don't know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead is a story about uh, these two guys that were basically background characters, and like they're it, it's a it's commentary on Hamlet, and um, it's also like sort of a, a an analysis of like storytelling and what have you, and it, and like the nature of background characters, and so like this bit is like. He's, fl he's flipping a coin, and it's deterministic because they live in a story, so he just keeps getting the same outcome from flipping the coin, unless he predicts it, in which case it's wrong. But, um, yeah, I recommend Rosencrantz or Guildenstern are dead over Hamlet. I if only because it's mildly interesting. I still like Hamlet. Don't they, like, every 20 years adapt Romeo and Juliet in a different way? And it's, like, a mainstream film? And I don't mean that, like, every romance story is Romeo and... I mean, like, um, literally adapting Romeo and Juliet. Even be in the, my top 100 favorite... None of them would even be in my top 100 favorite stories. Well, I mean, I haven't read... The Iliad or the Odyssey. I haven't really read that much Shakespeare. I'm not that well read, but like, I don't know. You evoked it. You're you, you're the one admitting that like you're a cultural pleb, basically. Like, sure, I get it. You don't fuck to the Iliad, but like, I don't know. This is like a weird perspective to take. I think a better perspective would be here's an old story that I actually like. stories but it doesn't matter they are good stories and good stories last forever they're good stories but they're not in my top 100 my top 100 including batman versus superman and <laughs> every single film in the marvel cinematic universe i'm not saying he's actually said that don't take that out of context and say oh yeah acer thorn is a huge fan of marvel because that could be seen as like a death threat but um <laughs>
I don't know. I feel like this is what this is the wrong way to go about things. Plus, I think this is in the wrong part of the video. Regardless of what stories may come afterwards, whether Skyrim as a whole holds up by today's standards is still up for debate. It's weird. This is like the thesis statement of the video, but you you do the thesis statement at the end of the introduction. You don't do the thesis statement an hour and 16 minutes into the video. But the various stories this game tells are good stories and therefore automatically continue to hold up and will continue to hold up until the end of time. Okay. Well, I mean, the Divine Comedy Part 1 is good by modern standards, but it was not good by 1800 standards. You have to understand that these things, standards change over time. And in the 1800s, it was not a good story. It was full of plot holes, but a lot of those plot holes have been patched up by the uh, government of the Divine Comedy Part 1. Um, <laughs> However, before I end the section on NPCs, I would like to talk about something that is a What is it with everybody who covers Oblivion videos doing it in ultra wide? This has got to be like will footage or something. Cuz as far as I know, uh Will is like the only person to cover Oblivion in fucking ultra wide. That's too bad for you. Mike is glad he has a compass. Makes it easy to find things. Much better than wandering around like a fool. He tends to just berate areas of Morwent and even Oblivion that Bethesda has modified or removed. His comment about the objective markers and It is... I mean... Will is right about this. Mike the Liar is like Bethesda cope for like stuff that they changed and like... Also complaining. It's like... I don't know. I don't like Mike as an NPC because it feels spiteful. It feels like Bethesda's outlet for like hating their old fans. The Divine Comedy was made in the 1300s, LOL. So? That doesn't hurt my joke. My joke was that the standards are okay today, but they weren't okay in the 1800s. So that implies... I'm not implying that the story was written in the 1800s. I'm implying that but the it was good when it came out and it's good now, but the standards were bad for a while. Let him finish! I hope that wasn't ironic, let him finish. It's like, um, yeah, I'm gonna let him finish. Well, m maybe I won't. I could have said that last time we covered Acer Thorn and been wrong. The Divine Comedy is an isekai self-insert fantasy. It's true. A man is inserted forcefully into an alternate reality, uh, <laughs> I love when a video has no fixed aspect ratio and ranging audio quality. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, some stuff you can't help. Like, you know, there's the occasional moment in the Oblivion video where the aspect ratio is in 4x3 because I'm using footage that I used for the Morrowind video. It happens. Like when he mockingly said, we heard on the internet that our games always work perfectly during Fallout 76. Um, well, I mean, okay, I forget. Was that, pre are you saying that was pre or post Fallout 76? Because it's definitely damning if like he was saying that and then he released Fallout 76. But if he's saying it afterwards, I mean, you're gonna have to wait till Starfield comes out to determine if it's disingenuous. However, before I end the section on NPCs, I would like to talk about something that is a game mechanic and therefore may not hold up forever, Radiant AI. I, I don't know, it's a weird premise for a video. Does it hold up in 2019? Because that's when the fucking video came out, let's be honest. It, it, I mean, that is the thing, like, 
why the fuck would your 2019 perspective be able to be be relevant in 2022 but also like I don't know it's like those people who complain about like graphical fidelity is art style you know those plebs like if it holds up it holds up there's no timeliness element to I, it's like making the assumption that oh yeah we were all plebs 25 years ago who liked shitty games no a lot of people at the time that those shitty games came out commented on those elements Radiant AI was introduced in Oblivion as a means of creating procedurally generated scripts in game for the AI to follow in layman's technically wrong it's a package system but the packages have to be hand applied it's not procedural terms this meant that while the algorithm for dynamically creating the ai might have been hella difficult to program once did he say hella 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 that while the algorithm for dynamically creating the ai might have been hella difficult to program he really did say hella. Once that algorithm was set up, Bethesda could simply get a handful of general parameters for the NPCs, and the algorithm would come up with various AI for pathfinding combat and interactions with other NPCs. Again, that's not true. The pathfinding mesh is made on a level-by-level -level basis, um, and it just pulls from that. But that's the same way it worked in um, that's the same way it worked in Morrowind. Um, the combat packages is not you know generated by the system; it's just assigned. It, like procedurally, like generated is wrong. Again, what Radiant AI is if Radiant AI is a framework; it's not procedural AI. What is he from NorCal or some shit? No, South Midwest. We've talked about his accent earlier. Stupid gun. I wonder if that scene's on YouTube. The gun scene. Aim a bit to the right. Sir, yes, sir. Oh, yes! Did you see that shit, Max? Duh. That was so fucking cool. Let's pump up the volume and find me another target. I want to get creative here. Give me something to shoot, Max. Blow your own brains out. Hello, what should I shoot? I bet you want to blow apart those old computer monitors. Where's the part? Let's read. Come on. Wheel rim on your I wanna, left. I want to get to the good part. Cruel bumper. Jesus, I sh shot myself! Ugh, I shot myself! Back up, back Stupid up! Stupid gun! Yeah, it's the gun's fault. It's not like you're doing target practice in literally one of the most dangerous environments that you could do it. Like, and, and okay, if they miss or it goes through this wood backboard after shooting a glass bottle, it's just going to keep going. It, they're not shooting into a, like a backdrop or anything. You deserve to get long shot and fucking die for choosing this as the place to do your target practice. The sad part is, like, people from the Pacific Northwest are exactly like this. This is exactly what they do. They, like, well, they, they're they in, they're not into guns. They'll ban, like, high-capacity magazines, but they still will do, like, target shooting, but they're dangerous as fuck because they don't know anything about guns. It's like the old uh, Alec Baldwin routine. 
NPCs would wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, leave their- Oh, yeah. Uh, the player character in that game is, like, time rewinding powers. So, like, she's saying back up, back up, because she's telling her friend- she She's telling her friend to save her life. In my, in my opinion, um, I would have let her die. If I was a chronomancer and I saw that shit, I'm not rewinding time for your stupid ass. It's time for you to go. You just won a Darwin Award. Back in interactions with other NPCs. NPCs would wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, leave their house, lock the front door, head to work. None of this is procedural. Or, and travel to the local bar, or even visit another city, all before heading home to sleep for the night. None of this is procedural. Ouchie, I shot myself. Yeah, she... Like, her voice actor doesn't even, like, try to make it sound like... Dude, you got shot in the lung. You're gonna have a hard time saying shit after that. In fact, Radiant AI works so well... Oh god, it's this anecdote. It worked so well, they had to turn it down. This is one of my favorite bits from the Oblivion streams. The uh, Radiant AI was like so powerful that Bethesda had to stop it from taking over the planet. Like, they can't have released Radiant AI. Radiant AI, if you don't know, actually connects to the internet. It connects to other instances of Oblivion running. And like... Uh, it's like the Geth, so the more instances of Oblivion that are running, the more intelligent the game actually is. Um, so... <laughs> so, like... It really was like a Skynet situation when Bethesda was developing Oblivion, and, and thankfully they, they toned it down. Um, because it was just, it was too powerful. The AI would just keep, like, spawning dogs and then burning them to death. It was horrible. Um, and th there's very little doubt that, uh, if the AI had gotten loose, that, um, they probably would have made a, uh, competitor to Elder Scrolls, and that's just not acceptable. But yeah, like, fucking, I love this anecdote because it's kind of disingenuous if you read about the story. Basically, what was happening was, like, um... There's like a morality setting for AI in the game, and so they would get hungry, look for food, but if they were low morality, instead of buying the food, they would steal it, and then they would get killed by the guards. Um, I think there's a, still a few places where you can see that happening in like the waterfront in the Imperial City, but there was also stuff like um, you would start a fight with an AI, and it's it, it was like so tuned that like. If it didn't have a weapon, it would, like, run to the building next door, take their neighbor's weapon, and then come back and fight you. It was, like... It wasn't that, like, oh, it was so powerful and they had to turn it down because it was too good. No, it was, like, it was not good. Like, the weird shit that it would do. Uh, well, actually, uh, Radiant AI came very close to, uh, to, uh, revealing information, um, that could lead to the arrest of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> well, voice lines doesn't have to do with Radiant AI. Or heading home to sleep for the night. In fact, Radiant AI worked so well that Bethesda actually had to tone down the Radiant AI before launching Oblivion because they were unable to create worlds massive enough and quick enough to adapt to actually keep pace with the Radiant AI they had inadvertently coded. It was too complex. Taking the weapon from your neighbor doesn't seem stupid. Okay, so a guy is breaking into your house, right? So you decide, I'm going to leave my house, go next door, get my neighbor's gun, then go back to my house and gun down the person invading my home. I think even in, like, a castle doctrine state, you would be, like, sentenced to manslaughter because you got out of the dangerous situation. You got out of your house. At that point, the reasonable thing to do would be to call the police. You don't go to your neighbor's house, grab their AR, and then gun down the home invader. 
Although I'm sure there are some states where you could get away with that. But it's like... Again, you, I think that a lawyer would be able to make a pretty good case that, like, you got yourself out of danger. Radiant AI started calling everybody the N-word and had to get shut down before it got cancelled. It's true. Um, they actually radiantly generated dialogue and the NPCs would talk to each other. Um, and they started being extremely racist towards each other and forming into, like, uh, clans. I'll provide a link to this guy's video in the description if you're interested. His entire channel is pretty funny and he does it with minimal production value. Is that a good thing? Oh yeah, he's got... Minimal production value. <laughs> this ain't it. This ain't it either. This is your own video. Yeah, I don't think... You didn't link it. So, yeah, he didn't actually link... Unless I'm, unless I'm blind. He didn't actually link the video he's talking about. Why would you praise Radiant AI for the AI if it has more to do with developers having easier workflow and scripting? Because he's mistakenly of the impression that Radiant AI like procedurally generates the artificial intelligence. There's an infamous story where people were robbing a house, a neighbor called the cops, then shot the robbers in the back and got off for self-defense. Okay, so your story is missing the critical part of who shot the robbers in the back. Did the neighbor shoot the robbers in the back? I'm, I'm, it stretches my sort of morality when it comes to a home defense situation. If your neighbors come over and defend you, it, I mean, okay, maybe it's one thing if like you're an old woman and like your neighbor, like the old woman has a neighbor who's kind of taking care of her and then like they hear a home invasion going on. Like it's pretty defensible to say, to say, I'm going to go over there and like, uh, protect that person. I think he said the description. Yeah, he says the description. Um, but yeah, so that's a situation, but it's like, if it's just a normal, you know, there's a, there's a man in the house, and he's got a weapon. You know what I mean? The neighbor shot the robbers. Okay, that's a weird one. That's a weird one. I'm not really sure my, my sense of morality supports uh, going to your neighbor's house to shoot their robbers. I don't have an issue with you killing robbers in your own house. Um, this was made when annotations were still a thing, if I remember correctly. I don't think that's true. Annotations have been gone a long time. Annotation. When were annotations removed from YouTube? January 15th, 2019. So, no, this is literally like two weeks after annotations stopped being a thing. Some Self-defense laws vary a lot from state to state. Some states don't allow you to use lethal force to defend property, only your life. Some do. Yeah, well, of course, that's necessarily true. You should be... You should be aware of what the local laws are if you plan on, like, defending your home from a robber, right? Because it's like, in some states, um, that situation where, like, you go to the neighbor's house to get a gun, the state would see that as, like, you got out of the situation. I think it's, like, right to, or, um, what is it called? Um, duty to retreat or something like that, right? There's duty to retreat where, um, if you can reasonably get out of a situation without killing the other person, then, um... You, you aren't protected in a self-defense situation. And then there's castle doctrine, which is like... Like in Texas, it's the exact opposite, where it's like, if you're in any situation where you believe your life's at risk, you can uh, you can legally kill the other person. So yeah, it obviously varies from state to state. I'm talking about morality. I don't think it's moral to run to your neighbor's house to get a weapon, to then go back to your house and kill them. I think if, if you're in a situation where you're willing to kill somebody who's invading your property... You should already have the weapon. No, it's not. Uh, of course, everybody has a right to flee. Uh, no, this is 
duty to retreat. You have the right to run away. Although I don't think prisoners have that right. So if you escape from jail, what do they do they charge you with anything? I think that um I think people who escape from jail should not be charged with a crime unless they commit a crime while like in while doing it like they kill a guard or something. There's no property worth dying over. Uh no, there absolutely is property worth dying over. I would kill somebody if they tried to steal my old beater bike, let alone my actual like bike that I get around to go to places. What if someone else is in your house and you grab the weapon to defend them? It's true. Your neighbor might come over and try to kill the robber, in which case um, you have a duty to defend the robber's life from your neighbor. <laughs> If you're interested, his entire channel is pretty funny, and he does it with me. Okay, but I think escaping from jail is like a civil service. Like, you're exposing a vulnerability of the prison system. I don't think people who escape from jail should be charged with a crime. I think they're doing what naturally comes to humans. Minimal production value. It's just weird. He's a really good channel. He has minimal production value. What? 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 Why would you praise that? I would kill somebody if they tried to take my rice cooker. I would kill somebody with the rice cooker. Procedurally generated anything in video games is generally treated with an almost knee-jerk reaction by gamers. It is often considered- Wait, no. Oh god, no. Acer, the, the reaction isn't knee-jerk, okay? There can be- a knee-jerk good reaction to something like a, a lot of Marvel fans will have a, a knee-jerk reaction to the movies and think it's good before they actually come to any kind of consensus about it there can be I have a negative knee-jerk reaction to something the reaction in of itself isn't knee-jerking because the metaphor is referring to like uh, you instinctively moving your leg from a stimulus like you're automatically responding to something You'd probably find that nearly all jailbreaks involve assault or at least destroying property. Oh, come on. If you have to break some shit to get out of jail, I think that's forgivable. I think humans have a right to escape captivity. But yeah, like, okay. Here's where I'm, I'm going to prove you wrong here. There's this game that, like, a lot of people play that they don't have a knee-jerk reaction to. Uh, it's called Minecraft. Today, the more XP we earn, the more realistic our game will become. From up Fat cringe. What is this? Upgrading graphics to new realistic items and structures. Can we unlock every realistic upgrade? And will my PC survive 100% realism? And our realistic meter is at zero, which is... I have the- okay, so I have these noise reduction panels. Also, what the fuck is this? But yeah, like, I think Minecraft is a good example of, like, that game has a lot of procedural generation in it. And people don't hate it. So does that logic apply to people resisting arrest then? I would say so. There's, like, there's always a situation where you can pick up a, a suspect after the fact. You know, it's like, oh, you ran away from the cops because we were trying to arrest you for tax evasion. That's a world of difference from you ran away from the cops because you're a murderer and we're trying to stop you from go continuing your spree. But yeah, sorry, I apologize for that Minecraft video. That was some fat cringe. It's synonymous with developers putting less effort into the game design, instead of just letting the algorithm do the game design for them. This may be the reason why Bethesda marketed their new AI algorithm as Radiant AI rather than Procedurally Generated AI. They also might have marketed it that way because it's, uh, you know, not procedural.
Tax evasion is not theft from other people. The government is not people. But in this case, Radiant AI was truly revolutionary. No, it wasn't. There were games that did it before Oblivion. It was cool, but it's not revolutionary. I'm going to nitpick you on every fucking thing. Every sentence and term that you use wrong, I'm going to call you out. And that's not nitpicking, okay? If you're wrong, you should say that you're wrong. Um, oh, private sessions. I forget what happened, and I wanted I wanted to comment that he had used a phrase wrong, but I don't remember what the phrase was. Like he used a metaphor wrong. But I apolog but I apologize because I just don't know. I don't remember what it was. And I thought at the time. I should comment now so I don't forget. And then I was like, no, I won't forget. And then I forgot. I love being stuck on Acer's brainlet takes. Yeah, I guess that is one of those things where it's like when someone's wrong, they're wrong for a while and we should probably just power through it. Have you heard of the game Shut the Fuck Up? Maybe Patricia Tier. <laughs> I know that's not what you said, but that's that's what I read on first uh, on first review. You know what's wrong with the world? The people. There, there's a lot of people who think that. The government is not people. Shall we tell them the truth of Mr. Government, boys? Well, uh, the government is a group, is a collective effort, and it's made up of people, but it's not a person. Just like corpora corporations are the same thing. It's a collective group. Um, it's sort of a, a psychic gestalt, a uh, mimetic egregore, if you will. Uh, but it's not a person and really um, as Americans it is actually your duty to evade taxes um, that's what the founding fathers fought for is was tax evasion so uh, if you're not doing your like literally it is your job to fight the state and pay as little taxes as possible if any it was crude in its earliest development, but now that it exists, the possibilities for expanding it are limitless. This this video came out post Fallout 4. Just FYI. Just putting that out there. Just putting that little fact to wait out there. We could assign various personality traits to NPCs and have those personality traits become some of the factors that the algorithm will use when assigning AI to its various NPCs in order to give each NPC a unique AI to apply to it. When you're wrong, you're wrong for a long time. Kind of like what Oblivion did with the AI trait of responsibility. But at the moment, I'm just thinking about what Radiant AI could become. What about what we actually find in Skyrim itself? Well, Radiant AI- Did you say Scotty? What about AI could become? What about what we actually find in Skyrim itself? Well, you did not say Skyrim. I don't know what you said, but it wasn't Skyrim. I only watch your streams when there is zero chance someone walks in. That's kind of sad. It's not pornography. I know I know it's weird, but like I don't know, there's worse things that you could be caught watching. I'm just saying, if you were jacking off, you could keep me on the alternate tab and, like, tab over to me. That's what I'm saying. Radiant AI is a double-edged sword. On the one end, it enables each NPC to have a unique schedule in life, giving them even more individuality in addition to their aforementioned personalities. I am really looking forward to what the double edge of this sword is. I am excited. Is there a lower view of this waifu model? Um, hang on. I can hook you up. I think. Actually, I don't think I ever... No, this is as low as it gets. She's wearing white pants. Okay, I deleted something, but I don't know what. I just find it hard to explain. I mean, <laughs> just say it is what it is. There's a guy on YouTube who is a has a VTuber model um, and watches Skyrim videos. 
uh, the truth is often uh, the most effective way to go about things. I thought in my early 20s that you get arrested for not taking the back taxes the IRS owes you if you're under the poverty line. Yeah, I remember freaking out the first year. I didn't file uh, for a tax return like the first year. Um, but like, I made an extremely insignificant amount of money and um, I don't know. I don't know what happens if you don't file for a tax return. Like, does the government just keep that money? Like, did, did someone at the IRS get a new desk? I think it was probably it was probably like two hundred dollars. I, I made a really small amount of money the, the first year that I was employed because I was minimum wage and I was part time, and I started working in July. I was very excited when I got promoted and got my quarter raise. I was making. Hang on. There's a great bit from this video that I like. It, because it it's basically like captures a year of my life. To eight to spy on you. They just increased my pay to eight dollars an hour. <laughs> so yeah, this is the, this is the video. They like they changed all the voice lines to be slightly different. But that that line in particular resonated with me. There's no way you only made $200 in the tax return. On paper, this sounds like a great concept, but at the same time, this also provides a bottleneck on how many NPCs can be processed at one time. Yeah, because the the game is just every time Nazim is generated, it roll it it has to figure out what his AI is. Yeah, the AI is the reason for the bottleneck of the number of NPCs that are in the game. It's the AI, guys. The AI is the thing that's responsible. Okay, the AI is the thing that. <laughs> This may be a justification for the small populations in cities and, by proxy, the small city areas I complained about earlier. Having too many NPCs being processed at once would simply put way too much strain on console and PC processors. Poss Why wouldn't you just say processors? It's a CPU regardless of where, like, where, it, what, what it's in. believe into the point of overloading them, causing permanent damage and, in extreme cases, literal explosions. I've entertained an Literal explosions. This g Oh man, it might be impossible. It might actually be impossible for me to, to find a relevant clip for this one. Like, the plot of this season is that, like... Awesome. Um, the hackers came up with a way of exploding Xbox power supplies. So, like, um, they, they kill you in Halo, and then you die in real life. And, I'm sorry, I like John Graham. I like the content that he produces. But the idea that, like, every Xbox power supply exploding is fatal for the person is really dumb. I think that like John gets killed in this manner, like the 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 in series John. But like, are you seriously going to make the argument that Skyrim's radiant AI had to be restrained? <laughs> Skyrim's radiant AI had to be restrained. Because it would have killed people <laughs> to be more powerful. <laughs> it was so powerful that the chance was there that it would have fucking killed people.
So what happens if you stand up? Uh, nothing. So like the AI's position is kind of fixed. So you can see me if I lean off, like... Like it's not full tracking or anything like that. My AI is so powerful that it's going to take over my world. Oh, it's going to take over the world. That's how powerful my AI is. Oh, yeah? Well, my AI is so powerful that you are going to fucking die. There was a vulnerability in some MacBooks that could uh, overdrive the battery and it would leak battery acid, but that's about as much as you could do with a hardware vulnerability. Yeah, it's like... There's not enough power in an Xbox power supply to make it explode with enough force to kill people. Again, I want to say this sentence again. Skyrim's radiant AI had to be restrained because it would have killed people if it was more powerful. Causing pro okay. If you want to clip this part, it's at 119.19. City areas I complained about earlier. Having too many having too many NPCs being processed as once would simply put too much strain on console and PC processors. NPCs being okay, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. That's a real thing that happens. They had massive limitations that were based on like the power of the Xbox 360. That's a legitimate thing that Bethesda was worried about when developing Skyrim. Okay, this sentence is fine. It's logical. This makes sense. Being processed at once would simply put way too much strain on console and PC processors. But okay, and maybe, okay, let me clarify. Their problem was not the AI. Their problem was graphical. Like, they claim that the legs and chest had to be combined to, like, save processing power so that, like, less models would be loaded. And it makes a degree of sense that, like, each model being unique means that, like, there's more models that have to be in the RAM. So, um, but then stretching to make the claim possibly even to the point of overloading them, causing permanent damages and in extreme cases, possibly even to the point of overloading them, causing permanent damage and in extreme cases, li literal explosion. Like the subtitles have comedic timing. If you were deaf, you would be on the edge of your seat trying to figure out what's the next crazy thing he's going to say and then it just says possibly literal explosions even to the point of overloading them causing permanent damage and in extreme cases literal explosion will said something along the same lines in his oblivion video it's like these people don't know that when you put strain on hardware it just gets a little hotter and the game slows down i no i do not recall will saying that the fucking Radiant AI was going to explode processors or whatever. Whatever he thinks explodes when it, it becomes overpowered. Do you really think that game designers, one of the main things game designers have to worry about in the modern era is that they're going to overload the system and cause it to explode? Fucking arcade developers didn't have to worry about that. I mean, like, you gotta, this is why people give Acer Thorne shit, because he says stuff like this. He said, he, he is of the mind that Radiant AI is going to fucking destroy someone's systems. There are lots of videos of rechargeable batteries for high-powered portable devices like hoverboards exploding. Yeah, like, e-bike batteries will explode, but that's because, like, a battery is a literal chemical reaction. Um... Consoles and PCs don't really have batteries the same way that like an, an e-bike would have a battery because they're plugged into the they're plugged into the system to the grid. Somewhere out there right now, a nuclear power plant is polluting somebody's garden to provide the processing power needed to make this video. Well, maybe not right now, but at the time it was being made. Might have been a joke though. Okay. Here's our general rule. We don't assume that people joke. Because 
pretty much every instance someone in the chat has like defended a point by saying, well, maybe he's joking. They weren't joking. That electric chair is pretty nice. Now let's see Acer Thorn's method of execution. It, yeah, his method of execution is uh, he straps an Xbox power supply to your head and then runs Skyrim. I'll be right back. I got my sip up. It's full of water. I'm going to be honest, guys. I think my body produces more liquid than it consumes. Where is Acer Thorn? I don't know. He wasn't invited. You know what I managed to find? I've managed to find some 12 gauge slugs. So, uh, whoever tries to steal my uh, body pillows is going to be in for a nasty surprise. If the processor gets too hot, the PC just, just, just shuts down. I'm going to go ahead and assume that uh, Microsoft included such a feature in their in their consoles. I mean, um, oh, that wasn't a Glock. That was a shotgun. No, no, this is what a Glock sounds like. It's a much quicker sound. Do you think Noah sends Xboxes with pre-installed Skyrim to minorities? Uh, he actually home modifies the console. He home brews it so that uh, the gate it can only run Skyrim. You should sell body pillows if your wife is. Um, I'm waiting for the day that I get I I got an interesting sponsorship offer that I might uh, take up. I'm waiting for the day, however, that like a Dakimura company contacts me and like uh <laughs> asks me if like they want to if i want to sell some uh body pillows of my waifus because the thing is i absolutely would um 
I'm pure and innocent in the sense that I am going to assume that they would not be used for sexual purposes because it would be really weird. I don't think there's any way you could have sex with a body pillow um, that is associated with my voice. Like, because, okay. Thinking about my voice while you masturbate is gay. Um, having sex with an anime girl is straight. And bisexuals are like unicorns. So, um, I, I just don't see it happening. All right, how do we proceed? How do we move on? How is there... I'm literally like, I feel like I've just been brain blasted. Uh oh, do I not know what part of the, okay, there it is. I was like, do I not know the part of the Angry Joe video? Final verdict for the Elder Scrolls Skyrim is a full highest rating that I can issue. 10 out of 10, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot wait to see all the DLC and expansions No, bisexuality, I think um it would probably be it would probably be easier to tell people that you're a leper than it would be to say that you're bisexual. Voice chat with Acer Thorn? Oh god. I don't know how that would go. That's one of that's just one of those things that I don't think should happen. I'm just gonna put that on screen. Let me size it up. Just right. There we go. I like the fluoride stare memes that people come up with whenever I uh, leave. All right. Let me just, uh... She is cute when she smiles. Bam. You're a furry now. You just got tricked. There's a new Morrowind review by a fella named Dovinati. Yeah, people have been telling me about it. I mean, what? I don't know. What do you want me to do? Watch it? Um... We haven't really watched a Morrowind video before. And that's the thing, like... We start watching Morrowind videos, then we have to watch the Salt Factory Morrowind video. In bed. What makes even less sense to me is the fact that I rounded the corner in the same temple and slept in this bed with no issue at all. And it's like... Also, hang on. I've got big issues with this blanket texture. Um, but yeah, I just broke the rules for harassment. Now, like, okay, hang on. What's going on with this fucking blanket texture? This is, like... This is stitching that you would get from a sewing machine. Like, blankets of that era would not look like that. Alright, anyways. Sid Alpha got roped in the Acer Thorn shit because of all the DMCA he has been doing to smaller creators, and he is making a video and all the shit. Yeah, I, I had heard there's a lot of, like, Acer Thorn uh, drama going on. Like, people are throwing... Like, I like the old era of, like... Uh, YouTube content creators should not DMCA other YouTube content creators, but...
But yeah, it's like, I don't know. Don't take this as a hard quote of my policy. Uh, I don't know if I want to do more Owen videos. If only because, like, that stretches into the realm of, um... You know, just doing it to, for the sake of doing it. God, if I had $100, I'd be so rich. Just watch him and cut him off every five minutes. You're being very generous. See... I don't think Mr. Dark Moo here is a fan of my work. But that's confusing because that would imply that he's a fan of Acerthorn's work. Acerthorn has less subscribers than your second channel. I mean, so does Tetramore. Tetramore makes good content and he's got like... I don't think he's even at 2k. Yeah, he's at 1.6k. I recommend this channel. Um... Specifically, the Control video and the Metal Gear Solid 5 video. Uh, this is Tetramore. We did a podcast together. Um, I haven't seen the full Kingdom Hearts video yet, though. I'm having issues with it because I think that... Um, I don't know. I can't take Kingdom Hearts seriously. I was going to ask him about it on the podcast as a topic, like... What do I need to do to be able to watch this three-hour Kingdom Hearts video? How far along is the Skyrim video? It's hard to put a percentage on that kind of thing. Um, seven out of 11 parts of the script, I guess. That's one way to say it. Revisiting topics that you've already covered with nothing new is weird. Not a fan of repetitive content, just reviews. I mean, so I thought about streaming Morrowind videos, but even before I did the Oblivion videos, because I figured, well, I'm knowledgeable about Morrowind. And I think, like, the only Morrowind videos I'd seen was Lore Runners, which was good. Both both of them. Uh, he's got, like, a... He's got one that's, like, 45 minutes long, and then, obviously, he's got his uh, Lore Run streams. I disagree with some things that Lore Runner says, but generally, I would say that he did a good job. And then... I think I had seen Salt Factory's Morrowind video, and I didn't like it at the time. Alright, there you go. Deep lore. The Salt Factory rivalry goes back far. Well, see, chat is like roasting Tetramore. I think the man deserves the right to defend himself. And I'm prepared to invite Tetramore on my platform um, to give him the opportunity to defend himself. I've okay, so I, I just want to remind everybody of where we're at. Acer Thorin just said that the AI had to be held back so it didn't explode consoles. Okay entertained in my head the idea of only actively processing the npcs in the low cell that the player is currently in while any time i mean that's basically what it does you, you, like if you don't understand the system like is this okay this has to be the dunning kruger effect i know i know me dunning kruger meme but like it's not that acer thorn is malicious it's not that he's like intentionally being wrong for the like to accomplish some end right i think that he doesn't know oh i was looking for tetra more in the chat i think that he he thinks he knows how it works and like so that the, the the what's the right word for it the dangerous the sad part something like that some mix of danger and sad is um that with the dunning kruger effect it's not that the people are malicious it's that they think they have a level of confidence and understanding about the topic that they don't necessarily have and that's why it's in like it's a vicious trap to fall into because it's like how do you know that you're even falling into it like you could be doing it right now right um so, I think he 
thinks that he knows how Radiant AI works, but he doesn't because he seems to be of the assumption that like the game is just like how would this work, sir? How would it work where it's just it's so powerful and it's constantly generating, you know, procedural things for the AI to do? Do you realize that? So I don't know specifically how Skyrim's engine, like, what kind of ticks it uses, or if it processes on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. Um, but you realize that, like, the game is making dozens, if not hundreds, of calculations per frame for, lot, for a variety of things, right? It's not like there's a tube and there's somebody at the end of the tube with a stick ramming the AI instructions down it and it can get clogged up, right? Um, plus, it's like, AI processing for areas that you're not in is not particularly complex. There's not really a whole lot of AI stuff going on. And plus, it's like, um, it's not a huge weight on the system to just have a standing order for the AI to follow. Um, if all an AI is doing is, you are traveling from Markarth to Whiterun, then that's actually not a huge strain on the system because it's going to take a while before it needs to actually uh, do the heavy part of figuring out what it does next because it's currently carrying out a task. And so, like, that's how you distribute the weight of the system. What's holding up Skyrim is not its massive, girthy AI cock. It's graphical. It's how far they can render stuff and... Uh, how much stuff that they can have on screen and the complexity of all the objects that were that are on screen That's what the game is struggling with um, They talked about was it the podcast or no, it was the documentary they made recently about how um, They couldn't figure out like how fast to make the werewolves because if the werewolves ran too quick it would like outpace the uh, The LODs or something like that. I forget exactly what they said, but like yeah, their main issue was graphical. Um, you head through a load I don't know, boss. Acer flagging the debate video he was in is kind of malicious. Well, of course. Um, I don't think I said that like Acer Thorn was was not being malicious, but I will say I don't have enough context to really. Hey, know. boys and girls know what's going on with this um best of acer thorn reddit posts what why is this content you're producing y people are going to be annoyed with you if your sub if their sub feed is just full of acer thorn reddit posts so he's got a two hour and six minute video on how not to do fair use i assume this is a video might be a stream the real reason behind the you didn't play enough excuse can't exit bios try this before you spend money i like in the mix of like drama he has a video on how to exit bios let's are, are you gonna be fast with this okay Criticism is under fair use, therefore the video is fair use. Dear Acer Thorn, I urge you to read the Fair Use Act of 1976. Your false DMCAs against Artemis and others are illegal. You're abusing the system to silence those critical of you. Yeah, I'd heard about the this. Videos I, okay, so I had heard about this because Moth Person is in my Discord. But yeah, it's like... Artem. I don't trust the guy that just said that like AI were going to explode consoles to tell me about how like cop how copyright works because anybody who tries to explain about how copyright works is almost always somebody who's like trying to justify why they abuse the system I don't think there's been a situation where somebody out of the blue said hey hey guys let's talk about let's talk about how <laughs> what is and isn't fair use The recent third video has a soy jack in the thumbnail. Wait, really? Hey, uh, boys and girls. Oh. 
I don't know how you... I guess I scrolled up and you saw that. Where the game would simply calculate where each NPC was... I don't really care about the Acer Thorn copyright stuff. Not really. Because that's happening like three years after this video came out. So I even if it... Even if this is a 2022 perspective, this video is not from 2022, and I don't give a shit. Acer Thorn seemed like a a reasonable person when, when this video came out. I mean, barring the odd really weird thing that he said in this video, I'm not he's he's not an asshole or anything like that. At least as far as this video is concerned. And this video is on the again, I'm not being ironic here. Anybody who's seen a lot of the streams can tell you that this is true. This is one of the better Skyrim videos that we've watched. I will say this is worse than Mr. Caption for the first hour and 30 minutes, but it's better than Mr. Caption after the 90 minute mark. Because I, I do think there is a part of the Mr. Caption video where I think he's intentionally lying. Even just exposure to a different audience than the original work can be considered transformative and therefore fair use. See Benjamin versus Hughes. Um, was that, I thought the core, I thought the judge's decision on that was based on the title is fair use, or the title was what made it transformative. I think it was the title and it was like, it was a cut up compilation. So it wasn't the video in question. It was like a short compilation. Acer Thorn has 367 videos out at the moment. Um, that's not, that's not unreasonable. I do want Acer Thorn to say that I'm doing blackface, though. That would be funny. 99% of DMCA claims against a YouTube creator against another YouTuber are frivolous. Yeah, the only valid applications of DMCA that YouTuber for YouTubers is someone's re-uploaded your video, and um, someone is. And that even then, if you take a video down for like they're doxing you, that's not a that's not like a that's not a DMCA. That's a privacy complaint. That's a whole different law that is and different part of the TOS. Hot take: Copyright shouldn't exist to begin with. So unique name Asaurus talks a lot about that. And I don't necessarily agree with his position. He makes he makes the case that like copyrights shouldn't exist and artistic projects should be funded from the outset rather than purchased at the end of production. So it's like if you were interested in seeing something animated, then like they, they would do a GoFundMe, generate the money and then um, it wouldn't be an issue after the fact if, like, the video was re-uploaded because there would be no protections for copyright. And I just don't see a way for his system to work. It's fine. His idea of, I'm going to make a uh, public domain series, that's a fine experiment if you want to do it. But I don't think that there's a world where the abolition of the idea of copyright entirely would be effective. I do think it's excessive current in its current state, but I don't think the solution is to just get rid of the concept entirely. What's up with a guy with only 2K subs trying to start drama? Not a good way to promote a small channel. I Well, okay. Uh, when you're small, drama is actually a great way because uh, drama gets views, but also... Um, I think it's more of like a neur uh, neurotic component than uh, like this is part of Acer Thorn's big plan. I think Acer Thorn wants to cut it as a creator, and it's fine. Hey, boys and girls! God damn it! This is the same shit as Twitch autoplay and stuff, but it's like he absolutely has the nickname Nick problem of like someone commented something critical in my um, in my comment section so i need to have a series of videos where i like where i explain how these people like he gets too hung up on 
on the people being critical of him. And there's a lot of people being critical of him because at some point in 2019, he's just started saying crazy shit. And it's like, I, I don't know. The Skyrim video from Acer is all right because he likes the game. When he tries to critique games he dislikes, it's the shits. Yeah, that could be a thing. Like, is Acer Thorn and the anti me? Because if you think about it, like, I have a lot of difficulty uh, making videos where I'm positive about something. Um, I guess he has a lot of difficulty making videos where he's negative about something. So I don't know. Maybe he should just cover stuff he likes. Maybe that would be like healthy for him. I would also think like, um, I don't know, maybe he shouldn't read comments or he should, I don't know. It's easy to say like, don't get upset about comments. Um, how is DW Terminator so far? Uh, I think we're like this far into the video from last time. Uh, we're secretly, we're secretly watching Acer's Thorn. If you if Acer Thorn really is some kind of YouTube strategic genius, he'll, I will definitely sub. Okay, I w I can see a world where um, Acer Thorn is an ex extremely deliberate content creator who's having all these bad takes because it can get him attention. But if you actually look at it's going to happen again. If you actually look at his view counts, um. It doesn't seem to be working. He's been doing this for years, and um, it doesn't seem to be, like, working out for him. I think a funny part of, like, the first stream was, like, he said... He defended something he said as, like, well, that's the way I want to do it. And it's like, well, okay, it, that can be the way you want to do it, but that's then why this video has, like, 22,000 views. And, like, you should listen to me because... I know how egotistical it sounds, but you should listen to me because, like, I can, in a very short amount of time, I've, like, accrued this much attention, and it's, like, basically, I, I just flexed my numbers on him as an argument, and it actually seemed to work. So I think that he very much wants to be a content creator, and so it's not, I don't think he's... He, he's this Machiavellian genius where he's having bad takes because it gets him attention. I think that's his honest opinions. And I think that he can't come to terms with the fact that he kind of has some radical opinions. We should all sub to him. You can sub to him if you want. I would not endorse being an ironic subscriber. Being somebody who's like in his community because um... Like, don't make him a lol cow or anything like that. I think what the guy deserves is to be uh, left to his own devices. I mean, obviously, I think that, but we're watching his video. But it's like, at the same time, I don't necessarily think this is a bad video. Again, wild takes, but overall, it's fine. supposed to be and what they were doing before placing you on the other side of the low door. Unfortunately, that wouldn't work because some NPCs are supposed to travel between low doors and even travel to other cities as part of their Arabian AI packages. However, even if new ideas... The old adage, when you're wrong, you're wrong for a long time. ...is can be developed to circumvent the issues of too many NPCs being processed at one time. The bottom line is that Radiant AI will always put a bottleneck on the amount of NPCs we can have. This means that, as long as the Elder Scrolls franchise keeps writing an AI, it will never match the sheer population of cities like Novigrad and Witcher 3, even if Bethesda were other- I like, I like this, the CC's interpretation of Bethesda there. Do you understand why they were able to do Novigrad and why they weren't able to do that for Skyrim other than the simple observation well the Xbox One or whatever is more powerful I mean seriously it's four years difference four or five I think Witcher 3 is 2015 
But I mean, it, it's not it, it's not like a significant amount of difference. Like technology did not change and improve significantly between the 360 and the one, right? So that's not the answer. The reason that Novigrad is the way it is is because there's a lot of generic NPCs who have extremely basic packages instead of like, I mean, and I mean like, Jesus. Otherwise willing to code individual scripts. I love how diplomatic you're being. It's not even necessarily that I'm being diplomatic or like trying to pander to him so that He's not necessarily... You made me question YouTubers, question YouTuber vids. You'll see me making some tra trash kind of soon, Bethesda games eventually. Um, I don't necessarily understand what you just said. Um, I'm not being nice because like, I, I mean, I'm being nice in the sense of like, Acer Thorn's a small creator and I think there's some constructive criticism that he needs um to improve as a content creator however with the way that he's conducted himself recently i think that he might not be capable of taking the necessary constructive criticism um and and also he likes to hype on the argument of like well the the criticism is not constructive because at one point in the video you you said like uh you said something mean and it's like well that sucks sucks to fuck but Listen, um, I think he's worked on, from what I've gathered, he seems to have worked on his enunciation a bit. I'm sure he's a better content creator, but there's still lessons that can be learned. And I don't know, like, I want these, like, when I'm talking about smaller creators, I want that to be more constructive and helpful. You can't kill any of them. You can't enter their houses and rob them blind. They're nameless background characters. Yes, that's ex that's exactly it. And I think that um, I think he doesn't get the difference, or maybe he does get the difference, but he doesn't realize how big it can be. I don't know. It's like play an Assassin's Creed game. They, those cities are populated. Like, th there's a lot of tricks you can use to make game worlds feel populated. This actually has a lot to do with like the pro the Warcraft project I'm working on right now. Why are his man mannerisms so strange? Even at increased speeds, he says some words so slow. It, yeah. There are some interesting presentation aspects, but I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of content creators we can listen to that sound weird. I mean, like, British people exist. Kind of sneak up on your prey and use the shadows to your advantage. Take on a little ch But yeah, I think, you know, Salt Factory is highly successful and he talks kind of weird. And then there's that guy that made that Kraya video. He's like, he's from some part of the world. It's like called, uh, like Dutchland or something. I don't know, but like he has, he, he has, oh, um, he's from a part of the world where, um, I have found this interesting. When's the next LARP? Uh, we were talking, we were talking about that in private chat. So we're, we're figuring that out. Um, he's so interesting thing. The English language is one of the few languages where the TH sound exists. So, th. So, uh, if you've ever watched that Kraya video, hang on. I bet this is enough. Okay. If you ever watch this, this Kraya video, you can. Uh, there's a very interesting way. Listen to the ways that he says the, the letter D. But it's later revealed that the exchange is doing this to draw up the Jedi into helping the refugees. Obviously, if you start helping the refugees like a goody two-shoes, Kray will start to scorn you. I'm feeling into slavery with the huts. Represented beautifully with Zalbar near the end of the first Knights of the Old Republic game, where he has to choose whether to uphold his life. So he um he's uh he's from the Netherlands, as somebody said, which they say the Nederlands. Um I think that's what they call it. They, they use a D because they can't say the TH sound because that's an English thing. So there's all sorts of weird mannerisms that you can have when you, when you uh, are a content creator that people will accept. They'll overcome those issues. You don't have to have an American broadcasting voice to be successful as a content creator. 
There's people more successful than me that can't, can't speak worth a fuck. Yeah, every time he says, um, the, he says, duh, because he can't, he can't say that TH sound. I'm sure that guy was Canadian. Which guy? I don't know where Salt Fact or yeah, I don't know where Salt Factory's from. I know where Acer Thorn's from, but I'm not gonna say it. And um Region DC. So that begs the question. It begs the question. Fest were otherwise willing to code individual scripts for Region DC. So that begs the question. Does that make Radiant AI an obsolete concept and by proxy causes Skyrim to hold less by today's standards than it would have held up without the Radiant AI? Well, honestly, whether you believe Radiant AI is worth the setbacks is almost completely subjective. For some yeah, most of this is subjective. I have to sneeze, but it's not happening. What? I'm reading the transcript. Um... The transcript seems to be off with the timestamps. I asked how to be a content creator and what mic he used. Oh, Salt Factory was actually super helpful when I showed up in his server and messaged him about stuff. Oh, yeah, he seems to be a decently nice person. I'm not saying Salt Factory is a bad person. I'm just saying that he talks weird. He talks weird and claims that he needs to, like, synopsize the entire game for his analysis, but... And also, he shit-talked me without saying my name. I hate when fucking people do that. Hey, hey, people. Some population size and density is more important than each NPC being unique. For others, they would advocate quality over quantity in nearly all things. So does Radiant AI hold up by today's standards? It's controversial, but I'm going to say yes. I don't like this framing device for the video. Sky the Skyrim music is getting kind of intense. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this, this framing device of um, everything has to call back to this. I mean, I get it. It's your thesis statement. So you have to answer the question, does it still hold up in 2019 when the video was made, not 2022? But listen, I don't know. I feel like it's holding the video back because he's stuck like, he's stuck saying stuff like, well, some people think that Radiant AI is a bad thing and that they should prioritize quality over quantity. And other people say, and it's like, okay, one, it would be nice to see those people saying that, and, but two, I don't really see how it's relevant. Just tell me whether or not you think it holds up and why you think it holds up and why you think it matters whether or not it holds up. Sometimes having a weird voice speech pattern can help you stand out. It's true. It's absolutely true. Salt loves the phrase in my eyes. Well, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, where's... Somebody said something. What did he say about you? Uh, give me one second. I'll pull it up. I wonder, is this video still age-restricted? By the way, private sessions... Ah, oh, fuck. I forgot. I forgot that happened. It's age-restricted, so I can't watch it on the viewing browser. Because it's not signed in. 
Mass Effect 2 Salt Factory. Give me them CCs. All right. All just really exciting. I know this is a weird break, but when I summer. Hang on. So it's on the second thing, so like I gotta turn this up, turn the music off. Summarize things, the summary tends to be to give people context for what I'm about to say. Am I long winded? Yeah, I mean, yeah. But I do it when I usually have something more to say than just, this is really fun. I mean, it's not always the case, but usually there's some critique attached to my summaries. I have nothing to say here for a lot of this part, and I think that's fine because it really should be experienced for oneself in my eyes. Anyways, when we get to where the crew that So yeah, like, that's exactly the right time to be like a response, where like he would be writing that as a response to the original streams where like we called out called that out. So yeah, that's the that's the context. I've responded to it before. Um the Skyrim video is more synopsis than uh synopsis than analysis. There was like there was a lot of things that he explained happened that he didn't necessarily call back to or really have any commentary on. Radiant AI may not be your cup of tea, but it's not broken by any means. I think it's not broken by any means. It's not killing anybody. It's not exploding consoles. It's separately from non-radiant AI games like Witcher 3 and Kingdom Come Deliverance. It just means that it gives Skyrim a niche. Maybe and AI games like Witcher 3 and Kingdom Come Deliverance it just means that come that it gives Skyrim a niche. Maybe someday, some other game will come along and do Radiant AI better than Bethesda does, but Radiant AI will always have a place in the gaming industry. Just- Wow, how based. He's not a Philistine who goes, Radiant AI bad. So that means Radiant AI never do Radiant because it's bad. <laughs> Open parenthetical based, closed parenthetical. Didn't really sound like he was talking smack. I think you read a little too deep on that comment. It sounded more like him defending himself. Yes. Exactly. But, okay, here's my problem with it. Most of the people who watch that Mass Effect 2 video have no idea what the fuck he's talking about. Because, like, he's randomly deciding to explain why he synopsizes things at hour four in the video without any context or clarification. It's, like, I had the same issue with Joseph Anderson in his Witcher 3, or Witcher 2 video. Obviously, his Witcher 3 video is not out. Um, where, like randomly in the middle of the video you can tell that like he started getting covered on efap because he started uh like randomly taking snipes at like objectivity and what have you but like of course he didn't name names you know it'd be out of place to talk about your youtube drama in the middle of a in the two hours into a video on the witcher 2 so like i i, I don't know i just really hate like random snipes in videos Like, if you want to talk about it, there's this website called Twitter where you can just, like, you know, make a post and say, you know, I really didn't appreciate what that Patrician TV guy had to say about my Skyrim video. It's like how turn-based combat engines will always have a place. So, yes. Well what about... Hey, 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 are you based? What about dice roll combat? <laughs> Does it have a place? I don't know if he actually mentions it, but let's find hey, out. Hey, boys and girls! Hey, boys and girls!
Combat in Morrowind is the most boring, dreadful experience I have ever had. Not just from the Elder Scrolls games, but from any RPG, period. Morrowind's combat engine wants to be a CRPG, but without any party members or skills. Isn't that kind of like being a platformer without a jump button? For those of you who don't know, CRPGs are essentially video game versions of tabletop RPGs like Dungeons & Dragons. In tabletop RPGs, whether you hit your opponent is dictated by a dice roll, since there's no way for real-time combat to physically manifest itself in a tabletop format. Video game CRPGs like Diablo also had combat engines where the player acted like a general rather than a combatant. Rather than controlling every aspect of your character's actions, you instead merely provided instructions. I'm reading through the transcript. He says it's bad, but he never really... I don't see the part... I don't see a part where he's making an argument like, um, it needs to be cut. And it doesn't have a place in the industry. So, you pass for now. Kind of sounds like a breathless Ethan Van Skyver god. I haven't seen an Ethan Van Skyver video in a while. I actually don't remember what he sounds like. I think he's Canadian. Joe Rogan should invite Pat TV on his show. I would listen. If I got an email and it said, "We need you to come on the on jo the Joe Rogan Experience," you best believe I'm gonna hop on that shit. And I know full well. Listen, I'm gonna be the monkey, and they're gonna ask me to dance because they're gonna be like, "Yo." How do you make a 12 hour video about a video game? Okay, that's the novelty is they're gonna invite me on because I'm a weirdo. I would still do it. I was thinking about this recently. Um, Sam Hyde was probably insulted when iDubbbz asked to make a documentary because if you think about the people that iDubbbz has covered on a documentary, it's like, oh yeah, the common trend is they're washed out YouTubers who are doing poorly in life like post fame and so it's like it's almost insulting to be asked if like you want to let idubs make a documentary about you anyways i think that's like <laughs> i think that's a funny observation because it's like i don't think idubs realizes how much of an insult it is for him to want to make a documentary about you joe's gonna want joe's gonna call you a nerd and then hand you a blunt Okay, so, of the Joe Rogan experience, I've always heard that Joe does weed. Um, I've never actually seen an episode of the Joe Rogan experience where they sm where they smoke, though. I remember Kretosis and company cheering when they were able to probe by piecing together the PowerPoint picks and prove that Kretosis went three strikes out for the Morrowind combat. Yeah, I, I heard about that. They used my... Um, they used my test uh, in their streams. I know my influence gets around, and I stand by like the validity of that test um, because I think it's extremely accurate. I think if you don't understand the the Morrowind combat system, then you don't really you shouldn't really talk about it. Elon Musk episode. Yeah, I have a picture somewhere. Hang on. I have a picture. I have lots of pictures of Elon Musk from that episode. Yes, indeed. This is like one of my favorite pictures. I'm so glad that he went on the Joe Rogan experience and smoked weed. Yeah, there's memes about the Joe Rogan. Ex I don't think anybody actually watches the show or listens to it. I don't know. I haven't seen any Joe Rogan stuff since he went to, to Spotify. Hmm, how weird. It's almost like I don't use Spotify. But it was like, I would listen to like clips of the Joe Rogan show at work. But I'm not really like a big Joe Rogan fan. I've just seen some stuff that he did. And like, I don't know. He seems like a really good interviewer. 
Like I can, I can definitely like. There's a lot of celebrities where I'm like, I don't understand how you're popular. I can definitely understand why Joe Rogan is popular, even if I don't necessarily like Joe Rogan. All controversial, I will say that Radiant AI holds up. Oh yeah, by the way, before you say anything, um, what the fuck? So, like, the, uh, when he rendered it, the these transitions were like in a really slow frame rate so that's why like it looks like that it's not like he's aware that it was messed up and it's just like well it's either i re-render this two this almost three hour long video or i just accept that like the cards are messed up how long do i think i'll be streaming tonight uh until i feel like stopping so a while uh the upper limit on my streams is like 12 hours i think no I think what it is about Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan reminds me a lot of my, of my parents, um, people who were like young adults during the nineties, um, who like were big and hip and like, were being rebels, but then like kind of just accepted the, the, uh, the faux fascism in the U S government in the two thousands, like those kind of people, like. We're rebels, but there are lines you don't cross kind of deal. So it's like, yeah, he reminds me a lot of my of my parents' sort of mentality. Artifacts are important in an RPG. Okay. Let me write that down. Okay. Well, is that going to be on the test? <laughs> is this true? Like, how many RPGs are there that you would say, like, artifacts are, like, is super important, like, a big deal? Like, we played Dark Souls 3 the other day, and it's like, there's powerful weapons, there's, like, boss weapons and stuff, but there's not really artifacts. Like, at the end of the day, most of the swords, even the enchanted ones, are, like, still just swords. It's not like, this is the Moonlight Great Sword, and it was blessed by so-and-so, and it has thousands of years of history. What do you think it is about the Elder Scrolls specifically that causes there to be so many more analysis videos than the other popular series, e.g. GTA? Um, well, part of it is um, Skyrim is an extremely popular video game, and it also seems like a very easy target. Um, I would have a nightmare trying to cover something like GTA V, but I actually think in reality it would be easier for me to talk about GTA V than it would be for me to talk about Skyrim. Um, but at the surface level, it seems like the opposite is true. It seems like, oh, Skyrim, there's not much, there's not very much going on, while in GTA V, there's just so much going on. And the inverse, and again, the inverse is true. I feel like it's just a it's just a strange sentence. I'm not going to say, "Oh, you're wrong that artifacts are important." It's just like it's a weird way to open up a point or to open up a discussion about artifacts. I think it was an innocent phrasing on his part. I think he should have said artifacts can be crucial in defining a fantasy world. Would you consider recurring weapons in Dark Souls to be kind of like artifact weapons? Um, no, not really, because artifact kind of implies that there's a lore significance to it. There's a difference between a unique item and an artifact. So, like, um, I don't know, like, there's a lot of unique swords in World of Warcraft, but the Ashbringer is an artifact. They simultaneously serve as one of the biggest means of leveling your character and also the primary incentive to go out and complete quests. Okay, so I... 
I should let him finish, but I think he probably should have called this section like items or something, like or progression other than artifacts. Because um the funny thing about Skyrim is that actually a lot of the artifacts are worse than like the generic items that you can create. So it's like almost everybody I see who runs an in-game build in Skyrim is using Daedric and Dragonbone. So it is important that these artifacts and their relative usefulness within the game hold up in order for Skyrim as a whole to hold up. For this analysis, I will divide the artifacts into two categories, weapons and armor, and everything else. Why would you divide it that way? Like, what is in the everything else category? Azura Star? <laughs> There's not a lot of artifacts in Skyrim that aren't weapons and armor, that, like, aren't equipment. Azura Star, uh, the Ogma Infinium, I guess, are, are, like, rings are armor. I would say, in Skyrim, for the... Like, unless you're being super pedantic about the definition of armor. Like, I don't know. This seems like a really weird way to go about this topic. But I... Whatever, whatever. You're wrong, you're wrong for a long time. Let's just keep going. For Sword and board is expected of YouTubers. Uh, yeah, but... The thing is, like... Sword and board's probably the best build in Skyrim. In terms of having fun. Does he have a section talking about perks? I don't remember there being a section talking about perks. He did have a part... I think we saw where he was talking about how Skyrim doesn't have classes. But he doesn't have a section called perks or anything like that. What the fuck is that? For weapons and armor, they are more or less a linear progression. Steel is better than iron. Dwarven is better than steel. Daedric is better than ebony. And... I... Okay, come on. Come on. Close captioning. You can do better than that. Deidric. I hate that peak performance build requirement. I want to stay in the more practical leather and steel realm fucking wow bullshit. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, funny thing about World of Warcraft is they added level scaling. Do travel stained pants count as an artifact? I like to, I want to know the way in which those pants are travel stained. Ah, uh, yes, traveler, you can have my pants that I died in. They are full of shit. But, but, they're not just any shit filled pair of pants. These shit filled pair of pants let you fly. Is Acer Thorn done being wrong for an hour straight, or do I have to leave again? Um, he's not wrong. He's just, like, presenting things weird right now. So on and so forth. Generally speaking, this linear progression of weapons and armor is rather simplistic. But frankly, the system still holds up surprisingly well. It's like he's holding back a laugh when he says that. Like, the system is simplistic, and it's really stupid, and I fucking hate it. But it really holds up well. Like, that's... Again, you understand why, like, this is such a weird thesis statement to chase, like, does it hold up? Yeah, I guess you can load up Skyrim and play it in 2022. Wow, how fucking... how revolutionary. Wrath of the Lich King ruined MMOs. Yeah, I've been thinking about that topic. Like, okay, what was the part of World of Warcraft that ruined MMOs? And I want to say that everything started with Wrath. I mean, everything started with the base game. It all builds on each other, right? But I really want to say, like, Wrath of the Lich King is what informed the change in design direction uh, for the game. Armor is rather simplistic, but frankly, the system still holds up surprisingly well. Just get a second take. If you ever do that, like... I don't know. You have to listen to what you're saying, and if you say something weird, just get a second take. Like, even if you aren't sure, like, it might have been a good take, it might have been a bad take, it would not have been the end of the world for you to spend three seconds just saying the line over again. Just so that down the road when you're editing the video, you have the option, like, oh yeah, I could definitely use that second take. Like, I do redundant takes all the time that I end up not using, just because. 
It's like he makes aggressive and overblown statements, then walks it back way too far. Yeah, I mean, it's like your your wife is a fat whore and should probably die. Uh, but she seems like a nice lady. <laughs> Compare Skyrim's weapon and armor scaling system to other games of the year that have come out since then, like Witcher 3 or IGN's 2018 game of the year. Why this metric? Why this metric? Oh, it's their games of the year. Like, Game of the Year is such a meaningless title. Like, why would you use that as your metric of comparison? Here, Monster Hunter World. These all have weapon and armor systems that have linear tiers to them. Higher tier means the weapons and armor... It would be nice to see them. Like, even just a picture of a Wikipedia... Uh, not a Wikipedia, but like a fandom article explaining the progression system... Would be nice to see compared to you in a chest looting a Daedric sword. Like, please. I want to see the Witcher 3 progression system. I don't remember it off the top of my head. It would be nice to get refreshed on what that is and why it's better and or worse than Skyrim's or doesn't hold up or whatever he's saying. These all have weapon and armor systems that have linear tiers to them. Higher tier means the weapons and armor are better, period. So while this aspect of Skyrim does indeed hold up by today's standards... Oh man, we got one. We got one. And uh, I've got news for you guys, actually. Hang on, hang on. This is going to be a deep cut. You better brace yourself. Hello. Hello. Let's see. Where's he at? I want to know exactly hmm. so um to clarify what's going on here um There's no way. There's got to be another part where... So, like, I swear... Give me a second. God, that was gross. Okay. Um... I swear. This has got to be Mr. Caption footage. Okay? And here's why. I distinctly remember Mr. Caption having a ridiculous amount of iron ingots and iron strips that were the same. I remember him being level 38. I remember him grinding this specific anvil. I remember it being night. I will find this clip. I'm looking in the wrong video. Like, I'm not crazy. Someone who was here for the Mr. Caption video, like, that specific clip has to be that. Like, it's not the biggest stretch to say it's a coincidence. Like, um, 
you know it's the anvil and white run I can I can say I have footage of me crafting stuff there and it's gonna look similar because it's got a fixed camera perspective so it's not impossible but Acer Thorn has been shown to like use footage before not the biggest deal but like is this it Patrick and enchanted armor smithing all of this aside it must be a coincidence then. If I had a nickel for uh, every time it happened, I'd have 10 cents, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Indigo says, I believe you, you have a keen eye for detail on questionable footage. It is kind of weird that that's my super, my superpower is that like, I can, <laughs> I can like instantly tell when something's wrong with gameplay footage. Cause yeah, I've told the story on stream before of like, whoops. Hello, one and all. Fuck. How we figured out, um. This guy is like streaming Skyrim until he crashes. Um, I can. Damn it, it went off screen. I've completely like derailed and lost my train of thought. I also accidentally closed. I accidentally closed the browser, so. What the fuck? Too bad we lost a lot of interesting Tez creators, Sammy Online, Mr. Caption, etc. Well, it's hard to keep Tez creators around when there's so little fucking content for them to talk about. Like, eventually you're going to run out of things. Yeah, that save game issue on my footage was wild. Had no idea I was playing an artificially nerfed character. Yeah, so to explain, um, Indigo uh, started a new character... But he used the save that skip. He uses the 001 save that skips the cart ride. That every. If you've played Skyrim before, you have that save. Um, but he. That save had been generated on a modded playthrough. And it was actually like. So the skill values were all changed by a, a like leveling mod that like adds classes to the game. So like completely by accident without even knowing that he was doing it like he was using modded footage despite like trying to intentionally go out of his way to not do that so it was pretty it was uh it was pretty interesting f figuring out why that had happened who's sammy online um he was the guy that made the elder scrolls is dumbing down video means the weapons and what's your least favorite skyrim quest oh god um on the metric of it being stupid i can handily say the the contract where you kill lurbrook the bard uh because there's some really stupid details about it um in terms of gameplay there's such a wide variety of options you can choose i don't think there's a quest that's really like tedious though in Skyrim at least compared to like World of Warcraft <laughs> are a better period so while this aspect of Skyrim does indeed hold up by today's standards here's something you probably didn't expect me to say do the RPGs of the 2010s even hold up by 1990s standards okay so there's like a key part of the sentence that you're not pronouncing and now, I'm not going to say Blood on the Ice is my least favorite quest. I actually like that quest. Does indeed hold up by today's... Oh, hey. I'm getting, like, recommended random Skyrim live streams. Jiggle peeking in my ear. Come join up with the gang. We're doing a live stream heck? playing Skyrim. Oh, that didn't hit him. Who the heck is this guy? Where is he at? Is this... All right, well, we dealt with him. No, I don't know where this is. Look at, look at this guy. Get the, get the bag on. 
Get the teabag done. Oh, fat cringe. Why are you streaming on Pleb TV anyway? I remember you mentioned you're gonna do it, but not the why. Um, it's the it's the issue of unscheduled streams, basically. I think that streaming on the main channel only works. Crimson Nernrit can be tedious. Yeah, I guess Crimson Nernrit would be up there. Um, if, if it's scheduled, I don't have an issue with streaming on the main channel, but it's like, um, I decided to stream and 10 minutes later it was live, and I've been doing that for the last couple times, and um, I think it's one thing if there's like, if I can tell people like, hey, there's going to be a bunch of streams in November. It's another thing if like, you just keep getting notifications standards, here's something you probably didn't expect me to say. Do the RPGs of the 2010s even hold up? Okay, so he said, do the RPGs of the 2010s. I wasn't sure what the words do the were. So, like, the sentence could go a thousand different ways based on what those words were. And I had to listen to it a second time to know and so, like, there's a lot of things like that in this video where, um, and I think that's one of the reasons, like, this isn't a particularly popular video, despite this being on the better side of Skyrim videos, is because it's an inconvenient viewing experience to have to, like, go back to the start of a sentence to figure out what you're saying. Will you keep the streams up here or delete them, like, on the main channel? Um, so, a uh, funny thing about that... is those streams aren't deleted. Now I want to go to the actual playlist page. Yeah, all those streams are, you can just like go watch them. But yeah, they'll be left, they'll be left actually public on this channel because it's not an issue over here. by 1990s standards to show you what okay so do the rpgs of the 2010s hold up to 1990s standards of rpgs that's a weird question um also this transition's messed up like it's like the um like the the title cards for the transitions also i didn't point out okay so we're at 12302 i was gonna ask what's the background of this like is this a leaf a fucking leaf there you go i said the words another quest i hate is the lights out quest there's no option to turn in those criminals even if you're an imperial legionary because they're marked as essential yeah i hadn't thought about that that is a good point but that quest is not particularly tedious in my opinion like if we're talking about like if we're talking about a quest being stupid or poorly thought out, I think the Lurba quest is dumb. Um, but if we're talking about like the mechanics of a quest, then uh, I think someone else had a point. Like Crimson Nernrut is a good uh, example. Let's take a look at the game that I grew up with, the first video game I ever owned, and the game that made me an RPG nerd and a gaming nerd in the first place. All right, we're getting a deep cut here. This is going to be some. There's, this is some lore. Alrighty. Let's find out. What is the game that is responsible um, for this video being made and for the Fallout New Vegas video being made? And who is the person that I can sue for making that video? Skyrim is the 90s or the 10s. Uh, the 90s are the Dark Souls of decades. <laughs> the Super Nintendo cult classic Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. How do I... How do I respond? Um, okay. 
weird flex, but sure. I've, I've literally never heard of this game. Let's uh, hear him out. In that game, despite having an incredibly simplistic battle system by today's standards, the way you equipped your character actually required a bit of planning and foresight. Each character could only wear one piece of armor and one accessory at a time. While the armor you could get was certainly a linear progression, the accessory slot provided a lot more strategy than we see in many modern day RPGs. There were six status ailments you could get in the game. Scarecrow, Poison, Silence, Sleep, Mushroom, and Fear. Each had different effects, but there were accessories you could buy that made you immune to the various status ailments. However, because... Status elements. What? <laughs> I just want him to get to the part where he says, like, this is what, uh, it does, like, Skyrim doesn't hold up to the standards of 90s RPGs, because in this Mario game, there were accessories that gave you immunity to status effects. It's like, yeah, they're also in Skyrim. It's called Poison Resistance. <laughs> like, like, I get it, but it's like, at one point, he had the nuance to say, like, oh, it's a different style of game. But at another point, now he's making the case that, like, because... Of this Mario RPG from the 90s, like modern RPGs are just terrible or something. I assume that's the direction he's going in. Like, does he ever quantify what today's standards are? I assume he has to do it, like in the part we watched. I don't remember him doing it, but maybe I just like blocked it from my memory. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, just, oh, we were at normal speed. We can turn this up. Because you could only equip one accessory at a time, you had to strategize about which accessories to wear in various dungeons. You want to know the reason that systems like that aren't very popular? It's because it incentivizes you figuring out like what dungeons do what in advance. And so it's like it just encourages metagaming in a way that isn't really fun because it's like, damn, okay, I, like I think a good example that's applicable is like speech equipment in Fallout, where like you need you, like you have a piece of equipment that gives you charisma gear and it's like oh man i really needed my charisma equipment for this conversation and you have to like reload and equip the charisma conversation that's why systems like that kind of got phased out of popularity basically Compare that to modern RPGs, where by the late game, you're pimped out in so much enchanted armor and clothes that you're effectively invulnerable to everything all round. One set of armor for dungeon delving, and one set of clothes for crafting and selling around the city. That's- I mean, he did clarify it was the first video game he played, so I assume, like, the first video game he played isn't gonna be, like, Fallout 1. That's not really something that can hold a kid's attention. Um, my first game was uh, Doom 2. Uh, but, I mean, that's a game that I can understand kids being interested in. Disco Elysium is an even bigger example with their put on this hat to have a plus one to logic. Yeah, that's the kind of shit I don't like in RPGs is like... Oh man, I gotta reload a save so that I can fucking have the right equipment on because I have a I'm carry I'm burdened carrying around this item that specifically serves a purpose that I need to like predict or or like hotkey so I put it on before every conversation. I just think I am not the biggest fan of that. But yeah, it's like you know, there's there's poison and like elemental stuff and so it's like oh you're going into a falmer cave you might want your poison resist gear now that's not really a practical thing that happens in skyrim but still like and even then he's opened it up to he's not comparing skyrim to mario rpg he's comparing rpgs of the 2010s which is a pretty monolithic thing to make the comparison to to this game Yeah, I have the clip of Medicare mentioning my Morrowind video. 
that was where I uh, this picture comes from. I mean, we could say uh, Dark Souls is an example of that still being the case. Like, there's literally rings that exist to make it easier to navigate, like, swamp areas and stuff. It's quite literally it. In fact, not only do RPGs of the 2010s not hold up by the standards of the RPGs in the mid-90s, Skyrim doesn't even hold up against older games in its own franchise. Specifically, I'm referring to Daggerfall. During character creation in that game, you have the option of giving your character various advantages. However, the game's difficulty slider would actually go up, making the game more difficult to balance out your OP advantages. You can't adjust the difficulty slider manually like you could in Morrowind or Oblivion, and once you created your character, you are locked into that difficulty for the duration of the playthrough. You can bring the difficulty back down during character creation, but only by giving your character additional disadvantages to balance out the advantages. And it wasn't like it was a totally gameable system. <laughs> Like, let's, let's be completely honest. If you decide to play a certain way, which games like Daggerfall encourage you to play a very specific way for each character, there are ways to easily game this system. Like, I don't know if this is the deep cut you want to make to back up your point. And it's a weird thing. It's like, okay, so you're establishing that the standards of the 90s is not, the 90s is like basically Pokémon in all honesty. Like <laughs> I'm corporeal. Oh no, I'm a ghost again. Where are my where are my Daggerfall content creators? Is it just a coincidence that DW Terminator sounds like Acer Thorn? Is the peace treaty that ended that war. It did a number of things. One, it disbanded the blades. Hmm. I'm not convinced. This is like that. Oh yeah, you sound like um what was the there was like a ridiculous one where like somebody was saying I sounded like somebody who had like a very heavy accent. It wasn't difficulty, it was experience needed per level, not the same thing. Yeah, and isn't difficulty like game speed in Daggerfall? So it's like you can turn up and down the game speed and it makes the game it's supposed to make the game easier or harder. Pat, you know your first game? Yeah, I said it I said it earlier. Doom 2. Or are we not watching DW Terminator? No, this is totally DW Terminator. It he it is true. We he does sound like Acer Thorn. Um, but it's not Acer Thorn. Not Acer Thorn. This is a Photoshop. So like this is uh, is it's actually pretty interesting how I have this set up in OBS so I can scroll down. This is the web page. This is just an image. Um it took a lot of work to set this up. This feeling that RPG protagonists deserve to be this omnipotent demigod who can't be Okay, where does this footage come from? Who the fuck is playing Sky I don't even think Will was playing Skyrim in Ultra Wide. Where is Will at? I know he's in the recommendations on this page. Let's see. It's gotta be it's somewhere in like the first hour. There's a big tangent about Skyrim somewhere around here. Yeah, okay. Is Will playing in Ultra Wide? He is. But he plays he they're critical but that's not ultra wide
Will is okay. Like seriously, Will is the only person. You mildly sound like a friendlier mediker with a decent mic. Uh, I have a I have a thing I can compare my voice to mediker. Um. But yeah, Will is like the only person I know that plays, that does this with an ultra wide monitor. Fair, but uh, yeah, it's definitely going to be quite, quite lengthy. Well, per so this is Medicare's voice. Actually, I love documentaries like this, um, and, and I think a lot of people like long form videos. So hmm. uh, don't don't try to constrain yourself too much. I mean, I I'd sit there and watch it for seven hours. Yeah, you know, like I watch oh, yeah. those fucking. Uh, uh, video game analysis videos where people spend eight hours talking about Morrowind. So, if that can <laughs> if that can hook me, watching Mersh. So maybe I sound like him. He is a northerner, but he he sounds like I think he's from like the northern Midwest, like Wisconsin area or something like that. Like he's not from Milwaukee. You sound better than Medicare. Um, yeah, that's because. Medica records in like a blue Yeti or something. That's just part of the aesthetic. Because he's going for that like old internet vibe. How do you speak without moving your mouth? Uh, you talk out the corner of your mouth. Well, there are some people who don't know vocal comparisons. Like, I think someone said earlier that the comparison that was made was like Civi 11. Like, you sound like Civi 11. Faster. You won't see too much of it because of the general lack of ammo lying around. Yeah, I definitely sound like like Civi Eleven. He does have a little bit of a deeper voice. Probably the smoking. Uh, smoking gives your voice more texture. It doesn't make your voice deeper. Like that was one of the pieces of advice voice actors give: is like just smoke, smoke a lot, and you'll have a good voice for voice acting. Be harmed is, in my opinion, total bollocks. It's called game balance. This is game design 101. Care oh god, he's one of these. I like what people. There are some people out there who are really bothered when I say, "Oh god, he's one of these." But yeah, it, it really is what the case. Like, he is one of these. You know what I mean? Game balance is game design 101 why 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 does somebody who uses a sword have to be as powerful as somebody who uses magic what's the logic of that why is that game design 101 it's game design 101 in a multiplayer setting where you want players to have fair advantages with each other because you don't want everybody you know playing the one overpowered build right so you don't want overpowered characters in World of Warcraft. But in a single player game, why would it matter that mages are inherently more powerful than warriors? And hell, why would it matter? Like, how is it an issue of game balance that by the end of a Skyrim playthrough, you're very powerful? Does, Sky Does Daggerfall have better game balance than Skyrim? Um, no. No. <laughs> I would say it doesn't. But yeah, I, I've never been convinced about the game balance argument. I, I've always thought it was just a stupid thing to say. Well, it's imbalanced. Well, I'm sorry that the single player game is imbalanced. Because Elder Scrolls is magically a multiplayer game. What's funny is Morrowind is a decently balanced multiplayer game for something that was never designed to have it. You don't want to have a game be super easy or super hard. Um, that's what the difficulty slider's for. <laughs> Mages should be more powerful but weaker. I think mages, but mages by the end of a playthrough should be more powerful than warriors or archers. Um, but I also advocate, I've said before, like at the end of a playthrough, melee characters should be able to just vaporize 
uh like low level enemies like generic bandits if you over if you do enough damage to do overkill it should like just destroy their limbs right and then archers like high level archers should be so powerful that like they pin low level enemies to objects like i think they went the wrong direction where instead of making melee and archers more powerful they just made magic weaker Lay down your keyboard. It is not too late for my 10 out of 10. There are some extremely broken builds in Daggerfall, both good and bad. Very unbalanced, but I like that you can make meaningful choices in your character design. Very difficult to break Skyrim characters. I wouldn't say it's very difficult. There's some, there's some things you can do. Well, yeah, so that was my complaint is... Um, there's a point in combat where mages just can't do anything anymore. But if a ma if a warrior runs out of stamina in Skyrim, that doesn't stop them from being able to do attacks or anything like that. So you're talking about balance, but um, like there's no balance in the way the systems work, which I don't think there should be homogeneity in the way that the combat systems are designed. Like, I've run into that issue in World of Warcraft. They have homogenized the classes so bad that, like, every class has counterspell now. They have, every class literally has some variation of counterspell that does exactly the same thing for exactly the same duration. So it's like nobody's special at being able to turn, like, to stop wizards from casting. That's just, like, everybody can do that now. In-game warriors should be able to rush down mages before they use their magic. Um, well, I mean, we're not talking about a balance from warriors and mages fighting each other. We're talking about, like, the relative differences in their power levels between characters. ...have limitations placed on them, otherwise the game would provide no challenge. That's why god mode has traditionally been considered a cheat code. But oh man, what a what a what an amazing cut. God mode is supposed to be a cheat code. Yeah, it's also supposed to be what you achieve at the end of a playthrough. At least in Elder Scrolls. Elder Scrolls has always been about accruing power until you become like really powerful. Like what fun would Skyrim be if you just sucked the entire time? Oh, there's games that do that and they can be fun. But Skyrim particularly is going for the fantasy of you start small and end big. And I don't think you can make the case that it doesn't do that. But comparing Skyrim only to the games that have come out since then, do Skyrim's weapons and armor hold up? Yes. Yes, they do. Sadly. But what about the artifacts? I like the... It's just like really weird um again it's like the central thesis statement is like a brick chained to his ankle it's just like drowning him at the bottom of lake Illinalta. like fucking i feel like this is the no i guess he would i guess he has been comparing it to like the witcher 3 i don't know i don't think you're in a position to make comparisons to other games when you don't really seem that versed in the variety of role-playing games like, you don't really talk about Dark Souls. You don't talk about Dragon's Dogma. Um, you don't even talk about, like, obscure niche stuff that RPG fans would know about. And I'm not going to say that I'm particularly knowledgeable either. But, like, look at Civi 11, right? I think he's a great example. Civi 11 knows an absurd amount of stuff about boomer shooters. I think if he were to make a video about, like, um, does Doom 3 hold up in 2022... He could absolutely do it because he knows everything there is to know about like first person shooters. But you don't seem like he doesn't seem knowledgeable enough about the subject. Like, I'm sorry, The Witcher 3 and what Monster Hunter World, those aren't adequate points of comparison. And I guess Kingdom Come Deliverance. And collectibles in Skyrim that aren't weapons on armor. Honestly, Skyrim has some of the most unique and interesting non-weapons or armor artifacts. I didn't know this was the case. The, uh, this is pretty, actually pretty cool. 
the B in the jar is staying upright no matter which way he rotates the jar. In any game I have ever played. There aren't as many unique artifacts in Skyrim as other RPGs, but this is certainly a case of quality over quantity. An unbreakable lockpick. You're really going to make the case that Skyrim has quality... I, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to the part where you explain how the Mace of Moloch Ball is a good melee weapon. It doesn't get rolled by shit in the mid-game. You have to see his Dark Souls video. I know it exists. I can spoil you and give you a short clip. We can we can do the old stink test of jumping to a random point. Dark Souls retrospective. Dark Soul The the title's great. Uh Dark Souls sucks and here's why. Hang on. Uh Idris, can you pull up the cringe compilation? And then I need videos. Now, before before we do anything like this, file type, I need to... Um, I finally did. Yes, this is it. Um, you're not going to see the video, but to be honest, you're not really missing anything with the video. Um, I finally decided to go ahead and... God, what, w what was I going to say? I'm not good at, like, multi-tracking my brain today. I guess your, your brain's not meant to be multi-tracked. But, listen. This is great. He's copying the H-Bomber guy format with the titles. Uh, yeah. Okay. I finally decided to go ahead and make a video of all the idiots that continue trying to argue with me about the specific aspect of Dark Souls. Everybody is too busy trying to force their opinions into this and on me, as well as saying stupid-ass comments like, My six-year-old cousin can figure this out. You must be dumb, or you're right. I finally uh, decided fuck. to go ahead and make a video. Can I just see it in the Explorer? Trying to argue with me about the specific aspect of Dark Souls. I finally decided to go ahead and make I'm, a video. I do, I do apologize for jumping back and forth. I am getting it in a format where I can better control it. All the idiots that continue trying to argue with me about the specific aspect anything, instead of actually focusing on what the fuck is really being talked about. So, I am going to use this video to apply nothing but what the game says. There's going to be no opinions used, no nothing. Straight what the game says to do, and only that. I'm also going to take all the comments that people say about what this game says to do, and actually pull up what the game says to do, and compare it, and see if what the game says is the same as what people say the game says. So. To start this, I'm going to tell you I've already picked the shield up off of this corpse from around the corner. Now, people, take in one of the comments that people say. Every single person has said to me, this game explains to you how to equip an item. So that's the first thing we're going to focus on. We're not going to have any opinions. This is what the fucking game says. So, people say that the game says the, explains to you how to equip an item. So, I'm going to first read this message. Okay, does this message say anything about how to equip an item? No. It says, we're, it just says, start opens is, will open the menu, and the arms icon is the change equipment screen. So I don't know where, how the fuck people are saying the game explains stuff to you and applying it to this. They're adding information that doesn't exist. Now, I'm going to go to the start menu and go to the arms icon. But before I open it, I'm going to explain it to you. Any game in existence you play ever has three steps in order to equip something. And the steps are always done in the same order. First, you open the screen. Secondly, you find the item on the screen and you highlight it. Third, once the item has been found and highlighted, you press the equip item button. Alright, so that's enough of that. Um, I, I saw the thumbnail of the Fallout New Vegas retrospective. Oh man, this has got to be juicy. This is Acer Thorn's problem. Is each uh, it's like it builds. He doesn't forgive is the issue, right? 
So it's like all of the shit that got on him from the Skyrim videos, probably in the New Vegas video, all of the shit that is in the New Vegas videos, probably in the Dark Souls video, um, it just keeps building and building until it's like this, um, th just this massive manifestation of salt that like, uh, yeah, so let's get a little vertical slice of this Dark Souls video. Oh, why is it just saying your name? So I tried to work around this. I booted up the game and attempted to record some footage of me flailing around in front of the door, just like when I played the game for the first time. However, the button prompts still appeared on screen just like they were supposed to. So sadly, I do not have any visual proof that this exact problem actually happened. Of course, you don't just have to take my word for it. There is still some circumstantial evidence of this bug. If you go and watch episode- I, I feel like there's some necessary context we're missing with that. Happened. It's what sets the stage for the current narrative, and explains how the world and the characters Jesus got Christ. to the points they are currently at. It isn't a story, because there's no storytelling taking place. Backstories do not have any characters going on any journeys. No characters are seen struggling to achieve any goals, nor do they grow as characters in a backstory, and there certainly is no resolution. That's an exceptionally dogmatic opinion to have about storytelling. Did you see that Acer Thorn had a gig selling YouTube thumbnail design? Oh. Wow. I mean, hustle if, hustle. Hey, if you boys! Can, but. Part of claiming that you have a winning thumbnail design is having, like, videos with views. So, yeah. Uh, he's about to explain why Skyrim's so cool. I guess. Skyrim as other RPGs. H Bomber guy makes some of the dumbest videos. Yeah, we saw his Skyrim like April Fools video, but like, I don't, there's a lack of self awareness in the video. It, it's a joke. Um, it's one of the few occasions where like, um, he was saying a bunch of stupid shit, and in the uh, beginning, it was like actually a joke, but it's like. Immediately, uh, they, they paid to have Patrick Stewart in, and they just killed him. I mean, why would they even do that? It was incredibly stupid. Uh, but then, everyone lost their shit for Skyrim. Skyrim from the creators of the award-winning. So yeah, like he's doing a bit, but it's like it's not really that different from his normal content. So it's like, you know, when you do an April Fool's bit, it's supposed to be like, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do the Mauler thing of let's do some commentary. On a, uh, on a type of video, it shouldn't be, like, basically indistinguishable from your normal content. That was my issue with the video. But this is certainly a case of quality over quantity. An unbreakable lockpick, a reusable soul gem, a self-refilling bottle. These are rewards that keep on giving. Wow. Three whole rewards. I can't think of any other RPG that provides such great rewards that aren't related to weapons or armor. I mean, I guess you have a point, but I also can't think of a lot of RPGs that have also, like, also have, like, the mechanical depth that could benefit from such items. I mean, he's right in the sense of, like, I don't know. It's one of those things, like, it is literally one of those things, like, fucking the unbreakable lockpick. What, are you serious? Lockpicking minigame is not difficult. You can get, un like, the skeleton key is nice, but it's hard, it's a shadow of its former self. Azura's star is nice, but, like, I don't know, like, uh, like, Azura's star is really the only thing on that list that's good, and then, like, the self-refilling bottle is a fucking meme. All of the options you get for that quest are dumb. It should have been an object, like, you can make a potion inside it and then it refills with that custom potion would that have been exploitable yes absolutely that that's the nature of it but anyways like as far as other role-playing games don't have items of such what would you say that is like such interest such intrigue 
Yeah, I had the white file and I never used it. That's like a universal to like all of my Skyrim playthroughs is I get the white file and I don't use it. Granted, there are some RPGs from this decade I have yet to play. You don't have to clarify that. We can just assume that you haven't played every role-playing game out there. I, I, however, I can also assume, based on like some of the stuff you said, that you haven't really played that many RPGs. Why are video game exploits seen as a bad thing? If you have to work for it, then it should be fine. As much as I like it, it is a problem that you can duplicate items in Dark Souls, because it's very exploitable even though I like doing it. But I also checked out the wikis and other guides as well. I wasn't able to find any information on games like Witcher 3 offering artifacts as rewards that aren't either weapons and armor or means to that end, such as crafting material. Yeah, probably because they think that it would slow down the Witcher 3 to have shit like that. I mean, I know that Cyberpunk came out long after this video, but I think Cyberpunk... Let me, let me think about stuff that's in Cyberpunk. There's stuff you can get that, like, kind of changes some mechanics with, like, uh, the cyberware and stuff. I don't know. This feels like a really arbitrary thing. It's like, okay, how many items in your Mario RPG game were like that? Skyrim's artifacts, however, are not a means to an end, but ends to themselves. I guess that's literally true, in the sense of, yeah, you get the white file at the end and then never do anything with it. <laughs> like, I made millions in Daggerfall by breaking into the shops after dark and stealing an infinite number of horses and carriages. It took me ten minutes to sell it all. Getting the skeleton key is itself something that people join the Thieves Guild exclusively for. Really? What people? I've never heard that. I've never heard that. I'm not an Elder Scrolls channel, but I'm just saying I'm surrounded by people who play Elder Scrolls games. I have literally never heard of anybody joining the Thieves Guild. Like, this is the first I'm hearing of this, that people join the Thieves Guild for the Skeleton Key. One, how would you know? How would you know? How would you know that you get the Skeleton Key from doing the Thieves Guild unless you were metagaming? Ah, yes, Brynjolf. I would like to join your organization, for you see, I seek out the Skeleton Key. Never used the Skeleton Key? I would imagine most people... Most people probably just, uh... Give it to Nocturnal, just to finish the quest line. I missed the first hour of the video. What's this guy's point? Is he criticizing or praising the game? He is asking the question, does the game still hold up in 2019, not 2022? Um... Why? I had like 99 picks halfway through the Thieves Guild quest. Like, yeah, literally the only reason you would want the Skeleton Key is because it makes the game slightly faster because it doesn't reset the position when the key breaks. Because the Skeleton Key doesn't break. So the game, the mini game is like slightly faster. But yeah, it's like the Skeleton Key doesn't solve the problem of you running out of lock picks because it's literally impossible. Like, there's just ra random generic NPCs that sell the skeleton or sell lock picks. And by the way, can I just say that it is not a defense of oblivion to say that Shady Sam sells lock picks so you don't have to join the Thieves Guild to get access to lock picks. There is I I who the fuck finds Shady Sam? He's literally out in the middle of nowhere. There's no quests that take you out in that direction. It's like saying, "Oh, uh it yeah, it's like I debunked that shit in my fucking Morrowind video and I said that like Creeper and the Mudcrab Merchant weren't uh, adequate defenses to like the NPCs not having enough money to buy a lot of things in the game. Just because there's some NPCs who can doesn't like some vague NPC that sells lockpicks is not a defense of that. Anyways. 
I mean, I met a game Morrowind grabbing the Limeware platter every time, but once I got that one code patch they that replaced it, it just felt wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's up to you whether or not you want to get the extra 600 gold. Honestly, like that it's nice, but that 600 gold's not the biggest de not the biggest deal to not get. Who is Shady Sam? Shady Sam is an NPC who lives outside of the imperial city and sells like lockpicks and poison and i think skooma but he lives outside the city next to the wall on like the northwestern northwestern section but lockpicking in oblivion is super easy i ran out of lockpicks like that was an issue i had in my oblivion playthrough if you don't do the thieves guild or the dark brotherhood it's and you don't do like bandit dungeons, it's actually pretty easy to run out of lockpicks. People actively seek out the Shrine of Azura for the sole purpose of obtaining the Black Star. Why specify the Black Star? I'm sure somebody out there, I don't know who, but somebody out there probably picked the White Star. Again, it just, it still seems like a metagamey thing, like, oh, they're doing the quest specifically to get this item. That's, okay, weird flex. There's people who specifically do Oriole's bow quest in Morrowind to get that item. But I get, like, I guess that's a, like a weapon upgrade, but it's like, I don't know. I feel like there's more to it than simply saying, oh, well, the items you get have bigger numbers, and that's a simple system. How the fuck do you remember, like, every NPC in every Tez game? Um, I had a brain that had a lot of potential and could have done a lot of useful things for humanity, but I decided to consign it to knowledge of Elder Scrolls games. So, do the quality of non-weapons and non-armor artifacts actually hold up by modern standards? Without hesitation, I can absolutely say that yes, they absolutely do. Again, this is... The issue that I'm having with his thesis statement, which it feels like it's just randomly come up that, like, now he's structuring things around it. It's like, at some point around here, he figured, like, he figured out what he wanted the title of the video to be. And so he started writing about, like, oh, does it still hold up? And, like, why would that... I don't know. YouTubers have weird metrics. It's like the old salt factory thing. Of... Oh no! Wait, he self. So this this breaks the norm. Sorry, let me just scroll down here. Was Oblivion as good as I remember? My analysis after an eight-year hiatus, and it's like this is the classic issue I've had with Salt Factory. Who the fuck are you? Why would I know how good you remember this game being? Why would I care whether or not the game is actually as good as you remember? But this is like the core branding that he uses for his videos is like was fallout as good as i remember like there's got to be a point where salt factory says was this as good as i remember for a game that he like played for the first time for the channel like uh hang on was metal gear solid as good as i remember but caveat i've never played metal gear solid before hasn't he been extremely negative up to this point but now the game absolutely holds up He's been he's been a mixed bag, and I know that confuses some people in the chat, but that is something that you're allowed to do. This is something Acerthorn does a lot. He asks a rhetorical question and then concludes that the question was rhetorical. That's a I'm gonna say that's a mildly fair assessment. Does he say, was this as bad as I remember? That would be an interesting curveball. Um, I, I guess that would be an interesting curveball in the sense of like, oh, you typically expect this, but no, I doubt he does.
Okay, what the fuck is with the backgrounds of these slide transitions? This- the last one was a leaf. This one is like... a wooden table. Stealth in RPG- Okay, hold on, hold on. Editing thing here. Stop the music. Stop the music. Okay. You need a transition on that audio entrance. You can't just hard cut some music in here. I mean, you can if that if it's for a hard cut joke, but this is just like the start of the part, so... You gotta help me transition here. You've done some violent things to my brain, and you gotta help me through the process of recovering. I'm kind of shocked Acerthorn isn't here causing a ruckus. That's because he doesn't know about it. The only reason he knew about the last stream was because it was scheduled. Opinion on Act Man. Um, I haven't really seen a whole lot of Act Man videos, to be completely honest. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think I've seen any Act Man videos. But there's something about the vibe he gives off. He is like pandering to the same era of nostalgia that I am, but he's like the general gist of like the takes he has has like struck me as him kind of being a pleb. Like I think he likes Bioshock. Stealth in RPGs is very difficult to get right. Because RPGs tend to place a lot more emphasis on character skill than on player skill, stealth does not normally mix well with that system. In the 20 knots, stealth in most RPGs... The 20 knots? Okay, I've never heard that one. I've heard the 20 aughts. Like, the aughts? I'm not sure why it's called that. But I have heard that before. I've never heard the 20 knots. Stealth does not normally mix well with that system. In the 20 knots, stealth in most RPGs was entirely RNG focused. You would activate stealth mode and take on a ghost like appearance. NPCs were then scripted to ignore your actions unless they passed a mental resistance check, which was entirely outside of your control. Oh, it was entirely outside of your control. It's not like you fucking built your character around that and then, like, Characters that were bad at stealth would fail, and characters that were good at stealth would succeed more often. Does, did he say stealth doesn't work in an RPG? Yeah, it's not like it's not like the. Uh, it's not like the thief class is like the, one of the most popular classes in D&D. I've heard the knots, but not the 20 knots. 20 knots sounds like uh uh steam on ahead 20 knots. You know, it sounds like a, a nautical term. That is not fun, and it's often frustrating when things don't go the player's way just because some RNG rather than their skill. Didn't you say early? Did, weren't you based earlier and said that like uh, radiant AI has a has a place in the industry? I don't know. He writes that line. He never. He's not a pleb. He's not a pleb in like the way Will was a pleb in that like I don't like this, so it's got to be cut. Stealth as a major gameplay mechanic was popularized by the Splinter Cell games of the 20 Knots. Okay, please stop. One, please stop saying the 20 Knots. Okay. Two, I don't think that's true. Maybe my timeline's messed up. Splinter Cell, please state. 
Yes, yeah, Splinter Cell came out in 2002. I think it came out after Morrowind. Okay, there were these games that came out before Splinter Cell, and I don't even think they were the first. Uh, they were called Thief. They were mildly popular. There was also, you know, Metal Gear Solid 1. That was a that was a little more popular than Thief, I guess. And I think it came out before Splinter Cell. But yeah, okay, I'm sure, yeah, Splinter Cell is where stealth came from. In those games, protagonist Sam Fisher had to stay out of the light, move slowly, avoid obstacles like broken glass that would make sounds when he stepped on them, and avoid using his gun. You dealt with enemies by sneaking up behind them and grabbing them from behind, and memorizing enemy movement patterns was critical to finding opportunities to sneak up behind them. You were highly encouraged to take out enemies one at a time, since you were normally- It's so weird hearing Skyrim music over Splinter Cell, it's like, kind of uncanny. ...ill-equipped to handle multiple foes. Maybe the furry community calls it 20 knots. Ah, yes, now I get... I mean, it's not applicable since it's a cat girl, but it's like, so it would be like 20 barbs, but like... Ah, yes, I can take on five guys. I can take 20 knots. <laughs> This guy, the guy had never heard of stealth games of 1998. Well, yeah, it's like RPGs did not exist until Mario RPG. I feel like that's the kind of thing he's saying. It's just, he did, he did say, he did say they weren't popular. But I feel like that's a really weird metric to say because, like, again... Yeah, Metal Gear Solid came out in 1998. It was mildly, it was mildly successful. If enemies traveled in groups and you were unable to find moments when they separated, you were instead encouraged to blank past them altogether. There was no shame in avoiding fights in those games because you didn't level up in those games. Your characters. Wait, is there shame in avoiding fights in other games? I didn't know that was shameful. I didn't know it was dishonorable. I can imagine now. Um, I can imagine now, like, a Klingon watching somebody play Skyrim, and they're like, they, like, avoid a fight with a Draugr, and it's like, You have no honor! Honorable men kill all of the Draugr in the dungeon. Your skill couldn't play a factor in your success, so player skill was the only thing that mattered. Sure, there were gadgets you could unlock that would make an easier time, but you still had to- Yes, we get it. Splinter Cell was not a role-playing game. What the fuck? Take things slow and pay attention. Starting with Oblivion, however, the Elder Scrolls series juggled the delicate balance between player and character skill almost effortlessly. Light levels and line of sight factor into the player's sneaking ability just as much as his sneak skill. The speed at which okay. he moves, combined with the weight of his clothes, factor in how much noise he makes. While the characters and enemies... I've never really heard anybody praise... Oblivion stealth compared to actual stealth games. What did he say? Avoiding fights is shameful? Yeah, I think he wouldn't like a speech build. Make Watching this makes me want to take a shower. Good luck, cat man. I'm not a man, I'm a girl. I'm a cat- I'm a tiger girl, not a cat girl. Cat girl has a sexual connotation, but I think tiger girl is like... dangerous enough to be undesirable. Like, Tiger Girl is not down for casual sex. Tiger Girl will fucking kill you. And bury your corpse to eat later. Also, does his... Is, does he... Okay. I got several questions. One. Do your hands have durability? What's up with that? Two. Why are you wearing these clothes while doing this mission? Did you literally not equip any items from, like, the starting area? Like, you're not escaping from a prison. This is the quest where... You steal the bust as part of the Thieves' Guild? So why are you wearing these clothes? Respective sneak skills are certainly a factor. I mean, if it wasn't, there would be no point in even having a sneak skill in the first place as a separate skill. Sneaking still feels- What's your point?
take things slow and pay attention. Hey, if you're in the chat and you think you gotta let him finish, that's what this is. That's why we went back in the video. To let him finish, uninterrupted. Starting with Oblivion, however, the Elder Scrolls series juggled the delicate balance between player and character skill almost effortlessly. Light levels and line of sight factor into the player's sneaking ability just as much as his sneak skill. The speed at which he moves, combined with the weight of his clothes, factor in how much noise he makes. While the characters and enemies' respective sneak skills are certainly a factor, I mean, if it wasn't, there would be no point in even having a sneak skill in the first place as a separate skill. Sneaking still feels... There's something I'm missing here. Characters and enemies' respective sneak skills are certainly a factor. I mean, if it... Okay. Sneak skills are a factor. I mean, if they weren't, what would be the point of having a sneak skill? Wow, that seems kind of circular to me. I hate calling things circular because I don't want to be wrong about that. But it's like... It definitely seems like... Like it's eating itself, you know? to at everyone again. Not getting his voice, not getting his point, let him finish. Blah, blah. Welcome back, Saman. Uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't watch anything without you. Why did you add again? I want to make sure everybody, everybody knows we're still alive. This is like a more normal, uh, time. Was it there would be no point in even having a sneak skill in the first place as a separate skill? Like, why does he occasionally enunciate a sentence like that? Maybe I it might be like he's running out of breath or something. Are we still giving out badass seals of approval? Is I don't know, is this a is this does this merit a badass seal of approval? It's mildly interesting video. Sneaking still feels much more in the player's control than in the hands of RNG. Because of. I think Zarek had pointed out, had kind of pointed this out, and that was when I kind of realized it. The block picking minigame is much more reliant on player skill than it is, um, like your lock picking skill. And it, it does kind of stand out to me that, like, as time has gone on, it's become more reliant on player skill over character skill uh, to the point that like I don't know there are like a lot of people who would see it as a detriment that like player skill is leaning is like um, factoring in so heavily into the play style horse cock horse cock horse no, I'm doing that because that guy said he hit the live button so I want I wanted him to come to the live with me saying like horse cock over and over this it feels infinitely more can you link this video in the description um just look it up it's very trust me it's, it's not hard to find this is not um I don't know it's it doesn't have a lot of views this is like an infamous video but uh, it's not a hard to find video like 
is not getting a lot of views because it's obscure kind of deal. 10 out of 10 exploding CPUs, badass seal of approval. It's true. If a bunch of people joined, I'll show them the clip. Nah. Someone clip you wait, you can clip a stream live. Ah yes. I can take on five guys. I can take twenty knots. <laughs> oh. I didn't know that you can clip streams live as they happen. That's kind of weird. It's so weird how he constantly uses footage from the same in-game places will be used to illustrate his points. Uh, it's a very, as he would say, minimal production value kind of way of doing it of, um, let's let a point, let's let a clip play for several minutes while I kind of just talk over it. Let's see. Like, I do this at this part, not have to deal with it. To me, durability should represent the prospect of potentially losing an item if it's broken. Like, I think this particular clip goes on for like 10 minutes, which is why this has like the most uh, ads on this, in the sidebar. I think it does. But yeah, like, um, it, it's a trick you can do. You don't want to, um, you don't want to like spend a bunch of time cutting different clips superfluously. But at the same time, I don't know, it really stands out when it's just like two minutes of just uncut footage that's mildly related to what he's talking about. Like it's stealth, so here's some here's some footage of me sneaking around a castle in oblivion. We'll also use the section where you steal the bust for his section on stealth. Um, you're right. And, um, fucking, I'm, like, it's standing up to me. There's a reason that happens. Where is the part on stealth? I heard it say it's probably somewhere around here. probably difficult to pull it up on the fly or like I think that's like the standout stealth that's like basically the only stealth mission in in Skyrim or in Oblivion so when people talk about the game's stealth I think that's what they show off because it's like it has a patrolling NPC and it has dark areas and it's like I don't know it feels disingenuous because it's like sure it's like this for you know this mission like these few actual stealth missions but the majority of the game's stealth is not like this satisfying to sneak up on or sneak past an enemy but this isn't an oblivion retrospective it's a Skyrim retrospective Okay, that's that's got to be a quote. This isn't an Oblivion retrospective. It's a Skyrim retrospective. That's like that will uh if you talk about the lore, the video will be twice as long clip. So what about Skyrim's stealth system? Honestly, I feel like, I don't know, you kind of, you self-defeat yourself in the sense of you poison the well and now people think, oh, well, the entire time you were talking about Oblivion's stealth system, you were basically wasting my time. That's one of the places where this game falls flat. The basic mechanics are still there from Oblivion, but Skyrim's execution falls short of the bar due to two fatal flaws. The f 
Okay. I'm excited. What about Poison the Bandit Leader? Yeah, I guess... That mission's really simple, though. Like, I think if you're trying to talk about stealth, if there's one mission you would remember, it's the Crypt mission in Oblivion. I get that, but he used the same exact forge for his Just Make Dagger section and somehow found the same exact chest to find a Daedric sword in as Will. No, we know that he's using Will's footage. Like, that that's not a mystery. Um, occasionally, like, when he doesn't want to find a specific point footage for a specific thing or get specific footage, um, he's not above using other people's stuff. Like, I think there's uh, an, in, a part of this video that's, like, Indigo... It's from Indigo's documentary. So, like, yeah, we know that's going on. I wonder if, like, anybody in the comments has talked about it. I bet he's got a really good reply to this. Title isn't misleading. I've updated the title to appease the almighty algorithm. That doesn't make it not misleading, but the arguments that I make in this video are still relevant in 2022 without needing to update the video itself. Um, no, dude. No. You know the anniversary edition came out, right? There's been a new edition of the game. There's all sorts of new, like, documentaries and stuff about Skyrim that came out for the, like, the 10-year deal. Um, there's, like, new role-playing games that are out, so it's, like, the modern standards that you're using to compare Skyrim, um, they don't hold up. Like, this video doesn't hold up in 2022 because there's new role-playing games. There's new stuff out there. Like, we mentioned Cyberpunk earlier. Um, don't you think that Cyberpunk 2077 now contributes to this conversation due to how it's stylistically similar to Bethesda's formula? The first phase of law is that there aren't enough opportunities to be stealthy. We'll play them. We were talking about this. I was worried he was going to say something like this. We were just talking about this. Um, Oblivion doesn't provide a lot of opportunities. Like uh, Skyrim offers as many opportunities and stealth missions to be stealthy as Oblivion does. So you can't really praise Oblivion and criticize Skyrim for that. He didn't have to specify the year. Oh, but he does. Because he needs the year and the title so that when people look up... Like, here's... When people are looking for a Skyrim retrospective... and he, here, Here's his logic, anyways. Here's the idea behind logic. Someone's going to look up Skyrim retrospective, and they're going to see... Oh, man. There's, like... Like, I've... Oh, I've seen all of these. Probably not. Oh man, he's number six. I've seen all these videos. I'm going to put 2022 in there so that, because it, it's currently 2022. So it's like, I want to watch a new video about this. And then it's like, oh, there we go. So that's what he's doing is he's basically like, he, he's, he can say it's not misleading. I got to disagree. And he's doing it specifically so that he ranks higher than other Skyrim retrospective videos. But it's like, do people who have released content more recently not have not deserve a chance to have their Skyrim retrospective at the top of analytics than your video? You know what I mean? Like it, it's disingenuous for everybody who is who has made a Skyrim video since for you to do stuff like that. The Thieves Guild questline, a questline that supposedly revolves around stealth, I can recall exactly a one moment when being sneaky actually came in handy. 
and that was right here at Golden Glow Estates. This mercenary was sitting at a table with his back to me. Clearly, Bethesda wanted me to sneak past him, which I did. Is That's gonna, honest. Is he going to say it? Sleep about it. Most of. Okay. Uh, here's why your example sucks. So I, I, in fairness, I can understand why you didn't know this because you don't have the advantages that I do of doing this, of having basically like a uh, stream chat to kind of help you out with this kind of stuff. You don't have to sneak for the Golden Glow job. Now that might sound off, but you can complete Golden Glow and you can complete it without failing the quest. There's no there's no penalty for just walking through the front gate of Golden Glow and murdering everybody there. Literally everybody. You can destroy that place as long as you don't burn more than three beehives. So your example of like where stealth is necessary is funny because it's not. Uh, let me think. I don't know if there's a quest in Skyrim where like you can... Well, I mean, we can assume there isn't. There's no quest in Skyrim where you fail because you didn't do it right. You didn't, you know, engage with the mechanics. Other opportunities to be stealthy are few and far between and are usually broken up by segments where you are simply forced to come into the light because there's no means of staying in the shadows. Sounds like a skill issue to me. You have to sneak for any of the Thieves Guild main quests. No, and you you can fail the first three Thieves Guild main quests. After that point, um, you can't fail any of them. And failure in that instance is just you don't get paid gold. Blood on the ice. I don't think you have to sneak for blood on the ice. You have to sneak if you want to get a specific outcome, I guess. I don't even know if that's true. The second fatal flaw is that it is too easy to obtain gear that completely bypasses the various factors I mentioned a moment ago that make stealth such an engaging experience. Muffle enchantments are ubiquitous in the game, which completely negate one of the biggest factors that makes stealth a player skill based rather than character skill based game mechanic. It's almost like, I mean, I agree that muffle is too common in Skyrim because it's a novice level illusion effect. So uh, literally anybody in the game can cast muffle. Um, however, this is working off of the assumption that Bethesda is going for a character skill based game. They might have accidentally done that with Oblivion. You don't technically fail Blood on the Ice, you can finish it later. Uh, we know somebody who did fail Blood on the Ice. What about using certain shouts required for the main quest? It's a stretch, but still. Well, we're talking specifically about stealth, so. Panic. Noise from movement. When you don't have to worry about making too much noise from your movement, stealth becomes graciously unbalanced. What's worse? Graciously unbalanced. He said egregiously, but it didn't really come out that way. I mean, it's true. Custom muffle enchantments always eliminate 100% of your movement noise regardless of your enchanting skill or the strength of a soul gem being used. I think muffle enchantments are a waste of an enchantment slot though. There are much better things you can put that you can enchant than muffle. And plus like the sneak perks do the exact same thing. Skyrim's the game where you can literally sneak on the fire in the Bannered Mare, and nobody will see you if you have a high, level, high, high enough level sneak skill. Who failed Blood on the Ice? Mr. Salt Factory. Uh, it's a rather infamous bit where he, like, framed the wrong person. And, like, the infamous part isn't that he did the quest wrong. It's that, like, how poorly he responded to people saying that he did the quest wrong. Still streaming, he said in broken up letters. Yeah. And it's only been five hours. I'm going to, I'm going to be streaming for a while. Now, maybe that was an oversight on Bethesda's part, but if it was, it's an oversight Bethesda still has not patched up all these years later. So if it wasn't intentional at first, it has become such.
I like that logic. If you don't patch something, that means it's intentionally there. So it's like... It's like making the assumption that... So... When you have when you train with a companion, um, you can tr you can go into their inventory and take the money back. Now we don't know if that was intentional, and it hasn't been patched. At least it's not been patched by an official patches. That doesn't mean you can make the assumption that oh well it is intentional by omission. It's like saying that, um, like. Bethesda was artistically invested in games for Windows Live for Fallout 3 because it wasn't fixed for years after the service was abandoned. I don't know. It just seems like a wild assumption. It's like noise from gear was not a big deal in stealth in Oblivion. It really wasn't. It's not like there. Uh, it's not like you walk on carpet and you make less noise or anything like that. Like it's an extremely extremely basic thing where basically you have heavy boots on they make more noise you have no boots on they make less noise that kind of deal in 2018 kingdom come deliverance was released and it has a much better stealth system than skyrim does okay i get why he's framing it like this because it's does it hold up to modern standards oh well here's this game from 2018 that did it way better okay so yeah i guess it doesn't hold up to modern standards you see what i mean like i don't know what's the point of answering the question does it hold up to modern standards i know we're going to get into like some existential stuff it's like that's like why do we do what we do but it feels like it's a very useless question to say does the game hold up It's like, wow, time has passed. Instead of just enchanting whatever boots you want with Muffle, you instead have to wear clothes that complement a stealthy lifestyle. Yeah, it's almost like there's not magic in that game. AKA those that have dark colors. Of course, this can be circumvented in the early game simply by not wearing any clothes at all and just becoming the naked bandit. But at least then, your movement noise isn't completely negated, which alone puts it above Skyrim's stealth system. If you're playing as a stealthy character... You're also probably playing a criminal character as well. Stealing, lock- Wow, big assumptions there. Are you saying that just because somebody is, um... Favored towards a stealthy persuasion, that that means that they are a criminal? Are you saying that certain races which have bonuses to sneak are more likely to be criminals than other races? How do you prove that you exist? Maybe we don't exist. Yeah, I saw I saw the Plagius thing. I wasn't going to comment on it unless somebody else did. I don't know. I shouldn't start asking questions about, like, why does your video exist? Why do we exist while watching a video? That That's kind of a sign that things aren't going well. Pickpocketing picking and pickpocketing are the primary actions you're going to be performing while you're on your stealthy crime sprees. Honestly. Hey, lockpicking isn't necessarily a, a skill set that's assigned to criminals, okay? There are people who legally lockpick in our society who do it as a service. Like if your keys get stuck inside your car or something like that, you know? Are you saying those people are criminals just because they have a criminal skill set? I'm not saying Khajiit have light fingers. I'm just saying Khajiit have coin. Or fuck! 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 Khajiit have wares if you have coin. Now, see, that doesn't work now. However, these mechanics don't hold up really well either. Stealing is, well, it just is. You in a sneak mode, you make sure you're not. Holy shit, he is getting philosophical. Stealing is.
Yes. Vertical slice. Novak, the guilty party isn't just leaving the evidence lying on his coffee table. He's keeping it locked away inside a safe, and he keeps the key to that safe on his person at all times. So at the very least, I will give this quest that much of a thumbs up. This came later. Why are you... Why are you saying it like that? What is anybody fighting for? Storyline seems a little dubious. Is it real or a metaphor? And I'm back from showering. What did I miss? Well, things started to get really existential mo recently because we're starting to ask questions like why we exist. What are we doing here? What are we doing with our lives? Are we... Are we wasting away in the winds of time? You know, you take some stuff. It's mechanically no different than looting in a dungeon, except that you have to make sure nobody has seen you before you do it. I mean, it's the same thing in Oblivion. What do you want? What's your point? Like, why is this a bad thing? What do you want from... The action of taking things should have a mini game, And the mini game is like... There's a hand, and it's going across the screen horizontally, and you have to guide it up and down through various obstacles on the screen until it gets to the item. And it takes about a minute to play the minigame, and you have to do it for every single time you pick up an item while in stealth mode. Why are we watching a VTuber? I mean, I don't know. Calling someone a VTuber is kind of like calling them a Redditor, you know? It's quite frankly a very simple mechanic, but in its defense... I Please say that word again. You see, you before you do it. It's quite frankly a very simple mechanic, but... Just do a second take. There's no way you said that and then went... Oh yeah, that's good. That's a good line. That's a good line read. I said that I said all of the words in that sentence correctly. Like if there's even a if there's even a a, a a morsel of doubt in your mind that you did a line wrong, it doesn't hurt to just say it again. I mean listen, listen, listen. I mispronounced a few things in the Morrowind video, and some of them weren't intentional i get it it happens but very typically there were words that it was understandable why you would say it wrong and it's understandable like how you would say it wrong you just said it weird mechanic mechanic i don't even know how he said it in its defense i can't think of another rpg that does this system much better what what do you want it's like saying the running system isn't complicated enough. <laughs> Nor can I even think of a hypothetical way it could be handled better. So it's And I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time! Seriously though, like... <laughs> I don't know. This feels like what I get accused of doing. I get accused of doing like a, I just write down a, a list and then check off the boxes as I uh, explain every single little thing in the game. Correct me if I'm wrong. I do not recall a moment in my video where I explained and broke down the concept of picking up items. I mean, to clarify, he's doing it from stealth, but still, it's like, I can't really think of a better way to handle the mechanic of picking up items. Wow, it's almost like it's just, it's so simple. It's so simple, in fact, you probably should not have mentioned it in the first place. Oh, it holds up because it's so simple. Well, why the fuck are you talking about it?
so at the very least I have to say it holds up. Well, these running mechanics, you, you press forward and you run. It's simple, so at least I have to say that it holds up. Yeah, thanks. Literally, how long does he talk about this? It's literally like 30 seconds on the concept of picking up items. These mechanics don't hold up really well either. Stealing is, well, it just is. It's like a non sequitur because he's talking about how like lock picking and stealth don't really hold up and it's just like okay here's 30 seconds on stealing you in a sneak mode you make sure you're not seen and you know you take some stuff it's mechanically no different than looting in a dungeon except that you have to make sure nobody has seen you before you do it it's quite frank it's to pad the length pat okay well i'm gonna let you i'm it, listen i'm all about constructive criticism i'm gonna let you in on a little secret okay i'm gonna let you in on a little secret and i'm gonna Put a video on screen that is completely, completely, oh wait, different thing. Ellis Mark, what's his name? Oh yeah, it's Ellis Mark. There's two Marks. Oh, this is gonna be. Okay, I'm putting a video on the screen and it has absolutely nothing, oh, gonna... nothing to do with what I'm saying, okay? The aesthetic of long videos is not that they're long, okay? I know. This five hour video already has like more views than either of my works. So, you know, it's one of those things, I guess. But listen, listen, listen. If you want to be successful on YouTube, um, the key to it is that it's not just that the video is long. It's that the video also has to be interesting. Okay. You lose people after the first 30 seconds, your video won't get recommended as much. You have to be a time vampire, right? So you've gone from making Skyrim videos to ragging on Skyrim videos. Cool, bruh. Do you... Do you know who I am? Are you familiar with me? Are you here by random recommendation? I haven't made a Skyrim video. I, I, we can look at my channel. You might be more of an expert than me on this subject. I'm going to look at my video catalog. Hmm. Hmm. No, I don't see any Skyrim videos in this catalog. So. But listen. Listen. I think it would serve Acerthorn better if he didn't pad his videos out. You don't have to include this stuff. Ranking every work stream ever. Well, I know which one's the worst. It's that second Bethesda podcast stream. That's definitely the worst. Let's see, what's the best? Uh, Salt Factory is probably up there. I would say the the Indigo and the Dumbing Down drama stream was was pretty good. Um, I would say G Man was pretty good, probably just from the brain blast of realizing that like that that was the peak. And it was all downhill from there. Th that video is 1.6 million. Oh, I thought my videos were still at 1.5. I don't know. I don't... I'm not sure why I'm getting comments all of a sudden. Oh, it's because I'm signed into my main account on my phone. Do I get notifications of comments that way? That's dumb. All right. But still, like that uh, LS Mark video or whatever has like 1.6 million views in a very, very short amount of time. Oh, wow. I guess I edged out. Yeah, like literally the Morrowind video is like at 2,000 views over 1.6 million. Like that might have happened today. Um, but I'm just saying, like, there's some people out there who, uh, are making long videos for the sake of making long videos. Who's the worst YouTuber? And don't be generic and say DSP. 
Well, um, you have to think about the metrics of what makes a YouTuber bad. Like, there's ethics and production quality and, um, sort of, like, their, their mentality and attitude towards, like, towards their fans, towards other content creators. Um, it's probably some, like, the worst YouTuber is probably somebody who came from, like, internet blood sports. Or, like, one of those, um, one of those channels that came from Comicsgate. Or maybe some, like, communist grifter. Th those guys are pretty bad, too. Uh, actually, there was a video I saw recently that pissed me off. It was this video. This video is brought to you by... Okay, so we start with, like, a really shitty sponsorship. I was trying to listen to this video because I was kind of curious because I've been getting, like, a shit ton of these guys' podcasts recommended to me. And then I see in my recommendations, because I'm getting lots of podcast recommendations, the rise and fall of the McElroy fandom. So I'm like, okay, this sounds like a really interesting topic that I would learn want to learn about. This video fucking sucks. And it was amazing to me because um, I actually like some of the videos this person's made. Like, they did a video about... What was it? The author of My Immortal... Although this isn't the video, I think. And it was a really good, it was a really good video and I liked it. And there's some other stuff that she's made. But yeah, that McElroy video is like really bad at ex actually explaining the situation. And it almost this feels like it's probably a topic that wouldn't take two hours to explain, but does because she's figured out the right way to kind of get, oh yeah, she kind of does look like Serana. Um, she's kind of figured out the way to, like, game the system to get people to watch her. You saw Hassan buying a $200,000 Porsche? Doesn't surprise me. Hassan, the brilliant thing about Hassan is that he can get away with, he can get away with it. He can buy as expensive a house as he wants. He can buy an, as expensive a car as he wants. He can probably buy a private plane, and as soon as he owns a private plane, the bar will move up to, like, a yacht or something, right? He can buy whatever he wants, and um, he would. His fans aren't going to question it. His fans aren't going to see the issue with like, you know, at, at the very least, like if I was in that situation, I would want to keep the grift going forever. And so what I would do is like, I would have I would have my super expensive house, but I would try to keep it on the DL, and then I would um. I would like have a second house that's in like a middle class suburb and I would kind of make it like look shitty. Like I would kind of like uh water damage the side paneling or what have you. Like I would make it look like a poor house, but it's not a poor house, right? So I would do that and then I would have a second car that sucked and all my pictures would be of like my shitty beater car that I never drive because I would be driving the Lambo, right? And I would have a private plane, but I would never mention it. I would I would pretend that I was, like, flying at an airline, right? You know what I mean? Like, if I was rich from tricking communist people into donating money to me because they think that I'm fighting for the working man, I would be keeping that shit on the DL so that it would last longer. Like, there's no way... But the thing... The sad part is... He doesn't seem to need to do that. He doesn't need the second house. He doesn't need the second car. He doesn't have to pretend that he's like a working class man, you know? He doesn't have to eat, like, I would be eating ramen on stream, and then as soon as the stream end, I would be going for, like, my dinner at the at the fancy restaurant, right? <laughs> I have to be really alienated from people because I have no idea why Hassan is popular. Um, I think that there are some people out there who are just kind of stupid. Well, that's the sad part, is that the rest of us have to try and trick people into thinking that we're real. <laughs> Frankly, very simple mechanic, but in its defense, I can't think of another RPG that does this system much better, nor can I even think of a hypothetical way it could be handled better. So at the very least, I have to say that it holds up. Pickpocketing is just boring. It's basically the same interface as taking stuff out of a container or looting a corpse. The only difference you're literally stealing all the clothes off of people and then saying that like the mechanic is boring it's like yeah it's a simple mechanic what do you want 
Do you want a mini game? Like, how many games can you play? Someone, someone pointed this out. Um, one of the interesting thing, things about Elder Scrolls is that, like, very typically, you'll most of the NPCs you see have clothes that you can take. Like that, and that's a very deliberate design thing at Bethesda. They talk about like how, um, oh, I see this guy and he has a cool sword. I want to kill him so I can have his cool sword. Like that's something that they've talked about at Bethesda as being a very intentional part of their design philosophy. Um, most games that have pickpocket systems, I'm thinking of like Dishonored, where you just get behind somebody and then you press a button and bam, whatever they have on their belt is now in your in your pocket. I think even Thief is like that, right? So it's like. Elder Scrolls is interesting in the sense of, like, there's not a lot of other games where NPCs actually have, like, items in your inventory that you can take. A light pickpocketing minigame might actually fix the problem, honestly. What's the problem? That it's boring? Um... I don't know. I don't think that's something that, like, is made better by... Like, you need more quests that incorporate pickpocketing, or you need more reasons to pickpocket. Like, something I didn't know is that NPCs don't replenish their jewelry when stolen. So it's like, you can run out of things to really steal in the game. Sort of like how you can run out of locks to pick that give you XP. There is less of a problem with Hassan's car because he doesn't make his money through exploitation of someone else's labor. I feel like that's an extremely arbitrary metric. I mean, being rich is an exploitation of labor in of itself with all the fancy things that you buy. Hassan would be more legit if he was, like, um, an employer. And he, like, said, I'm going to show the world what it means to be a good employer and other people can use me as a standard. But the thing is, and this is something I thought about the first time Hassan was kind of in conflict with our community. Um, Hassan is somebody who has no life experience. He went to school and he got out of school and he started being a streamer. Um, Hassan has never been in a situation where he's had to lead people. So I think his big fear is that he doesn't want, he doesn't want the optics of being a bad leader, which would invariably happen um, for probably the first while that he would have employees. So because of that, he's in a situation where it's like it's impossible for him to have employees because he's terrified of the notion that he would be a bad boss and being a bad boss would be bad optically. Well, yeah, as they say, there's a sucker born every minute is that whether you successfully acquire the item or not is dependent on your pickpocket skill and RNG. The only way to manipulate the pickpocket system in your favor is to quick save just before you enter the victim's inventory and loading the save if you fail. But that Are you going to mention that there's like pickpocket equipment? Or uh, one interesting... Th okay, so you can't go past 90% um, theft rate, which I think is dumb. But also, I think the fort fortified pickpocket potions don't actually do anything. I think he screws over his editor's mods and stuff, right? Really poor exemplar of his ideals. But yeah, again, that's the thing. If I was pitching socialist slash communist ideologies, I would try to be a really good boss. That would be one of the... And then I would have that on my belt. And any time I would have a debate with somebody, I could say, well, I'm an employer and I don't have to exploit my employees. I can give them extremely generous benefits and um, all that. But... Hassan's not a socialist. He's not a, a communist. He just doesn't believe in the things that he's advocating for. He's a capitalist. I think the amazing thing is like, who are these people that get banned from Hassan's chat for speaking up? And why do they stick around? Like at the first sign that I saw a streamer like banning people, like, okay, the notion of subscribing have, having a monetary component of i'm going to subscribe to this channel and this means i'm going to give them five dollars a month and then the idea that like the uh the streamer can just ban you from the chat a service that you're paying for basically 
He can just ban you from it because he doesn't like what you have to say. And sure, you can make the case like, um, it, if you donate money to me, that doesn't mean that you can just like go in my Discord and like say fucked up shit and be racist and what have you. But um, yeah, it's like, okay, how do you look at somebody doing that and say, I want to continue to give this person money. This person values the relationship that I have. Like five a five dollar subscription to Hassan is so inconsequential that he feels no apprehension about banning those people. And for some reason, none of his fans take that as a cue to cut their own subscriptions. Like that would be the first thing I would do if I saw somebody doing that and I was like monetarily uh supporting that person. That's not engaging. That's the equivalent of using save states to win at gambling minigames. That's not the equivalent of doing that. That is doing that. I agree that um, pickpocketing encourages save scumming a little too much. I think the issue is that the game doesn't create enough scenarios in which you can use pickpocketing. So there's not enough like early Thieves Guild quests where you have to pickpocket. There's nothing like uh, there's a gate and there's a guy who has a key to the gate. And if you're playing combat, you can kill the guy. But if you're playing stealth, you can steal the key to the gate, you know, like solve a problem that way. I'm thinking of like Jedi Knight levels where it's like... Um, if you find a locked door, there's an officer nearby who will have a key kind of deal. Pickpocketing needed a smooth difficulty curve so players of any skill level could at least engage with the mechanic. I don't know. What I found with pickpocketing in Skyrim is that it's exceptionally easy. It's like... Um, if you steal the money back from trainers, you can level up pickpocketing absurdly quickly. Because the amount of experience you get scales with the amount of money that you're stealing, or the value of the item that you're stealing. And training gives NPCs lots of, lots of value, so... Wait, you'll ban Noah on your Discord? Well, you know, um, yeah. I think if Noah Caldwell Gervais comes in my space and starts saying the N-word over and over, and he won't stop despite me asking him nicely, um, I think, this is my opinion, I know it's subjective, I think that I have a moral imperative to remove him from my community. Despite the fact that Noah Caldwell Gervais pays me $100 a month to stay quiet about him. Didn't the Elder Scrolls dev say not to quick save when pickpocketing, or was that some other dev? Uh, I have not heard that. Talking your way out of failure consequences or mitigating them somewhat would also help. Yeah, I think that it would probably stand to benefit if, like, pickpocketing was a consistent criminal charge, regardless of the item value. Which, I don't know off the top of my head how bounties for pickpocketing and Skyrim work. I think it's based on item value. You should make players feel like it's not the end of the world if they get arrested. So like going to jail is a normal part of the thief playstyle. Now how you would accomplish that is something I would have to think about more on but I think that's the key to discouraging people from safe scumming. Doesn't difficulty also scale with the amount of gold you're pickpocketing? Yes, there's a certain gold threshold that you just can't stop being able to steal. Training is kind of a crutch for poorly implemented skills, in my opinion. Yes and no. I think that training is a good avenue for increasing your skills. Uh, or it's a good way to use gold, because if you don't have training, there's pretty much nothing to spend your money on in, in these games. Um... But you don't have to train pickpocketing. I'm talking about training other skills and then stealing the money. There's a great line in the Daggerfall manual warning against safe scumming. Basically, it recommends going along with mistakes and seeing where you end up. I agree, but you can't just tell people to have a different mentality 
you have to come up with a way of mechanically encouraging people to come out of their bubble and avoid doing stuff like safe scumming. So one of those ways that like Fallout 4 tried was like, you can't quick save, you can only save at beds with survival mode. And I'm not the biggest fan of that personally, but I also think that like Fallout 4, if Fallout 4 had been designed around survival mode, it would be one thing, but it, it is a mode that was tacked on and um, no it doesn't it doesn't feel very good it's not a fun system Joseph Anderson's like explanation of how of his experience playing survival mode is basically my experience uh, which is basic which is dying instantly from something you couldn't control and then losing like an hour of progress. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of areas that aren't designed around the idea of you saving at beds either. Like it could be cool if the areas were designed where like beds were bonfires from Dark Souls, but the game very obviously was meant to be a, uh, played where you could save wherever you want and the, it auto saves at loading screens, etc. Like, it's, it's like tacking on multiplayer to No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky was not built around multiplayer. You can't just force it in and expect it to work well. There's nothing remotely engaging, fulfilling, or rewarding about this system. True, true, not true. So, uh, engaging and fulfilling, I would agree with rewarding i would disagree with um it's very fun to steal the dagger of woe from astrid the first time you meet her and end up with two daggers of woe there's a lot of like there's a lot of interesting stuff you can do if you're talented at pickpocketing in skyrim You should do, I would do an early Thieves Guild quest where you break out of a jail so that players realize like, oh, it's ac breaking out of jails is actually like content. Like it's not a, it's not a hassle. It's something that you can actually do as an activity. This is another instance where Kingdom Come Deliverance blows Skyrim out of the water. It begins the same way. You talk to a person while crouched, so instead of initiating dialogue, you pull up their inventory. That's exactly how it works in Skyrim. But instead of simply selecting the item from their inventory and then saying a hail... I like the... Whoever he took this... This is not his lower third. So who, whoever he took this from is like... Added a remember to subscribe thing. And he didn't like go, well, that sucks. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna find a different video that doesn't have this in my example. He's just like, fuck it. Isn't the shit you steal the rewarding part? Yeah, and there's like, there's a lot of money to be made from uh, pickpocketing in Skyrim. It can be very rewarding. Mary, you actually have to pull the item out of their pockets in a system similar to the old board game operation. For regulars on my channel, you may recall me suggesting this very system during my series on the ideal Elder Scrolls 6. Well, after playing Elder Scrolls 6. Kingdom Come and Deliverance, I can personally attest that this system is ideal for pickpocketing. Now, if only everything else about Kingdom Come and Deliverance was in good, the game might have been a masterpiece in a bone fight Skyrim killer. Wait else about Kingdom Come Deliverance was in good, the game might have been a masterpiece in a So if only everything else about Kingdom Come Deliverance was good, the game might have been a matched based in a bona fide Skyrim killer? I don't understand what he's saying and the closed captioning isn't helping. Also, I basically predicted his opinion, which is that um want to make pickpocketing more interesting mini games fucking a i hate mini games i don't like 
playing the pot. I don't like playing the lock picking mini game. I don't like. I don't really like speech pie or whatever whatever we're calling it this week. You know what I mean? Like, the solution to a system shouldn't be. Uh, we're gonna play Tetris for a few minutes. I don't. I guess I don't understand how pickpocketing should be rewarding as a mechanical action. Yeah, there's kind of like a, a flawed basis of like, he's making the assumption that pickpocketing should be some like immensely rewarding concept. Well, jailbreaking is also more viable in Oblivion because you don't get a massive bounty for doing it. Yes, this is DW Terminator. Um, he has a cold, so he sounds kind of different. And a bona fide Skyrim killer. Lock picking is atrocious. Wait a second. I thought mini games were the were the final solution to bad mechanics. I'm sure you. I'm sure he copiously complained about uh, lockpicking in Morrowind. Come on, come on. Lock picking. Hmm. The close captioning doesn't pick it up. Lock, lock, lock. Hmm. I don't think he talks about lockpicking. That's a shame. It would be nice to hear him go. Uh, lock picking is fucking terrible. Be replaced with a mini game. It feels like a joke, doesn't it? It feels like performance art, like, uh, like he's leading us on, right? Like he literally just proposed that a mini game would be a uh, a mini game would be the solution, but, but. Here's an instance where a mini game is not a solution. Now he might be going, "Oh, well, the mini game is bad." And the only the only argument out of this that doesn't make him look bad is if he says that the Oblivion lockpicking mini game is good, and that in and of itself is an executable offense. Like that's literally his only way out at this point is the Oblivion lockpicking mini game is good, and I don't think he's gonna I don't think he's gonna go that route. Well, no, he does. There is a little bit of oblivion, but he doesn't show the mini game. Who'd you mention? Oh, DW Terminator. Oblivion Skyrim lockpicking is similar to Morrowind, where you just attack a chest with a lockpick and hope for the best. Um, is that an actual quote? I'd love if it was a quote. I should just why do, why do we keep closing this tab? Just leave it open. Just leave it open. All right, open transcript. Chest. Nah, the closed captioning didn't pick up that up either. Oblivion's lockpicking minigame held up just- He said it! But why didn't he show an example? Okay, so he's of the mind that Oblivion's lockpicking minigame is good, but that Skyrim's is bad. Weird opinion, but okay. Fine. I don't see why Bethesda felt the need to overhaul the system for Skyrim. Basically, have you played Fallout 3? It is basically just a copy of Fallout 3's system, ported over into Skyrim. That's probably the reason for the change, more than anything. Are you referring to me using the Royal Wii or? 
or what? It's the quote from his ideal test six video, not the Morrowind shit post. That's that's hilarious. Okay. He is kind of getting out of it because he said that the Oblivion lockpicking system is good, which I did say is like the only way out of not looking like an idiot with this. League is searching for a sweet spot in the lock. However, where the sweet spot is located is entirely random. Especially on expert and master locks, you can very easily... Not actually true. Um, the... Depending on your lockpicking skill and what have you, the location can be made like closer to uh, your lockpick. But sure, I understand what you're going for. I've picked master locks at level 15 easily on Skyrim. Yes, I've done master locks in a single lockpick at extremely low levels on non-thief characters. Yeah, you said, why do we keep closing this tab? Huh, weird. Easily break a totally fresh lockpick so fast you don't even have time to take your thumb off the analog stick. You're playing it with an oh god, he is playing with an analog stick. Acer Thorn confirmed controller player. Okay, um, so basically, his argument is. Master locks are hard. Wow, gee, it's almost like it's supposed to be an obstacle to completion. Like, uh, so far, he's not made it. I don't think he's made a particularly compelling case about why Oblivion's lockpicking system is better, but maybe he will. Think about it this way. If you were playing a platformer and obstacles appeared on screen as fast as you can break your lockpicks in Skyrim, that platformer would be almost universally criticized for its unfair difficulty. No. No, it wouldn't. Not a platformer, but here's another game that's extremely fast-paced, that you can die as quickly as that. Although this guy's... We need, like, a speed run, because that guy's, like... That guy's playing super safe. Well... Hard behind as I thought. Play a weapon in terms of active frames. I don't know, probably the katana or something. Oh fuck. No. Anyways, my point still stands. Um, there are platformers that uh, are exactly as he's described that are loved exactly for that reason. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it would be universally criticized. No, it's an entire genre. What am I fighting for? I feel like lockpicking should be, just be completely player skill based or entirely character skill based. Having a mix of both with the minigame and the skill tree just makes everyone frustrated. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. That's why I advocate for Morrowind's lockpicking system because um, it is entirely player skill based. Well, no, it's not entirely uh, character skill based because there's still the player skill of doing it at the, at the appropriate times. But if anything, there's more player skill involved in that than there is in a minigame. A moment ago, I mentioned how Skyrim's skeleton key is often the primary reason people join the Thieves' Guild. Well, the reason the skeleton key is so universally sought after is because Skyrim's lockpicking minigame is a pain in the ass. 
again, I want to state, this is the first I'm ever hearing of it. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to put this out to the chat. Give me a one in the chat if you've ever played through the Thieves Guild on a character in Skyrim that wasn't necessarily a thief to get the to get the skeleton key and give me a two in the chat if you have not. I know there's a poll feature, but I'm still gonna ask you to post it in the chat because I'm looking to farm that engagement. So one in the chat if you've ever played Skyrim's Thieves Guild just to get the skeleton key, two in the chat if you have not. Is that actually an Acer Thorn? Hey, boys and girls! Hey, boys and girls. Oh, wow. It is a thing. What's up, guys? Acer Thorn here, and this is my first impressions playthrough of Hotline Miami. Now, this. Just on the title screen alone, this is honestly giving me a headache. The the visual style is just trippy, like I'm on an LSD trip, and then honestly I- This man's never done drugs in his entire life. Alright, now you should try killing the- I was about to fucking do that, you fucking hippie. But use the bat in the room re in the red room over here. <sighs> the metro. Why? Why is he exhausted at the level transition screen? It's like, ah, oh, Jesus Christ, the metro. Richard. Brickell Metro Station, shift to aim. What's with the SJ though? Like, what does that stand for? Uh. Okay, so I knocked that guy over. Whoa! R to restart. Okay, forgot. I need to press space to finish if I'm not uh, using a weapon. This is actually amazing. I. <sighs> Oh, okay, now I've got this. Whoa, whoa, I can't turn around that fucking fast. What? It's a secret joke competition? Is this another one of those... One of those... Oh yeah, he's telling a joke. It's a meme. I don't think it... I don't think that's the case. That's pretty on brand for the Acer Thorn I've dealt with. I love Hotline Miami. It's, it's like... Uh... The people who watched Dark Souls, the Dark Souls stream that we did last time, um, it's pretty much like that for me. I love going extremely fast and getting killed in that game. I mean, I don't play it to get killed. I played it. I do play it to complete the levels, but like, I'll die like a hundred times on a level just trying to do it as fast as possible. That is the complete opposite of how Crest Rewards should feel. What? Okay, um... So, quest rewards should not... make mechanics easier? Is that the implication? Quest reward... It, okay, so the skeleton key is the opposite of how a quest reward should be. And the skeleton key... People I invented, for the sake of making this argument, my army of straw men, only play Skyrim to get the thieves or only play the thieves guild to get the skeleton key and that's not how it should be so quest reward uh, as i understand it quest rewards should not be rewarding they should not make mechanics easier and they should not be desirable enough that people would want to do the content to get them
That's what I'm taking away from that. No, it's not. Secret joke is his community engagement. He hides words and videos, and if you get the whole phrase correctly, you're eligible for his giveaway. Um... That sounds kind of schizophrenic, I'm not gonna lie. I don't mean that as an insult, but it sounds like... Like, there are schizo posts on X that are more cohesive than what you just said he does. It sounds like he's actively fostering schizophrenics. It's like, you should listen to the subliminal tones of my videos in order to win 50, a $50 gift card. It's like encouraging people to form conspiracy theories around your videos. It's part of like, I get what he's trying to do. He's trying to get like engagement metrics and like encourage people to watch his content. That feels like a lot of effort when something you could strive for is to just try and make better content. And try and have a better mentality about dealing with the criticism that you get when your bad takes get criticized. I mean, one thing is, like, you can be mad about somebody criticizing something that you say in the video. Oh, hey, it's on the front page. Like, you can be mad about that. Like, let's look at some comments. Let's see, is there any that make me mad? I'm trying to find a good example of, like, someone who gets obscenely upset about something that happens, like, uh... Something that happens in, like... Jesus Christ. Basically, like, if somebody's complaining about a take that you have an hour into the video, that means that they watched an hour of the video. You know what I mean? Like, it's the old, um... Oh, they're out there, then they're burning our records. Well, they bought them. Fuck it. They paid us. If you can identify who is in my basement, I will deliver a gift to your address. <laughs> I hope Pat doesn't find my comment. I could look for your name, but I'm not signed into that account, so. And I don't know, like, what changing accounts would do to the stream. Like, if that, that would fuck up the chat or not. So, better not to mess with it. Once again, I have to give the nod to Kingdom Come Deliverance for coming up with a better mechanic for picking locks. Sure, your tendency to break... Let's be honest. It's not that... I mean, they are mechanics, but it's not that... The mechanic is better. It's that the mini game is better. The mini game is better, and it like esoterically represents the concept of lock picking. Lock picks is influenced by the character skill, but a player with enough skill of his own can make it entirely unnecessary. First, when you enter the lock picking interface, the sweet spot is randomly determined, but hovering your lock pick over the sweet spot will cause it to turn gold. However, as you begin to turn the lock with the other thumbstick, the sweet spot moves, forcing you to adjust the lock pick's position on the fly. While a higher lock pick skill will reduce the penalty you get for going out of bounds, whether you even go out of bounds in the first place is still entirely in the player's control, even if getting the hang of the mechanic might take a little practice. This is a hard one. But is that a good thing? Should a role-playing game have a high emphasis on player skill? Or should the minigame just esoterically, like, represent the concept of doing it and not necessarily be complex? Like, the hacking minigame in Fallout should be a minigame. It shouldn't actually be hacking, right? And you want it to be, like, kind of quick and snappy. You don't want players sitting there, like, you know, solving a Sudoku puzzle uh, as part of your game. He's putting on that voice, right? Nobody's mouth is that wet. <laughs> I don't know. I, there's probably some medical conditions that you could have that would make your mouth kind of moist. What game does he give out? Oh, that's a good question to the person who uh, seems to be an Acerthorn fan that like knows a lot about it. What games has he given out? Sounds like he's playing Chubby Bunny while narrating this. Are you watching the same videos I do? <laughs> and 
for me. It really is, because the incredible stealth system in Oblivion is the main reason I got into the Elder Scrolls games in the first place. Wait a second. Damn it. Oh, whoops. Really? That's the reason that you got into the Elder Scrolls games was the like the stealth mechanics. Like It's kind of like saying that I don't know. What kind of comparison can I make here? It's like saying that you It's like saying that you got into going to the gym because you really like seeing muscular guys. It's just kind of gay. It's just kind of a homosexual thing to say. I got into Oblivion because of the stealth mechanics. Like... I don't know. How do how do we go on from here? How do we like how do we parse this information? I got into GTA for the driving. I got into Call of Duty for its excellent story. I got into Thief for its gunplay. You're saying gay like it's something bad. No, I'm saying that the reason you should go to the gym is not to look at people at the gym, it's to work out. You're going you're doing something for the exact wrong reason. It's like saying, "Hey, I saw you at the gay bathhouse." Is it's one of those it's it, you shouldn't say it. You should not say it. I recognized your voice at the glory hole last week. I was at the glory hole, and I was enjoying myself, but then I heard a man's voice on the other side, and I got pissed because I realized I had been blowing a dude the entire time. You know what I mean? Like, fucking... You really got into oblivion because of the stealth in it? I go to the gym to pick up guys sometimes. Why is that bad? Because the gym is for working out. The gym serves a purpose. Violating the sanctity of that purpose is a sin, okay? Now, I'm not saying that being a homosexual is a sin. I'm saying that doing anything at the gym other than working out is a sin. You were doing some gay cruising in the bathrooms? No, I was looking to blow a woman. <laughs> Before I got Oblivion, I was a huge fan of the Splinter Cell games. So when I first got Oblivion, stealth- So why does it seem like you're a fan of stealth games, but it, you have a really like basic understanding of stealth games and their history, and it's like, surely you would have like known what Thief and you know Metal Gear Solid were, right? Breathing is part of working out, though. Like, it's fine if you want to breathe. But there's no point... There's no part of the rep that involves hitting on the other people at the gym. It's more like I, got, I went to the gym to sit at the squat rack on my phone. It's true. The squat rack is like the most comfortable bench in town.
what was my primary build focus for at least my first dozen playthroughs of that game. Hold the fuck up. How did you say something worse? Okay, 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 okay. What? 136.30. I got into Oblivion for the stealth mechanics. They defined the first dozen. The first dozen playthroughs. I don't think I've played Oblivion a dozen times. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, the squat rack seems like a common pain point for gyms. I think we could cut some machines out if we just put more squat racks in there. Like a couple treadmills. Why do we need so many fucking treadmills at the gym? If you want to run, just go run. Go take the streets back from the cars and shoot at people who try to run you over. Okay, don't run at the gym. I can't imagine a more American thing than running in a climate-controlled environment, okay? If you want to run, it doesn't have to be the perfect temperature. Literally, get good. If it's cold, get used to it being cold. If it's hot, get used to it being hot. Bring some water or wear some extra layers, you know? Do what you got to do, but just run outside. And let's have less treadmills at the gym and more squat racks. I think it's a very basic thing. This is some wild shit. This is what I live for. Is, uh, wild takes in Skyrim videos. This is the guy who thinks that Radiant AI can't be more powerful because it will blow up processors. And now he's gone and dropped on us the idea that he get into oblivion because of its stealth mechanics and that they defined the first dozen playthroughs for the of the game for him. I like to imagine that he was just doing it back to back. Like, he would finish a playthrough and then immediately, like, start the game over. And, like, he would look at the class selection screen, and he would look at all the skills in the game and say, I really think that stealth is the one for this one. I know that was the last three or four or six of them, but... I go to the gym for the smoothies. I don't think it's a temperature thing. It might also be a confidence thing. No, it's a I don't want to get run over thing. Because, again, a lot of, a lot of America is, like, a third world country where you can't run without chancing like getting killed by a car wait the processor thing was an actual take there was no punchline if it was a joke I think he legitimately thought that like if the game used more power that it would destroy the console the gym is a home of self improvement and people are less likely to mock you for being fat and running at the gym I mean, isn't derision part of the process for getting fit? I mean, I guess everybody else does it differently, but it just seems like you just... It, it, you're the, the lazy sort of runner. You're, you want to do it in a climate-controlled environment. That's what it seems like to me. I joined the Thieves Guild in Dark Brotherhood because those were the factions geared towards stealthy players. Because I- Aha. You've fallen into my trap. You assumed that the Dark Brotherhood was for thieves. Oh, you... You fool. Didn't you realize that the Dark Brotherhood was actually the multi-class faction? I initially exposed myself to the Brotherhood because those were the factions geared towards stealthy players. Because I initially exposed- I feel like this is a, like, we've just crossed the line of, like, days that he was recording. So it's like, this is one day, and then when this sen sentence ends, a new day is going to start. Like, listen to the way he's talking. Scale in Dark Brotherhood because those were the factions geared towards stealthy players. Because I initially exposed myself to the best and funnest. Also, who would mock a fat guy running down the street? Exactly, you would blend in with the cars. Two faction quest lines in not only that game, but the entire franchise. I fell head over heels. I'm sorry, what did you just say to me? Geared towards stealthy play- Oh no, I hate treadmills. I don't like running on treadmills. They're not- it's uncomfortable. Because I initially exposed myself to the best and funnest two faction quest lines in not only that game, but the entire franchise, I fell head over heels in love with this franchise almost overnight, and I've been hooked ever since. Man. 
I think the bar is extremely low at this point. I think instead of playing, I, I know it's some, I know it's rich coming from me, but I think instead of playing Oblivion a dozen times, you should like play different games. I don't know. Maybe you're not. Maybe you weren't in like a financial place where like you could afford a bunch of games. So it's like, but it, I don't know. It's like I wouldn't play the same game over and over. I would like try and get other games to play. You know what I mean? Reminds me of Mr. Caption jerking off Deus Ex. Kind of. Hooked on the franchise, only likes Oblivion and Skyrim. Hey, listen. He mentioned in a mildly positive tone Daggerfall. I don't think he played it, I think, but he did mention it. That's the other thing is, like, a lot of his basis for understanding other games seems to come from, like, wikis. And I think he already, he already said it earlier, didn't he? That, like, um, he was reading the wiki about The Witcher 3 to come to, like, conclusions about that game. Also, this is ultra-wide footage. I, I think, honestly, like, every time he, sh he shows Oblivion, he's just using Will's video. I have since discovered a lot more of this franchise to love, so I no longer need the great stealth to continue my love for this franchise, but I really, really wanted stealth to be a winner here. I really, really wanted to say that the stealth system in Skyrim still holds up. But alas, I have to look at- He's like- He's trying to put on this voice, but it just sounds like he's about to cry about how, like, the stealth system is- He can't say that the stealth system holds up. And it's like, no shit the stealth system doesn't hold up. It doesn't hold up to the standards of Thief. Isn't the definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again? We're talking about a guy who, like, fosters schizophrenics to watch his channels by doing, like, secret giveaways where he asks them to find the patterns and the numbers. The matter objectively. And looking at it with as little personal bias as possible, I have no choice but to acknowledge that no, it does not hold up. Why are you being so dramatic? Why is this such an emotional thing? One thing I've seen which improves analysis is having a wealth of genres to draw experience from. People get so myopic because they only play one genre and don't see how other games do things better. Um, I do agree. If you want to be an anal an analyst of anything films literature architecture anime girls what have you you need to have a wealth of experience under your belt and until you have that you should really like kind of lurk keep low you know try to learn uh try to learn seven new things every single day do methamphetamine so that you can learn eight new things every hour okay and then once you have a large degree of experience, then you start talking about your opinions. And you might want to start small. I don't think I would start like with a three hour. I don't know if this is. His hey, start, boys you know. and girls. Hey, boys and girls. I don't know if this is his start. Oh, no. Sort by oldest. No, he started at like the 20 minute grind set. Okay, hold on. YouTube success is not luck, and I can prove it. They say that being successful on YouTube is mostly luck. It's true. <laughs> it's like the meme of the guy that's like, how to get a million views in a week, and the video has like three views on it.
Here's hoping that Elder Scrolls 6 can have a stealth system that makes Elder Scrolls the undisputed king of stealthy RPGs once again. I guess I agree. I, I can agree with generic sentiments like, Hey Bethesda, do better. <laughs> like, thanks. Well, listen. Okay, let's ask ourselves a simple question. Who's this video for? I like to be optimistic and think that Bethesda watches my videos, and I think they actually do because I mentioned the Games for Windows Live thing about Fallout 3, and literally like 45 days later it got fixed, right? So somebody at Bethesda is watching my content. I like to think that Bethesda is looking at my content, and maybe they're not like, they're not listening, they're not like, I'm not whispering in their ear and changing the core design philosophy, but I'm giving them some ideas, I'm kind of like pushing them in a way, in, better directions because one of the things i realized is that everybody who analyzes skyrim says that the game looks good it's artistically beautiful but the mechanics suck and the quests suck and oddly enough the artists that make the beautiful game talk or have talked about their experience the mechanics people and the quest people have stayed silent so i think that like bethesda's been like bl overblown with like negativity and so, the reason I say all this is that you have to think part of the audience of people that are going to be watching your video are the people who made Skyrim. So it might be beholden upon you to sit down for a few moments and just, I don't know, give some fucking ideas about what you think could be done better. And please don't just go, you should copy this game, you should copy this mini game, or what have you. I mean, really give your thoughts. What could be done better? What's being done wrong? I feel like I didn't walk away from this section with a better understanding of what the stealth mechanics in Skyrim could be doing better. You're glossing over him calling Skyrim the, st the stealth king of all games. I don't think he said that. Oh, once again? I think he's... I don't think he's saying what, you think what you're thinking he's saying. Ironic, he says, there's no need in overhauling the existing stealth system. However, there are minor tweaks I'd like to see. Yeah, I guess that is interesting. Um, but this is the same issue I had with Salt Factory, but it's for a different reason, right? Salt Factory's issue was that he was mostly just giving us a book report on like what happened in the game. Acer Thorn isn't doing that. He's not giving us a book report. He's just observing, like, what's wrong with the game. He's saying, here's what's wrong with the mechanics. And he might elaborate on, like, why, but he has no proposals for fixes. And I know that's controversial with some people, that they think that, like, it's not the place of reviewers to include uh, proposals for ways to fix the game. I think that it is necessary. I think that... I don't know. It's like, what does it serve? What does it serve to have a video where you ask the question, does it hold up in 2019? Because, I don't know, who cares? I mean, you can say there's an entertainment aspect to it, but very clearly there's not a lot of people who find this particular video interesting or inter or entertaining. It seems like a lot of the entertainment factor is like, um, they're waiting for you to say wild takes, which is not a good way to be entertaining. You don't want to be... Uh, famous for being a locale who says like wild shit that people laugh at, right? You know, they you want people to laugh with you, not at you, that kind of deal. So, I know it would probably make the video longer. And that might be an issue of like... God, I don't remember what went on in the first hour that like made that part so long. I'm not really sure on like what can be cut. I mean, obviously the 30 second section where you said that like stealing items still works the same as normal. You could probably cut that part, but I'm not exactly certain like what you should be uh, cutting to cut the runtime down. But I am certain that there is definitely an issue with these sections of like, you're it, it's just observing what what's wrong with the game and what's right with the game and it's just not giving like the necessary commentary
If you didn't add one new perspective to the topic at hand, the video is pointless. Yes, I think that's the core of the issue, and it was the same core of the issue with, like, Salt Factories Skyrim video, is that there's very little in this video that I feel like Bethesda could learn from. In a way, I can very easily imagine that, like, Bethesda employees wouldn't want to watch this video because it's almost, like, it, or watch a lot of Skyrim videos because they seem almost mean-spirited towards Bethesda. Like, it's just insulting them for, like, like, this part of the, of the video is just, like, it's not really proposing ways that the Dark Brotherhood's humor could be improved. It's just, like, this is stupid. You're stupid for adding this. I mean, that's a, that's a really broad, broad uh, summary of what, what goes on in that section, but I'm just tired of these fucking review videos that have nothing to say, or they have something to say, but they're so inarticulate and bumbling that, like, they don't know how to say it, or they don't know, they don't even think about, like, what they should be trying to accomplish with the video. Like, they don't, they just don't think about why the video should exist. Like, who cares if it doesn't hold up? Who cares if it's as good as you remember? Tell us how it could be better. Tell us what games do it better. Tell us what ways, like, what mods you could use to fix it. All right, I do apologize. That was a bit of a, a bit of a rant. I don't know. It just bothers me. Evaluating Skyrim, an extremely shallow experience. That is true. Like the title of this video is interesting because it's like he's calling it an extremely shallow experience, which is funny because this va this video is extremely shallow when it comes to its, um, analysis. And I mean, you can make that fair criticism. Like you can say, "Oh, recently, most of his videos aren't analysis." Oh no, wait, analysis is in the title of this one. Fuck. Well, that's messing. That's messing it up. Hang on. Yeah. See, like, was Fallout as good as I remember? It's a look at the series beginning. See, it makes sense that like. That it's gonna be a lot of that it's gonna be a book report because it's just a look. But then it's like, oh, it's an analysis of Bioware's companion. Oh, it's an analysis. Okay, this is an evaluation. Okay, like, I don't know. Titles mean things. They're actually kind of important. They're not just marketing. They just regurgitate what the Moro Boomers browbeat them on Reddit and 4chan a decade ago. I don't know that that cut doesn't necessarily apply in this situation. Um, if anything, I don't recall Salt Factory talking too negatively about Morrowind in his video, but Acer Thorn definitely doesn't like Morrowind. I mean, specifically Salt Factory's Skyrim video. I haven't seen Salt Factory's Morrowind video. Retosis' Skyrim video is very mean-spirited. Uh, well, my understanding is that that's just kind of part of the... That's part of the Kretosis package, isn't it? Like, let's do a vertical cut on Kretosis' Skyrim video. I know th these guys have been looking forward to me kind of talking about their video. Your enemies die. Dual wielding has finally been added to the series. However, it comes in the most useless form possible. There are no real special attacks for having two weapons outside of power attacks. Okay, I'm gonna say this bitrate's kind of terrible. Attacks and clicking both attack buttons at once. For regular attacks, a weapon in each hand to your companions and summons for the majority of fights while you backpedal away from enemies. I mean, there's definitely like a tone of uh, mean spiritedness there, but I'd have to watch more of it to come to a conclusion about whether or not that's an accurate assessment. Matthew Matosis is the greatest YouTube analysis person? Probably true. 
Um, I was going to say Ross Scott, but the thing is, Ross is, like, not really an analysis channel. I think that's a fair thing to say. I don't think Ross is really in our sphere. I would say the same thing about, like, Civi 11. He's not really in our sphere either. What's the background of this one? Does he just have, like, a bunch of stock generic backgrounds that he uses for all his thumbnails? And, like, that's what we're seeing here. It feels like they're trying harder to dig up bad things about Skyrim to talk about than they have to. Like, there are genuine flaws in Skyrim, but they try way too hard to trash the game. Is that it? I don't know if that's it. At its core, Skyrim is a dungeon crawler. The quests almost always send you to dungeons, and there are plenty of dungeons that you are encouraged to explore independently. But these dungeons need enemies in order to pose a challenge. I mean, it's either that or challenging puzzles, and Skyrim does not do that very well at all, for reasons I already discussed in depth. Combat can be divided into three different categories. Melee, archery, and destruction magic. Stealth can augment both melee and archery based combat. This music's killing me. Music's too loud. And it's too loud in the mix. So it's like, and the, the combat music you have to be careful with because it can be very distracting from what you're talking about because it's very active music. Like what we're listening to right now is ambient kind of calm music. And um, like, it doesn't distract from the stream. Like if I start playing Skyrim combat music, it would be very distracting. Do you think he has any sort of production value? I mean, there is a minimum of like, he does say the words minimal production value in a positive light. So um, I don't think there's anything wrong with having low production value. You don't have to be crazy. You don't have to do some of the crazy shit that I'm planning for the Skyrim video if you don't want to, right? Especially when you're small. I don't see any issue with... I don't see any issue with it just being long clips of you playing the game that you're talking over because I understand the reality of being a small creator and it's just one of the things that you kind of have to work against. It's nice when you're, if, if you have a small creator who puts a lot of like production effort into their videos, but it's better for small creators to have more content than it is for them to have extra, exceptionally good content. They should still strive to make good content, but when you're small, it's a lot more about the quantity. Like you're playing a dangerous game of quantity and quality. Um, YouTube is not a space where you can just max out the quality at the cost of quantity and make one video a year and really be successful. You have to be exceptionally talented to pull something off like that. So I really don't have an issue with low production values. Um, yeah, so that that's basically my thoughts on that. They don't have anything to add, so they simply make base level observations and call it content. Yeah, I've kind of taken to calling that like book report videos. Book report videos are fine when they're like seven, eight minute videos and there's like a lot more entertainment value to them. But I don't know how you could stand listen listening to a two hour comprehensive book report on Skyrim. Skyrim is not such an inherently interesting game that like, oh yeah, I'm going to sit down and listen to this book report about it, right? Um, like, take private sessions. Um, even his most recent videos are probably more on, like, the book report side. But I would still say it's interesting because there's a lot of effort that goes into, like, planning Mass Effect playthroughs. And, um, he does, like, he did a playthrough that, like, would result in you get it, seeing a lot of scenes that most people probably don't see. And so, I feel like... Private Sessions is trying to, like, forge out a way where you can do interesting book reports. And at the same time, like, you know, Ross Scott and Civi basically do also do the book report things, but they make it interesting by doing entertainment along the way. This seems like it's striving to be, like, raw analysis. Like, I am a thinker. People are here for my thoughts on Skyrim. So, 
Um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, that's what I'm going to produce. But the end result is that it's mostly just observational. No, I already, I already saw H-Bomber Guy's Skyrim video. And I got really mad at it because, um... It, it's like the guy lacks self-awareness. I've explained before why I don't like it. I don't watch those book reports. I listen to you dissect them. Well, that's sort of the thing. Is It's kind of a shame. There's a lot of effort that goes into producing all of these videos. So it's a shame when, like, the vast majority of them are just fucking terrible. I must be completely honest. Most of these videos fucking suck. This video... Even after today's stream, I would say this video is still in the top half of Skyrim videos. It's just that, like... The Skyrim video bar... The Skyrim video bar is so low that videos like this can rank highly. I feel like raw analysis on Skyrim is hard because it can be a very surface level game a lot of the time. I think it's deceptively difficult to talk about. I think there's a lot of things that like... Um, that's the issue I've run into is like... So I want to talk about the throat of the world and how underwhelming a mountain it is, but that oh, that's a fucking can of worms in of itself. That becomes a very complicated thing, and suddenly I'm learning about like real mountains and trying to figure out like how to compare the throat of the world to real mountains, um, and what have you. And it's like that's a level of effort that very few people are are wanting to put into their videos, and I don't blame them for that. But it is tr it is true that like. Um, the dummy down stuff brought the average down massively. I definitely think that the but the discourse about Bethesda games was probably damaged by the dummy down controversy. We did Angry Joe. Angry Joe has like the second best Skyrim video. Maybe, maybe third best. It goes G Man Lives, Skyrim video, Angry Joe, Noah Caldwell Gervais. And then it rapidly, like, it rapidly starts, like, going downhill out of control from there. Like, we're talking going going downhill and spinning so fast that, like, you start breaking your bones every time you, like, smack into the ground. And so by the end, like, your body is just jelly from how devastated your body is. That's how rapidly downhill the Skyrim video goes. Dead, using what's known as sneak attacks to deal massive opening damage and sometimes one hit your opponents. Meanwhile, you can also attach potions, which you can create using the alchemy skill, to your melee and archery weapons to serve as one time buffs to your weapon's attacks. Archery is honestly the easiest to pin down. You fire an arrow and it shoots its target. There's honestly very little to say about it. Really? The point and click melee is, is more complicated than archery? I mean, I don't know. I'll let you have it. Are you ever going to talk about Skyrim after the video is over? I, and I think it is one of those things where I'm probably just going to kind of... Uh, I think after the Skyrim video is over, I want to cut Elder Scrolls out of my life. I mean, I want to cut Elder Scrolls out of my life until Elder Scrolls 6 comes out. I think that's that's probably the best thing that I could do. I'm not going to talk about ESO. I'm not going to talk about... I'm not going to go back to Daggerfall. I think the best thing to do after the Skyrim project is over is move on with my life. To just do something different. I think even, like... I, I, I think Fallout is too similar. I think that's going to be one of the big reasons I might decide not to just go to Fallout is just... It's too similar. Even Mr. Caption had more insightful stuff to say about archery in Skyrim. I mean, I disagreed with it, but Mr. Uh, here's the thing. Let's see. Mr. Caption is definitely on the list of like people who talk about the game. He starts getting like around this part of the game. He starts being like really, really wrong. But it is still analysis by default. 
Mr. Caption's video has to rank higher than Salt Factory and uh, Never Knows Never Knows Best. Yeah, I would say it ranks higher than Never Knows Best, and definitely Acer Thorn. Which okay, hang on, that makes the numbers weird. Acer Thorn's in the top half of videos, but he ranks lower than Mr. Caption, and I would not say that Mr. Caption's in the top half of videos. See, the system's breaking down. I need a I need somebody to tell me the pattern in the numbers. No is a seven, private sessions is a six. I think private sessions being a six is generous. That might be nepotism. Than I do is an actual increase of character power because frankly Oh whoops. That's Mr. Caption. <laughs> But other than that, I would definitely argue that archery takes more player skill than in other more recent games like Witcher 3 or Dark Souls because you actually have to aim your bow. Yeah, I guess. Like, that's a particularly difficult action in Skyrim. See, Dark Souls is a tricky one. That seems... It, Dark Souls seems... Dark Souls, Dragon's Dogma, what have you, those seem like even The Witcher... I think, I don't know, it's what, I'm looking at, like, Joseph Anderson, and I'm saying, what are the traps that he, that caused, like, what's the big trap that got Joseph Anderson, and how do I avoid that trap? I don't think any Skyrim video deserves to be in the better half of Skyrim videos yet. Are you saying that? Um, there's so many Skyrim videos we haven't watched that we have to assume that they're all better than this. We ran into this issue with DW Terminator where it's like, um, it's a nice romantic idea to say that like low view count Skyrim videos are going to be the, the true gems. Like we're going to find a diamond in the rough at the lower end of the Skyrim videos. But the reality is a lot of these Skyrim videos have low views because they're not very good. Ah, yes, archery in Dark Souls, the widely used playstyle of archery. Yeah, it's almost like, oh, he uses controller, it's hard. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah, Dark Souls archery almost feels like just a tacked on addition. Like, it's not the main way you're meant to be interacting with the game. Or it's meant to be like a utility that you do occasionally. Can we agree that console players should not be allowed to make analytical videos? No, I would say that console players should be... I, sh I will agree, however, that console players should be banned from covering games that are meant to be played in the first person. Wasn't Joseph Anderson trapped by his 22 kids? Uh, yeah, I think he's like... I think he's tied up in like a semen plant or something. Joseph Anderson's trap is making the longest video analysis. I thought that was the schizo thing. I thought I made that up. I would love to see if, like, Joseph Anderson has ever said publicly or privately that, like, his his goal is to have the longest video. But I don't think... I think you would have a hard time finding it. I don't think that's the problem. I, I think there's something else to it. I think that the Witcher series was a bad idea. Oh, no. Private, we have a spreadsheet. Um... Yeah, I have a spreadsheet of, like, the numerical nut values that we've given videos that we've watched. What's really bonkers about his statement is that there's plenty to say about Skyrim Archery, like how it becomes one of the dominant strategies and why, from a mechanical standpoint. I'm going to imagine he talks about that. There's no way... There's no way that this video is like, you know, another hour and he doesn't mention that. Yeah, I've, I've often heard that IRL stuff is what has slowed down Joseph Anderson. Did you watch Strategy's video on Skyrim? We watched one of them. We watched the bad one.
Other RPGs have lock-on, which takes out all the aiming that comes with using archery as a combat skill. While the lock-on ability might be a welcome addition to melee combat, a system I'll go into more detail about momentarily. No, I'm going to let him go into detail on it before I contend with it. I'll definitely believe that it feels out of place in archery, seeing as knowing where to point your weapon is the whole point of that skill. Melee combat is honestly the biggest lost opportunity in Skyrim as far as combat is concerned. There's no way to sugarcoat it. Melee combat in Skyrim sucks. Oh nice observation. Truly insightful. No, I know, that's a basic summary. Okay, I could go into a great de amount of detail. No, 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 please. Please. Feel free. Which bad one? Uh, the one where he compares Morrowind and Skyrim. Dude, listen. That strategy video... It did something to me. I think he even came into my chat and like saw that it was on the schedule and is like, yeah, you probably shouldn't watch that. There is a part in this video where he's talking about <laughs> like brainwaves from like reading versus like listening. Like if you activate these centers of your brain, uh, strategy will come to your house and gun you down. I hate when reviewers do the, I'll talk about this later. Mr. Caption did this so fucking much and it was so annoying. Okay, so I sympathize. Um, I sympathize with the need to do that because like the Elder Scrolls games are such a complicated mess of like topics and issues and it's difficult to like, it's difficult to really kind of, I don't know, like, just trust me, I sympathize. Um, it's better than Never Knows Best gameplay loop, though. Yeah, I guess that's true. Or Never Knows Best Nightgate End bit. Or Never Knows Best Dungeon bit. Never Knows Best Skyrim video was a flop. I'm just putting that out there. That's not like... It's not good. Hang on. Hey guys, wanted to remind you... It always starts with, hey guys. I'm getting a vertical slice here. Skill you're developing. Often these perks boost the effectiveness of a skill or unlock a unique ability or buff that makes that school more versatile. Though... Okay, so the reason we're watching this video is it was in the recommended and it's a Skyrim video that I don't have on my list. Because it's from a small person. So, uh, let me just throw that on the list. What's the name of this video? The Legend That Refuses to Die. Also, the thumbnail caught my attention. Can I show the thumbnail? Hey guys, one. Hang on. Uh, I can do it this way. This is the the cool way to take screenshots, which is to use paint. I know screen snip is a feature. I want to show this thumbnail. I'm surprised that, like, this video isn't getting more views. Because this seems like the exact kind of thumbnail that, like, would get a lot of views. I think it's pretty good. Never knows best got better after his porn game video that almost killed his channel. Um, I... I, I don't know about that. I think Never Knows Best made a good Oblivion video. So him dropping the ball on Skyrim, I think, was like a change in style that didn't pay off. Mr. Caption did the I'll talk about this later for so many things, but never got back to talking about them. Yeah, he says like 
there will be spoilers for Oblivion and Morrowind that, like, literally never happen. Okay, I could go into a great amount of detail about what sucks about Skyrim's melee combat system, but somebody... Oh, okay. I'm not gonna do it because somebody else did it. He has already done a bang-up job of describing the flaws in the system. Why do you keep saying bang-up? about Skyrim's melee combat system, but somebody has already done a bang-up job of describing the flaws in the system already. Regulars of my channel might remember Mr. Caption. In one of my earliest analysis videos, I included clips from his analysis of Fallout 4, and my response to those clips became the basis for that video. It's a crossover episode, everybody! <laughs> I was really worried he was going to reference some video I'd never heard of. But, um, I guess I already have all of my opinions about his combat. <laughs> well, I'd like to play a segment from another one of his videos. This time a review of Skyrim, where he succinctly explains why Skyrim's combat system is so terrible. You should really go for a second take on that sentence. Come on, there's no way you said that and then said, uh, yeah, that's good. I like Never Knows Best Video on Oblivion, Mountain Blade Warband, and Vampires the Masquerade Bloodlines. He has decent takes on Kingdom Come Deliverance as well. I mean, he seems like an overall like good content creator. It's just that Skyrim video is not good. Yeah, that video wasn't very good. He cut a lot of captions clips down. Now, personally, I have a bad feeling in my gut that Skyrim's list of bad guys may not be all that up to snuff, partly because I've already done all the research. But for the sake of the audience, let's do what we did for Fallout 4 and list out all of the enemies in Skyrim. Okay, that is not the original way the video is. is. Please lower the volume on the combat music. I can barely hear what fucking Mr. Caption is saying. Skyrim, and compare it to a few other games from around Skyrim's time. Note that we won't be counting alternate versions of a single enemy as a new entry. God, it, this is something that you're citing as a positive in the video. Like, we talked about how disingenuous this was when we watched Caption's video. So, for example, polar bears and bears just count as one bear enemy. And all 800 versions of Drogar only count as one as well. Yeah, see, like, that's a disingenuous thing to do. Like, there's Archer... Like, there's basically three types of Draugr. Four, if you count the, like, Dragon Shout Draugr as being different, but, like... There's the Archer guys, there's the guys that summon Frost Atronax, there's melee guys, of course, and then, like, there's guys that use Dragon Shouts. I mean, it's not a huge enemy variety, but it's really weird. Like, it, there is some stuff that Caption does that I felt was disingenuous, and, like, intentionally so. Alright, let's start. We have Bandits, Forsworn, Ghosts, Warlocks, and or other associated Mage Bandit type. Okay, fuck this. I'm not sitting through the fucking thing of him listing out all the different enemy types again. And then him explaining, Oh, well, you know, uh, Dragon's Dogma has all these different types of enemies. Like, what the fuck is this? You're just wholesale lifting a section of Caption's video for your own bit. Like, okay, there is a world of different, like, okay, hang on, hang on. Here's something I do in my video. Or am planning to do in the Skyrim video. Where the fuck is it? Alright. I quote Joseph Anderson. I'm going to play part of his video in my video to explain this point because he hits the nail on the head. Here's the extent of the quote. My guess is that some people at Bethesda are really proud of how these radiant quests can sometimes appear like regular ones. That some players might not even notice that they are doing artificially generated content. When in reality, I think this is viewing it backwards. It's that the actual scripted quests are so dull and samey that it's that they appear like radiant ones, not the other way around. In my opinion, when you're using other people's content, the amount I just used is a lot. So the fact that you are including like several minutes of Caption's video, just because Oh, he already did a good job. Great, so you have nothing to add to this conversation. Why don't you just link? Like, put the thumbnail on screen. Because I want to know what the original thumbnail was. Put the thumbnail on screen and say, go to this timestamp and watch to this timestamp. Those are my opinions on the combat. 
What the fuck? Like, this is literally just stealing, in my opinion. Like, it's one thing to have a short clip of somebody else's video that succinctly explains the problem. How long does this go on? Okay, so this is like the end. So 147 is the end. And he's not adding things to it along the way. This is literally just playing the video. So he starts at 140. Holy fuck, what? Seven minutes? You can't do that. You can't... No. Seven minutes? I think the video still existed at the time that this was being made. No. I don't know if that's true. The caption's been gone a long time. But seriously? Seven fucking minutes? I'm actually... I am... I am in shock. I am in awe. Mr. Caption's video is what? 144 minutes, I think. So that's 5% of his video that's just lifted and stuck in this one. It doesn't matter if it was up or not. Mr. Caption still holds the copyright on his video. That's the thing. Um, if he wanted to, he could strike down my archive of his Skyrim video. I don't think he'd want to. Um, but that would be within his rights. This is actually wild. I am like legit. I'm legit in awe. I mean, do I really need to explain why this is wrong? I don't know if I would say it's plagiarism. Plagiarism involves trying to pass off someone else's work as your own. So if his combat section was just him reading out Mr. Caption's script and trying to say it was his own, or even rewording Mr. Caption's script and trying to pass it off as his own, which I don't think he could do because it's very just the, I'm going to list out all of the enemy types I'm going to list out all of the enemy types and compare them to Dragon's Dogma. That's so distinct, there's no possible way Acer Thorn could get away with. Caption struck down the Zeke Blowstein up re-uploader. That's not... As far as I'm aware, that's not true. Uh, Zeke Blowstein, who was the original re-uploader for Mr. Caption, got taken down for, like, hate speech violations. Do I know... Now, do I know the veracity of those claims? No, but that's what... I think YouTube said outright on the on the like re-uploads that I was looking at. Oh no, it just says that the account was terminated. Play the Acer Thorn video on copyright. Holy fuck. I'm sorry, but somebody's got to ask for me. Somebody's got to ask for me. Um, are the Kratosis guys aware of that? Of, or anybody who's having drama with uh, Acer Thorn aware of this? Okay, hang on. 
Um, I'm gonna... How many words is seven minutes? Uh, hang on. Words to minutes. I have a thing for this. So... So about 900 words is seven minutes. 900. 900 words. That's a lot. <laughs> I don't I don't think I need to tell anybody who's ever taken like a writing class how much seven, 900 words can be. I think, so, um, Zeke does not have a second channel where he's been re-uploading, uh, caption videos. You could probably ask him, uh, what exact, if he was given a reason. I think YouTube terminations are typically given a reason why they occur. So, um, if he got taken down for copyright strikes because, or privacy complaints, that would be one thing. However, I would imagine that um, the caption stream and the re-upload that I did would have gotten back to him. I don't know. I feel like Kretosis knows this. Aware of, um, so specifically, in this... In his Skyrim video, he just wholesale lifts. Uh, no, Zeke does not have a, a second channel. This is not something that he is doing. He is not re-uploading captions videos on a second channel. That would be against the terms of service if he were. So that's why it's not happening. But, so yeah. Um, No, like, I feel like somebody should tell him, like, how many words is seven hours? Uh, I don't have an exact count, and the reason for that is that, like, there were a lot of changes to the script and what have you. The Morrowind scripts are extremely inaccurate to what's actually in the video. Um, the Oblivion script is a lot, is much better about that, but, yeah, I couldn't tell you how many words the Morrowind script was. I don't know. They have not covered this video. I'm just curious. Just in shock. How do we go forward? Proportionally, that's like if you had a 28-minute clip in your Oblivion video. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, you're right. I don't know why you guys keep lying and saying that Zeke Blostein has a second channel where he's re-uploading caption videos. That's not a thing that's happening. That's not something that's happening, and you shouldn't lie about stuff like that, because there's a chance that a second channel would be banned, because he would be ban evading. We shouldn't say things like that. Is your Warcraft video going smoothly? No. Um, there's some issues with, the, like, the later expansions that I'm having. Um... Yeah, so... Wow. Which is just one of the deep-rooted flaws the way this engine handles combat melee. Well, long story short, Skyrim's melee combat... Oh, uh, yeah, definitely a long story short. A long fucking story. You're telling me that 
You have so much to say about the melee combat system, but you need someone else to do it for seven minutes. There's not even like a broken link in your section in your in your section that links to the original caption video. Like, just straight up. Combat system has practically no strategy to it. Honestly, the reason so many Skyrim fans eventually gravitate to a stealthy archer. Oh, he said the words. So, for the person in chat who is wondering, yes, he got to it. I feel like, again, the every player gravitates towards a stealth archer thing is a meme. I don't know how much... Tr it's more grounded in truth than the skeleton key claim, but... I don't think that's necessarily a universal thing. I think, like, a couple YouTubers observed that, and now it's just become, like, uh, basically canon. Are they going to have your playthrough... Are, are they going to have you play through Battle of Azeroth after all? I was going to, to see those zones. Um, the issue is Pandaria, honestly. Pandaria is fucking terrible. There are people who think that, like, it's good, it's good, like, questing material, and it's not. Alright, I'll be right back. I need something to drink. Bulky. I feel like the microphone isn't picking up enough of it. Why do you need a bulky fursuit to have sex with men? I just want to say something I thought about while I was in the restroom. Which was not the gay sex thing. Um, <clears throat> a monetized video on YouTube has to be eight minutes long. Which means that... If it's seven minutes, it's most of the way to being a monetized video. I don't... It's just... It's too much. Or not... 
Okay, you can monetize videos shorter than eight minutes. It's eight. You need eight minutes to get a mid-roll ad. So that's like the meta, basically. I am refreshed. I am invigorated. But I don't know if I have the strength to go on. I thought it was 10 minutes. It hasn't been 10 minutes in years. But it's funny that, like, people still don't know that, um, that, like, the, the amount changed. Like, the numbers changed. It's eight minutes. <sighs> it's a shame it's Wednesday evening. This is, like... Private Sessions told me, like, the two times that he's not available in the week, and this is one of them. Otherwise, I'd ask him if... I'd ask him if he wanted to join, uh... isn't because it's the most powerful. Most Warriors of Combat Skyrim can two-shot most enemies if they're a high enough level. Okay, that, that's a... Ooh, that's an extremely arbitrary metric to use. Um, you can one-shot most enemies in the game on the lowest difficulty. You know what I mean? Like, why would that be your metric for whether or not a build is overpowered? Most people gravitate to a stealthy archer playstyle because it combines two playstyles that actually require the player to pay attention and be skillful with their actions. The Wait, your argument is that stealth archer is the dominant strategy because... Stealth archer is the dominant strategy because it is two playstyles that are both involved wouldn't shouldn't it be the opposite that like stealth archer is so monotonous that like people fall back into it the aiming of archery and the situational awareness of stealth this is the most popular playstyle because it's one of the few playstyles in the late game that isn't super boring Okay, I've never heard that before. I've never heard that before. Stealth archery is popular because it's one of the few playstyles in the game that isn't boring. I've literally, I've always heard the opposite. The stealth art, like. I've heard the opposite. I've observed the opposite. Stealth Archer is the most boring playstyle in the game. People comment on how Stealth Archer is the most boring con- Like... What? He's really hitting a- Like, this is- Is this the Mr. Caption effect where you hit 90 minutes and bam, you just like turn your brain off? I stopped taking my brain medicine and now I'm gonna say some really stupid shit. He doesn't mention Restoration Loop in his Ways to Become OP in Skyrim. Uh, I can see a reason why you might not want to. Like, if you're looking for Ways to Become OP in Skyrim that doesn't involve exploiting the game. Or something like that. Because he seems, he seems to be very anti-exploit. In his mentalities. I kind of agree archery requires more engagement than melee. Um... In the sense of, like, you have to aim, but aiming in Skyrim is so easy that, like, you can do it, like, 
with your eyes. It, you, like, you can sleepwalk an archery build. You can sleep off a, a melee build as well, but... All stealth archers have the most brain-dead takes. It is true. And it is actually true. Like, pretty much consistently... Pretty much consistently, we have dealt with... Um, like, yeah, the common trends between all the dumb takes have been stealth archers. Because Caption was a stealth archer, but G-Man wasn't. That's foolproof. There were actually- Alright. I'm so sick of The Witcher 3. It's a fine game. It's a fine game. You can bring it up if you want, but, like... Stop. Just stop. That's not a death threat, by the way. That's just a coincidence. Listen. Um. Oh, my God. How do you, like... I don't know. It's not his fault. It's not his fault that The Witcher 3 is, like, super oversaturated in Skyrim videos. Oh, God. I think more than six hours of Acer Thorn is toxic. At least several games to have come out since Skyrim that have combat systems that can dance circles around Skyrim. Witcher 3, the entire Dark Souls trilogy, King. I don't like where this sentence is going. I wasn't cocking a gun, I was I was making sure my gun wasn't loaded. Which is something that I do frequently, even though, like, I never actually load it. I mean, I do, but... I'm sick of people play saying Witcher as if it's in the same genre as any Tez game. I, you said game, but I'm going to assume genre. Um, yeah, that's, that's always what bothers me. It's the same issue with Dark Souls. It's like they're trying to accomplish different things. I think Dark Souls and The Witcher are, like... Dark Souls and The Witcher are more co adequate comparisons to the, each other than they are to, like, Skyrim. Like, th one of the things that's interesting about Elder Scrolls is how unique its formula is and how um, it hasn't really been replicated by other companies. Like, I think Cyberpunk is, like, one of the first main uh, attempts at, like, even approaching... And even then, it's more of a Fallout game than it is an Elder Scrolls game, right? Oh yeah, I didn't even notice the meme if he says Dark Souls, but he shows Bloodborne. Listen, it happens. Um, <laughs> do you keep a gun at your desk at all time? Yeah. I have my wallet, my keys, my headphones, and my phone here. Everything that I take with me out into the world is on my desk. So, like, that's where my gun is, too. I also have six entrances to my house. <laughs> Kingdom Come Deliverance, hell, even Bethesda themselves have made combat engines that dance circles around Skyrim in recent years with the release of Fallout 4. That is a fucking bold claim if I have ever heard one. I played a melee build in Fallout specifically for the Skyrim video. And I think Skyrim's melee combat is better than Fallout's. I think the only thing Fallout 4 has on Skyrim is impact. You can smash somebody's brain in... You can smash somebody's brains in uh, with a sledgehammer in Fallout. You can't really do that in Skyrim. Yeah, I guess Kingdom Come is a pretty similar thing. So you bring a gun everywhere? Yes. I don't know what you're not, like, getting about this. I have a firearm. This firearm has a 15-round capacity magazine. Oh, no. I, sorry, I lied. It has a 17-round capacity magazine. Um, that is 17 heads that I could shoot. Uh, but I'm not that talented. Uh, listen... I take a gun with me places. That's mostly because I walk out at night. And anybody could just roll up on me and, like, try to rob me. Now, honestly, I don't think that... I actually don't think that would happen. But there have been a few occasions where it's like having a gun is nice. It's like a safety net, you know? 
Especially the one night that I think I encountered a boar. The last, I mean, I don't think I could kill a boar with any of the guns I own. Maybe the, maybe the shotgun with the 12 gauge, but I don't carry that. Because, like, you know. But yeah, it's like, what's a pistol for if not to be carried with you out in the world? Can I cock it? Sure. There you go. Uh, people on K are going to identify what firearm that is based on the information I've given. Shoot it in the eye. I don't... I don't know. Boars are very... Uh, boars are very difficult to kill. They're like bears in that, in that attribute. Note that I don't think I'll ever actually have a run-in with a boar, but I have definitely heard some strange animals while going out for walks. Is a gun en is a gun enough against a boar? Well, I would imagine twelve gauge slugs would be able to kill a boar. I've heard like three hundred blackout can kill boars. Which I um who would win in a shootout, Patrician or Rags? I didn't know Rags was a gun owner. Who is it that said? Uh, they wear skinny jeans and an NRA t-shirt. I always liked that line. I once saw a black bear tear, tear at the nape of a boar's neck for 30 minutes. It was alive the entire time. Yeah, like, um, boars are pretty wild. Like, not only are they invasive in North America, but they're difficult to kill. They're difficult to hunt. Like, there's a reason that in a lot of states you can just kill boars without any kind of permit. Hey, why did my opinion of rags suddenly go up? I always had a low opinion of rags, if only because I thought that, like, of the original EFAP crew, he was, like, the worst. But, well, it's good to know that he's, uh, based and or red-pilled. So go on about how Fallout 4 has good combat. Honestly, melee combat not only doesn't hold up by today's standards... Okay, hang on. Please enunciate, because I can't tell if you said if it does or does not hold up. Or, Honestly, melee combat not only doesn't hold up, I did- It sounds like he says not only does it- it doesn't? What? The release of Fallout 4. Honestly, melee combat not only doesn't hold up- Melee combat not only doesn't- Okay, so the issue is that it's a double negative. It- Not only does it not- What state has the most boars? Um, I think Texas has like a really bad boar problem. That's what I heard, but that's also like where you can go if you want to like hunt boars from a helicopter. So it might just be popular to like, boar hunting might just be popular there. Like a lot of Midwest areas have boar problems because like that's where pig farms were by today's standards, but it doesn't even hold up by 2011 standards. Dragon's Dogma, as Mr. Caption points out in the clip, I... It, as Mr. Caption points out in the clip, I generously played for you. <laughs> played for you? As a combat system that is leagues better than Skyrim and came out in the same year as Skyrim. Hmm, I wonder if there's a key difference between how Dragon's Dogma presents melee combat and how Skyrim presents melee combat. It's almost like third-person melee combat systems are like a decade ahead of first-person melee combat systems. You know, weird. 
the Skyrim's melee combat system hold up by today's standards? No, with a capital E. Last but not least, we have Destruction Magic. So no Illusion Magic then? That's not a valid form of combat? If you're a mage, Destruction Magic is going to be a... So the case has been made that, like, um, boar hunting is, like... Open boar hunting is a really bad way of conserving the boar population because... Um, it means that, like, the local Department of Conservation... Like, Departments of Conservation will, like, trank boars which sounds like a skeptical claim in itself. I don't think it's possible. I don't think there's enough tranquilizer in the world to tranquil a boar, but regardless, they, they like capture the boars and like you know, give them tracking collars and uh, figure out like where they congregate and breed and then like uh, eliminate them that way. But it's like open boar hunting can create problems for that because you might kill like a boar that's being used for that purpose. Illusion magic is illegal in Skyrim videos. Primary means of dealing damage against other enemies. Unfortunately, destruction magic on its own is simply not a viable option, simply due to balance issues. The spells you need to cast are way too expensive, and you simply don't have a large enough magic pool. You literally have infinite magic right now. I can tell. I can see that like you're not using magic. But listen, what? That's like saying. I don't know, I feel like I could make this exact argument with melee combat, because like, oh yeah, you need block and an armor skill to use melee combat effectively. Like, is he gonna make the argument, oh, you have to enchant to use... Like, I'll agree that it's badly designed, but to say that it's badly designed because it's reliant on other skills is disingenuous because, like, stealth archery is, reliant, is a combination of sneak and archer. And melee combat is a combination of an armor skill and a melee skill. Where is the sport in gun hunting? Genuinely curious. Um, I mean, each hunter is going to have their own kind of morality when it comes to sport hunting. Uh, a lot of hunting isn't about sport, though. That that like that's the kind of argument I've seen a lot of people who like don't live in areas where hunting's unnecessary kind of make because there's only two there's like there's three ways to solve the deer problem okay the first way you solve the deer problem is you bring back you reincorporate uh the predators of deer mountain lions uh bears uh wolves into local ecologies that's not practical in a lot of uh occasions Tracking deer after it gets spooked is hard as fuck. Yeah, uh, as nice a notion as like tracking is, um, it's not really practical. Uh, no, this is DW Terminator, but he's got a cold. Um, but I mean, like, okay, you can reincorporate predators. Not really practical on most of the country. You can uh, just entirely wipe out the deer population also not practical because there are like ecological benefits to deer but you need some way to control the popu the deer population because otherwise you know they're going to be like you know constant roadkill incidents and then there is uh you know deer hunting programs and um a lot of people can have you can have an issue with deer hunting but at the end of the day a big part of hunting is focused on conservation plus it's like you know there's a ritual with hunting you have to wear special clothes there's special things you have to do you go out like way earlier than anybody logically would and you most people around here tree stand hunt because um you can't really go on like other people's property so it's like it would be basically impossible to track a deer without like violating somebody's property right um, so they tree stand hunt and then you gotta kill the deer and you gotta like skin it and eat it um, I live in an area where um, hunting is like one of the main ways people get food for the year so they'll get meat freezers and like um, you know it'll be like they have venison that goes for, for the whole year it's not all they eat but like 
it saves them a significant enough amount of money per year that they would have spent on food that um that like it's not impossible to live in this region and that's partially due to hunting but yeah it's one of those things like you can't just go oh well there's no sport in it so it shouldn't happen like it's a lot more complicated than that Potions to restore your magicka are a pain in the butt as well, since ingredients to make them are hard to come by. He's actually going to list the ingredients. Um, I didn't particularly have this issue. I made generous use of the um, of the planters to come up with like potion ingredients. Oh no, wait! I'm thinking of fortify destruction potions. I, he's talking about restore magicka potions. Seriously. Again, this is like, um, make all the same arguments, but with combat. Fatigue potions are hard to make. They're not, but I don't know. There's a lot bigger issues with magic than the potions are difficult. I mean, people do spear hunt. I don't know, why wouldn't bow hunting be a valid form of sportly hunting? You know people do that, right? Red mountain flower is all over the place, but you need at least one other ingredient to make a potion with. So in a majority of cases, you're going to be waiting patiently for your magic to recharge on it. There's a lot of complaints I have about magic. This is not the route I would have taken. Also, what's going on? Like, what the fuck? Is that like a bird on his it's hand? Own. It's like the exact right frame to look fucked up. All while being completely helpless. Seeing as you need Magicka to deliver both offensive and defensive spells, running around like a jackass is your only means of staying alive whenever you're out of Magicka. Now, some of you Sky fanboys right now are probably- Oh no, he's calling us out. Will be thinking, well, you can just get some enchanted armor that'll reduce the cost of your spells and even eliminate them altogether so your complaint is invalid. All right, so he's gonna say that's an exploit. Listen. I get it. You don't want to, like, 100% reduce your magicka costs, but that is an intended way of you playing. Like, it is an intended way of you playing with the system because enchanting is a magic skill. Now, it's badly designed and it's poorly tuned, and I'm not really sure, like, what the ideal cost reduction is for it to be challenging, but not inconvenient, like, where you have to stop. Um, it's a system where, like... Yeah, it's just inconvenient, but <sighs> this comes off like I need to talk about the magic system, but I don't really engage with the magic mechanics. In Skyrim, destruction is too expensive. It seems that Bethesda balance costs on using enchanted gear for discounts. But enchanting should only be a bonus, not a requirement to play the game normally. Oh god. Ugh, god. Um, no. Why would, why would, like, that's like, like, smithing is part of the balance of melee classes, and alchemy is part of the balance of stealth classes. Like, that's literally, like, you're supposed to use those skills. Those aren't, those aren't in the game as decoration. They're part of the, like, poor mechanical design of the game. What's the most annoying meme in Skyrim? Okay, Pleb answer is arrow in the knee. Patrician answer is the black hand. You can reduce a magic cost 100%. Fortify restoration on the Shalador Maze Circlet is an exploit and one I love in Skyrim. But fortify restoration in general is like a dumb effect. I don't know who thought that was a good idea. And it's just another instance of like, nobody gives a fuck about magic at Bethesda. Ideal cost reduction is 100% for all schools. Not maximizing health is asking for trouble. Um, 
Sure, I guess. I think maybe they balanced it around like you can get 100% Magicka reduction, but it's at the cost of stuff. But they, like, I don't know. I feel like nobody actually used the enchanting system when they were playtesting. Black hand meme. Yeah, it's the meme of every time you see a, a handprint out in the world, it's a Dark Brotherhood reference. Because not, literally, it's not like the handprint dipped in paint was one of the first painting techniques that cavemen came up with. Oh no, every handprint that's out there has to be a reference to the black hand. Yeah, that's why it bothers me. By the way, I can call you guys Skyrim fanboys because I'm a Skyrim fanboy myself. I have inward privilege. I'm looking at the game of... You take 1d20 psychic damage. Roll a d20. All right, I'm going to roll a d20. Oh, God, I just took 17 psychic damage. If I was a DM, I would call psychic damage cringe damage. Objectively, but I definitely love this game to death. Anyway, that just highlights... Like, why? Why? Why would you just stop and go, oh yeah, I can call you guys Skyrim fanboys because I love Skyrim to death. I rolled a nat 20. Fuck yeah, I'm dead! Finally. Guys. There's an hour left. There's a fucking hour left. God help- God please. Can Acer Thorin steal more Skyrim videos for us? So that we can just skip skip those parts. Like there's only 15 minutes of Acer Thorin left and literally everybody else. Uh, everybody else is like the majority of the remaining video. Another aspect of Skyrim's combat engine that I have to complain about. Just as Oblivion had scaled its enemies on the assault. Hey, I recognize this clip. It's from Will's video that the player was consistently obtaining plus five plus five plus five attribute bonuses with each level up causing the enemies to become too powerful for you after about level 10 unless you're see i don't think the issue with oblivion is that they assumed that you would be getting the max thing because even if you get the max upgrades per levels um it's still it's still bad like people People don't get the max upgrades per levels because that's the way you're supposed to do it. They get it because um, that's the, like the easiest way to do it. And like uh, fear of missing out is like a is a power is a powerful motivator too. You're doing efficient leveling. Skyrim's combat engine likewise seems to be balanced around the assumption that the player is going to be making maximum use of their crafting skills. Daedric and dragon weapons. Okay, so it's fair to say um, he probably is using Mr. Caption's footage, given that he literally just used Mr. Caption's video for like uh, seven minutes. Hey, hey, boys and wait, is it hey boys and girls? Boys and girls? Yeah, you don't have any girls watching your videos. I don't have any girls watching my videos. Actually, I do. But listen. Let's get a vertical slice Dark. here, shall we? This is my favorite thing. Let's get vertical slices on like random videos. That's just really, really like bringing the stream together. Rest you're leaving the stream to go watch wrestling? That's like a, whew, that's a cut. That's a real bad criticism of my content. You're. This is so b or well, not my content. Yeah. Okay.
So we're back to the Dark Souls video. Oh no. Oh no. This is our vertical slice. Well, yeah, I have very few women watching my uh, my work. I'm going to assume he has as few or less. I firmly do not believe that women watch these videos laughing my ass off. So I've had at least one woman, like, at me on Twitter saying that, like, um, she couldn't stop watching my Morrowind video because she was really attracted to the sound of my voice. So, I think that's the appeal, is like, if, if a girl likes my voice, then she's gonna like it for eight hours. <laughs> but I really can't see, like, uh, too many girls being, like, uh, super into Elder Scrolls lore, like, uh, the, it's the old meme of, wow, King, that sex was really poggers. But can we get back to talking about the entirety of the Elder Scrolls lore? <laughs> There's a clip for you right there. To Mario's world. Fallout 4 is often criticized for completely botching this important part of RPG story. He stole this footage. I think Indigo's right. I have an eye for this. I know exactly what is and isn't stolen footage. I'm telling you right now. Listen. Listen. You see how the, the name is censored out? It's pixelated. It's censored out. He doesn't want people to see the name because if they see the name... They, there's a chance they might be able to identify what the actual source of this clip is. Retelling. Your mission in the main quest is to rescue your infant son and avenge the murder of your spouse. Yeah, I know. It's super overbearing. It's really restricting on the types of characters that you can create. And overall, I think it was a really bad idea. All right, go on. Two characters who the player, as opposed to the player character, barely know the first names of, let alone have grown to care for. Now, while I disagree that the game actually botches this section of the story, see my full retrospective on that game for more details. No, I am not going to watch your full retrospective on Fallout 4 for more details on this extremely specific point. Just fucking say it! Go on. The fact that it is so criticized just goes to show how much RPG fans usually treasure this obligatory moment in their games. It provides essential context for your actions in the story. It shows that the player character has people who he cares about and who care about him. That's not necessarily true. Um, the reason that it was criticized is because it's difficult to create a character in Fallout 4 because of the heavy restrictions that the introduction places upon you. They don't criticize it because it's like, it's bad or it's poorly executed. In his Fallout 4 retrospective, he sources the footage from other people and also his own characters are named obscene stuff like cock smokers. God, he is a character. Hey, boy! He really is a character. Wow, okay. Black Mesa First Impressions. What the fuck do I fucking do? What's up, guys? Acer Thorn here, and this is going to be my first impression. On out, Gordon Freeman. Yeah, this footage looks like trash. It, there's a difference between get, spelling something out for me and giving me zero hints. How has it taken you 15 minutes to get to this point in the game? I and mean, where the hell do I go to get the hazmat suit? Close the damn door. Fuck it. 
I don't even care. Oh, this is. Be a dear and fetch me a roll of toilet paper. Tell me what this is. Hello? Share with me your indignation about this. Well, you trade me your hat, uh, your hazmat Would suit for a. Get me some toilet paper. Okay, so. These ludicrous penny loafers. So I need to get him a roll of toilet paper. It seems my locker just got something for you. So go grab another. Is he like doing a bit like, um. Is he doing a bit like, how do I, like he's intentionally bad, like I'm misunderstanding the game or something? He spends three episodes in the tutorial. Well, you got to give me context. Are they like three 10 minute episodes or are they like three 30 minute episodes? Dark Souls, Acer Thorn playthrough. So, uh, yeah, I read. This is 30 minutes. Okay, keys and Black Banish Phantom and Return Home. God, is it three 30 minute episodes? Wow. Sorry, I'm saw another random stream. What weapon is that and why are you doing? using it? She's just running into the fire. Okay, well, you know what? You got this buddy, you can do this. Wait. You can only chat if you subscribe to him. Yeah, this weapon sucks. Don't use it. Oh man, I can't I can't speed up or skip ahead on a live stream. And armor are not impossible to find in dungeon loot, but they are extremely rare. Doesn't say what level he is, but he doesn't have a lot of money. Um, extremely rare, you say? Extremely rare. Very rare, unless you hit like level 42 and then like it starts showing up all over the place. The Uji Katana, you get it by murdering the undead merchant. So if you want to participate in the Weebery, you have to murder a guy. I can believe that. And dragon weapons and armor are not impossible to find in dungeon loot, but they are extremely rare. Again, okay, this is a recurring issue. Uh, volume, kind of an issue. Really loud music, really bombastic music. Kind of hard to hear what you're saying. They were super rare in Morrowind, but at least they weren't random drops, so... <clears throat> well, actually, uh, there was Daedric stuff that you could get from random Golden Saints enemies. Despite being so rare, you could get them pretty early in the game if you already knew where to go and what to do. In Skyrim, if you want the best weapons and armor in the game, smithing is the only reliable way of obtaining them. Are you actually joking with me right now? Like, is this a meme? How, like, if you want to talk about video games, I would implore, I would implore you to try doing this revolutionary thing called playing them. Yeah. This wouldn't have been much of a problem if playing the game at later levels with inferior gear was a viable option. But the enemies just take way too many hits to go down unless you're maximizing your gear. Also, the game is balanced on the assumption that you're going to be tempering your weapons and armor before actually using them, and then putting enchantments on them. 
The game is simply unbalanced if you're not doing those things, and it's way too easy at higher levels if you are doing those things. Wow, it's almost like the game rewards you for interacting with the mechanics of the game. Smithing was a huge addition in Skyrim, but it's one that should have been optional. Instead, like efficient leveling in Oblivion, it's a mechanic that's touted- Okay, so you're just gonna blaze past the smithing should be optional bit? Can he not see that, like, every- all three of the playstyles in Skyrim, because there are only three. There are only three playstyles in Todd Howard's games. Um, all three of the playstyles have their own crafting skill. And all of the crafting skills are hybrids. Hmm. You should tell- you should play the games you talk about them. You should tell V of this revolutionary concept. That's true. I had a horrible stream. I imagined myself playing a video game. <laughs> you can play without smithing and enchanting. I did that my stealth playthrough three months ago. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. It's. I feel like there's a, a key word here that he hasn't mentioned, and it's difficulty, okay? Um, difficulty is like a big a big factor in this right it's like if you want to keep one hitting enemies you could try turning the difficulty down like i feel like he's leaving that out of the conversation because it might kind of ruin his argument i mean i don't like the i don't like the copium of if you have a problem with the system you should turn down the difficulty but if your primary complaint is that I'm not doing enough damage at high levels. They included a, a, a way for you to fix that problem. I guess he's one of those people that's like, but it's emasculating to turn the difficulty down. It's annoying to constantly tweak the difficulty, but it is like, I think it's an admitted part of their design philosophy. I think that's a thing. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Do you feel yourself becoming a Skyrim apologist due to the sheer amount of uninspired analysis you have to endure? Well, this happened with the Oblivion videos, too. Like, if you watch the Oblivion streams, I defend Oblivion a lot, uh, despite, like, my... Despite the way the video was, so... It's like, I don't know, I just want people to be right. You know what I mean? Or I just want to understand the ways that people are wrong so I can avoid the, those pitfalls. I'm basically, like, analyzing the play-by-play -play footage of a, a bunch of games to try and figure out the optimal strategy for uh, making my own game plan better. It's guess optional for a min-maxing playstyle, but is in fact mandatory just to keep pace with the rest of the game. Has anyone ever actually made a serious bid to play Skyrim at lower levels and not using smithing in any capacity? Just use the ebony weapons you loot off the Draugr without tempering them, and use only the armor that you can find as loot. It's not difficult. Ultra violence pistol starts only. I'm a man. Fights take forever, and since melee combat... Yeah, I think difficulties over adept are just for if your character becomes so ludicrously powerful that, like, you want to go back to, like, killing enemies in two hits. Then you can turn the difficulty up uh, to compensate for your overpowered build. But I don't think you're actually meant to play on master, dif on master or legendary difficulty as, like, a lifestyle. That is boring. The fights feel a lot longer than they actually are. Hell, maybe the fights aren't difficult per se, but they are certainly monotonous, and using smithing and enchanting is the only viable means of making them mercifully short. If it weren't for the crafting system, fights in Skyrim would be absolutely unbearable. Now, if it's any consolation, I personally find the crafting systems in Skyrim, taken in a vacuum, to be perfectly serviceable. The feeling- This is a, a classic Acer Thornism of- 
I'm gonna criticize something and then I'm gonna walk all of those criticisms back. Um, who was it that primarily, there was somebody who did this for the Oblivion video. They would make a criticism. They would like, uh, yeah, it was just like their entire video was, here's a criticism of Oblivion. Now I'm gonna walk it back. But yeah, it's like extremely annoying that I don't know why people feel the need to do this. Like, um, oh, my opinion on Skyrim is so controversial. I'm going to get in trouble for this one. I better ameliorate the fans. Ameliorate. Hang on. Make something bad or unsatisfactory better. Yeah, it's technically a good word for that. Never knows best if I recall correctly. I don't know. It's He clearly didn't understand that like I think part of magic's design is that you're supposed to use fortify destruction potions because destruction felt a lot better once I started getting really good at making them. ...of heading to a mine, digging up ore, smelting them into ingots, and forging those ingots into your own handmade weapons gives your newly crafted gear a sense of personal touch to them. Even if, as far as the game engine is concerned, these items are the exact same items that you can find out in dungeons, I still get the feeling that these items are my baby, because I made them myself, rather than- Ugh, resist the urge! Ugh, uh, oh god, I forgot. Don't say the joke, okay. Um, This is unrelated to his video. I think that smithing would benefit a lot from like uh, unlocking the the actual ability to make the equipment. Like, so the perk unlocks a quest where like you meet the master of I don't know glass smithing, and then like you have a quest where you go through the process of crafting a unique glass sword or something like that. You know what I mean? I think I've said on stream before that that's like something that would go a long way for making smithing actually feel like you're creating unique things. Finding them. The problem here isn't that the smithing skill isn't fun or rewarding. The problem is that it's mandatory when it should be optional. That with I don't think you made a particularly good case for why it is mandatory. Acer doesn't understand stuff, then he gets mad and blames the game. You know, that is kind of true. It, he's working under the assumption of... a self-forced bonus perk? But yeah, Acer Thorn is like... He's under the assumption that you have to smith to, like, be able to play the game at higher difficulties which I guess is true. But then he's making the false equivalence that um, because you have to smith to play at higher difficulties, that means that you have to smith. And it's like, well, you could also just play at like normal or low difficulty. But I guess that would be emasculating. I was able to play on legendary difficulty on all my characters without it being a massive pain in the ass. It was at the end of the playthrough, but I think that's what it's for is um, when Adept gets too easy, you play on Expert. When Expert gets too easy, you play on Master. When Master gets too easy, you play on Legendary. Or you just like, you know, one-shot things. Without it, combat is boring, unbalanced, and takes forever. And even with it, combat is still boring, just mercifully short. 
So, does Skyrim's combat hold up by today's standards? Hell no. I feel like he literally just dropped the Mr. Caption video in the timeline and didn't really like edit it down or anything like that to make it fit. A self-forged bonus perk, like bonus damage or armor for making it yourself. No, not in vanilla Skyrim. Uh, but the the perks would make you better at tempering equipment. So it's like if you got the steel perk, then you could like max out the temper on like a steel weapon. Changing the difficulty requires me to go into Skyrim's menus. Yes, but I will say that there's a there's not as much like difficulty dancing in Skyrim as there is in Oblivion. So you don't have to constantly like modulate the difficulty like I'm fighting this enemy, I need to turn it down. I'm fighting this enemy, I need to turn it up. Generally speaking, you can just like you can go a long time on the same difficulty setting. What's this background? This is a like is this like a ceiling that's been painted blue? Like, what's going on here? So... Oh, God. Good job of taking Oblivion's often awkward-looking modeling and making it a lot better, and particularly in terms of what people look like. Oh, sorry. I was just watching the part of the, D the DW Terminator video that made me want to stop watching it, which is... I really hate... Like, this is such a gamble. This is such a gamble. There's no way that this is not going to be him just saying that graphical fidelity is aesthetics. I could be wrong. Acer Thorn could be surprisingly based at some times, but yeah, there's no way. I don't know. Using someone's video for seven minutes, I don't think is is plagiarism. I think that's just stealing. Like, I think there are limits on what people should reasonably accept as a as a claim of uh, it being fair. You know, you know what I mean? Like... But what about the game's aesthetic presentation? Does that hold up? You played Oblivion to level 46? What the fuck is wrong with you? So what about the game's aesthetic presentation? Does that hold up? Well, there are two aspects to a game aesthetic pres- I feel like... Did he say that the combat, if the combat held up? I feel like he just kind of ended that section. Also, I think the, the transcript is like off. Okay, so like he has one sentence paying off. Like, yeah, wait. Hang on. Still boring, just mercifully short. So, does Skyrim's combat hold up by today's standards? Hell no. Okay. So he does mention it. I just glossed over it because I'm taking psychic damage watching this video. Who the fuck plays Oblivion past level 20? That's what I'm wondering. What kind of, what kind of psychopath are you? I honestly prefer smithing wasn't patched because now it requires 2,000 iron daggers to max out the skill. Is that... There's no way he said that. There's no fucking way he doesn't... Like, please. Just... Experiment. Look it up. Figure it out. Oh, they nerfed it. Like, he thinks that they nerfed it for balance reasons. I don't think he realizes that, like... No, they changed it so that experience comes from value to discourage spamming iron daggers. God. 
Okay. Hold up. Well, there are two aspects to a game aesthetic presentation, the graphics and the audio. Okay, interesting. Um, so aesthetics is uh, the combination of graphics and audio. That's not really a position I've heard a lot of people take. Uh, typically, aesthetics is used to describe like just the visual components, and then like audio is separate. But sure, okay. I feel like this is really going that route of graphical fidelity equals aesthetic design. For a game that came out in 2011, the graphics hold up surprisingly well. Oh god. I'm dreading it. I'm dreading it. I'll be a pleb and ask why graphic fidelity isn't an art style. Is it because there's no mortal... No mere mortal can replicate the art style of our Lord Almighty? No. Um, graphical fidelity is not art styles. Art styles are independent of stuff like texture quality or anything like that, right? Like polygon counts or stuff like that. Games with low polygon counts and like uh, low resolution textures can still have good art styles. Graphics are the things that age. Art style is the thing that um that doesn't age like it, it it's visually consistent like whenever you play skyrim its art style is independent of its graphical fidelity 10 years later skyrim looks bad 10 years from now skyrim will look bad skyrim looked bad looked bad when it came out like it seriously looked like a joke how bad skyrim's textures were at launch um they literally remastered the game within five years because of how not good Skyrim looked, right? But its visual aesthetic is something that's timeless. Now, is its visual aesthetic good? I would say not particularly. Uh, the vanilla game looks like somebody who has like seasonal affective disorder and then like, uh, what is it? Special edition is kind of like the opposite problem. like. Um, you can't just pump up the saturation and expect it to look good. But yeah, so yeah, this seems like it's going in that graphics is our aesthetic. Frankly, we're rapidly approaching an era where advancements in graphics technology is producing diminishing returns in terms of the improved visuals that we can actually see with our analog eyes. In 2016, Bethesda released a remake for Skyrim known as Skyrim Special Edition. The primary aim of Yeah, it's like this video is still accurate. Um, there's a new version of Skyrim out. It doesn't really change the visual aesthetics of the game, but it seems like something that should be mentioned. This re-release was to bring Skyrim to the next generation of consoles and, in the process, give console gamers, for the first time ever, the power to mod their games. Yeah, we'll get to that near the end of the retrospective. However, while the special edition certainly requires quite a bit more graphical horsepower than the 2011 release does, I have to ask, does that increased GPU requirement actually translate into better visuals? Yes. Anal. Sorry. I need to lube up this uh, fucking microphone boom arm. It's getting creaky. No, not really. People that think we achieved diminishing returns are dumb. I Yeah, I've heard this argument before, and I've never been particularly convinced by it. Because, like, there's still big innovations to be made. To show you what I mean, let's look at some side-by-side -side comparisons between the original Skyrim and Special Edition. Here's one. Here's another one. Here's a third. Honestly, I can't tell much difference. This I've... Oh, God. Okay. 
Problem number one. You didn't show those visual examples long enough for me to really process what the fuck was going on. Two, why is it only 75% of the frame? So not like... It's one. Three, okay. You didn't blur the background. So the background details are distracting, and I like I can't really focus on what's going on with the examples Here's that you're giving us so quickly. One. Here's a third. Okay. Four. Honestly, I can't tell much difference. You can't tell a difference between Skyrim and the special edition. You can't there's no difference between these two pictures. Chat, can we find the difference between these two pictures? I guess I'm kind of in the way. There you go. There you go. Get a get a good look see. Give me a one in the chat if you can tell a difference between this comparison, and give me a two in the chat if you're just incapable of seeing a difference between these two images. That's right. The difference is that there's a quest marker slightly to the right on the right side in the special edition version. <laughs> Whereas the quest marker is to the left of the west point. But yeah, he had the same problem in this video. Let's see, where in the video is it? Am I going crazy here? About two thirds of the game map boasts lush forests, majestic waterfalls, glistening lakes, and enough different colors of flora that you could make an oil painting entirely out of strategically placed flowers and then flying up to the sky and looking straight down. Do yourselves a favor. Head over to the Guardian Stones, stand directly behind the Mage Stone, and face due west. Use console commands to ensure that the weather- Breathe, my guy, breathe. And then cut the breaths out. But yeah, of course you see a difference. He, like, has this issue, like... I don't think he understands... Visual aesthetics. I don't think it, like, a lot of the video comes off as just, like, regurgitating stuff that he's heard from other content creators, and I think because there's not a lot of content creators out there that can really speak the visual language, um, that he doesn't really know what to say, so it's like, but, I don't know, that doesn't explain why he can't tell the difference between these two images. I'm trying to show some of the other examples. All right, so special editions on the left, normal editions on the right. It's like you can't tell the difference in the color palette. You can't tell the difference in like the visual effects that are being used. Like, okay, so special editions now on the right. That's another thing, is like he keeps switching what side the shit's on. So it's like you can't tell the difference between like the levels of saturation or the colors that are being used or like the effects that are on screen. Is he not taking the piss being intense and out of breath like that? Uh, well, yeah, it's the old Chris Chan question of, is this performance art? Is this, is Acer Thorn an extremely talented performance artist who's, like, laying all of us? But I doubt it. There's no way that you can hold that kind of performance art. Uh, that sort of interest in playing a character like that for years. He's been doing it for years. It would be one thing, if, like... I would be more skeptical if, like, um, over the course of six months, he had, like, a bunch of bad takes, but there was, like, a mysterious work ethic to it where it's, like, 
it's not just that he has bad takes, but that like, he has had like a lot of them in a very short amount of time. But this is from 2019. And I mean, he is out and about right now, uh, getting into like fights with people on the internet. I'm immensely curious. Brace yourselves, everybody. I'm, I'm serious. Hold, hold, hold yourself down. If you've got armrests, I want you to plant your hands on them, uh, because I really don't want you to get hurt by watching this. If your sex life was a country, what country would it be and why? The UK, because BBC. Really? Is that what you've been reduced to, Acer Thorn? Reddit text to speech videos. Country. Okay, hang on. Weren't you banned from Reddit? I thought they banned Acer Thorn because, like, he was filing so many, like, frivolous copyright claims. Holy fuck. I'm jumping down the rabbit hole, boys. Okay, here we go. Acer Thorn asks on the Twitch subreddit, Can I set my subscriber-only chat to exclude gifted subs? The whole point of subscriber-only chat is that only my greatest supporters are allowed to chat. But if you were only gifted a sub, you aren't exactly a big supporter. Prime subs and paid subs are the ones truly deserving of that distinction. So is there any way I can set my sub only chat to paid and prime subs only? And uh This thread did not go over particularly well for him. This is some wild shit. This is, like, legitimately some wild shit. <laughs> so, he's, like... Faulty generalizations. Overwhelming exception. An accurate generalization that comes with qualifications that eliminates so many cases that what remains is much less impressive than the initial statement might have led one to assume. Why did he post that? This is wild. He posted his Fallout New Vegas sucks and here's why video on the Bethesda Softworks subreddit, the Fallout New Vegas subreddit. This is wild. Holy shit. I'm sorry if this doesn't make for particularly interesting content, but it's like, he's like a Reddit, like his, his grift now is like, I'm going to go on Reddit and make posts. And if they get like tons of upvotes, I'm going to show, I'm going to do a text to speech video short on YouTube about it. I don't even know what a gifted sub is. Why is that a bad thing? Why is that something you can be entitled about? Another one. Here's a third. Honestly, I can't tell much difference. Oh god, I can't tell a difference. The special edition certainly has some increased levels of glare from the sun. Hmm, that seems like a difference. But as far as looking more realistic is concerned, the differences are negligible at best. Okay, why... Do you really think the goal of the special edition was to make Skyrim look more realistic? Or That sounds like a bit out of the bounds of what that version of the game could accomplish.
The increased glare from the sun comes off more like an artistic choice by the graphics team, rather than a genuine leap forward in making the graphics more realistic. This just comes off as ignorant. Compare that to the graphical leap that Oblivion made compared to Morrowind. What are you showing me? What is on my screen right now? Why? Or why is this the example that you chose to give? Okay. On the right hand side, we have the guard that asks you what race you are in Morrowind, but he's been heavily modded to look like a Ken doll. On the left hand side, we have an Oblivion custom character that has been made intentionally ugly, but not so much so as to break the illusion. What's his goal here? Is he like... He's uplifting Morrowind, and he's downgrading Oblivion. It... But he's making the claim that like... Oblivion was like he's making the claim that like Oblivion was a step forward but then he's like showing the worst possible example of why that is there's no way this isn't performance art compare that to the graphical leap that Oblivion made compared to Morrowind or the leap that Morrowind made compared to Daggerfall again a heavily modded version of Morrowind compared to just stock Daggerfall This is... Wow, this is some wild shit. The difference is night and day. Should I have ice cream before bed? Uh, I don't think so. No. As I said a moment ago, we're rapidly approaching a point where graphics are being bottlenecked by the human eye's ability to distinguish an increase in graphics. I remember something that the at-the-time president of Nintendo, the late Satoru Iwata, said at one of the 2005 Game Developers Conferences. He was defending Nintendo's at-the-time new and controversial corporate agenda of innovating new ways for the player to interact with the game, like the newly released Nintendo DS and the in-development Nintendo Wii, rather than focus on increasing graphical and processing power of their consoles. In defense of this controversial policy, Iwata said the following. Someday our games won't look any better. What will we do then? If we aren't already knee-deep in that era right now, that era is certainly just around the corner. I... oh god. Well, we also can't increase graphics anymore because there's a chance it could cause people's computers to explode. <laughs> like... How do I broach that? Every time... I have a moment where I'm in just stunned disbelief about something that somebody says. There's always somebody in the comments who shows up that's like, Mr. Patrician was always so on point. I don't know if on point's the right word to use, but like, Mr. Patrician is always so uh, willing to break down why someone's wrong, but he didn't do it in this instance. Yeah, what the fuck do I say? I feel uh, like... I'm not going to make it to the end of this video if I try to explain what exactly is wrong with what he just said. I just don't think that he gets it. Why would the special edition be a leap forward in graphical fidelity? Do you really think that that's something that's like possible? Like that's extremely ambitious. And also, are you one of those, like, the human eye can't see more than 24 frames a second, people? Like, really? You're of the belief that graphics are just so good. They're just so good that the human eye, because it physically exists, can't see the difference? Like, what do you mean the human eye is analog and can't see the difference? 
the can't see the differences in visual fidelity. Are you serious? Like, we're not fucking moles. We're not mole people. Like, the human eye can see a lit match from like five miles away, right? You can see a lot of visual detail. I've heard the mania theory before that he's, um, he's like symptomatic of mania. I'm not going to go so far. I'm, I'm not going to go the route of psychoanalysis just yet, but you know, there is still like 50 minutes. So does Skyrim's graphics still hold up? Yes, I would say they do. Okay. Let me understand your logic here. Skyrim's graphics hold up in 2022, even though this video came out in 2019. They hold up in 2022. Like, that's one of those things, like, you can't keep updating the title because it's still accurate. You mean to say that the graphical fidelity argument is still accurate in 2022? There's nothing that happened in the last three years. There, there's been no big push in a certain graphics technology. No shor GPU sor shortages or really anything worth noting. Nothing's happened. Listen, your argument is that Skyrim is so realistic that any updates to it are diminishing returns. The human eye can't tell the difference because you can't tell the difference for some reason. And that the graphics hold up as a consequence. This has to be performance arts. He could be a mole person. He's dug a pretty big... He's dug a really deep hole for himself with this video. With all his videos in general. This is the tame one, guys. Guys, this is the tame one. This is the one where he's reasonable. It only, his YouTube, his, his takes only went downhill from this point forward. I don't know, the Morrowind video predated this, but. Ready knee deep into that era right now? That era is certainly just around the corner. So does Skyrim's graphics still hold up? Yes, I would say they do. But what about the game's audio presentation? Unlike the graphics, the technical ability to present audio reached its plateau long ago. For the entirety of the 21st century, audio presentation has been exclusively artistic rather than technical. On one hand, it makes the question of whether the audio presentation holding up... Really? You're gonna make the claim that, like, audio engineering is just... It's been mastered. It's like Star Trek. We live in a post-scarcity society when it comes to audio engineering. Well, I can see with the audio engineering that you've shown in this video why you might think that. Um, I mean, there's stuff like... We've made developments in the way that, like, music mixing is handled from a software perspective like since Skyrim came out. You know, there are certain points when writing a script when you need to stop and think, this argument shouldn't be based on anecdotes. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's why graphics arguments are bad because it's pretty much entirely just subjective. Here's my opinion on how this game looks. Whereas if you talk about art style, there's a lot more objective things that you can note. Because, hey, it turns out that there is an entire discipline of study to the art of visual composition. And there are probably some people who are fucking seething right now listening to this. Because they studied this professionally and are just hearing you just take a 
fat shit all over it in your ignorance. I mean, I feel like this is going to be my moment for that because I'm, I'm like really big into like sound engineering. So like, he's just about to take a fat shit over stuff I know about. An entirely subjective one. It makes the question of whether the audio presentation holding up an entirely subjective one. But the graphics argument, like, by implication, the graphics argument wasn't subjective? Like, are you serious, my guy? Or are you... Okay, is he about to say just like with the section... On the other hand, just like with the section regarding Skyrim's story... Oh, no, never mind. He doesn't. He, he's not going to go that route. Okay, so audio. his opinions on audio engineering are entirely subjective, but his opinion on graphics and fidelity... Oh, that's subjective. That's where he knows what he's talking about. That's where he's experienced. It saves me from having to compare Skyrim to other RPGs. I'm lazy and don't want to compare the audio with other RPGs because it would be really difficult and I'd actually have to play those fucking games. So, uh, I'm just gonna focus on Skyrim. Hey, I've got an idea for you. Why don't you just do that for the entire video? Why bother with the comparisons to other role-playing games? I know that's part of your stupid, uh, does it hold up in 2022 gimmick. Um, but to be honest, making comparisons to The Witcher 3 and Kingdom Come Deliverance is hardly a comprehensive understanding of, like, role-playing games in the last decade. So, um, no, I don't think it's necessary. You should just include, you should just talk about Skyrim and mention Oblivion and Morrowind if you want. Audio quality can be divided into three major categories, music, sound effects, and voice acting. Proceed. As for his music, Skyrim certainly has one oblivion of an edge on its competition, because its music is composed by a master composer, Jeremy Soul. <laughs> Sorry, you got his, his cock in your mouth. Yeah, Jeremy Soul's pretty good. Jeremy Soul's really good. I feel like that almost doesn't even need to be stated. Yeah, everybody knows that Skyrim is a really good soundtrack made by a really good composer. I wonder if graphics as a criterion is based on the way magazines rated them back in the day. Well, yeah, that's like a big... So, like, if the theory is holding that, like, the reason he's doing this is that, like, he watched a lot of analysis videos and he wants to get in on doing it, then um, it's fair to say that, like, he's regurgitating stuff that he's heard other people talk about. And, unfortunately, a lot of the, the discourse is, like, uh, is of that caliber. Yeah, I'll talk about Skyrim VR. Oh, you yeah, trust me. Is there a way I can't talk about Skyrim VR? Like, that's the kind of production value that is going into the Skyrim video. Is like, not only am I talking about the other versions of the game, including the Anniversary Edition, because that's relevant, I'm also talking about Skyrim VR. I wonder if, like... I entertain the notion of just doing the review of Skyrim VR, but I, that, it's not practical. I thought about, like, why wouldn't you put ambience as its own category? Because, like, there's a world of difference between sound effects and ambience. I hate the whole outdated mentality people have on games. This game doesn't feel good to play, so it's outdated. Get the fuck out. Yeah, I have the exact same issue with it. Like, I don't think games age. I don't think media ages in general. I think it's, it's, complete, it's, it's a non-starter. Soul's talent for video game music knows no bounds. In addition to the songs he writes being objectively good. Wow. Wow. Please don't. Don't say it. Don't say that it's objectively good. I'd love Acer Thorne to be on EFAP. <laughs> Can you imagine the maelstrom that would happen if Acer Thorne got into an argument about objectivity on EFAP with like Mauler? They have a distinct advantage over most other video game soundtracks. They are emotionally neutral. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait.
Considering my argument about neutrality or realism in the presentation of an Elder Scrolls game, you might be expecting me to denounce the series for having background music, because music evokes emotion. Having a neutral visual presentation wouldn't mean much if it was accompanied by tracks that were clearly trying to invoke a certain mood, regardless of how good those tracks were. Thankfully, I don't have to denounce the music of The Elder Scrolls, thanks to the consistently masterful work of Jeremy Soule. It's tough to praise the soundtracks without accidentally slipping into sentence after sentence of adjective-laden hyperbole. But hyperbole may be perfectly appropriate when describing Oblivion's soundtrack, because its inspiration and objective were both incredibly dramatic. According to Soule, his primary insp- Corporate has asked me to find a difference between uh, these two images. <laughs> that was like one of the weakest points of Will's video is when he was talking about the music and like how it's emotionally neutral. And I disagree with this perspective. And Acer Thorn seems to just have wholesale lifted that opinion from Will's video. Whatever you're feeling as you boot up the game, Skyrim's soundtrack will somehow make you feel more of that. This this is the uh, same energy as uh, as the old uh, Rayloff greeting you with a smile meme. Had a bad day at work and need a catharsis killing bandits? Soul soundtrack will make it that much more satisfying to chop someone's head off. I thought it was emotionally neutral. I don't think emotional neutrality can really provide a sense of catharsis. Yeah, I can go the distance. I'm actually surprised that I've been a like, this has gone on for eight hours and he hasn't shown up. So that's pretty good. Just got out of a really terrible breakup? Soul's soundtrack will make you even sadder that you'll never see her again. So it's not emotional. It's, it's not emotionally neutral. It's sad. Unless you're making the argument that it's like, it's a emotional amplifier. Whatever you're feeling is amplified because it's emotionally neutral. Which, I don't know, that sounds stupid to me. Skyrim's soundtrack made me want to kill myself after my breakup. No, I don't think I've named any of the, uh... I haven't... I, I mean, I've named the Dunmer girl, because she's the... She's kind of the main character of the Skyrim video. You should make Rayloff smile when wide when you show off the intro during your video and not mention it at all. I almost feel like that's too deep a cut to not at least mention. You know what I mean? See, a cute thing about this detail, right? Um, Falmer girl is blind, so she doesn't necessarily know that, like, her hair is covering her eyes. Just got back from an intense workout? Okay, okay. Stop right there. You just got back from an intense workout? Come on. Come on. I'm trying not to be mean, but you're making it too difficult not to make jokes this is like this fruit is not just it's not low hanging it's not on the ground it is literally hovering in the air at like sternum level right all i have to do is reach forward and grab it that is it, like it is the perfect height for me to grab this fruit it's not low hanging it's perfect I'm trying not to be mean. I'm trying not to be mean. Because it won't accomplish anything with this guy. But it's too easy. And I know that, like, leading people up to the insult is basically the same as making the insult. But... Soul soundtrack will help you relax. Okay, so I definitely don't think he's done any intense workouts because, yeah, the number one thing I want to do after an intense workout is just relax, you know, without the slightest la lay back on the couch. Yeah, that's how you end up sore the next day. 
You have to wind down from a workout. You don't relax. Hint of hesitation, I could safely say that Skyrim's music holds up splendidly. The I don't like I stand by my opinion that that section was unnecessary. Because it's almost just assumed. Skyrim's got good music. Unless you have something to say about Skyrim's music, don't say anything about it. Or like don't spend more than a sentence on it. The sound effects are a little bit tougher of a nut to crack. They don't- I've not just been streaming for eight hours. I've been streaming for eight hours and I haven't made any money from it. This is a charity show. Well, no, it's not a charity show because nobody benefits from this. But it is free. Yeah, but why would hair touching your face bother you compared to the back of your head? Are you biased against the back of your head? You know, it works just as hard as your face. I don't have Jeremy Soul's master hand behind them, but fortunately I would have planned them. But whose hand is behind them? Can you name them? Can you name them? It's not like there's an Beth entire Bethesda podcast about fucking... I think his name is Mark Lampert. Yeah, it's not like there's an entire Bethesda podcast about the guy where he talks about his process. And he talks about how Emil, like, kicked down the door and, like, blasted his computer monitor with a shotgun and said, Get up, pussy. Uh, we're going to Disneyland. They are certainly adequate for what they set out to do. However, I wish to reemphasize what I said a moment ago. He said re-emphasize, but the CC fucked it up so badly that it heard reinforce. I don't know. This is These sentences are starting to become too coherent. But this is all subjective. That just leaves voice acting. Oh yeah, I forgot he divided it into three categories. So, like, you just have nothing to say then. It's just subjective. Wow, thanks for your contribution. Uh, I'm here all night, everybody. <clears throat> like, really? That's what... That's your contribution to the conversation. Skyrim's sound design is subjective. Any chance of a vampire VTuber model? I hadn't thought about that. That is the direction I can go. It wouldn't be too difficult, because, like, vampire teeth is already something you can do with the VTuber software. Skyrim boasts an all-star voice cast. Okay, that is an ambitious claim if I've ever heard one. Go on. Nearly every NPC who is important to a major questline. Uh, remember Mercer Frey? Remember, like, all of the companions? Or the College of Winterhold? He didn't even comment on the fact that Mesa sound like fucking swords. He gave an extreme, like... He's got all sorts of opinions about aesthetics that he doesn't understand, but something that he might uh, he might have a superficial understanding of because he's a YouTuber who has to like, you know, work with audio. He's got no opinions on sound effects. He has a unique voice actor, but what about the generic NPCs? You know, the guys who aren't part of quests or are part of a minor quests? They usually share a small pool of generic voice actors. However, the voice actors Bethesda selected for them are so skilled at what they do that even though they technically have the same voice, you honestly don't notice it unless you're paying really close attention. I don't know, this sounds subjective. Like, really? Because the voice talent Bethesda hired for this game is so damn good that they are able to convey completely different personalities with their voices just by carefully controlling the tone and inflections in their voice. To show you what I mean, here's a series of voice clips from generic voice actors in Skyrim. Holy fuck. Holy fuck. You're telling me that you're going to provide examples? Where's this Acer Thorn been for the last two hours? There are seven different clips across three different voice actors, one male and two female. Despite not seeing any visuals on screen, I think the majority of you can instantly tell which characters these people are just by the way their lines are delivered. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Has the whole city lost their brains? 
I've been scrying and auguring to find the murderer myself. Okay, come on. You gotta give generic voice lines. Like, legit, this is part of, like, a major quest. This is fucking the, the court wizard guy from Windhelm. You're really gonna have me tee off on some super easy references? Come on. Give me some obscure voice actors from some fucking village in the middle of nowhere. This isn't over. I catch you sending one letter to- Yeah, this is the Jarl of Dawnstar. General Tullius, I'll have you both executed. As my Thane, I'm sworn to your service. This is the generic female voice actor for uh, the House Carls. I think there's several uh, females that have this voice line. I'll guard you and all you own with my life. Splendid! There's a house available right now. It was difficult at first. I could not tell you who that... It's a steward, but I could not tell you who it is. The Nords of the city are at best suspicious of outsiders. In I think this is the steward of... Uh, Riften? In fact, I once took a seaside stroll on a moonlit night and discovered a unicorn, which I proceeded to stab in the throat with a crochet needle. It is clear that Bethesda- Okay, no, that- That might- that has to be a, a court wizard. ...to spare no expense with their audio presentation. Was that seven examples? With an all-star voice cast, a serviceable selection of sound effects, and a score composed by one of the greatest video game Wait, music composers are you serious? to ever walk the face that's of your, the earth. That's your section on the voice acting is just... Hey, just, like, listen to these people. You got... A, you played seven minutes straight of, of Mr. Caption, but you couldn't be bothered to, like, go more in-depth on this stuff? Skyrim is an audio masterpiece. With every fiber of my being, I can safely give Skyrim's audio the holds up by today's standards seal of approval. Oh, well. Truly, what a... what a masterful... What a masterful claim. Some that are just weird. Because they... And then, there, of course, there's the animations, which sometimes actually take you out of the... Damn, I was hoping... There's a part of this video where, like, it goes... Skyrim's sound effects are just wimpy. Like, I think that's the, like, the far opposite of, like, what just Acer Thorn just subjected us to. Gabriella from the Dark Brotherhood. Oh, yeah, of course. I should have figured that. Wait, does he mean 2019 or 2022? Uh, he means 2020, actually. Oh, uh, God. Can you read the description? What's this visual background? Truly, wonders abound. A massive world is great and all, but RPGs are boring if there's nothing to do in the games other than just run around like a jackass and raid whatever dungeons you come across. Sounds subjective, man. Fortunately, Skyrim boasts a massive quest log, with literally hundreds of hours of quest content. Hundreds? Hundreds? I think you're being charitable to say that the game has a hundred hours of content. And also, we live in an era when, like, games can absolutely be too, too big. Counting radiant quests? No, no, listen. Skyrim audio can't be terrible because it's subjective. Quests only once each? Sky and Acer Thorn is the one that's making the video. Okay, so he's counting radiant quests once. Skyrim boasts an astonishing 453 different quests that can be completed. By contrast, a comprehensive list of quests from Witcher 3 suggests that the game has only 358 quests to complete. That's certainly an impressive number, but Skyrim still has Witcher 3 beat. You, you, you don't know, you, you, you can't tell what's wrong with this argument. You wrote this down. You presumably, at some point, read it back. And then you recorded the audio and you never once thought to yourself, what is wrong with this argument?
seriously. Does it take mental brain power to figure out what's wrong with this argument? Well, that explains why G-Man's lives video was good. He can explain what he thinks. Most other videos just have a are just a to-do list with no ounce of analysis. Yeah, G-Man lives has opinions. He shares those opinions. He actually has things to say about the game and not just an explanation, like a report of his time playing it. And um, also he's really based and thinks that mods don't fix it. Like seriously, how do you say, how do you say this ironically? Witcher 3 has less quests than Skyrim, so Skyrim has it beat. Like, did he not? Did he not? Did he not say something about quantity and quality earlier? Like, am I wrong? Am I crazy? Oh, hang on. We got another clip. Wow, King, that sex was really poggers. But can we get back to talking about the entirety of the Elder Scrolls lore? Wow, King, that... Nice. There's just, there's no way he's saying this ironic, unironically. A massive quest log with literally hundreds of hours of quest content. Counting Radiant quests only once each, Skyrim boasts an astonishing 453 different quests that can be completed. By contrast, a comprehensive list of quests from Witcher 3 suggests that the game has only 358 quests to complete. That is certainly an impressive number, but Skyrim still has Witcher 3 beat. However, that's only... He's saying it a case of quantity what about the quality of the quests he's saying it he he thought about it he thought about it he thought about it and he still said it he it went through his brain he processed that there's a quantity versus quality argument to be made he thought about it and he still said the words Skyrim has more quests, so it beats The Witcher 3. I have actually heard Skyrim's quests be criticized as heavily boring and repetitive. I would like to play another segment for you from Mr. Caption's Skyrim analysis. Okay, let's 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 increment the counter. This is adding on to the seven minutes that you already stole. You stole that clip, okay? You didn't you didn't like that just breaks the reasonable social contract that we have of like there's a i can understand wanting to oh my god i can understand wanting to cite something that mr caption says because there is some stuff that he says that is insightful but you just wholesale lifted part of his video and now you're doing it again because you're going to explain like i'm breaking down i am breaking down I am dying inside. This is insane. I am so glad that I'm finishing this video. Heavily boring and repetitive. I would like to play another segment for you from Mr. Caption's Skyrim analysis. You know what sounds more interesting than talking? All right. So we start at 201.20. Talking about a quest where we go get a thing? Talking about all of the quests where we coincidentally go and get a lot of things. 201.20. To two oh three, so we're just gonna say that's two minutes, right? We all agree that's two minutes. Okay, so we're up to nine minutes of content you just lifted from Mr. from somebody else's video. And talking about a quest where we go get a thing, talking about all of the quests where we coincidentally go and get a lot of things. I do not understand the appeal of these quests. Of all the quests I've played, and I tried to play a lot of them, I found myself doing a lot of either walking into a dungeon, or fetching a thing, and oftentimes a combination of those two. 
The amount of fetch quests in Skyrim is insane. And oftentimes quests that should in no way be either just a dungeon crawl or a fetch quest are. Like, for example, this Dawnbreaker sword thing. It makes zombies explode. F***ing awesome. How do I get it? You run through a dungeon. You run through a dungeon and you kill a guy at the end who has a bunch of pet ghosts. And he also turns into a ghost, which is really nothing more than him getting a second health bar. Not kidding. Okay, what about this Azor- Okay, so it's like... I feel like it's being set up to be like... I'm going to explain why he's wrong about this because I think he disagrees with him because obviously like um, Acer Thorn is like praising the quests, I assume, and Mr. Caption is criticizing them. So there's got to be like an epic rebuttal. Or the star thing. It's apparently a soul gem that allows for an infinite number of souls to pass through it. A massively useful tool for enchantment. I will not have people complaining about Mr. Caption's voice when we've been listening to Acer Thorn. I won't have that. Where do I get that? Dungeon. F***ing surprise, am I right? That's not to mention all the other quests. For example, right now, right in Whiterun, I can remember at least three quests where I had to just go somewhere, get a thing or a person in one case, and come back, and that was the quest. I tried specifically finding cool quests by asking people on Twitter where to look, and honest to god, the only answer I actually got was quest mods. Mods. However, I would have to respectfully disagree. As far as gameplay is concerned, Skyrim may have a formula to it for better or worse, but this formula is merely a skeletal structure that is fleshed out with the individual twists and events of each quest. To show you what I mean, let's take a look at one of my personal favorite side quests, Mistwatch, which begins when you approach the fort of the same name. Seriously? Um... Hang on. Okay, never mind. Continue. A Nord named Krister believes his wife Fiola has been kidnapped by the bandits of this force. So basically, and asks you to rescue her because he has no combat skills. Why he didn't hire a few mercs before coming here is anyone's guess, but that's not the point. Yeah, that's completely unreasonable. Whoever would make foolish decisions when their loved ones are at risk? Anyways. So my understanding is that he's, his counter-argument to Mr. Caption's claim that Skyrim's quests are boring and repetitive, which I would say is a fairly reasonable position to hold, is to cherry-pick your personal favorite quest in the game and then say, well, see, this quest is different. Anyway, you work your way through the dungeon and ultimately meet the bandit chief. You literally just said you just, you'd go through a dungeon. It was actually Fiola herself not kidnapped by the bandits, but having joined them willingly. Now, I will be the first to admit that the dungeon itself is nothing to write home about. It's basically just your standard Skyrim bandit dungeon crawl, but that's not the point. What no, that is the point. That was... That was literally his point. His point was that the quests are just dungeon crawls. So the fact that this quest is just an unmemorable dungeon crawl... That's his point. What's wrong with you? <laughs> what makes this quest memorable is the story being told. The setup and plot twists that book in the dungeon are the real focus of this quest. Then again, it is important for me to emphasize that this is subjective. I so what's the point, then? What's it matter? Why do I care? Love a good story in my video games, and so I'll forgive a slightly dull dungeon layout if the story is good. Oh yeah, well you think Marvel movies are shit? Well that's subjective. And it's like, cool, I'm glad you've basically boiled the conversation down to it being literally impossible for us to actually have any kind of meaningful dialogue. Oh no, trust me. Like, this whole video is him, like, he sets up a point and then like he just takes a sledgehammer and he knocks out the supports. The best way I've seen this done is in Tisnaker's Greedfall video. He mentioned Mr. B-Tongue's Mass Effect Andromeda predictions, then put the video in the description. There's lots of ways to do it, and this is wrong. <laughs> I know there's not a lot of people out there who are big fans of, like, I think I, I saw on Twitter somebody complaining, like, I really don't like when analysis videos are, like, talking about other analysis videos, and it's like, cool, 
Uh, it was it was a games journalist, so your opinions are literally worthless. But listen, I, I understand it's not for everybody. Not everybody has the the capability or even the desire to want to kind of engage in like discussions. I know there's a lot of people out there who just want to be preachers, who just want to uh, step up to the pulpit, uh, shit out their opinions onto the internet, and then like get paid for it. Trust me, we, we've dealt with a lot of those types in doing this, right? I don't even... No, it doesn't have to be that it's objective. It's that when you hide behind the coattails of subjectivity, you are reducing the conversation down to being meaningless. There's no conversation to be had if your first line of defense is, well, that's just my opinion, bro. And it's like, cool, I don't give a fuck what your opinion is. Who are you? I don't care. I don't care what your opinion on Mistwatch is. I don't care that, like, you think that it's a good quest despite the fact that it's a dungeon run with, like, a very, very minimal twist. Where the princess that you are rescuing is actually there willingly. Wow. Wow. How impressive. And I mean, sure, it's allowed to be there. But, like, Mr. Caption's point isn't that, like, on a quest-by-quest -quest basis that side quests are bad. Mr. Caption's point is that there are no good Skyrim quests. Which I actually think he's wrong about. I think he's wrong about it. I think that, like, his Twitter friends that told him to do, like, quest mods and stuff. Like, he didn't do the Thieves Guild or Dark Brotherhood or anything like that. He didn't do any of the main side quest chains for some reason. I want to know how unbearable DW's video on Skyrim is. It's not that bad. Um... DW Terminator is just like a convenient cover. You may feel differently about this. However, if you enjoy a good story as much as I do, there is definitely a praise I can give to the vast majority of Skyrim's side quests that is far less subjective. The branchy pen. Hit me with it. Yes. What are you talking about? At least half the side quests in the game will offer you the opportunity to betray the original quest giver and instead side with his enemy. Half? Half? Really? You don't have a count of how many quests in the game are like this. Sure. I get that. Okay. But you're making the claim that 225 quests have a branching path where you can betray the quest giver? And then, one, I don't think that's true. Now, I don't have the numbers, but neither do you. So, like, it's literally like you just pulled that out of your ass. I, extreme, massive doubt from having played Skyrim fairly comprehensively looking for side quests, I can tell you full well, it's just not true. It's just not true. But, and then you get into, like, as somebody in the chat said, so he's just impressed that, like, it's a bunch of binary choices. Like, wow, the acumen of these immense quests is that you can betray the person. Oh, no, go on. This is the, this is the objective argument. This is his grand counterpoint. If you weren't impressed by the Mitch Swatch thing... This is what's going to put Mr. Caption in the grave. Half the side quests in the game will offer you the opportunity to betray the original quest giver and instead side with his enemy. Promises to keep, delayed burial, the jacket crown, the lovely letter, the list goes on and on. Okay, so you gave four examples, which fine. You gave examples. Good instead, job. Instead side with his enemy. Promises to keep. Promises to keep. Delayed burial. Delayed burial. The jacket crown. The lo really? You're going to count the jagged crown? Like... The betrayal in the Jagged Crown doesn't really make sense to me because it's not like you learn anything about the opposing faction in that conflict that would make you want to change sides. And the other side is way too um, facilitating to let you switch sides. So yeah, I don't buy that half the quests in the game are like this. Lovely letter, the list goes on and on. 
Honestly, the only quests that don't appear to have a branching path are those that don't have any opposing parties you're trying to screw over in the first place. You're making the claim that, like... Okay, so... Half the quests have branching que have branching paths. That implies that the other half of the quests are in this category, which he's basically saying don't have antagonists. Or that the antagonist is, like, uh, something esoteric that you can't side with, like nature or something. Okay? But it's just not true. The blacksmith in White Rune wants me to deliver a sword to the steward? I can't betray her, but only because there's nobody else I can resolve that quest in favor of. It's fine. Because the bar is just so low that... <laughs> like, really? You want to know a great way that you could betray her in that situation? Not delivering the sword! What if, like, you could sell the sword and then the quest, like, ends? And that's the resolution of the quest is you betrayed her trust because instead of delivering the sword, you sold it. Whew, okay. Isolde wants a mammoth tusk so she can convince the Khajiit traders to take her on as an apprentice? Well, unless there's only one mammoth tusk in the game and there are multiple people who want it, I don't know how you even could betray her in that quest other than just- Okay, but that's not like- Okay, sure. It's not really a way that you can betray Isolde in this quest other than like just not doing it. Like maybe there's a time component or something, but like- This doesn't really disprove the point that that's still a fetch quest. You're still just sent to a dungeon. You're not even really sent to a dungeon because you're not given like instructions on how to get a mammoth tusk. I always just get one from the uh, the mine that has all that iron ore in it and the transmute spell tome. But yeah, like it's basically okay because the bar is I I accept that the bar is extremely low. This is his objective argument: is that um, there are branching paths in some quests. Just not doing the quest. Next, we have one of the most controversial additions to Skyrim, the Radiant Quests. I have heard that they are merely an excuse to pad out the game indefinitely without having to actually- Yeah, you've heard that from Mr. Caption. Like, don't even pretend. Like, why not just say, well, I guess he doesn't want to like, he's trying not to have too many references to Mr. Caption. So it's like, oh yeah, I've heard that Radiant Quests suck. And it's like, yeah, I know who you heard that from. They make indefinite content. However, I wholly disagree. Once you've completed the faction quest lines, those quest lines are basically over. Yes, you can continue to do radiant quests with those factions, but only if you choose to. Radiant quests are not required to complete the game. Radiant. Someone hasn't played the Thieves Guild. Also, how what what is completing the game? I'm sorry. If radiant quests are not necessary to complete the game, well, what the fuck? Wait, hold on. What do you mean complete the game? Like what? Quests are just like survival mode in Fallout 4 and Skyrim Special Edition. They are 100% optional. You don't want them, don't do them. It's fighting fire with fire, you know? It's like... Mr. Caption made a really stupid point about how you, like, you can play Skyrim forever. That is not true. And so... Like, he wants to respond to that point, but his response is just... Well, if you don't like it, don't do it. Wow, great. Yeah, great observation. If you don't like my video, don't watch it. If you don't... Hey, if you say, if you don't like my Skyrim video, don't watch it, I can respond. Well, if you don't like my stream about your video, don't watch it. Hey, this is a... This is like... A, this isn't just a double-edged sword. It's just like a, a circular saw blade. But like... No, no, no. It's like a... It's an impossible to pick up object because every side of it is just sharp, right? Like... Great counter argument. If you don't like it, just don't do it. Wow, yeah, thanks.
But what about the radiant quests you need in order to unlock the next quest in the faction quest line? For example, the commandos quest line is only six quests long, but it's padded out with radiant quests that you do in between the six named ones. Just get a second take for this line. Come on. Surely this is just pad. Breathe. Breathe in. And then say the long line. Right? Honestly, I would still have to disagree. Well, let me clarify. I disagree with the accusation that they're padding insofar as the word padding is used in a pejorative sense. Sometimes padding is actually good, like on a bed. What if that's why he didn't show up? Uh, you know, he was there entirely for the last stream. This guy's obsessive. He would actually... He would... If he knew this was going on, he would be here, he would be in the chat, he would be demanding to, like, argue with me point by point. We would never get through the video because we'd constantly be, like, trying to debate stuff on this topic with him. Like, I gave him- I, I was very generous with how much I engaged with him in the first stream, but yeah. For example, compared to Oblivion's Mage's Guild questline, you make it to the Arcane University and you're immediately sent to acquire a Mage's staff. The game presents this as standard for any new Arcane University recruits, but from that moment on, the questline just moves at Mach 10. It's just necromancers from now until the questline ends. We see some apprentices actually attending classes in the Arcane University's courtyard, yet here we are- Why wouldn't it be, like... They literally massacred a bunch of mages here. Why wouldn't the necromancers become, like, the primary focus of the questline? I don't know, it's such a weird thing, like... Didn't he literally email you? Yeah, he asked me to ban people from his chat, or from my chat. Art, the Archmage of the Arcane University, and we've never actually attended such a class ourselves. In Skyrim, most... I blame the American education system. A lot of people don't seem to really know what, like, universities and colleges were for, uh, before the era of, listen, um, those degrees that those institutions give out, they do that to pay the bills on the real work that they do at universities. That's not the primary, the primary purpose of a university is not education. It's whatever research the people who work for that university are trying to do. But, research doesn't pay for itself. There's not enough grant money to go around to fund all the projects that are going on. So they keep the light on with, with uh, education. And then, like, a whole industry is built around that. Didn't he try to bribe you? No, that was a joke. But yeah, like, I hate this stupid fucking... Why isn't the College of Winterhold like a magic school? Because that's not the point of a college. College is just an aggregation of knowledge and people who are experts in the field. So the factions require you to complete radiant quests in order to unlock subsequent major quests in those factions. Okay, hang on. What? Yet here we are, the Archmage of the Arcane University, and we've never actually attended such a class ourselves. It feels like such a non sequitur. Like, what's your argument? What? How does Radiant Questing fix the Mages Guild to make it where, like, you get an education? Are you arguing that there should be Radiant Quests where, like, you go to school? Because that sounds kind of stupid. In Skyrim, most of the factions require you to complete Radiant Quests in order to unlock subsequent major quests in those factions. But if we think about it, doesn't that make sense? It makes sense that we would need to do the dirty work in order to earn the trust and respect of the faction leaders who call the shots. I'm processing this. It also makes sense that you should have to do odd jobs so the faction can continue to earn revenue, so they have the financial means to pursue whatever goals they are working towards in the actual quest lines. This is mostly true, but this is a really, a really dense and copium way to, like, 
counter argue this position it's like no we need the shitty filler quests it wouldn't make sense otherwise and it's like yes i agree that there should be spacing in the quest lines where you just do work but i don't think it should be this lazy shit that's actually in the game Padding is good, like on a bed, or spam. Mystery meat. As for the quests being randomly generated, I quite frankly consider that to be an improvement. To show you what I mean... Stop with the music, holy fuck. This is hard enough as is, without you suddenly, like, jumping me with Skyrim music. As for the quests being randomly generated, I quite frankly consider that to be an improvement. To show you what I mean... An improvement on what? On handcrafted quests? Okay, go on. I mean, let's take the Oblivion's Fighter's Guild quest line as an example. There's a quest in that quest line known as More Unfinished Business. In it, you visit an apothecary at the Proville Meech's Guild who needs 10 imp gold. With the exception of Maglier having jumped ship to your competition, which does advance the quest line to destroy a small amount, this quest could very easily have just been randomly generated. Aside from Maglier's jumping ship, there's hardly any real story being told here. However, this quest is handled far worse than the equivalent quests in Skyrim. Okay. Stop. Are you serious? This is worse than the Radiant quests that are in Skyrim. Because it isn't random. You always go to this specific location, always speak to this specific person, who always needs specifically imp dull, and it will always be 10 samples. Well, that's only a problem because you're a fucking psychopath who plays Oblivion 12 times. As one playstyle. Like, I like that your answer to this problem is... Well, we could just radiantly generate it. Like, yeah, or we could make the quest better. Like, if you allow yourself the opportunity to say, I can make this quest whatever I want it to be, then the opportunities are fucking endless for what it could be. It could be a quest where you go and slay a beholder. If you're just making wild propositions about what it could be, right? So it's like, why would you just settle for, well, this quest could be radiantly generated, it would be better. And it's like, why? We don't need overlapping music. We need music when I, the video is paused. It's really awkward without it. Like, what is it with the, the, the position of, I don't know, it's like, pessimism? Like... Well, guys, it could be worse. And it's like, wow, what a great argument. Radiant quests aren't bad because they could be worse. Yeah, I guess that's true. Overall, I approve of these sorts of dirty work quests because they add to immersion. They please, please stop saying the word dirty. Make the faction feel like it's having to do jobs in order to turn a profit in order to stay alive. These jobs may not be the most glamorous jobs in the world, but they add to the immersion because they're so dull. However, I much prefer Skyrim's system of- They add to the immersion because they're dull. This is wild. This is legitimately wild. Like, I'm like forgetting to take notes about it because of how wild this shit is. Okay. Radiant quests are good because they could be worse. Like the imp doll quest in Oblivion. Oh, wait a second. There's quests that are exactly like that in Skyrim, like the blacksmith quest in Riften, who wants you to get 10 samples of fire salts. Hey, that could be Radiant. He could just say, I need non-specific ingredients to make the forge work, and it radiantly generates, like, oh yeah, you need 10 samples of creep cluster or what have you. His argument is that quests in Skyrim are not mandatory, so we should make the mandatory faction quests Radiant instead of handcrafted. I think he's projecting how boring his life is into this section. Well, it's like, I agree with the notion that these factions should have, like, you know, just work. But, like, this is not the way to do it. And why would you make the argument that, oh, yeah, handcrafting, fuck that. Uh, we should just radiantly generate this content. I, this feels like a really weak defense at, of, like, a really weak counter. Basically. 
of randomizing these odd jobs, sending you to random locations and giving you different objectives. That helps to add to immersion in its own right. Unless you play the game a second time and you realize just how, like, uh, superficial it is. So let me, let me get this straight. Oblivion bad because repeat playthroughs. Skyrim good because repeat playthroughs. I really... I'm looking forward to this. this. There's no way that this can't be full of gems. I like it also just generic green background for this one. Like, like come on, I want to see your desk. Of course, the side. No transition to the audio, we're just full blast music. Side quests are meant to be self contained. The faction quest lines are the ones that tell the largest and, by proxy, deepest and most interesting stories. How. They, by proxy, tell interesting stories. <laughs> That's a really, that's a really interesting way to insult somebody. You're beautiful by proxy. I don't think radiant quests are the worst thing. Um, I just think that like, it's cope to say, it's not padding. Padding's a good thing. You know what I mean? Like there's, there was like, like you could probably track the stages of denial through that section. Well, Skyrim handles its plans are the ones that tell the largest and, by proxy, deepest and most interesting stories. How well Skyrim handles its various faction quest lines is also a huge factor in how well Skyrim on the whole holds up. How well Skyrim handles its various say, faction quest lines. There's pro one thing I have to uh, give Acer Thorn. He does. He he's not one of those people that gives a thesis statement and then like abandons it halfway through. This man is like. He's firmly grasped onto his thesis statement, and he's holding on for dear fucking life. ...is also a huge factor in how well Skyrim on the whole holds up. The various different factions all blend together in one specific area. With the exception of the Dark Brotherhood, the other faction questlines all fall into a standard dungeon-after-dungeon dungeon formula, even when the questlines don't immediately appear a requirement. I should warn you out the gate that I do not plan on giving in-depth analyses of any of the faction questlines in this game. No! 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 Are you serious? Uh, then what is the section? I don't plan on ana analyzing it, but I see like... What? Ten whole minutes here? What? What's, what's in this section? Is it just like a Mr. Caption clip? What do you mean you don't plan on giving in-depth analysis? Am I going crazy? I need like, I'm, I'm in desperate need of some random stream. It is not. I wouldn't do that if it were anyway, because that feels cheap. I will keep this on. It's already cheap enough. Can't you stack both, one in each hand? Um, I guess I can. Maybe. Let's see. All right, enough with that. Ugh. What do you mean you're not going to do full analysis? What's the point? It's a complicated question to ask me, is this guy joking? Damn, this isn't live anymore.
sell don't, it all. Don't worry, Ratmaster's Iron here. Sword. Nope. To kick butt through Skyrim. Not seeing anything else in here. Nope. Already checked that. Ah. Uh. Retrospective is when you just piss out words and feel water rushing in your temples. Yeah. We are really on that schizo that schizo grind set. This is uh Yeah. Yeah. We don't deserve his full analysis. We probably couldn't handle it. It's too girthy. Wyatt, I should warn you out the gate that I do not plan on giving in-depth analyses of any of the faction questlines in this game, as this is an in-depth analysis of Skyrim as a whole. I've already oh, I see. Yes, Master, this makes sense. This makes sense to me. You don't, you wouldn't do full analysis of the quests because this is a full analysis of Skyrim. Yes, Master. This makes sense to me. This is something that logical, healthy minded people think. I. I What's the logic here? He wrote this sentence. He spoke this sentence. He edited the video of this sentence. You know he edited the video of this sentence. You know he, he didn't just like extend audio out and didn't just trust that it like it was good because he had to add this picture to this this specific part. So you know he had to listen to the part of the of the analysis where he decided to say that he was not going to do in-depth analysis because this was an in-depth analysis. It's like... Wild. I'm given a three-part analysis of Skyrim's Dark Brotherhood questline if you're interested, and I may give analyses of the other faction questlines in the future, but this is merely a retrospective of how the faction questlines contribute. Why? 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 Just do a second take. Analyses of the other faction questlines in the future, but this is merely a retrospective of how the faction questlines contribute. Like, what happened? Why did you... Faction... Questlines. Like, why? This is like fucking... Wow, this is wild. I'm not, I'm not powerful enough. I'm not strong enough. This really is like our Septimus Cygnus moment, like uh, we're being driven mad by the pursuit of knowledge. Tribute to Skyrim holding up in the modern day, so an in-depth analysis of each faction is not needed. Oh, what? I'm sorry, what was that 300 IQ logic there? Analyses of the other faction questlines in the future, but this is merely a retrospective of how the faction questlines contribute to Skyrim holding up in the modern day. Oh, I see. So, okay. This is a retrospective of how the faction quest lines contribute to Skyrim holding up in the modern day. So an in-depth analysis of each faction is not necessary to this retrospective of how Skyrim holds up in the modern day. He said at two hours and 10 minutes into the video. So an in-depth analysis of each faction is not needed. Remember how in the first attempt at this 
take in the video, he was in chat arguing about your spellings. I don't remember that. He was like he was arguing about like how I was spelling notes. That's funny. Yeah, he's got he's got bigger things he needs to respond to, like why you wouldn't do in-depth analysis of the stories that are in the game that you are doing in a retrospective of. Anyway, the College of Winterhold questline is the one that calls the most attention to this unnecessary dungeon formula. For a fact. Okay, he said it calls the most attention. Actually, it calls itself a college. There are surprisingly few actual classes in this questline. Oh, Jesus Christ. I should. Like, this should be part of the bingo card. 2 in 25. What's the deal with the lack of classes at this college? You know, I said it in the Oblivion video, and it reminds me, like I said it in the video, and I had no idea that it would be this bad. Like, there weren't that many people in the Oblivion stream series that were, like, complaining about how the Arcane University doesn't have enough classes, right? This seems to be, like, a Skyrim thing, and I can't have been more right about how, like, stupid people are when it comes to, like, this idea. We gotta get back to Hogwarts. We gotta get ourselves to school. What's the next line? What's the next line? Fuck. Hang on. I gotta get myself to Hogwarts, where everyone thinks I'm cool. Back to witches and wizards and magical beasts, to goblins and ghosts and to magical feasts. It's all that I love and it's all that I need at Hogwarts. Hogwarts. Okay, that's enough of that. Listen. You start the quest line by attending a single class where the teacher shows you how to use ward spells. That's honestly a doubt bit. There aren't any classes after that. Once you learn a ward spell, he decides to put these rookie mages in unspeakable danger by having them explore a Draugr ruin while the Draugr are still walking the halls and attacking people on sight. Not in the active part of the dig site. Are you serious? You didn't... You... You didn't... He... Actually thinks that the college didn't clear the Sarthal like how do I how do I put this into words he doesn't he thinks that the college hadn't cleared out the active parts of Sarthal before the students arrived Like, did you miss the part where you knocked down a wall to access, like, a hidden part of the of the ruins? Like, they didn't know that the orb was there until, like, you showed up. The college is presented as a school to the player, though. Not really. I don't remember my academic recruitment officer uh, approaching me and we had to figure out like how I was going to pay the tuition to go to the college. It's clear the way this supposed field trip is set up that Bethesda felt like they couldn't afford to go more than a few minutes without giving the players some action or else the players- You're literally showing it. You're showing why there are still Draugr in the ruins that they hadn't cleared out. Would lose interest like a cat distracted by a laser pointer. From there, you come across the Eye of Magnus, aka the God's Elder Scroll Reader. From there on out, classes appear to be- What? The Eye of Magnus is the God's Elder Scroll Reader? Is that like a botched joke? Cancelled? You don't attend a single class after that? As if that weren't banning.
that yeah that's that's really the the crux of your argument here is that the college of winterhold is just not a school just not enough like a school i think you needed to go to a school that might, that's probably it like you couldn't get into a nice school so you want to just like you want to live the fantasy of getting to go to college Enough, after you've resolved the immediate conflict regarding the Eye of Magnus, the Psychic Order shows up and appoints you the new Archmage of the College of Winterhold. And this makes absolutely no sense. The Psychic Order are not in any way affiliated with the College of Winterhold. What gives them the right to appoint this new Archmage? They can say you should be the new Archmage, and then the council that, like, would be the, uh, the second level of management for the College can agree to it. It would be like saying... Well, the president doesn't have the authority to assign a new president for this college. And it's like, that's true. But if the president said that this person should be the president of the college, that's a pretty big endorsement. And then, like, the board of governors would, like, basically have to agree with that endorsement. So, like, yeah, they don't literally have the authority to make you the archmage. But it's like... Basically, like, everybody at the college agrees that it should happen. Now, should they agree? No, absolutely not. It's stupid. But, all the same, like... I mean, can you imagine if someone walked into a restaurant they didn't own, fired the owner, and then turned to some other guy and said, Hey, Jimmy, you're the new manager here. Hey, that's pretty gigachatic energy. Seriously, who has the balls? Who has the balls? Dude, it's just his subjective opinion on, like, who should be, you know, the Archmage of the College. Uh, yeah, I don't, I think the reason he's not doing in-depth analysis is because I don't think he could do it. Slightly better than the College of Winterhold questline is the Civil War questline. Earlier, I opined that the college. Wow. I don't know if he's wrong, but I don't know if he's right either. What's? Wasn't that Salt's argument? Was that Salt's argument? Hang on. This buddy. This is like a police officer coming into a restaurant having really good service and going, you know what? You should be manager. Congrats on your promotion. But apparently gang- Okay, so listen, listen, listen. You might think that's damning and that somebody has stolen from somebody else, but it's actually the other way around. This video came out after. But that's like, I don't know. Like food analogies are like easy mode, I guess. It's weird that it happened twice. I don't know. I don't think uh, Salt Factory doesn't strike me as the as the type to like lift stuff. Salt Factory and Acerthorn use the same metaphor about restaurant ownership. Okay. That's me putting it in, in the real notes. College of Winterhold questline calls the most attention to the dungeon after dungeon formula with hardly any real story to break up the monotony. However, in my humble opinion, the Civil War questline is the worst offender of this formula. It just does a much better job of hiding the formula. Upon closer inspection, however, 
of this questland's offenses begin to show. As far as the gameplay is concerned, it's basically just board battle after board battle. They do make some attempt to break up the monotony by having us do sabotage and blackmail missions, but at least half the quest line are going to be fort battles. When half of any quest line is composed of one specific thing, it's time to rethink the quest line. Oh man, it, it's almost like Bethesda had really big ambitions for the quest. And, uh, they had to rein those ambitions in and cut a lot of that because they didn't have time to finish it. Of course, that's, that's unattainable information that, um, was, you know, found immediately by people looking in the construction set because, like, Bethesda literally left a note for modders saying that, like, you shouldn't copy the scripts that we used for this quest line because we didn't have time to finish it. So what about the story? Well, I'm about to shock you, so put your drinks down for a minute because you're not going to believe what I'm about to say. You're going to say that the story's good. Wow, how shocking. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. The story for Skyrim's Civil War quest line is practically non-existent. Oh. Wait, what? He went the other way. I can understand this position from the con like the Skyrim Civil War quest line really is mostly just context. But so is New Vegas, and I guess, yeah, I guess, like, uh, he really hates that. How can that be? Political intrigue and political conspiracy in this game is one of the game's most universally praised aspects. Who? Who? Who is the one who praised the political intrigue of this game? So yeah, like, there were supposed to be, like, 12 quest types that you could randomly get throughout the course of the Civil War quest line. So, um, each time you played it, it would be, like, slightly different. Um, and it was also, like, it was going to be possible for you to lose battles. There were going to be battles at Riften and Markarth. Um, there was supposed to be, like, an ebb and flow to the Civil War that just didn't get realized. Like, it got cut down into the shape that it is today. And that is true. However, here's something that you probably never really thought about until now. I'm sure I never thought it. I'm sure that you're going to say something that this is the first time that this thought has crossed my mind. Please, brain blast me. 99.999% of the story that the Civil War is supposed to be about is completely divorced from the Civil War quest line. Yeah, I literally just said that the Civil War quest line is mostly context. Yeah, think about it. Season unending where the big players in the Civil War actually get the bulk of their character moments? That's part of the main quest. The part where the... I disagree, but I'm not really sure how to word my feelings on it, so sure. The Thalmor are actually driving a wedge in between the Stormcloaks and Imperials, encouraging them to fight each other to weaken each army in the process? Yeah, we learn about that during the quest Diplomatic Immunity, which again is part of the main quest. Yeah, it's almost like the main quest and the Civil War are tied together. Like, they're both introduced at the same point in the introduction. Yeah, it's, it's really weird. Not the Civil War quest line. The way every NPC, and especially the Jarls, feel about the war and whose side they're on? Each NPC who has the appropriate dialogue option available can be asked about their opinions regardless of whether you join either army or no army at all. That doesn't mean it's not in the game. You should have made this argument like these... I would have been dumb, but you... It would have been better for you to say... It's not great, but better for you to say that like these conversations are optional or something. 
I have played the Stormcloaks multiple times, and I have seen- Wow, why? <laughs> you do not have to play the Stormcloaks more than once. You don't have to play the Imperials more than once. I don't know, why? Why are you like this? Why would you play- Why? Why, 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 why? The season on Indian is interesting, but it really is a quest line uh, or a cutscene. Where like you're given very minor choices. The Civil War was totally a faction quest line, bro. Despite the luxurious plans for the Civil War and its massive tie into the entire game and setting, totally. I mean, that doesn't discount the fact that it is still a faction. Like, it can be both. These things aren't mutually exclusive. It's a faction questline, but it also has ties to the rest of the game. Wow. It's almost like the Thalmor play a big part at the college, and, like, the companions don't really have anything to do with anything else. Thieves Guild minorly, mostly through Maven Blackbriar. And, yeah, Dark Brotherhood has big political implications, even if it doesn't really pan out. But, like, come on. This game sucks. I've beaten it 20 times. Yeah, like, what the fuck? I really hate the Stormcloak's quest line. You know, it's non-existent. He's probably... No, 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 no. He's gonna turn it around and be like... But, being able to fight all these battles is just so fun that you can't help but do it multiple times. Multiple playthroughs of the Imperial questline as well, and I can recall precisely one moment in both questlines when I learned something about the Civil War that I would not have learned had I not done the questline. This is when I am sent to Markarth to dig up some dark on the steward there and blackmail him. I search his drawers and find that he's a closet Talos worshipper. However, that hardly comes as a shock if you have played the rest of the game extensively. We learn that Balgruff White Run is a closet Talos worshipper if we do the danger quest to the Whispering Door. We learn that High King Torig was a closet Talos worshipper if we do a mini. Okay, so how is it a surprise that, like, it's not a surprise that the Markarth Steward's a Talus Worshipper because here's all these other people that are Talus Worshippers. It's like, okay. The quest line to become Thane of Solitude. Hell, even Markarth has a side quest where we- Also, you don't have to do those quests as part of the Civil War. Dig up evidence of another closet Talus Worshipper right there in Markarth. So frankly, having another closet Talus Worshipper is not that big of a deal to me. It's certainly- is not a game changer when it comes to the Civil War quest line. Now the wait, so your your argument is that there should only be one secret Talos worshiper in the game, so that it's more impactful. Like what? Well, seven people can take over a city if the guards. If there's also only seven people defending it, like oh jeez. Okay, I don't understand the argument. So, this particular plot point shows up in multiple instances. That means that it's not impactful. And it's like... I don't know, like... I don't understand. I don't understand. He's too big-brained for me. I can't handle the immensity. Equivalent Imperial mission is a different story. When we dig up dirt on the Riften steward, we don't find that she's a closet Talus worshipper. She's a dumber, so that wouldn't even make any sense. It's She's a Dunmer, so she can't be a Talos worshiper. Because the Dunmer people have never worshipped Imperial gods. Whew, okay. Like, does he not know that the Dunmer and the Thalmor are, like, opposed because the Dunmer are Daedra worshippers? Instead, we find that she's actually in league with the Thieves Guild. Okay, credit where it's due, I did not see that coming. Not only that, but...
you didn't see it coming. I remember you having a part of this video where you point out how, like, there's corruption in the city. Hang on. There's corruption in the in Riften, and you didn't figure that the steward was in league with the Thieves' Guild. Is this guy assuming people's religion based on their race? Holy yikes, sweetie. He said sweaty, but I said sweetie. Um, yeah. I'm just... Um, yeah, a Dunmer Talus worshiper would be weird, but it's not impossible. But I'm more baffled by the prospect of, like, you didn't anticipate that a member of the Rifting government was in league with the Thieves' Guild. But it actually makes a lot of sense. It offers an explanation as to how Riften can be so corrupt and crime ridden when the Jarl, who supposedly cares about law and order, appears so blissfully unaware of the corruption happening just ten feet outside her palace's front door. You really shouldn't smack yourself in the skull with a hammer every night. It does not give you more brain power because you're applying power to your brain. I'm like... I was surprised, but it explains everything. And it's like, I'm pretty sure you could figure this information out through other quests. He's one of those, he strikes me as like one of those people that like would be really into conspiracy theories because like, you know, he's never really entertained the notion that like the government can be corrupt. And so like, He's going on the internet and he's learning that, like, the government's covering up UFOs or some shit. And he's, like, really getting into it. Just because, like, it's new and there's a novelty to it. So, like, he's basically a boomer in the sense of, like, really? You couldn't figure this out? You didn't see it coming that there was... You saw the Talos Worshipper thing coming, but you couldn't figure out that there was corruption in Riften. And that maybe members of the government were involved with the Thieves' Guild. However, I would argue that this is more of a contribution to the Thieves' Guild story than the Civil War. Yeah, it's almost like... It's almost like... It's a tapestry. Like, the storylines can be connected to each other. Like, the Thieves' Guild goes to the College of Winterhold at one point, And the Companions isn't really connected to anything. And... The Dark Brotherhood is superficial references to the other factions. Like, Arnbjorn was an old companion. Personally, he just strikes me as kind of a sheep. I was surprised, but actually it makes sense. Like, yeah, sure, whatever. Now, some of you may think I'm nitpicking. Arguing, arguing that it isn't that big. Some of you may think that I'm nitpicking. I'm not surprised that he said that. I'm not surprised that... He doesn't really know what, like, nitpicking is, and so he's, like, he's coming up with a straw man argument that isn't even applicable. Didn't he also compare Maven to Donald Trump? Uh, yeah, I think he did. I think that was in the, in the first stream. Yeah, it's like, I, this, you might perceive this as nitpicking. No, dude. I didn't think, I, d literally, the thought did not cross my mind. Guild story than the Civil War. Now, some of you may think I'm nitpicking, arguing that it isn't that big of a deal that the story of the Civil War is primarily being told outside the Civil War. You, of course, have every right to feel this way. How oh, I thank you for the permission. Really, I thank you. Truly. Are you about to make the argument that, well, you're allowed to have your opinion and I'm allowed to have mine? Wow, how fucking. how bold. However, I don't see why we couldn't have our cake and eat it too. Once we've chosen... Okay. Thank you for using this metaphor, because I've really had an interest in, like, trying to explain what it means. Alright. Here's what having your cake and eating it too means. It means being able to appreciate the sight of a big cake that's ornately decorated, 
but also being able to eat it. That's what the metaphor means. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have the cake as a decoration and eat it. They're mutually exclusive. As soon as you eat the cake, you stop having it. As an aside, is there any reason why the storytelling had to come to a screeching halt at that point? Couldn't there have been new story developments at each new leg of the questline? For example, imagine if at some point during the Stormcloak questline, we get the opportunity to bring some evidence to Ulfric's attention that the Imperial City had already been conquered by the Thalmor before he was tortured into giving up the information. Dude, it's been 20 years. I'm sure he's figured that out at some point. I'm sure Ulfric's Stormcloak was like reading a history book in one night and he's going, wait a second. I was captured on the 4th of uh, Sun's Dawn, and the Imperial City was captured... Hey, hang on, what was it? Before or after? Like... Yeah, I'm sure Ulfric knows. Like, really? You think that Ulfric hasn't figured out since the end of the Civil War that he got lied to? So he's blaming himself for a problem he didn't actually cause. Imagine if Ulfric forgives himself for spilling the beans, but decides to continue the war effort nonetheless. Wow, it's almost like that would be meaningless to tell him that information. It's almost like, hey, maybe being lied to by the Thalmor about it only motivated his hatred more. Arguing that there is more to this war than simply rectifying his betrayal of the Empire. This yeah, the war is about his betrayal of the Empire. This is like... This is... Ulfric Stormcloak is a rebel because he thought he he was a stupid boy who thought that he had betrayed the Empire. This would have been great character development for Ulfric. Or imagine if, upon joining the Legion, there's a quest that forces you into a trolley problem, where you're forced to choose between killing an innocent bystander and giving Ulfric the chance to escape once again. Such a moral conundrum would certainly have put the Imperial's decision at the beginning of the game to summarily execute you despite your name not being on the list in a whole new light, wouldn't it? The possibilities are endless for opportunities to tell stories and develop the characters even after you join one of the two armies. Wow, it's almost like that's almost always true. Yes, the possibilities are endless. Is it reasonable for Bethesda to accomplish that? Maybe you could do some mild research and read, I don't know, the cutting room floor, the most basic surface level of research to find out why the civil war is the way it is literally just google why is the civil war the way it is like something come on i'm still stuck on you could tell ulfric that he didn't betray the empire and it's like do you like the they they have a calendar they have dates I'm sure Ulfric at some point, there's just no way, like, come on. I don't know, maybe I am nitpicking, but... No, the thought still hadn't crossed my mind. I don't think you're nitpicking, I think you just aren't very smart. Bear in mind that the story that a quest tells is a huge factor in the quest's overall quality. I personally feel that it's only half a quest if it only tells a story for as long as you're not actually doing the quest. Thank, all I can say is thank God it's over. The Thieves Guild, Dark Brotherhood, and Companions will be analyzed simultaneously as they are similar enough in their structure that separate analyses of them for the purposes of this retrospective would result in a lot of repeating various points. As I said...
No. Well, okay, so his thing is like, um, so Ulfric's dossier says that, like, the Thalmor were, like, playing psychological warfare with him by, like, claiming that, um, information he had given them had led to the downfall of the Imperial City, despite the fact that they actually took the city before, um, before he had arrived, or some shit like that. So it's like, basically, they tricked him into thinking that, um, he was responsible, but it's like, again, I feel like a casual conversation would have just led to the conclusion, like, wait a second, these dates don't add up. Pat sounds like he's fed up with this dude. I joined late. What started the rage? Hmm. Uh, maybe, maybe something happened in the last nine hours. As earlier, I've already done an in-depth analysis into the Dark World Road story, if you're interested. These questlines are structured much better than the Civil War questlines. For starters, they each tell stories that you have to actually join the faction to fully experience. That alone puts them above the Civil War questline, structurally speaking. As far as falling into the dungeon after dungeon formula, the Dark Brotherhood, as I pointed out before, falls into this rut the least, which of course makes sense, seeing as the vast majority of targets you need to eliminate can be found in urban and suburban areas. Thieves Guild falls into this rut, but it is saved by the various radiant jobs you can do that take place entirely within the major whole capitals. The oh, cool. The the content that is optional, that you like made a big point about being optional. Yeah, it's it that saves the Thieves Guild. Oh, the Radiant Quest saves the Thieves Guild. Oh, good. The companions are probably the worst offender of these three for falling into the dungeon after dungeon formula. But like the Thieves Guild, the variety of raiding quests affects. So are you gonna explain why the dungeon after dungeon formula is a bad thing, or like are we just gonna like not? It offers elevates this faction above the College of Winterhold and Civil War quest lines. Yes, these raiding quests have you heading into dungeons to kill X dungeon boss, but they also involve you rescuing kidnapped civilians, walking up to troublemaking civilians and bar dungeons to kill X dungeon boss, but they also involve you rescuing kidnapped. This is not a Radiant quest for the Companions. This is the uh, Darkwater Crossing quest. That's how you get the only Argonian Companion in the game. I know this because I wanted to make this Companion the leader of my farm. You know, Dunmer farm equipment and all that, but... Uh, the game wouldn't let me. It hated fun, so... Civilians, ...walking up to trouble making civilians and bar brawling with them, clearing out civilians' homes that have been overrun by wild animals, and many, many other types of quests. Story-wise, I find it interesting, but not necessarily in a good way, that both the I figured- I figured he was going to say this. I figured he was going to make this exact comparison. Dark Brotherhood and the Thieves' Guild both have a plot twist of the Guild's leader betraying you. That's a perfectly fine plot twist for one faction's quest line, but to do it twice in one game just feels repetitive and it shows a lack of imagination on Bethesda's part. You know, the funny thing, though, is that they were written by different people. Companions are saved from this repetition by having a storyline that doesn't revolve around betrayal. Even though oh, wait, I thought betrayal was a good thing, though. I, I have it on good authority from somebody named Spacerhorn that uh, betrayals are what makes quests interesting. I guess it's only interesting if the player can do the betraying. The main source of the conflict, the Glen Morrow Witch's gift of lycanthropy, isn't even a betrayal per se. They just didn't give all the details when they gave the gift. The companions likewise provide a fairly interesting con- That's such a weird read of the story. It's like, the betrayal of the story, like, like, wouldn't, like, just because the Glen Morrow Witches aren't explicit about the details doesn't mean that the fucking companions that know that it's were being a becoming a werewolf and all the downsides of it. Oh, yeah. The companions don't know. Contrast to the traditional fantasy tropes. The companions are werewolves, by the way, spoiler alert, yet they still fight for good. This is in stark contrast to tradition. They still fight for good. Okay. Woo! That's a... 
Yeah, no, they uh, basically fight for money so that they can continue to run their frat house. Where they do nothing but have rough gay sex all day. And, uh, well, I guess AL is a girl, but, like, she's a white girl, so she fucks dogs. But, like, um... Yeah, I've never really heard the Companions described as, like, a morally good faction. That's, like, as someone said earlier, like, a, a chicken breast brain take. Like, they, they're, they're sellswords. That's what they are, they're sellswords. Do you think the reason so many Skyrim videos are bad is because they rely on shorthand assumptions? The video creators assume all Skyrim players, their whole audience has. I get that vibe from them a lot. Yeah, there's a lot in this video of um, this is what people do. This is what people think. And sure, Acer Thorn doesn't really have the resources to ask people like I do. So like, if I want to know what people do, I can just ask them. I've done polls before. I've asked chat before. I have a Discord server and Twitter and what have you. If I want to know what people do in a situation, I can ask them. Uh, he doesn't necessarily have that resource. That said, he does have several videos downloaded and is like has used as footage and has like just lifted outright sections of for his video, including like nine minutes of the Mr. Caption video that like he could use as a basis of argument to explain like what other people actually do in their games. I don't know. It, it's a very, I, I think it's a dangerous thing to assume what other people do in their games. At what point do the companions do anything honorable or remarkably ethical or altruistic? Literally no, at no point. Um, here's the companion storyline in a nutshell. Uh, they're being hunted by werewolf hunters that they kill in self-defense. Okay, that's reasonable. Uh, they're looking to reforge the axe of Luthrad. Okay, that's reasonable. And then um, they initiate you as a werewolf. Okay, we just had a conversation with Kodlak where like werewolves go to hell. They don't actually go to hell, but like they don't get to go to Sovereign Guard. So that kind of sucks and you have no choice. So uh, the companions haze you into becoming a werewolf. Okay, that seems kind of questionable. And then um, as part of the hazing ritual, they like go attack the Silver Hand and Skior gets killed. So Aeolus starts on like a... A crusade of revenge just like slaughtering silverhand base after silverhand base and then like codlex like you should cut that shit out by the way go to the glen moral coven and just slaughter all the witches and bring back their heads and then you bring back their heads and like codlex has died and then like you kill more silverhand people and then you like redeem codlex soul like they're not good people Traditional fantasy tropes, where those afflicted with curses such as the canthropy and vampirism are treated as complete outcasts by society. The Elder Scrolls franchise is itself not exempt from this trope. That's it. That's the that's the extent of it. Where's the part where you say like how it holds up? But like, okay, like I feel like Well, I guess I'm done with this section. Moving on. It's like he didn't really know what to say, so he started writing the main quest line stuff and then, like, never went back and actually finished that part. Like, wow. Okay. I don't know. So that leaves us with just the main quest. Honestly, forming an opinion on the main quest is a tough one. When I first played this game back in 2011, I essentially played very little except the main quest. The reviews from back in 2011... I have been on good authority that nobody does the main quest because that means you're completing the game. I built up the dragon fights and shouts as being the most badass thing to come in gaming in years, and so I didn't really care for anything else. However, nowadays the main quest is just kind of there. 
One might argue that this is just an indication that the main quest doesn't hold up, but then why did I find it so compelling when I first came out? It was Maybe it's that you have like really bad tastes and you play Elder Scrolls games in really weird ways that nobody else does. Like playing the Stormcloak's quest line multiple times. Like if I had the magic power to retroactively record previous playthroughs, I would not have played the Companions or the Stormcloaks. I would have just like conjured my retroactive footage for it. Please have it, but it holds up reference in the Skyrim video. I can't find the spirit to write that down. All right. All right, cool. I wrote that down. Does Acer Thorn edit his scripts? I think he doesn't know that's something you should do. I don't think he knows how to do it. It wasn't just the advertising either. I very distinctly remember playing the main quest in 2011 and enjoying the hell out of it. So it wasn't just a case of the critics hyping up the main quest beyond its merits. Are you saying that you're prone to um, having your opinions be influenced by uh, games journalists? And reviewers? Gameplay-wise, the main quest revolves around learning various dragon shouts, which grant a variety of effects. These shouts are your main reward for killing dragons as- I think this is Mr. Caption's footage. Because he has Lydia as a companion, and also he spammed Unrelenting Force. By killing them, you absorb dragon souls, which are the currency you spend to unlock dragon shouts that you learn. This system is a rather interesting one because it encourages both exploration and fighting dragons, as you need both to earn your rewards. You need to explore to discover new words of power, and you need to kill dragons to get their souls in order to unlock those words. However, I'm making this idea sound like it's executed a lot better than it actually is. That's the part I hate. See, the idea of giving you a twofold reward to encourage two aspects of gameplay is a great idea on paper, but there are several key problems with the way Skyrim actually executes that idea. As far as the words of power are concerned, the vast majority of word walls are located in either Draugr Ruins or Dragon Notes, and that gets repetitive pretty fast. While this certainly Sure. It makes sense in lore that the word walls would only be located in those two locations, simply being more friendly doesn't necessarily translate to good game design. In addition to that, the dragon souls also suffer from repetition. The novelty of fighting a dragon at Stone was a phenomenal back in 2011, but after you kill your 500th dragon across your 10th playthrough, you start to realize the core problem. Here it is again. Oh, come on. Come on, Bethesda. Come on. You're telling me that you couldn't make Skyrim interesting to the 11th playthrough? How much of this video is original footage? Honestly, I don't know. Um... Literally every dragon fight is the same. I seem- I think he has a lot more original footage at the start of the game than he does later on. Okay, hang on. We are at 2.22.48. So this is... See, I got an eye for this. This is Will Loves Video Games, uh, footage. Like he's he's admitted to it before. We had a conversation about it last last stream. Um, here and there, it's not an issue, but it seems like it's a lot more than here and there at this point. Have you talked about the quest to get Keening in Skyrim? No, but I plan to. Because there's a Creation Club thing that adds Wraith Guard and Sunder, so I completed the set.
Dragons are boring after the first playthrough. Yes, I would agree. Um, it just seems like a very, like, it's a meme that people say that, like, we're disappointed that we only got, like, 500 hours and 10 playthroughs out of a, out of a video game. Is this a common thing to take other streamers' footage even for B-roll shit? Not that I've heard of. Pretty much everybody I know uh, records all of their own footage. Unless it's something that's extremely specific. But yeah, like he's unironically doing the meme that like we get made fun of for doing. Once the benefit of novelty wears off, the repetition of each dragon fight starts to wear on you. If you can avoid the repetition that accompanies acquiring these shouts, once you actually get them, the shouts themselves are certainly interesting. Unfortunately, the clunky interface requires you pause the game and go into a menu every time you want to change a shout. Since you only have 8 keys on the PC that you can use to hotkey your items, and on the console you're even more limited, you're probably just going to be gravitating almost exclusively to the few shouts that are most useful. Unrelenting I feel like I would be stupid for asking, but I'm going to do it anyways. Is he aware that the favorites menu exists? Also, this is like... Console, you're even more limited. This is you're a... probably just going to be gravitating almost exclusively to the few shots that are most useful. Unrelenting force. I seem to recall this happening in the uh, Mr. Caption video. Dragon Rand and become ethereal for surviving fall damage. Honestly, the game should not have given you unrelenting force as your first shout, because it's one of the most universally useful shouts in the game, working on nearly all. But it's in the trailer. Enemies. By the time you have logged even 30 hours into your first playthrough, you'll be firmly entrenched under your pattern. Dragon Rand for dragons and unrelenting force for everything else. This problem could have been severely alleviated if there were dungeon puzzles that actually. It sounds like a lack of creativity on your part that you don't use more shouts than that. Utilized other shouts, like the puzzle in Eastern Grove that required the Whirlwind Sprint shout, or perhaps a puzzle that requires the Become Ethereal shout to enable you to pass through spike pits or acid pits without taking damage. I mean, sure, yeah, I agree. Are you gonna get into like why Bethesda's afraid to do stuff like this, or what? The story of the main quest is oh, no, you're not. Heavily interwoven in Skyrim's Civil War questline, which leads me to believe that Bethesda originally intended for the Civil War to be the main quest, or at least part of the main quest. Or, or, hear me out. They're connected. They're tied to each other. W wouldn't that be novel? However, the main conflict of the main quest is that the dragons are attacking indiscriminately, and everyone wants you, the dragonborn, to put a stop to the dragon attack so they can go back to killing each other unabated. It's basically a case of, hey, these guys are really, really good at our favorite game, so we don't want to play with them anywhere because they make us feel inferior. My cat's bigger than your cat. My cat's double the size that yours is. So you kill your first dragon and get summoned by the Greybeards to- Why am I not surprised that, like, okay. Man, we dodged a bullet. Do you guys realize if we had finished this video in November? We did this at the end of November, okay? Acer Thorn would have literally game overed no nostalgia critic November for our entire audience. Wow, holy shit. We literally we literally dodged a bullet. Also, yes, I am absolutely done. This is fucking... This is hard. Fate protected us from failing No Nostalgia Critic November. I'll learn how to use your shout ability for what they consider to be good. Delphine of the Blades gets in contact with you by breaking the laws of physics, both in real life and in universe. For full details, see my list of five Elder Scrolls quests that make no sense. It
No, please don't make me watch another video for details. Just say it. Just fucking say it. Yes. There, it doesn't make sense that Delphine was able to get the horn. Do you see how long that took? Anyway, she and you find Esbern, well, okay, you find Esbern, while Delphine just sits around all cozy in her inn, and the three of you decide that we need to stop Alduin from destroying the world. You now finally have an actual goal with the main quest, rather than just meandering around from one reference to the next. This is certainly a huge strike against the main quest. The first half of the main quest is honestly just you working your way through a series of contacts. I did note this in my script. Um, one of the interesting things about Skyrim's main quest is that you actually go a long time before meeting any characters that you could say are recurring. Look, I think the closest thing you can do is Jarl Balgriff, and you have the choice you have the ability to replace Jarl Balgriff. There's no like Caius Kasadi's uh Joffrey Martin characters, like Boris, you know, characters that you meet and like recur through the main quest line until you get to uh Arngear. Dude, listen, he has asked us to stop and probably watch like four hours of content at this point. It was like, yeah, you should go check out Mr. Caption's video. And it's like, great, I've got another two and a half hours of, to watch. Thankfully, I've already seen it because unlike this piece of shit, this video is all right. <laughs> it's good until it's not, basically. You side with the guy in Helgen who introduces you to a relative of his in Riverwood, who refers you to the Geralt of White Run, who then tells you about the Greybeards, who indirectly and inadvertently causes you to meet Delphine, who directs you to Rift in- I uh, skipped two steps. You skipped Weakfall's Barrow in the dragon fight. ...and to meet Esper. It's only when you finally meet Esper at the end of this breadcrumb trail that we finally get to the A-plot of this quest line. You ultimately work your way through all these contacts, and most of them ultimately prove superfluous. There are several of these contacts I just mentioned that you could remove from the quest line entirely, and it would change very little about the quest, if anything at all. For example, your Helkin companion could be the one to advise you to bring news of the dragon to the Jarl of White One, completely bypassing his Riverwood contacts with no impact on the main block whatsoever. While Esbron is That's like the weirdest place to like try and fix the quest line is you know what stage needs to be cut? The family in Riverwood. That's the part I actually like is that you like, you know, you meet commoners of Skyrim during part of the as part of the main quest. If you want, I have it on good authority that that part is completely optional. You could just go left and run off into the woods with your full inventory of equipment that you need to sell. Guards. This man has lost his composure. Replace his brain with chicken breasts. Delphine may be considered essential to the plot. There was no reason. Listen, I'm not interested in the Acer Thorn cinematic universe. Okay? I'm just trying to finish the Skyrim video. Once the Skyrim video is done, I hope to never cover another fucking game that Acer Thorn has talked about and have to watch this video and stream again. How about don't cut quests, expand on it? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, this is the return of the lumberjack approach of you should cut things instead of fix them. I feel offended for Caption. His footage is stolen for a garbage tier Skyrim video. Yeah, it's true. Like, I don't know if it's stolen because I don't recall Caption playing on a controller. but that they're actually coming back to life itself. The Dragonstone one that we got for her is apparently a map which details the locations of many dragon burial sites and the and the from the city. Hmm. When do you get to the part with Esvern? I already touched on how I'm looking for the old man pussy. Man, and people say my video is like hard to hard to navigate. 
see this is console footage that's the confusing thing is like i don't know if i don't think this is captions footage reason for them to be introduced separately they could very easily have simply been introduced at the same time together recruiting you as dragon four then the first half of the main quest wouldn't have felt nearly as padded as it currently feels wait a second wait a second I have it on good authority from you yourself that padding isn't always bad. So you're telling me that the handcrafted quests in the first half of the main quest line are worse than the radiant quests that literally just exist to fill space for the companions. Oh, hey, the the meme happened. I ran out of Skyrim music because the stream's been going on longer than 10 hours. And the 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 uh, things I use are the Everness. Uh, I, could sh I can show you, actually. The uh, audio things I use are, are these. Because they go on for 10 hours. And uh, I think this is like the third occasion where we've run out of... Uh, run out of footage. Granted, having Delphine and Esbarn introduced at the same time would require you to cut out the diplomatic immunity quest. Not necessarily. You still need to figure out if the Thalmor are behind the dragons returning. And therefore lose out on a lot of the political intrigue that this game is so widely praised for. But then again, Bethesda could very easily have reworked that quest into the Civil War quest line. Not only would they have given that quest line some much needed story after Okay, how how would how would you work that into the Civil War quest line? Starting the quest line, but from a gameplay standpoint, it would also have been a nice change of pace in a quest line that is bogged down by fort battle after fort battle. Granted, I am currently speaking from a position of hindsight, but then again, isn't that what retrospectives are all about? You psychic damaged me in a way that I don't think you could psychic damage a whole lot of people. You really hurt me with that sentence. That sentence. Um, this is like assault. But now that you have a main goal, if you thought the superfluous plot devices and chain of unnecessary contacts were finally over, you were dead wrong. As soon as you recruit Esbern, he helps decipher an Akaviri stone wall that says that the ancient orcs used a shout to defeat Altman. Delphine randomly decides that this shout is one that can knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Esbern didn't say a damn thing about knocking dragons out of the sky. I mean, what else would it do? My stand just fucking kills you. That's its ability. Play Morrowind exploration music to deter it. Acer Thorn from watching it later. Is that a thing? Why don't you just spawn at the throat of the world at the final battle in the Skyrim's main quest? You just fight a single dragon named Alduin. Rather, Joan Allen knew that this was the gameplay-related effect that the Dragon Wind shot would have, and so she had Delphine say, knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Delphine had no way of knowing that. What? Are you, like, you're pinning the blame on the voice actress? Think about knocking dragons out of the sky. Rather, Joan Allen knew that this was the gameplay-related effect that the Dragon Wind shot would have, and so she had to- Really? Okay, so... Pff, oh, fuck. Okay, so... The voice actor improved and added what the dragon rend shout does because like I'm sorry you're making a big assumption that the voice actor one was aware of things that were going on during the development of Skyrim two even bothers to play video games like really The voice actress improved 
This is one of those wild takes, like, that Skyrim Radiant AI was going to make processors explode if it was more popular. Like, seriously? You're blaming the voice actress for this line. Like, <laughs> this is like, this is like perfect ammunition for the old claim that like fucking, um, that like he's pretending, but there's no way this guy is this crazy for years on end. This has to be authentic. He has to actually think that like the voice actress is the reason. Delphine voice actor. I'm, I've got to be crazy, right? Joan Allen. He's actually bla he's actually of the mind that this this line is a consequence of the voice actress. So this shout is one that can knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Esper didn't say a damn thing about knocking dragons out of the sky. Rather, Joan Allen knew that this was the gameplay related effect that the dragon Dragonfin shout would have. She knew. She knew. Okay, Joan Allen was a known. A quality assurance employee of Bethesda. <laughs> Reminds me of Halo fans asking voice actors specific questions about gameplay or the games at some QA event, and they all go, we don't play games. Yeah, it's like... Well, yeah, the voice actors union is pretty powerful, but, like, that's a big assumption that literally anybody who voices a character in these games has ever played an Elder Scrolls game. It's like... No, this is definitely, like, this has lost its position in the top half of Skyrim videos. Joan Allen knew. Before even being hired to voice Delphine, Joan Allen knew. It's like, I know that people who make videos about Skyrim hate talking about the designers. They hate saying the name like Bruce Nesmith, Amo Pagliarulo, Kurt Coleman. You know, they hate talking about those guys because they don't really know a whole lot about them. But there's a new level of insanity when in your effort to talk about the actual people who made the game, you know, to talk about the human beings who worked on this project, that you start prescribing blame to the voice actress. That you said that the voice actress knew about this mechanic, and so she added that part. It, it It's impossible that the writers just, like, made a little fucky-wucky and, like, just said that Delphine knew what Dragon Ren does. Is Mr. Caption in top half of the reviews? Um, I would say yes, but that's like a that's that's like a, a participation trophy at this point. There's so few good Skyrim videos that like um like there are bad videos in the top half just because like uh, I would say there's been one, two, three, three Skyrim reviews, analysis, retrospectives, what have you, that I liked. Joan Allen knows why Mr. Caption deleted his channel. Who do you think who do you think finalized the deletion order? Oopsie whoopsie fucky wucky. But Patrician Daddy, Acer said all the voice actors in Skyrim were amazing. How could Joan Allen be at fault if she's so amazing? Why wouldn't she know? The Blades were probably would probably know about anti-dragon tactics in some capacity. Well, okay, so his point is like 
We the, the dragon rend is learned about because we read the Akaviri wall, so it's assumed that they don't have this information, which I think is a pretty reasonable assumption. Like, there's a lot about the dragons they learn because they came here that they didn't have access to before then, because, like, it's not really in the purview of the Blades to know about how to, like, ancient dragon lore for a species that didn't exist for several hundred years. Joan Allen knows where Will is at. I suppose it's true. Will come home. Your oblivion video wasn't that bad. It had some issues, but I really think that you had the potential to be a good creator if you had just kept at it. And so she had Delphine say, knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Delphine had no way of knowing that. So we- It's the voice actress's fault. Like, literal insanity. Go on another breadcrumb trail, working our way through another series of superfluous contacts. From the Greybeards to Parthenax to that orc for area in Intelligent Winterhold to Septimus Sigmus in the northernmost border of the game map. Padding, 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 padding. We f- Brain blast. Brain blast. Insane in the membrane. Insane in the brain. Like, really? Come on. Of the faction quest lines, those quest lines are basically over. Yes, you can continue to do reading quests with those factions, but only if you choose to. Reading quests are not required to complete the game. Reading quests are just like survival mode in Fallout 4 and Skyrim Special Edition. They are 100% optional. You don't want them, don't do them. But what about the radiant quests you need in order to unlock the next quest in the faction quest line? For example, the Commandos quest line is only six quests long, but it's padded out with radiant quests that you do in between the six main ones. Surely this is just padding, right? Honestly, I would still have to disagree. Well, let me clarify. I disagree with the accusation that they're padding insofar as the word padding is used in a pejorative sense. Sometimes padding is actually good, like on a bed. For example... Truly, wild shit. Let's see Joan Allen's Elder Scrolls knowledge. Which three of your views on Skyrim do you think is good? I've said it a lot of times, okay. But um, G-Man Lives, Angry Joe Show, uh, Noah Caldwell Gervais. Would have, and so she had Delphine say, knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Delphine had no way of knowing that. So we go on. I think there's been some that I liked, but not for the right reasons. Like, uh, I like the ones that are modded, but actually look good. They don't, like, their taste in mods is good. Um, what, what one is that? I think it's like, uh, DJ Peach Cobbler. I think that's the one. Yeah, like... His video wasn't... Phenomenal. And there was like some cringe compilation moments. But his modded version of Skyrim looked really good. So that's gotta be up there. On another breadcrumb trail, working our way through another series of superfluous contacts, from the Greybeards to Parthenax to that Orc Librarian of Intelligent Winterhold to Septimus Sigmus in the northernmost border of the game map. Padding, 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 padding. We finally get a quest to obtain the MacGuffin that we were looking for, an Elder Scroll. That way we can go back to the point of Anduin's original defeat and learn how the Ancient Nords defeated him. What's the logic of calling the Elder Scrolls quest padding? I look at it like saying that like during the Hobbit, basically like the entire sequence between when they enter the giant forest and when they get to Lake Town is padding because it's like, man, they could have just gone down the road to Lake Town and skipped up 
like meeting the elves and escaping them and what have you. But I don't know. I, I, I would say that like it's still a valid part of the story, even if it isn't necessary to the overall plot of like retaking the mountain, right? Like just because something is mildly superfluous doesn't mean that it doesn't serve a role or that it isn't good to have. Like if you're if you have a good thing, why wouldn't you want it to last longer? Smegma mail. There you go. So we can do it again. We go there, learn the Dragon Grand Shout, come back, and Alduin gets away. We trap one of his minions inside Dragon's Reach, head to Sovereign Guard, and kill Alduin for real things. Well, it's not entirely clear if he actually dies, but his body is certainly destroyed. Maybe he'll pull a Voldemort on us and get his body back in a future game someday. Who knows? If it sounds like I may... I guess it isn't fully obvious what happens at the end of Skyrim. I can understand why somebody who uh, really doesn't get it wouldn't would not get the the finer intricacies of the storyline because it is kind of an obscure thing that like alduin's alduin's is destroy is supposed to be the destroyer not the dominator and so like the main quest is uh returning alduin to akatosh so that like uh, he can get back to his shit of one day being the world destroyer Alduin's defeat just now seem kind of anticlimactic, that's because it is. The boss fight itself is nothing to write home about. It has a higher health pool than most other dragons, but that just means he takes maybe one or two more hits to kill. He gets a uh, much longer and drawn-out cutscene for his death than a normal dragon, but again, it's only about 10% more epic than the death scenes for regular dragons. How do you quantify that? How do you say it's 10% more epic? This is like that, um... It's like that Mr. Caption problem of like, fuck, man. I'm frustrated with this project, so I'm just gonna start like phoning shit in. I don't give a fuck at this point. They're not watching. I don't care. You know what I mean? Like when Mr. Caption reached the 90 minute mark and like just stopped giving a fuck. Yeah, that's this. That's this section of the video. The uh, I don't care anymore. But the real kick in the nuts is that there's no closure to the main quest line. Your achievement is hardly even recognized by anyone except the Blades and Greybeards. More importantly, dragons continue to attack indiscriminately in cities, on the roads, all over the place. There's no real incentive to destroy Alduin because his defeat doesn't really amount to anything. Contrast that with Oblivion's main quest, where the completing of the main quest absolutely... Where the completing of the main quest would cut you off from a feature of the game, so you were incentivized to never actually complete things until you were satisfied with the sigil stones that you had gotten absolutely has an effect on the main conflict, because Oblivion Gates will no longer be active in the game. Bethesda's decision to make it so the dragons will continue to attack after the main quest is completed was made in response to fan complaints that completing the main quest in Oblivion forever cut you off from obtaining Sigil Stones and Daedric Alchemy ingredients. Okay, well, I guess he got me. He got me. He's pulled pulled a fast one on me. Or maybe it's just that like my brain works faster, I don't know. I think my video has to be the Skyrim video to end all Skyrim videos because we can't keep doing this. We can't keep doing this. We have to stop the production of Skyrim videos. I don't know. It's a weird thing. It's like his suggestion is that killing Alduin should stop you from getting dragons. Okay. What if you don't have all the dragon shouts? Are you just shit out of luck? I do agree that like... I agree in the sense of there should stop being random dragon encounters, but there should still be, like, the dragon layers. Or maybe, like, the dragon encounters should still be rare, but I don't think they should go away. Just because Alduin's gone doesn't mean the dragons are, like, you know, they're not the droids in Star Wars that, like, all just fall over when the ship blows up. By having dragons continue to attack after the main quest is completed, the player can still obtain an infinite amount of dragon bones, dragon scales, and dragon souls. However, I should just let him finish. <laughs> I feel that they went from the freezer to the frying pan in this respect. A much better, middle of the line approach would have had to only dragons appear in a handful of guaranteed but responding locations, all of which were far away from civilized society, thus ending. I don't know, why would the dragons just stop attacking society because Alduin was gone? I guess because Alduin can't bring them back. Oh, wow, wait. Alduin can't bring them back from getting sucked up by the Dragonborn anyways. 
the main quest would have provided the benefit of ensuring that cities and quest essential NPCs were safe from being- Okay, here's why the Angry Joe Show review is good. It's because he basically said what people uh, would say years later, like two weeks after the game came out. And because, like, honestly, you can't act like your video is better than the Angry Joe Show video and, like, just recreate it. Like, I think there's a lot of people who think that they're better than Angry Joe that really aren't. I thought the radiant aspects were the best part, Acer Thorn. But no, it ruins his immersion if the dragons keep attacking. Because, you know, killing Alduin was like the end of the dragons or something. Indiscriminately killed outside the player's control, but would still give us the ability to continue to farm bones, souls, and scales. I mean, okay, after Alduin's gone, that would make Parthenex, like, not only chronologically the oldest dragon, but, like, he is, the, like, the second son, so... In conclusion, Skyrim's main quest is poorly plotted, poorly paced, and poorly resolved. This is certainly a downside on the game as a whole, and a huge strike against the game holding up in the modern day. I guess. Angry Joe has no pretension as well. It does everything it's set out to do. Yeah, I guess that's true. I don't know. It just felt like... Angry Joe was super enthusiastic about the game, but it felt like he was being honest. Like, those were his true feelings. He wasn't making up that he thought the game was a 10 out of 10. And you might say it's absurd and, like, uh, if you're spiteful, you might show clips of Angry Joe saying it's a 10 out of 10 years after the fact. Because how embarrassing, but, like, I don't know. It seemed like he was being real. I don't think, like, I think there's some shit that... Joe's been controversial for, but I don't think, like, his opinion on fucking some random Elder Scrolls game is, is one of them. Downloadable contents with a background from Target. After you complete the main game, there are three DLCs to give you extra replay value. Well, yeah, see, this is why your video doesn't hold up, because there's a lot more than three DLCs now. More like two and a half DLCs, or rather more like 2.1 DLCs. Who else made that joke? It's like, yeah, we get it. Hearthfire's not a real boy, okay? The Hearthfire DLC isn't even a true DLC. It's more like a microtransaction. It has horse armor beaten that it actually provides some utility, but it's so insubstantial that it doesn't really deserve any real discussion beyond this one paragraph. The first DLC... Yeah, but you did... Okay, one, that was not a paragraph, but two... Um... You didn't really seem to know that, like, a big part of the Hearth Firehouses is that, like, they add the ability for you to grow alchemy ingredients, which is something you had an issue with. Ah, yes, because we have had such great plotted, paced, and controlled games like Greedfall, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and Red Dead 2. Yeah, that's the thing, is, like, um... You know, you play a lot of modern games, and it's like, it could be so much worse. So much worse. Like, Red Dead Redemption 2 is actually, like, a nightmare story. I legitimately, like, it's it's gotta be brainwashing that, like, people like that story. It's such a clusterfuck. It's nice. There's good vibes. I like hanging out at the camp. But, like, playing the actual story itself is like a fever dream. Um, I felt more sane when I was, like, high on Benadryl trying and having a fever dream. And I dreamt in Technicolor that night. So, the fact that that was more cogent than, like, Red Dead Redemption 2's story kind of says a lot. Please stop bullying Hearthfire. It doesn't deserve it. Like, yeah, it's not super exciting, but it isn't offensive. I really don't understand what people's hatred of Hearthfire, Hearthfire is. It's a house DLC. It doesn't really claim to be anything bigger than that. See to be released was Dawn Guard. Basically, it's taking the one interesting thing about the companions that those with cursed bestial existence are actually the good guys, and basically just chucks that out the window. The Dawn Guard are the good guys, and they're hunting vampires. Now, either one. Okay, so Dongar bad because I misunderstood the companions.
Are you going to mention the seeming brain rot whenever people make Skyrim videos in my video? Yes. Is a pretty interesting character. Also, Saron is well, Red Dead Redemption. Red Dead Redemption 2 suffers from the classic, like, prequel problem of it's a prequel story to Red Dead Redemption 1, which means that um, there are necessary endpoints for all the characters, and that can be like a heavily restrictive uh, limitation on the storytelling possibilities. I feel like Dutch and John Marston are pretty much like the only characters that really have anything going on in Red Dead Redemption 2. Obviously other than Arthur. But even then, like, Arthur's not really much of a character. There's not much of an arc to him. He starts as either a good or a bad guy and ends as either a good or a bad guy based on the player's uh, decisions. You can't be allowed to have supernatural beings be the bad guys. They're literally a race of people that drink blood, Acer. Like, it's almost impossible at their level of technology for the vampires to uh, integrate with society in a way that isn't evil. Like, in modern society, you could have vampires that, like, could exist publicly and like have people know about them and it's like no 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 uh we buy our blood we pay people to give us their blood and drink it we don't we know you know we don't break into people's house to drink blood anymore right but um yeah in like this era of society it, it it's impossible they literally have to have slaves to drink blood from is one of the most well-done companions in the entire game. She was created in direct response to fan complaints that the followers in Skyrim didn't have enough personality and individuality to them, and... Well, that's the first I'm hearing of that. Boy, does she deliver and work to find that problem with the vanilla game. Right out the gate, however, this questline falls flat on its face. To initiate the questline, you have to go to Fort Dawnguard and speak to Ysbron. He'll send you on a mission to a cave to see what the vampires there are up to. There you meet Serana, who insists you take her back to her father. Then you meet Lord Harkon. Then and only then does he give you the option to choose one side or the other. This setup works just fine, provided that the player character isn't already a vampire to begin with. If you are a vampire, however, Isron will still let you join the Dawnguard and complete the entire Dawnguard questline, and never once make even the slightest reference to the fact that you're the very thing the Dawnguard is dedicated to fighting against. I mean... It is mildly a problem, but... Dawnguard prevented you from being a vampire who hunts other vampires like Alucard or Blade? Yeah, I guess that's true. Like, that's pretty much exactly an answer to this criticism. Like, you know, maybe you're a vampire who wants to hunt vampires. There's nothing wrong with that. That could be something that, like, characters want to do. But it's like, one of the main things about that makes vampires dangerous is that you can't tell... You can't tell that fed vampires are part of, like, are around you. And so, like, it's plausible that, like, Isaron in the five minutes that he knows you, uh, could absolutely... Does he? I don't think he does. Like, we're specifically talking about the first quest. You can walk in here as a vampire. Isaron won't address it, and he'll still send you on the mission. Now, personally, I think the mission is an open enough prompt to assume that, like, oh yeah, Isaron was sending you to die. Like, it's a, if he comes back, he's worth joining the Dawn Guard, and if he doesn't, no skin off my back kind of deal. But yeah, you can absolutely uh, do this first encounter as a vampire. You can't simply go straight to the Dim Hollow Crypt, rescue Saron, and join up the vampires directly. It's not even but how would you know that that were the case? Like, I... Yes, Dawnguard starts extremely awkwardly. He does the magic test to see if you're a vampire. 
I think that a lot of people in the chat don't seem to ha have not very recently played Dawn Guard and are like are combining a bunch of Dawn Guard scenes into like one scene. Okay, we are specifically talking about the first scene in Dawn Guard when you first arrive at Fort Dawn Guard. That's when you meet Rosh, uh, and you go up with him, and like that's when you first get the crossbow. Okay, there's the vigilant guy there. They don't do the magic test. He doesn't gauge whether or not you're, va you're a vampire or not. The magic test happens after you recruit the people for Fort Dawn Guard. So you've already committed at that point. I personally have not tested the I'm going to be a vampire, but I'm going to reject Lord Harkon path because that seems extremely specific. But I do know that like Later down the line, there are stages where Isran insists that you get cured before giving you the next quest. But yeah, like I can tell several people in the chat are like combining multiple scenes. He tests you when you come back. He tests you after you recruit the crossbow lady and the troll guy. I think the the quest line probably start should have started at the Hall of the Vigilant, and I think it was supposed to, like originally, because the Hall of the Vigilant is extremely close to Dim Hollow Crypt. Like it's very easy to imagine you go there, and then, um, like you you find a journal and it leads you to Dim Hollow Crypt or something. Even like Ezron is willing to accept a vampire if they're willing to fight for the Dawn Guard's cause. A big part of Ezron's character arc is coming to terms. Right. Because people who are extremely hateful and violent towards vampires are going to tolerate the presence of vampires because they're what we're one of the good ones, guys. with the fact that Serana isn't evil despite being a vampire. So no, Isran is simply not programmed to recognize that you're a vampire, which is just dumb. But he is. There's like... Okay. One of the ways that you can do this, the Soul Cairn thing is you can let uh, Serana turn you into a vampire. But when you come back from that quest, Isran flips his shit and like insists that you aren't allowed unless you can find a way to get cured. So it's like, this seems to be an instance of like, he probably only did one playthrough and like did not test a lot of the branches out. So it's like, I mean, you know, I haven't done the start as a vampire, but reject Lord Harkon and try to keep playing the Dawn Guard path. It sounds like an interesting thing to, tw to test, but um, no, I don't, I don't think this is the case. Hell, even Serana says that she expected you to be one of her, aka a vampire, so even she isn't programmed to recognize if you already are one. She does, though. She has a voice line. She literally says, do you really think the Dawn Guard are going to continue believing that you're not a vampire? She has a voice line for that. Like, like, dead ass fucking... So, yeah, she ha um If you're a vampire, she uses the line You ask her who Okay. Uh where is who sent you here? And you can answer who were you expecting? And she will say, "I was expecting someone from my family. I don't recognize you. Are you one of my father's little acolytes?" And then uh later down the line, you you can ask her, "How did you know I was a vampire?" Um Oh no, you can ask, who's your father? And she'll respond, he's a very powerful man, or he was at one point. I'm surprised another vampire hasn't heard of him. Or you can tell her who you're with, and you can say, no, a group of Dongard called, a group called the Dongard sent me here, and she'll respond, that's not a name I know, and it doesn't sound like a name of a group of vampires would choose. How did you know I was a vampire? 
You think I can't tell my own kind? You're a vampire? Can't you tell your own kind? I smelled you almost before my eyes were open. And then you can say, the Dawn Guard would want me to kill you, and she'll respond, don't think that'll keep them from turning on you eventually. They'll figure out what you are. Like, they extensively compensated for the fact that you would be a vampire and, like, called out that, like, no, dude, the Dawn Guard, you are not going to survive being in the Dawn Guard. There's no good vampires for that cause. Beyond that, the Dawn Guard questline is surprisingly interesting. While it falls into the dungeon after dungeon formula that the vanilla faction questlines fall into, it is saved by having each dungeon look and feel unique. Dim Hall of Crypt initially appears to simply be a Draka ruin at first glance, but it quickly takes on a new aesthetic. The puzzle you have to solve to open Serana's coffin actually requires some brain work to pull off. Really? Okay. Again, this is like, I'm so stupefied that I'm like, I like, don't know what to write. Okay. He thinks that Dawnguard has no contingency sees for if you are a vampire and he thinks Brazier puzzle requires brain work. I guess it would require brain work if your brain was made of fucking chicken breasts. Not a lot of brain work, but infinitely more brain work than the Dragon Claw knot puzzles that we see in nearly half the dungeons. I'm sorry, I uh, no. The vanilla game. We also get. A we should run the DSP test on that puzzle. If DSP can figure it out instantly, it's not com. It does not require brain work. A surprising amount of character development from this run. Not a lot, but a surprising amount. What's even better is that this character development is shown to us rather than told. You actually have to be pay paying attention, or else you very easily can miss it. I guess I must not have been paying attention because I very easily missed what Isran's character development was. He starts up extremely hateful of vampires, and he ends by planting his axe in a bunch of vampires. Wow, big, uh, big ups there. When Sarana first shows up at Fort Dawnguard, Isran refers to her as It, and refuses to call her by her name. However, just before Kindred Judgment, Isran wonders if Sarana is prepared to commit patricide. During this conversation, however, he not only calls Sarana by her name, but even refers to her as her rather than it, suggesting oh. that he has grown to respect Sarana for- Why is that he calls her by her name a minor detail, but that he uses the correct pronouns a major detail? Sacrifices she has made for their cause. It's a level of character development and a level- Didn't Salt Factory basically say he solved the puzzle by randomly pushing shit until it works? I think that was him. ...of subtlety that I've come to not expect from Bethesda, and I hope that this newfound skill in writing character development will bleed over into the Elder Scrolls VI. After Dawn Guard, Bethesda released the Dragonborn DLC. Honestly, I wish the DLC was given a unique name rather than named it after a concept that already existed in the vanilla game. Because now we are forever confused and must specify which Dragonborn we're referring to, the vanilla concept or the DLC. Oh yeah, it's very confusing. Are we talking about the character or the DLC? There's no context clues that in a, in a sentence that would allow someone to distinguish between whether or not you're talking about the main character of the game or the DLC. Similar to how Tribunal was super confusing because are we talking about the gods or are we talking about the DLC? Or how like... Knights of the Nine was like fucking. This has got this is smooth brained. Not only is it like chicken breasts, but like the chicken breast like before they put the chicken breasts in, they cooked them. But aside from that blunder, the Dragonborn DLC is on. Yeah, it's a real blunder. That's that's a nitpick. Okay, what you did earlier, not nick, not nitpicking. This is an extreme nitpick. Why wouldn't they name the DLC after one of the main concepts of the DLC, which is like, you know, the Dragonborn?
honestly the better of the two Skyrim DLCs. It's not Shivering Isles by a long shot, but there is definitely a lot to like about it. I would disagree. I think um, Dragonborn is... I mean, it doesn't have the character of Shivering Isles, but mechanically, I think it's fairly comparable. Taking place on the island of Solstheim, which was also the setting for Morrowind's Blood Moon expansion, this DLC could serve as a throwback to Morrowind fans. However, this is an example of a throwback done right, because you are only missing out on a few tidbits of nostalgia if you haven't played Morrowind like yours truly. The Dragon... Like yours truly. I'm a big fan of the series, uh, but I've only played two of the games. I've always found Arturius and the Abyss confusing because it's never clear if I'm talking about the Arturius and the Abyss from the base game or the Arturius and the Abyss from the DLC. Yeah. Born DLC may reuse some background music, places, and NPC names from the Blood Moon expansion, but it is still its own standalone experience, even without the throwbacks. It also. Wow. That's like. Yeah. Avoids the pitfalls that Dawnguard falls into when it comes to actually initiating the quest line. The quest only initiates after you train with the Greybeards. By that point, your status as the Dragonborn is publicly known, saving us from the contrivance of Ezron looking into your vampire eyes and never realizing that you're a vampire. Of course, you are still free to explore Solstheim to your heart's content even before the Dragonborn main quest activates. There are new quests to complete, independently of the main quest. There are new items to acquire, new places to explore, new people to meet, and yet, none of this is actually required to play and complete vanilla Skyrim. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a lost art. Not the idea of DLC in general, but the idea that the DLC should be independent of the main game, interact with the main game only insofar as it's needed to make the DLC feel connected to it. And but yeah, it's not like certain parts of Dragonborn's main quest play out differently based on what stage of the main quest you've done. Most importantly, it doesn't give us anything that was cut from the main game. This is the ideal way to do DLC, ladies and gentlemen. It's an art that has sadly been lost on many game publishers in recent years. And just on that alone, I would argue that the Dragonborn DLC definitely holds up. Of course, despite all the flaws I have given about Skyrim, all the complaints I mentioned about where I point out that it doesn't hold up, all of that is seemingly negated by one important factor. Nostalgia. See, he said it again. That's what we said we were talking about earlier. He's saying that Eastron never confronts the player about being a vampire. Um, yeah, I mean, like... Um, as I've been saying for a while, if you're wrong, you're wrong for a long time, right? So it's like, if he, he's building on a faulty foundation that faulty foundation doesn't change he's not going to realize like while he's doing this that he was wrong about Ysauron in the first place you're actually unable to progress through dragonborn if you can't do dragon shouting yeah i think you you can you can visit the island and you can do the side quests but you can't do the like the main quest of dragonborn like it's it's a really weird kind of like praise to give the expansion because shivering isles is absolutely that way but dragonborn is not you have to do part of the main quest to do the dragonborn main quest do you think bethesda got really comfortable with the boat entrance into dlcs after fallout 3 we've seen it three times now in between uh el dragonborn and far harbor pl um, I'm trying to remember what Fallout 3 DLC that is. Um, I think it, it's an effective way to introduce content, though. Like, I'm not particularly bothered by them reusing the idea. You know that spinning move looks cool, but my karate teacher actually told me it wasn't supposed to turn... I'm not... I wasn't supposed to turn away from my enemy. Yeah, like, one of the worst things you can do is turn your back to something that you're fighting. Because it turns out there's a big thing in your back... A really big target on your back called your spine. You all know what it is. I don't know what it is. Mods. Okay, yeah. Really looking forward if you to made this. A you know full well. You know full well. This far into this video, then you're a nerd, so I don't need to explain to you what a mod is. But You made it this far into the video, you're a nerd. Wow, great, cool. Fuck you too. I wouldn't really say you're a nerd. More like you're a fucking moron. Or you're like a, uh, you're a masochist. 
but their contribution to making Skyrim the household name it is today cannot be overstated. Skyrim has, hands down, the largest modding community on the internet, and by quite a large margin. Bethesda not only permits mods, but actively supports the modding community. Yeah, your video really held up to modern standards. Um, one, I don't think that's necessarily true because the metric you use was the Nexus, but I don't think Minecraft mods are hosted on the Nexus. I think they're hosted on CurseForge. So, like, I don't know. I think the Minecraft modding community could absolutely give Skyrim a run for its money. Actively providing the tools needed to make modding as quick and easy as physically possible by releasing their creation kits for free download and even providing tutorials on their own YouTube channel for how to use them. Granted, these tutorials are pretty shallow and don't go into a tenth the potential the creation kits have, but the important thing is that Bethesda goes out of its way to- Yeah, I'm sure you really understand what's going on with the creation kit to make that assertion. ...support the modding community, not simply taking a passive stance and allowing modders to do their thing but at their own risk. Literally- why is Acer Thorn stealing all my brain wrinkles? Really, every single flaw I have discussed with Skyrim, and any you can think of yourselves, can be fixed with a mod. You are insane. That is one of the most insane things I have ever heard. Oh my god. 2, 38, 39. Any issue with the game that you can think of can be fixed by a mod. Okay. Okay. I need, I need a palate cleanser. How much time do I have left before we run out of time? We got time. Okay. Okay. D-Man lives. Skyrim. Where's the based part? I need the based part. D-Man. Okay. Okay. Boom. Uh, when did this video come out? May of 2019. So this is post... This is in a post Acer Thorn world. Okay. Where's it at? 16, 18. Okay. Please be based. In fact, you could probably join and rise to the ranks of the top of every single guild and faction in the entire game in one playthrough. And I don't fucking care if there's some kind of mod that fixes this. I don't. I hate when people use that as a defense. Games, I think, should be evaluated on how they play out of the box. I mean, some mod that some guy made that adds all this kind of stuff back in doesn't excuse the fact that it wasn't there to begin with. The modding scene from Oblivion is really responsible for introducing modding as a viable way of improving the fundamental flaws of a game. And this is also something that ended up being the case with Skyrim. And yeah, with mods you can make Skyrim to be a pretty damn polished and fun game, but that doesn't excuse the base problems it has. Oh, you may have a point. Anyway. Thank you, G-Man. But yeah, do I really need to explain it? There are core fundamental story issues that you can't really fix. Like, as far as I'm aware, the only mod that actually tries to change story elements of Skyrim is uh, the Parthenax Dilemma. The modding community for the Elder Scrolls practically has its own version of Rule 34. If you can imagine it, there either is a mod... Oh man, this guy is definitely a massive pervert. There's no way he can say that and not have, like, some kind of freaky fucking sex mod loadout. ...or there eventually will be one made. Now granted, such extensive mod support is a bit of a double-edged sword. For every person who praises Bethesda for their extensive support of the modding community, there are plenty others who accuse Bethesda of simply using their mod support as a crutch. They don't need to put any effort into making- You really shouldn't claim this is a modern video, this is the most dated section. ...games that are good on their own merit because they expect modders to clean up whatever messes the games are on launch day. There is some new fuel to the fire added in recent months with the release of Fallout 76, a notoriously buggy MMO RPG. Many of these bugs are grandfathered in from Fallout 4, only this time around, they are much worse because we don't have the simple expedient of modding the game to get rid of these bugs quickly and painlessly. However, I find that accusation to be not only inaccurate, but insultingly short-sighted. As I have demonstrated this entire retrospective, there is just as much to like about Vanilla Skyrim as there is to dislike. People need to remember that Skyrim was originally released on the Xbox 360 and PS3 before being ported over to the Xbox One. Hey, hey. There it is. There it is. Playing on God mode. What's the, is there? A, oh, he's also added like ten thousand gold to his inventory. Is there like a command to strip NPCs down? On PS4, those consoles did not have mod support at all for five years. The PC version of the game was the only way you could play Skyrim with mods, and yet the game still sold like a mother effer on all three platforms. 
Skyrim is the third best-selling RPG of all time, having sold 30 million copies as of the time of this recording. It What's number two and number one? Would not have gotten the cult stat- Modding a game quickly and painlessly. Yeah, if, that, it's true if you're like installing one or two mods, but uh, go past that and things become un unquick and unpainless. ...as it currently has if it was only good on PC. Besides, if the game wasn't good on its own merits, I highly doubt there would be enough people who cared enough about the game to actually have an active money community. Bethesda's support. I'm trying to think if there's a good example of a game where um, people like mod the shit out of it just to like spite the developers. Like just to. Support for the modding community doesn't mean Jack Squad if there simply aren't enough people interested in modding the game for there to even be a modding community for them to support. Right. So if a game is unpopular but releases modding tools, then you know that effort doesn't really it doesn't really count. It this is like a bizarre appeal to popularity fallacy where um like he's doing it backwards from the way most people do it, right? Is he? Let's see, most people do it to explain... I don't know, there's two ways to take the appeal to popularity fallacy. Something is bad because it's popular, and something is good because it's popular. And I think he's making the case that... Sky, like, Bethesda's doing a good job basically because it's popular. This is why Super Mario World for the SNES... Yeah, I guess The Sims is a great answer to the... Are there people who mod the game out of defiance for the developers? And yeah, Sims is a great answer. ...as an active, sprawling ROM hack community, while Shaq Fu, well, doesn't. I mean... But even if we accept that Bethesda really are just using mod support as a crutch so they can half-ass the rest of the game design, I'm not entirely convinced that this necessarily translates to an unethical business practice. This video, this video is extremely out of date. Show you what I mean. Look at Super Mario Maker. That's a game that, by its very design, relies on user submitted content. There is no game at all unless the players are designing and uploading new levels, and yet it's one of the best games on the Wii U. For There's a world of difference between an in game level editor and a, and a creation platform for mods. perhaps the only reason to continue to own a Wii U. So, in conclusion, the fact that Skyrim not only has mod support, but has the largest modding community in the world, is an incredible boon. It is not an excuse for releasing a crappy game, but it does cause an overall good game to come ever so closer to the impossible threshold of being perfect. Wow, that section's fucking sucked. It's... Just don't do it. Don't do it. I know it's tempting to talk about Skyrim mods, but don't do it. There has been nobody who has talked positively about Skyrim mods that came out better looking. Who came out better for it. Didn't people do that as well with Mass Effect? They unlocked Javik because he was since he was day one DLC. I always felt I was disappointed in private sessions for not mentioning uh, Javik being day one DLC. So like that, because he mentioned why people didn't really see like, um, the, the lady who has the stealth mission, uh, because uh, like, I never saw her back in the day and that's because she was paid DLC. So like, I also never saw Javik while playing Mass Effect 3 because of that, but he didn't really mention it. Was the Wii U relevant in fucking 2019? Like, hang on. Everything comes back to Joseph Anderson. When did Joseph Anderson make the, that uh, Breath of the Wild video? Twenty seventeen. Breath of the Wild was for the Switch, right? So, like, you know. 
How well Skyrim holds up in the modern day depends largely on how much it has influenced games that have come before it, for better or worse. Skyrim's runaway success has no doubt been a game changer in the RPG genre, and numerous games have come since then that are clearly inspired by Skyrim's scope and scale. Grand Theft Auto 3 was one of the first major players in the open-world sandbox genre of gaming. In recent years, the Assassin's Creed series has arguably made the best use of sandbox world style by having every piece of architecture climbable like platforming obstacles. Around the time that Assassin's Creed was making its mark, RPGs were likewise gravitating towards this style. Bethesda, along with BioWare and Blizzard, developed strong role-playing portfolios of open-world sandbox RPGs. But as far as cold to hard sales were concerned, first-person shooters like Call of Duty, Halo, and Gears of War were still the undisputed kings of the 29s. Oh, man. How do I fucking... Like, okay, yeah. I think he's making an argument like open world games were the underdog, but now they're taking over. And it's like, no, they're not. They're popular, but they're not on top. But in 2011, Bethesda released Skyrim and its runaway success would result in an RPG renaissance for the gaming industry. Assassin's Creed 2, what? Grand Theft Auto 4, what? We can make it, guys. Just hold it, hold through. Pat, what is he talking about? Um, basically, it's a big appeal to popularity fa fallacy. Just as platformers ruled the 1990s and first-person shooters ruled the 20-knots, RPGs appeared to be dominated in the 2010s, thanks in no small part to the runaway success of Skyrim. Bethesda had been known for several years by then uh, for its Elder Scrolls series featuring expansive fantasy worlds and was continuing to push the boundaries of scale in RPGs with Oblivion and Fallout 3. Rather than focusing on complex narratives and... Subtitle study said Plebeian personal relationships, like Bioware and other developers were doing, Bethesda focused on creating massive worlds that begged to be explored. Bethesda Yeah, okay. Skyrim's world is comically small. ...couldn't have missed the surge of popularity that open-world sandbox games were suddenly experiencing, so I have to imagine they wanted to take that new- Yeah, because Oblivion was, Oblivion was a hyper-linear first-person shooter, but Todd, then one day Todd Howard played Assassin's Creed and said, Damn, this is my shit. Uh, I think Elder Scrolls 6, Elder Scrolls 5, whatever, Whatever fucking game we're working on, and like Todd, Todd doesn't know what what number of the game we're on. Uh, Elder Scrolls Five, uh, make that shit open world. It's like, no, not really. You know, like um, Bethesda was already doing that, and it's just like a direct continuation of the formula that they had been doing for years. New Rising Trope and crank it up to eleven. This style of game design not only paid off in spades for Bethesda, but actually set the bar for how 21st century RPGs should work. It set the bar for how 21st century sh should work. Our 21st century RPGs. Got it? Okay. I hope you don't feel a little despondent, okay? The next 90 years, we've already peaked. We've already peaked. You don't have anything to... If you're a fan of RPGs, you literally have nothing to look forward to for the next 90 years. Well, you know, it's, it's closer to 80 years now. But, like, 11 years into the 21st century, we peaked. Developers to this day take the template that Skyrim left for them and build off of it rather than building their own games entirely from the ground up. That's right. They just take Skyrim and they build off of it. They don't make games from the ground up anymore. It's just Skyrim. Have you ever wondered why games have become increasingly buggy over the years? That's because they're all secretly Skyrim. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about RPGs is like... I feel like World of Warcraft was more influential on RPGs. You don't really see a lot of like item progressions that work like Skyrim, you, but you do see a lot of, this is a rare item, this is an epic item, this is a legendary item. Mixing them with some of the character development, moral ambiguity, and so much more that the developers like Bioware and Obsidian have created. Put simply, Skyrim is basically- Whoa, 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 you can't praise Obsidian. What's this? 
the blueprint for the RPGs we play today, years later. We see evidence of this in games like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, whose developers have freely admitted to using Skyrim for inspiration, as is explained by this Games Cannabis article. Nintendo are usually the guys who get caught. Wasn't that con wasn't that contested? I had heard something about that, like, um... Someone had claimed that, like, that was a misattribution. Copy, not the ones who do the copying. Considering they set the standard for 3D platformers in much the same way that Skyrim set the standards for 21st century RPGs, they also invented the D-pad. They invented shoulder buttons. Think about how many Mario Party clones have come and gone over the years. And do I even have to explain how the PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale is just a blatant ripoff of a famous Nintendo franchise? I mean, that game isn't even trying to hide how much of a ripoff it is. Is Acer Thorn and in Toddler? It is. Even in the RPG genre, they invented the use of timed button presses to do extra damage based on player skill rather than character skill. So for Nintendo to freely admit taking inspiration from another game, that is high praise indeed. As a result of this, Skyrim's legacy cannot be called in question. Regardless of how the game may hold up as a standalone game, it absolutely holds up just on legacy alone. So, now that I've analyzed Skyrim from top to bottom with a fine-tooth comb... Oh yeah, with a real fine-tooth comb. Come on, you ba you admitted that you weren't doing an in-depth analysis of the story. Like, you flat-out admitted that. Your words, not mine. Oh, but you really hit Skyrim with that fine-tooth comb. What is the final verdict? We've discussed... I... Profound mental retardation. I think that's the final verdict. Just what holds up and what doesn't hold up. But does Skyrim on the whole still hold up? My final verdict is... Yes, it does hold up. But only for a blind playthrough. I think someone's a fan of, like, Movie Bob. Okay, okay, hear me out. Yes, Skyrim's stories hold up because they're good stories. Why is it, What's with the sudden, like increase in uh editing effort and good stories last forever but that doesn't mean that being told the same story over and over again is very much fun after i've seen a movie or read a book i very rarely have any incentive to see that movie or read that book ever again except to pick up on subtle clues and stories that just foreshadowing the symbolism that i didn't catch when i consumed it for the first time sounds like you're a cultural pleb then like most people who like something generally rewatch it like once a year or every couple years right like, if they like a movie, or they like a book, like, you know. What does it hold up? It holds up his massive, gigantic brain. There's a reason why spoilers are usually frowned upon unless they're protected by a spoiler warning. Oh, come on. You can't hit me with that. You can't hit me with that. I don't have enough time. I do not have enough time. I'm ignoring that. The world is also- Why did he bring up spoiler warnings? So great to explore. But the world explore implies that you don't already know what you're about to find, meaning that you're only truly exploring the world on a first playthrough. Every playthrough after that is just scouring for whatever you might have missed the first time around. That leaves the gameplay, combat, and dungeon. Who? Why? Why is the music like this? The music is literally extremely overpowering. It means he wrote the conclusion first before he ran out of steam. That's what I assumed is he wrote the first and last five minutes and then like Everything in between has been padding because, as we know, he padding is all right in the right situation. That's the only thing that can hold up on subsequent playthroughs, and unfortunately, I simply cannot defend those. There are plenty of RPGs out there that have much more engaging combat, ones that actually rely on player skill as much as leveling up your character. Games like Dark Souls and Witcher 3 all blow Skyrim's combat engine completely out of the water. While their dungeons may not tell a story using their dungeon layout like Skyrim does, that's just part of the storytelling aspect, which again only holds up if you're experiencing it for the first time. Meanwhile, Kingdom Come Deliverance has a vastly superior stealth system in Skyrim, as much as it pains me to say it. However, you are absolutely free to disagree with me. I don't think that's true. I don't think I'm free to disagree with you.
I still love Skyrim to death, despite acknowledging that it doesn't hold up. Is that just my nostalgia speaking? Maybe it is. Wait, I thought your conclusion was that it did hold up. You can't flip-flop on me, my guy. You did a big drum roll. I still love Skyrim to death, despite acknowledging that it doesn't hold up. Is I love Skyrim to death, despite hold acknowledging that it does hold up, or despite acknowledging that it doesn't hold up? You, you've misenunciated the uh, exact wrong word to confuse the sentence, but it's like, okay. I love Skyrim to death despite acknowledging that it doesn't hold up. But you you said, you said, you said, you said that it holds up. Does it? Like, please stop with this shit where you just fucking make a point and then like disprove yourself. How many videos have crashed and burned like this before? Mr. Caption comes to mind. Um, Salt Factory second video. Is that just my nostalgia speaking? Maybe it is. But then again, why judge me for nostalgia? If I'm having a good time and I'm not infringing on the rights of others, why should I punish myself by feeling guilty about my own enjoyment? Whether Sky so basically, you would go on the dopamine drip. As a whole, whole Thanks for, like, basically admitting that, yeah, my video is a waste of time. I'm allowed to do whatever I want. And you don't matter. Great. Cool. Awesome. He does qualify his statement that it holds up, but only for a first playthrough. And then he goes on to say he thinks it's good because of nostalgia. You're on that Giga Schizo grind set. I started this video at noon my time, went to work, came home, and you're still streaming. Oh, it's true. I've been known to do, like, extremely long streams. But it's like, I'm motivated to get this done so I don't have to, like, ever talk about it or finish it. It's up in modern day is mostly a matter of your personal preference. Not only in terms of whether each individual element holds up. Wow, thank you. I'm glad that you've given me permission to have my own personal preference on uh, what I personally find appealing about a video game. But also in terms of how you prioritize each element. Some may consider dungeon layout and combat to be more important than story, and they are absolutely entitled to their opinions. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad that you have entitled me to my own opinion about what I find important in Skyrim. Um, what the fuck does this have to do? Like, I don't care. It's assumed. Subjectivity is implied. <laughs> Some may prioritize combat over character development, but feel that Skyrim's combat does hold up while its storytelling does not. Again, uh, some people might prioritize stripping all the NPCs down with the pickpocket mechanics. Those people are 100% allowed to have their opinions. In short, while I have given my opinion about Skyrim's holding up, it is only just that an opinion. Only you can. How many times have we seen this clip? I am right, still worth a purchase in 2019. Although, if you haven't already purchased the game, I hope this retrospective has enabled you to make a well-informed decision about this purchase. If you have already purchased the game- Why would you- If you watch this video, would you buy Skyrim? You'd have to be fucking insane. I have no clue if this particular software supports our movements. I don't really think it would add enough to, like, justify doing it. I hope this retrospective has given you a lot to think about. So please. Well, this is actually like this is the Turing test. I've been determining whether or not you guys are autistic or not. Remember what I said at the beginning of this retrospective about commenting. And that will do it for today's video. I don't remember what you said about commenting. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Also, check out some of the other analysis videos I have made, as well as my Let's Plays, where I take a more lighthearted approach to these games and just have a good time. In the I don't think you have a good time. You seem like a person who's incapable of joy. In the meantime, however, I am Acer Thorn, and I will see you guys later. I don't remember what he said about commenting. So let's look it up and find out. Comment. Last but not least, before we get to the retrospective proper, I have a minor favor to ask of you. I want you all to post your comments and tell me your thoughts. Not only do I enjoy deep, intellectual, and thought-provoking discussion, it also helps me to discover new topics to make videos about. By all means, feel free to even disagree with my opinions in this video, as long as you're civil about it. 
After all, it is fairly well documented that exposing oneself to different points of view than what you're used to is a scientifically proven method of coming up with new ideas whenever you're in a field that requires creativity, such as YouTube content creation. So even if you can't think of anything to say, be sure to say something. Be sure to comment, comment, comment. So with that out of the way, let's get this party started. Yeah, it's like, who's gonna watch this video when there's 45 seconds of you begging for comments up front? How do you unsubscribe from someone you're not subscribed to? It's funny how Acer Thorn talks about how much he accepts other people's opinions, but he went to war with Kretosis over them having a different opinion. Oh, well, you see, um, that has to do with the civility clause. Uh, the Kretosis, Kretosis and Co. were not civil in the way that they handled their analysis, so that means that it's completely invalid. So, like, the 12 hours of streaming we did today is invalid because I diagnosed Acer Thorn as, with ha as having profound mental retardation. Yeah, I know. I'm. I've been watching the uh, the timer increment closer and closer to twelve hours. I'll be sure to stop before then. If you can't think of anything to say, say something anyways. Not even that he bans other people from chats, although I'm sure he does, but that like he asks other people to ban people from their chats. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having heard you. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. But yeah, that was... I'm not a better person. I am not a better person. I think Acer Thorn should have to pay me for that kind of um, mental assault. We could say I I could also say it's like a uh, a critique session, you know, really trying to give him some constructive criticism. There is a lot of like shit that I should charge money for asking for because, wow, we mama. What's a numerical score that we could give it? Did you learn anything? Um, reflecting on the video, I would have to say that... Um, I don't know. It's like the pitfalls of the video pitfalls of the video um, are things that like I would already know about like one of the big things I'm looking for is um, what are some issues that other people have had in talking about Skyrim and how do I avoid those issues and I feel like I feel like this was two and a half hours like almost three hours of him uh, repeatedly stepping on a rake he steps on a rake it bashes him in the face he likes recoils backwards and the rake falls down and then he steps forward triumphantly after having recovered from getting smacked in the face with a rake and uh, it, he just gets smacked in the face again I, don't, I wouldn't say that 22,000 views is particularly impressive after what three years Three out of ten. Um, so for comparison, Arlo was rated at a two. Dime Tree was rated at a two. DJ Peach Cobbler was rated at a true at a two. Salt Factory was rated at a three. This has got to be a one. Like, there's a good video in there, but it needs Jesus. It doesn't need an editor. It doesn't need a script editor. It needs Jesus.
The video was very good for calling Joan Allen out on her bullshit. Oh god, right. There's the Joan Allen thing, there's like the fucking power supplies are gonna explode if you uh turn up radiant AI thing. A shit ton of those views are coming from Kretosis drama and you to be honest. Um no, not necessarily. When I took so I wrote down the like view counts of the videos when I was like assembling the stuff for November. So this was like back in October and it was at 19k. So it's gotten like 3000 views in the last couple months. I don't know. I don't I don't think that I don't think he's like uh No, I don't I don't think that like he's particularly benefiting from all the drama that he's in. Uh, if anything, it's probably like a massive negative for him. Because, I mean, there's the old Nick factor of like... Um, if, you live, if you live your life around negativity, then like you're always going to be... Uh, you're always basically going to be in a state of conflict. I missed the Joan Allen thing. What was it? Basically, he accused the voice actress of, like, ad-libbing and adding plot details to the scene because the voice actress was aware of, like, game mechanics. Like, it's so insane. It's such an insane claim that it is difficult for me to even try to explain... ...what it was. Like, we just have to listen to it again. It is like legitimately in years of watching YouTube in years of watching YouTube as a fan and as somebody who now makes content professionally it is uh, without a doubt one of the most insane claims I have ever heard someone make. Dragons out of the sky. Rather, Joan Allen knew that this was the gameplay related effect that the Dragon Brain shout would have, and so she had Delphine say, Knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Delphine had no way of knowing that. So we're clear here again. This was the gameplay related effect of the sky. Rather, Joan Allen knew that this was the gameplay related effect. Joan Allen is Delphine's voice actor effect that the dragon grin shout would have, and so she had Delphine say, knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Delphine had no way of knowing that. Like, seriously. I want to say that I've been into, like, YouTube analysis, like, this scene, since, like, I want to say, like, 2013. So, coming up on a decade soon, you know, nine years, and this takes the cake. Like, uh, this, this is, it, it, there's some really, like, there's some gems in this video. That's the thing you can actually say about Oblivion, where General Zod ad-libs some shit. They just leave it in, even though it's total nonsense, because his delivery is great. Oh, yeah, uh, Terrence Stamp. I mean, like sure but coming to the conclusion that like joan allen knows and has and has he she knows about how the dragon Ren shout works she has access to information about like the game development or that like she's even interested in playing video games these are all giant leaps in logic it was way easier to just assume that it's a writing fucky wucky What do they give schizophrenics when... What are normal pills? Clozapine. Or clozapine. Yeah. That's what I need. Some real... Heavy duty antipsychotics. 
I think there's nothing more amusing than the notion that like Acer Thorn is gonna find out about this stream and uh, watch all of it. I mean, it's pretty on point. I think the first Acer Thorn stream, it got through an hour and 10 minutes and it was six hours long. So this kind of like, it's basically the same pace. But I really can't wait to hear from Acer Thorn that like, uh, that I'm doxing him or, you know, some of the some of the crazy shit he says. Like, honestly, uh, if I have any one request, I know that this is far too late in the stream. It's that uh, just leave the fucking drama in 2019, okay? I don't know the Kratosis guys. I've never actually spoken to, I think, any of them outside of the public discord or like the live stream chat like i'm not in their dms uh i don't know these people i don't hang out with them i'm not part of the crew that messes with you does acer thorn deserve a kiwi farms article i don't think anybody deserves a kiwi farms article but i think if anybody fit on kiwi farms um it would be acer thorn and, okay, so I want to say this, like, as something that isn't necessarily meant to be a negative. There are some people who don't necessarily handle the internet very well, and it becomes, like, a net negative for them because of how poorly they can handle it. And Acer Thorn is one of those people. Um, anything he's wrong about, he gets comments about. And anything he gets comments about, it compounds into the next video. And so, for the last three years, Acer Thorn has been like this brewing time bomb of a person uh, who's just like stuck in a spot in a in a loop of uh, negativity uh, that's just going to keep going until um, I don't know, like somebody somebody dies in a drive-by shooting or something. No, I doubt that would be the case. But like, yeah, it's it's a net negative for him, and I think. I don't I know that it's hard after so many people have like criticized you and what have you that to like walk away from uh to walk away from this kind of stuff, right? Like you probably like of all the a bunch of people have criticized you, you've probably been wronged at some point, right? It, you know, someone took an argument out of context, what have you. Um you just can't fight you can't fight all these battles as, as they happen, as, as they're necessary. At some point, you just have to try and do better in the future. Just keep at it. And try to make better content. And try to be one of those things like in three years, you look back at 2022 and you say, that was a bad time, but I'm so much better than I was. You've reached something important. If he makes a reaction video, do you watch it or just give up on this entirely? Probably give up on this entirely. What the fuck do I care? Um, what his like meager defenses for his points would be. I mean, legitimately, I heard some extremely brain dead takes today. There's some stuff in this video that's indefensible in terms of just how how stupid something some of the stuff he says is. Like, I, and I hate the hypocrisy thing, but, like, padding is okay except when it isn't and I want to make a complaint about it, and then it's not okay. And it's like, wow, cool, awesome. But, yeah, it's like, if it makes him, I don't know, if it makes him feel better to make a reaction to, 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 grind that axe then I guess um then I guess that like you know that's he's got to do what he's got to do but I think that he gets the last word in the situation but I do want what's best for him because um, I can tell that, like, he's let the negativity really get to him. And it's a shame to see... I'm not a big fan of lolcows. 
I never really have been. Um, I think that, like, the story of Chris Chan is a tragedy. I think that key people in Chris Chan's life weren't there for him when he needed them. And that's what ultimately led to the... Um, to the very slow and gradual downfall until the explosive end. Um, and I'm not saying that Acer Thorn is like a Christian, that there's very few people that could really take that title, but I think that, um, I think he doesn't really have anybody in his life who can kind of walk him back from like this crazy shit of, I've, I have to respond to everybody who criticizes me, but I also have to make new, new, new takes uh, for people to go crazy about. Like, it's just, it's a feedback loop. No, I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy that, um, I, I don't find it entertaining to watch somebody kind of self-destruct, unless they're an asshole. But I don't think that, like, shitty takes about video games necessarily make you an asshole and you can say well he's been doing false dmcas or what have you i don't necessarily know the full context on that story um so i'm not gonna really give credence uh for or against uh but if he is doing that that's a consequence of uh him getting criticized for again shitty takes on on video games I like that there's always somebody who's going to ask who's Chris Chan. Like, that's something that I can explain in the next 10 minutes. Uh, there's more Chris Chan lore that you have to catch up with than there is Elder Scrolls lore. I've only really seen him start to be an asshole when he receives criticism. I think it's being overly defensive than actually being an asshole. I still think that... I still think that, like, it's a spiral where it's getting worse with time. It just says the more time that passes, the more people that criticize him, the more that he can't handle it. When can I find you on the Discord? Uh, I usually look... I'm, I'm usually looking. If it's interesting, I'll respond to stuff, but... Um... Yeah, like, uh, the Discord is a space where uh, you can talk on there and I might and I might show up to kind of talk with you about it. You could probably explain who he is relatively quickly, just not the history in full detail. I don't know. What's the key parts of Chris Chan's story that you give in a one-sentence description? I don't think there's any... Like, you can't effectively explain Chris Chan uh, quickly without, like, just raising more questions as a consequence of explaining it. And, like, what parts of the story are important? If you put yourself in a public space, you need to be able to accept negative comments. Um, yes, I certainly agree. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like we are um, we are free of consequence for uh, the ways that we interact with people's like with people like this. Like, my worst thought is like Acer Thorn is gonna have a fucking meltdown because like 
I said that some of his opinions on Skyrim were like were like stupid, right? But I mean like I don't know, that's the thing. I don't want to give him like the power and leverage to say that like um he gets to dictate what Skyrim videos I do and don't watch. And so I decided that equality was the answer and that he got the same metric that uh, other content creators in the space got. Is the Joan Allen thing actually going to be a segment in your Skyrim video? I can't imagine how one would even begin to convey the levels of insanity you have to be on to be to sincerely believe it. I mean, like, how do you not mention it? How do you live in a world where you know that information and you don't share it with other people? Even if just, uh, I play the clip and I say, what? The Joan Allen thing from the Acer Thorn video. You ever tried the Skyrim multiplayer bots? I've tried them, but this was a long time ago. Um, they were kind of rusty at the time. But I can't necessarily say, like, that's what they are now. I think revealing the truth about Joan Allen is a worthy cause. Like, Joan Allen is so ridiculous. That, that meme is almost on the level of, like, the burning dog meme from the Oblivion streams. Did you have to get special equipment to have that avatar? Yeah, for the first time in my life I had to buy a webcam. Someone asked me my opinion on a. Uh, do, wait, do I have time? Oh, we got a, we got a couple more minutes. Do you archive these videos as fallback in case your coverage results in deletion? Um, no. I mean, in terms of fair use, there's no real reason anyone can stop you from watching their videos if they're actually pausing and commenting on them frequently, right? It would be all about etiquette, all about etiquette. Well, okay, so the thing about copyright is that a lot of that stuff is untested, so it's like, uh, if you wanted to make the case, you always could. You always have that that ability to try and, and make it, like, a big deal. Um, I don't know. I feel like Acer Thorn should probably appreciate that, like, I'm one of the kinder people to talk about him. You know what I mean? Like, Ace responding to Acer Thorn stuff is like a genre in of itself. Like all these channels are like really like like this is a genre of videos on YouTube. And a lot of these guys aren't, um, aren't nice, to say the least. 